Heading Level 1 The Voyage of the Beagle Heading Level 1 Charles Darwin neared by D. Seltzer Mackenzie, after having been twice driven back by heavy southwestern gales, Her Majesty's ship Beagle, a 10-ton brig, under the command of Captain Fitzroy, R.N., sailed from Devonport on the 27th of December, 1831. The object of the expedition was to complete the survey of Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego, commenced under Captain King in 1826-1830, to survey the shores of Chile, Peru, and of some islands in the Pacific, and to carry a chain of chronometrical measurements round the world. On the 6th of January we reached Tenerife, but were prevented landing, by fears of our bringing the cholera. The next morning we saw the sunrise behind the rugged outline of the Grand Canary Island, and suddenly illuminate the peak of Tenerife, whilst the lower parts were veiled in fleecy clouds. This was the first of many delightful days never to be forgotten. On the 16th of January, 1832, we anchored at Porto Praia, in Street Jago, the chief island of the Cape de Verde archipelago. The neighborhood of Porto Praia, viewed from the sea, wears a desolate aspect. The volcanic fires of a past age, and the scorching heat of a tropical sun, have in most places rendered the soil unfit for vegetation. The country rises in successive steps of tableland, interspersed with some dry cape conical hills, and the horizon is bounded by an irregular chain of more lofty mountains. The scene, as beheld through the hazy atmosphere of this climate, is one of great interest, if, indeed, a person, fresh from sea, and who has just walked, for the first time, in a grove of coconut trees, can be a judge of anything but his own happiness. The island would generally be considered as very uninteresting, but to anyone accustomed only to an English landscape, the novel aspect of an utterly sterile land possesses a grandeur which more vegetation might spoil. A single green leaf can scarcely be discovered over wide tracts of the lava plains, yet flocks of goats, together with a few cows, contrive to exist. It rains very seldom, but during a short portion of the year heavy torrents fall, and immediately afterwards a light vegetation springs out of every crevice. This soon withers, and upon such naturally formed hay the animals live. It had not now rained for an entire year. When the island was discovered, the immediate neighborhood of Porto Praia was clothed with trees, note 1, the reckless destruction of which has caused here, as at St. Helena, and at some of the Canary Islands, almost entire sterility. The broad, flat bottom valleys, many of which serve during a few days only in season as water courses, are clothed with thickets of leafless bushes. Few living creatures inhabit these valleys. The commonest bird is a kayfisher, Tisalo iagonsis, which tamely sits on the branches of the castor oil plant, and then starts on grasshoppers and lizards. It is brightly colored, but not so beautiful as the European species, in its flight, manners, and place of habitation, which is generally in the driest valley, there is also a wide difference. One day, two of the officers and myself rode to River Grande, a village a few miles eastward of Porto Praia. Until we reached the valley of St. Martin, the country presented its usual dull brown appearance, but here, a very small rill of water produces a most refreshing margin of luxuriant vegetation. In the course of an hour we arrived at Tripura Grand, and were surprised at the sight of a large ruined fort and cathedral. This little town, before its harbor was filled up, was the principal place in the island. It now presents a melancholy, but very picturesque appearance. Having procured a black pottery for a guide, and to Spaniard who had served in the peninsular war as an interpreter, we visited a collection of buildings, of which an ancient church formed the principal part. It is here the governors and captain generals of the islands have been buried. Some of the tombstones recorded dates of the 16th century, no two. The heraldic ornaments were the only things in this retired place that reminded us of Europe. The church or chapel formed one side of a quadrangle, in the middle of which a large clump of bananas were growing. On another side was a hospital, containing about a dozen miserable-looking inmates. We returned to the Venta to eat our dinners. A considerable number of men, women, and children, all as black as a jet, collected to watch us. Our companions were extremely merry, and everything we said, or did was followed by their hearty laughter. Before leaving the town we visited the cathedral. It does not appear, so rich as the smaller church, but boasts of a little organ, which sent forth singularly and harmonious cries. We presented the black priest with a few shillings, and the Spaniard, patting him on the head, said, with much candor, he thought his color made no great difference. We then returned, as fast as the ponies would go, to Porto Praia. Another day we rode to the village of St. Domingo, situated near the center of the island. On a small plain which we crossed, a few stunted acacias were growing, their tops had been bent by the steady trade wind, in a singular manner some of them even at right angles to their trunks. The direction of the branches was exactly an E by N, and S W by S, and these natural veins must indicate the prevailing direction of the force of the trade wind. The traveling had made so little impression on the barren soil that we here missed our track and took the tufoons. 
This we did not find out till we arrived there, and we were afterwards glad of our mistake. Thunes is a pretty village, with a small stream, and everything appeared to prosper well, excepting, indeed, that which ought to do so most its inhabitants. The black children, completely naked, and looking very wretched, were carrying bundles of firewood half as big as their own bodies. Near Thunes we saw a large flock of guinea fowl, probably fifty or sixty in number. They were extremely wary, and could not be approached. They avoided us, like partridges on a rainy day in September, running with their heads cocked up, and if pursued, they readily took to the wing. The scenery of St. Domingo possesses a beauty totally unexpected, from the prevalent gloomy character of the rest of the island. The village is situated at the bottom of a valley, bounded by lofty and jaded walls of stratified lava. The black rocks afford a most striking contrast with the bright green vegetation, which follows the banks of a little stream of clear water. It happened to be a grand feast day, and the village was full of people. On our return we overtook a party of about twenty young black girls, dressed in excellent taste, their black skins and snow-white linen being set off, by colored turbans and large shawls. As soon as we approached near, they suddenly all turned round, and covering the path with their shawls, sung with great energy a wild song, beating time with their hands upon their legs. We threw them some victims, which were received with screams of laughter, and we left them redoubling the noise of their song. One morning the view was singularly clear, the distant mountains being projected with the sharpest outline on a heavy bank of dark blue clouds. Judging from the appearance, and from similar cases in England, I supposed that the air was saturated with moisture. The fact, however, turned out quite the contrary. The hygrometer gave a difference of 29.6 degs between the temperature of the air and the point at which dew was precipitated. This difference was nearly double that which I had observed on the previous mornings. This unusual degree of atmospheric dryness was accompanied by continual flashes of lightning. Is it not an uncommon case, thus to find a remarkable degree of aerial transparency with such a state of weather? Generally the atmosphere is hazy, and this is caused by the falling of impalpably fine dust, which was found to have slightly injured the astronomical instruments. The morning before we anchored at Porto Praia, I collected a little packet of this brown-colored fine dust, which appeared to have been filtered from the wind by the gauze of the vein at the masthead. Mr. Little has also given me four packets of dust which fell on a vessel a few hundred miles northward of these islands. Professor Ehrenberg, note 3, finds that this dust consists in great part of infusoria with siliceous shields, and of the siliceous tissue of plants. In five little packets which I sent him, he has ascertained no less than 67 different organic forms. The infusoria, with the exception of two marine species, are all inhabitants of fresh water. I have found no less than 15 different accounts of dust having fallen on vessels when far out in the Atlantic. From the direction of the wind, whenever it has fallen, and from its having always fallen during those months, when the Harmattan is known to raise clouds of dust high into the atmosphere, we may feel sure that it all comes from Africa. It is, however, a very singular fact, that, although Professor Ehrenberg knows many species of infusoria peculiar to Africa, he finds none of these in the dust, which I sent him. On the other hand, he finds in it two species which hitherto he knows as living only in South America. The dust falls in such quantities as to dirty everything on board, and to hurt people's eyes, vessels even have run on shore owing to the obscurity of the atmosphere. It has often fallen on ships when several hundred, and even more than a thousand miles from the coast of Africa, and at points sixteen hundred miles distant in a north and south direction. In some dust, which was collected on a vessel three hundred miles from the land, I was much surprised to find particles of stone above the thousandth of an inch square, mixed with finer matter. After this fact one need not be surprised at the diffusion of the far lighter and smaller sporules of cryptogamic plants. The geology of this island is the most interesting part of its natural history. On entering the harbor, a perfectly horizontal white band, in the face of the sea cliff, may be seen running for some miles along the coast, and at the height of about 45 feet above the water. Upon examination this wide stratum is found to consist of calcareous matter with numerous shawls embedded, most or all of which now exist on the neighboring coast. It rests on ancient volcanic rocks, and has been covered by a stream of basalt, which must have entered the sea when the white shelly bed was lying at the bottom. It is interesting to trace the changes produced by the heat of the overlying lava on the friable mass, which in parts has been converted into a crystalline limestone, and in other parts into a compact spotted stone, where the lime has been caught up by the scoriaceous fragments of the lower surface of the stream. It is converted into groups of beautifully irradiated fibers resembling aragonite. The beds have lava rise in successive and gently sloping planes towards the interior, whence the deluges of melted stone have originally proceeded. Within historical times, no signs of volcanic activity have, I believe, been manifested in any part of Street Jago.
Even the form of a crater can, but rarely be discovered on the summits of the many red cindery hills, yet the more recent streams can be distinguished on the coast, forming lines of cliffs of less height, but stretching out in advance of those belonging to an older series, the height of the cliffs thus affording a rude measure of the age of the streams. During our stay, I observed the habits of some marine animals. A larger pelagian is very common. This sea slug is about five inches long, and is of a dirty yellowish color veined with purple. On each side of the lower surface, or foot, there is a broad membrane, which appears sometimes to act as a ventilator, in causing a current of water to flow over the dorsal branch e or lungs. It feeds on the delicate seaweeds which grow among the stones in muddy and shallow water, and I found in its stomach several small pebbles, as in the gizzard of a bird. The slug, when disturbed, emits a very fine purplishered fluid, which stains the water for the space of a foot around. Besides this means of defense, an acrid secretion, which is spread over its body, causes a sharp, stinging sensation, similar to that produced by the Phasalia, or Portuguese man-of-war. I was much interested, on several occasions, by watching the habits of an octopus, or a cuttlefish. Although common in the pools of water left by the retiring tide, these animals were not easily caught. By means of their long arms and suckers, they could drag their bodies into very narrow crevices, and when thus fixed, it required great force to remove them. At other times they darted tail first, with the rapidity of an arrow, from one side of the pool to the other, at the same instant discoloring the water with the dark chestnut brown ink. These animals also escape the detection by a very extraordinary chameleon-like power of changing their color. They appear to vary their tints according to the nature of the ground over which they pass, when in deep water, their general shape was brownish purple, but when placed on the land, or in shallow water, this dark tint changed into one of a yellowish green. The color, examined more carefully, was a French gray, with numerous minute spots of bright yellow, the former of these varied in intensity, the latter entirely disappeared and appeared again by turns. These changes were effected in such a manner, that clouds, varying in tint between a hyacinth red and a chestnut brown, note, or, were continually passing over the body. Any part, being subjected to a slight shock of galvanism, became almost black, a similar effect, but in a less degree, was produced by scratching the skin with a needle. These clouds, or blushes as they may be called, are said to be produced by the alternate expansion and contraction of minute vesicles containing variously colored fluids. Note 5. The scuttlefish displayed its chameleon-like power both during the act of swimming, and whilst remaining stationary at the bottom. I was much amused by the various arts, to escape detection used by one individual, which seemed fully aware, that I was watching it. Remaining for a time motionless, it would then stealthily advance an inch or two, like a cat after a mouse. Sometimes changing its color, it thus proceeded, till having gained a deeper part, it darted away, leaving a dusky drain of ink, to hide the hole into which it had crawled. While looking for marine animals, with my head about two feet above the rocky shore, I was more than once saluted by a jet of water, accompanied by a slight grating noise. At first I could not think what it was, but afterwards I found out, that it was this cuttlefish, which, though concealed in a hole, thus often led me to its discovery. That it possesses the power of ejecting water there is no doubt, and it appeared to me, that it could certainly take a good aim by directing the two poor siphon on the underside of its body. From the difficulty, which these animals have in carrying their heads, they cannot crawl with these when placed on the ground. I observed that one which I kept in the cabin was slightly phosphorescent in the dark. St. Paul's rocks in crossing the Atlantic we hove to during the morning of February 16th, close to the island of St. Paul's. This cluster of rocks is situated in 0 degs 58 foot north latitude, and 29 degs 15 west longitude. It is 540 miles distant from the coast of America, and 350 from the island of Fernando Naranja. The highest point is only 50 feet above the level of the sea, and the entire circumference is under three quarters of a mile. This small point rises abruptly out of the depths of the ocean. Its mineralogical constitution is not simple, in some parts the rock is of a surety, in others have a philosophic nature, including thin veins of serpentine. It is a remarkable fact, that all the many small islands, lying far from any continent, in the Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic Oceans, with the exception of the sea chulls and this little point of rock, are, I believe, composed either of coral, or of erupted matter. The volcanic nature of these oceanic islands is evidently an extension of that law, and the effect of those same causes, whether chemical or mechanical, from which it results, that a vast majority of the volcanoes now in action, stand either near sea coasts, or as islands in the midst of the sea. The rocks of St. Paul appear from a distance of a brilliantly white color. This is partly owing to the dung of a vast multitude of sea fowl, and partly to a coating of a hard glossy substance with a pearly luster, which is intimately united to the surface of the rocks. 
This, when examined with a lens, is found to consist of numerous exceedingly thin layers, its total thickness being about the tenth of an inch. It contains much animal matter, and its origin, no doubt, is due to the action of the rain or spray on the bird's dung. Below some small masses of guano had ascension, and on the agralhus islets, I found certain stalactitic branching bodies, formed apparently in the same manner as the thin white coating on these rocks. The branching bodies so closely resembled in general appearance certain nullipori, a family of hard calcareous seaplants, that in lately looking hastily over my collection I did not perceive the difference. The globular extremities of the branches are of a pearly texture, like the enamel of teeth, but so hard as just to scratch plate glass. I may here mention, that on a part of the coast of Ascension, where there is a vast accumulation of shelly sand, an encrustation is deposited on the tidal rocks by the water of the sea, resembling, as represented in the woodcut, certain cryptogamic plants, marcanchii, often seen on damp walls. The surface of the fronds is beautifully glossy, and those parts formed where fully exposed to the light are of a jet black color, but those shaded under ledges are only a gray. I have shown specimens of this encrustation to several geologists, and they all thought that they were of volcanic or igneous origin. In its hardness and translucency, in its polish, equal to that of the finest olive shell, in the bad smell given out, and loss of color under the blowpipe it shows a close similarity with living seashells. Moreover, in seashells, it is known that the parts habitually covered and shaded by the mantle of the animal are of a paler color than those fully exposed to the light, just as is the case with this encrustation. When we remember that lime, either as a phosphate or a carbonate, enters into the composition of the hard parts, such as bones and shells, of all living animals, it is an interesting physiological fact, note 6, to find substances harder than the enamel of teeth, and colored surfaces as well polished as those of a fresh shell, reformed through an organic means from dead organic matter mocking. Also, in shape, some of the lower vegetable productions. We found on St. Paul's only two kinds of birds, the booby and the naughty. The former is a species of gannet, and the latter a tern. Both are of a tame and stupid disposition, and are so unaccustomed to visitors, that I could have killed any number of them with my geological hammer. The booby lays her eggs on the bare rock, but the tern makes a very simple nest with seaweed. By the side of many of these nests a small flying fish was placed, which I suppose, had been brought by the male bird for its partner. It was amusing to watch how quickly a large and active crab, Graspus, which inhabits the crevices of the rock, stole the fish from the side of the nest, as soon as we had disturbed the parent birds. Sir W. Simons, one of the few persons who have landed here, informs me that he saw the crabs dragging even the young birds out of their nests, and devouring them. Not a single plant, not even a lichen, grows on this islet, yet it is inhabited by several insects and spiders. The following list completes, I believe, the terrestrial fauna, a fly, Olifrisia, living on the booby, and a tick which must have come here as a parasite on the birds, a small brown moth, belonging to a genus that feeds on feathers, a beetle, quetius, and a woodlouse from beneath the dung, and lastly, numerous spiders, which I suppose prey on these small attendants and scavengers of the waterfowl. The often repeated description of the stately palm and other noble tropical plants, then birds, and lastly men, taking possession of the coral islets, as soon as formed, in the Pacific, is probably not correct, I fear it destroys the poetry of this story, that feather and dirt feeding and parasitic insects and spiders should be the first inhabitants of newly formed oceanic land. The smallest rock in the tropical seas, by giving a foundation for the growth of innumerable kinds of seaweed and compound animals, supports likewise a larger number of fish. The sharks and the seamen in the boats, maintained a constant struggle which should secure the greater share of the prey caught by the fishing lines. I have heard, that a rock near the Bermudas, lying many miles out at sea, and at a considerable depth, was first discovered by the circumstance of fish having been observed in the neighborhood. Fernando Naranja, February 20 of as far as I was enabled to observe, during the few hours we stayed at this place, the constitution of the island is volcanic, but probably not of a recent date. The most remarkable feature is a conical hill, about 1,000 feet high, the upper part of which is exceedingly steep, and on one side overhangs its pace. The rock is frontalite, and is divided into irregular columns. On viewing one of these isolated masses, at first one is inclined to believe that it has been suddenly pushed up in a semifluid state. At St. Helena, however, I ascertained that some pinnacles, of a nearly similar figure and constitution, had been formed by the injection of melted rock into yielding strata, which thus had formed the molds for these gigantic obelisks. The whole island is covered with wood, but from the dryness of the climate there is no appearance of luxuriance. Halfway up the mountain, some great masses of the columnar rock, shaded by laurel-like trees, and ornamented by others covered with fine pink flowers, but without a single leaf, gave a pleasing effect to the nearer parts of the scenery. 
Bahia, or San Salvador. Brazil, February 29th The day has passed delightfully. Delight itself, however, is a weak term to express the feelings of a naturalist who, for the first time, has wandered by himself in a Brazilian forest. The elegance of the grasses, the novelty of the parasitical plants, the beauty of the flowers, the glossy green of the foliage, but above all the general luxuriance of the vegetation, filled me with admiration. A most paradoxical mixture of sound and silence pervades the shady parts of the wood. The noise from the insects is so loud, that it may be heard even in a vessel anchored several hundred yards from the shore, yet within the recesses of the forest a universal silence appears to reign. To a person fond of natural history, such a day as this brings with it a deeper pleasure than he can ever hope to experience again. After wandering about for some hours, I returned to the landing place, but, before reaching it, I was overtaken by a tropical storm. I tried to find shelter under a tree, which was so thick, that it would never have been penetrated by common English rain, but here, in a couple of minutes, a little torrent flowed down the trunk. It is to this violence of the rain, that we must attribute the verdure at the bottom of the thickest woods, if the showers were like those of a colder climate, the greater part would be absorbed or evaporated, before it reached the ground. I will not at present attempt, to describe the gaudy scenery of this noble bay, because, in our homeward voyage, we called here a second time, and I shall then have occasion to remark on it. Along the whole coast of Brazil, for a length of at least 2,000 miles, and certainly for a considerable space in land, wherever solid rock occurs, it belongs to a granitic formation. The circumstance of this enormous area being constituted of materials which most geologists believe to have been crystallized when heated under pressure, gives rise to many curious reflections. Was this effect produced beneath the depths of a profound ocean, or did a covering of strata formerly extend over it, which has since been removed? Can we believe that any power, acting for a time short of infinity, could have denuded the granite over so many thousand square leagues? On a point not far from the city, where a rivulet entered the sea, I observed a fact connected with the subject discussed by Humboldt. Note 7. At the cataracts of the great rivers Orinoco, Nile, and Congo, the sedanitic rocks are coated by a black substance, appearing as if they had been polished with plumbago. The layer is of extreme thinness, and on analysis by Berzelius it was found to consist of the oxides of manganese and iron. In the Orinoco it occurs on the rocks periodically washed by the floods, and in those parts alone where the stream is rapid, or, as the Indians say, the rocks are black where the waters are white. Here the coating is of a rich brown instead of a black color, and seems to be composed of ferruginous matter alone. Hand specimens fail to give a just idea of these brown burnished stones which glitter in the sun's rays. They occur only within the limits of the tidal waves, and as the rivulet slowly trickles down, the surf must supply the polishing power of the cataracts in the great rivers. In like manner, the rise and fall of the tide probably answer to the periodical inundations, and thus the same effects are produced under apparently different, but really similar circumstances. The origin, however, of these coatings of metallic oxides, which seem as if cemented to the rocks, is not understood, and no reason, I believe, can be assigned for their thickness remaining the same. One day I was amused, by watching the habits of the diadern antennatus, which was caught swimming near the shore. This fish, with its flabby skin, is well known to possess the singular power of distending itself into a nearly spherical form. After having been taken out of water for a short time, and then again immersed in it, a considerable quantity both of water and air is absorbed by the mouth, and perhaps likewise by the branchial orifices. This process is effected by two methods, the air is swallowed, and is then forced into the cavity of the body, its return being prevented by a muscular contraction which is externally visible, but the water enters in a gentle stream through the mouth, which is kept wide open and motionless, this latter action must, therefore, depend on suction. The skin about the abdomen is much looser than that on the back, hence, during the inflation, the lower surface becomes far more distended than the upper, and the fish, in consequence, floats with its back downwards. Q veer doubts whether the diadon in this position is able to swim, but not only can the thus move forward in a straight line, but it can turn round to either side. This latter movement is effected solely by the aid of the pectoral fins, the tail being collapsed and not used. From the body, being buoyed up with so much air, the branchial openings are out of water, but a stream drawn in by the mouth constantly flows through them. The fish, having remained in this distended state for a short time, generally expelled the air and water with considerable force from the branchial apertures and mouth. It could emit, at will, a certain portion of the water, and it appears, therefore, probable that this fluid is taken in, partly for the sake of regulating its specific gravity. This diadon possessed several means of defense. It could give a severe bite, and could eject water from its mouth to some distance, at the same time making a curious noise by the movement of its jaws. By the inflation of its body, the papillae, with which the skin is covered, 
become erect and pointed. But the most curious circumstance is that it secretes from the skin of its belly, when handled, a most beautiful carmine red fibrous matter, which stains ivory and paper in so permanent a manner, that the tint is retained with all its brightness to the present day. I am quite ignorant of the nature and use of this secretion. I have heard from Dr. Allen of Force, that he has frequently found a diadem, floating alive and distended, in the stomach of the shark, and that on several occasions he has known it eat its way, not only through the coats of the stomach, but through the sides of the monster, which has thus been killed. Who would ever have imagined, that a little soft fish could have destroyed the great and savage shark? March 18th, we sailed from Bahia. A few days afterwards, when not far distant from the Agralhas Islets, my attention was called to a reddish-brown appearance in the sea. The whole surface of the water, as it appeared under a weak lens, seemed as if covered, by chopped bits of hay, with their ends jagged. These are minute cylindrical confervi, in bundles or rafts up from twenty to sixty in each. Mr. Berkeley informs me, that they are the same species, Trichidesmia meritrium, with that found over large spaces in the Red Sea, and whence its name of Red Sea is derived, no date. Their numbers must be infinite, the ship passed through several beds of them, one of which was about ten yards wide, and, judging from the mud-like color of the water, at least two and a half miles long. In almost every long voyage some account is given of these confervi. They appear especially common in the sea near Australia, and off Cape Lee when I found an allied but smaller and apparently different species. Captain Cook, in his third voyage, remarks, that the sailors gave to this appearance the name of sea sawdust. Near Keeling at all, in the Indian Ocean, I observed many little masses of confervi a few inches square, consisting of long cylindrical threads of excess of thinness, so as to be barely visible to the naked eye, mingled with other rather larger bodies, finely conical at both ends. Two of these are shown in the woodcut and united together. They vary in length from 0.04 to 0.06, and even to 0.08 of an inch in length, and in diameter from 0.006 to 0.008 of an inch. Near one extremity of the cylindrical part, a green septum, formed of granular matter, and thickest in the middle, may generally be seen. This, I believe, is the bottom of a most delicate, colorless sack, composed of a pulpy substance, which lines the exterior case, but does not extend within the extreme conical points. In some specimens, small but perfect spheres of brownish granular matter supplied the places of the septa, and I observed the curious process by which they were produced. The pulpy matter of the internal coating suddenly grouped itself into lines, some of which assumed a form radiating from a common center, it then continued, with an irregular and rapid movement, to contract itself, so that in the course of a second the whole was united into a perfect little sphere, which occupied the position of the septum at one end of the now quite hollow case. The formation of the granular sphere was hastened by any accidental injury. I may add, that frequently a pair of these bodies were attached to each other, as represented above, cone beside cone, at that end, where the septum occurs. I will add here a few other observations connected with the discoloration of the sea from organic causes. On the coast of Chile, a few leagues north of Conception, the Beagle one day passed through great bands of muddy water, exactly like that of a swollen river, and again, a degree south of Valparaiso, when fifty miles from the land, the same appearance was still more extensive. Some of the water placed in a glass was of a pale reddish tint, and, examined under a microscope, was seen to swarm with minute animalcula darting about, and often exploding. Their shape is oval, and contracted in the middle by a ring of vibrating curved cilia. It was, however, very difficult to examine them with care, for almost the instant motion ceased, even while crossing the field of vision, their bodies burst. Sometimes both ends burst at once, sometimes only one, and to quantity of course, brownish granular matter was ejected. The animal an instant, before bursting expanded to half again its natural size, and the explosion took place about 15 seconds after the rapid progressive motion had ceased, in a few cases it was preceded for a short interval by a rotatory movement on the longer axis. About two minutes after any number were isolated in a drop of water, they thus perished. The animals moved with the narrow apex forwards, by the aid of their vibratory cilia, and generally by rapid starts. They are exceedingly minute, and quite invisible to the naked eye, only covering a space equal to the square of the thousandth of an inch. Their numbers were infinite, for the smallest drop of water which I could remove contained very many. In one day we passed through two spaces of water thus stained, one of which alone must have extended over several square miles. What incalculable numbers of these microscopical animals! The color of the water, as seen at some distance, was like that of a river which has flowed through a red clay district but under the shade of the vessel side it was quite as dark as chocolate. The line where the red and blue water joined was distinctly defined. 
The weather for some days previously had been calm, and the ocean abounded, to an unusual degree, with living creatures. Note 9. In the sea around Tierra del Fuego, and at no great distance from the land, I have seen narrow lines of water of a bright red color, from the number of crustacea, which somewhat resemble in form large prawns. The sailors call them whale food. Whether whales feed on them, I do not know, but terns, cormorants, and immense herds of great unwieldy seals derive, on some parts of the coast, their chief sustenance from these swimming crabs. Seamen invariably attribute the discoloration of the water to spawn, but I found this to be the case only on one occasion. At the distance of several leagues from archipelago of the Galapagos, the ship sailed through three strips of a dark yellowish, or mud-like water. These strips were some miles long, but only a few yards wide, and they were separated from the surrounding water by a sinuous yet distinct margin. The color was caused by little gelatinous poles, about the fifth of an inch in diameter, in which numerous minutes farical ovules were embedded. They were of two distinct kinds, one being of a reddish color, and of a different shape from the other. I cannot form a conjecture as to what two kinds of animals these belonged. Captain Colonnett remarks that this appearance is very common among the Galapagos Islands, and that the directions of the bands indicate that of the currents, in the described case, however, the line was caused by the wind. The only other appearance which I have to notice is a thin oily coat on the water, which displays iridescent colors. I saw a considerable tract of the ocean thus covered on the coast of Brazil. The seamen attributed it to the putrefying carcass of some whale, which probably was floating at no great distance. I do not here mention the minute gelatinous particles, hereafter to be referred to, which are frequently dispersed throughout the water, for they are not sufficiently abundant to create any change of color. There are two circumstances in the above accounts which appear remarkable. First, how do the various bodies which form the bands with defined edges keep together? In the case of the prawn-like cramps, their movements were as co-instantaneous as in a regiment of soldiers, but this cannot happen from anything like voluntary action with the ovules, or the confer V, nor is it probable among the infusoria. Secondly, what causes the length and narrowness of the bands? The appearance so much resembles that which may be seen in every torrent, where the stream uncoils into long streaks the froth collected in the eddies, that I must attribute the effect to a similar action either of the currents of the air or sea. Under this supposition we must believe that the various organized bodies are produced in certain favorable places, and are thence removed by the state of either wind or water. I confess, however, there is a very great difficulty in imagining any one spot to be the birthplace of the millions of millions of animalcula and confer V, for whence come the germs at such points, the parent bodies having been distributed by the winds and waves over the immense ocean. But on no other hypothesis can I understand their linear grouping. I may add that Scoresby remarks that green water abounding with pelagic animals is invariably found in a certain part of the Arctic Sea. April 4th to July 5th, 1832 A few days after our arrival I became acquainted with an Englishman who was going to visit his estate, situated rather more than a hundred miles from the capital, to the northward of Cape Frio. I gladly accepted his kind offer of allowing me to accompany him. April 8th, our party amounted to seven. The first stage was very interesting. The day was powerfully hot, and as we passed through the woods, everything was motionless, excepting the large and brilliant butterflies, which lazily fluttered about. The view seen when crossing the hills behind Praia Grant was most beautiful, the colors were intense, and the prevailing tint a dark blue, the sky and the calm waters of the bay vied with each other in splendor. After passing through some cultivated country, we entered a forest, which in the grandeur of all its parts could not be exceeded. We arrived by midday at Dipashvania, this small village is situated on a plain, and round the central house are the huts of the Negroes. These, from their regular form and position, reminded me of the drawings of the Hattentat habitations in southern Africa. As the moon rose early, we determined to start the same evening for our sleeping place at the Lago America. As it was growing dark we passed under one of the massive, hair, and steep hills of Grana which are so common in this country. This spot is notorious from having been, for a long time, the residence of some runaway slaves, who, by cultivating a little ground near the top, contrived to eke out a subsistence. At length they were discovered, and a party of soldiers being sent, the whole were seized with the exception of one old woman, who, sooner than again be led into slavery, dashed herself to pieces from the summit of the mountain. In a Roman matron this would have been called a noble love of freedom, in a poor negress it is mere brutal obstinacy. We continued riding for some hours. For the few last miles the road was intricate, and it passed through a desert waste of marshes and lagoons. The scene by the dim light of the moon was most desolate. A few fireflies flitted by us, and the solitary snipe, as it rose, uttered its plaintive cry. The distant and sullen roar of the sea scarcely broke the stillness of the night. April 9th, we left our miserable sleeping place before sunrise. 
The road passed through a narrow sandy plain, lying between the sea and the interior salt lagoons. The number of beautiful fishing birds, such as egrets and cranes, and the succulent plants assuming most fantastical forms, gave to the scene an interest which it would not otherwise have possessed. The few stunted trees were loaded with parasitical plants, among which the beauty and delicious fragrance of some of the orchidae were most to be admired. As the sun rose, the day became extremely hot, and the reflection of the light and heat from the white sand was very distressing. We dined at Mendetiba, the thermometer in the shade being 84 degs. The beautiful view of the distant wooded hills, reflected in the perfectly calm water of an extensive lagoon, quite refreshed us. As the Venda, one, here was a very good one, and I have the pleasant, but rare remembrance, of an excellent dinner, I will be grateful and presently describe it, as the type of its glass. These houses are often large, and are built of thick upright posts, with boughs interwoven, and afterwards plastered. They seldom have floors, and never glazed windows, but are generally pretty well roofed. Universally the front part is open, forming a kind of veranda, in which stables and benches are placed. The bedrooms join on each side, and here the passenger may sleep as comfortably as he can, on a wooden platform, covered by a thin straw mat. The venda stands in a courtyard, where the horses are fed. On first arriving it was our custom, to unsaddle the horses and give them their Indian corn, then, with a low bow, to ask the sender to do us the favor, to give up something to eat. Anything you choose, sir, was his usual answer. For the few first times, vainly I thank Providence for having guided us to so good a man. The conversation proceeding, the case universally became deplorable. Any fish can you do us the favor of giving, oh, no, sir, any soup, no, sir, any bread, oh, no, sir, any dried meat, oh, no, sir. If we were lucky, by waiting a couple of hours, we obtained fowls, rice, and varinha. It not unfrequently happened that we were obliged to kill, with stones, the poultry for our own supper. When, thoroughly exhausted by fatigue and hunger, we timorously hinted that we should be glad of our meal, the papas, and, though true, most unsatisfactory answer was, it will be ready, when it is ready. If we had dared to remonstrate any further, we should have been told to proceed on our journey, as being too impertinent. The hosts are most ungracious and disagreeable in their manners, their houses and their persons are often filthily dirty, the want of the accommodation of forks, knives, and spoons is common, and I'm sure no cottage or hovel in England could be found in a state so utterly destitute of every comfort. At Campos Novos, however, we fared sumptuously, having rice and fowls, biscuit, wine, and spirits, for dinner, coffee in the evening, and fish with coffee for breakfast. All this, with good food for the horses, only cost two six deeper head. Yet the host of this venda, being asked if he knew anything of the whip in which one of the party had lost, gruffly answered, How should I know? Why did you not take care of it? I suppose the dogs have eaten it. Leaving Mendetiba, we continued to pass through an intricate wilderness of lakes, in some of which were fresh, in others salt water shells. Of the former kinds, I found a limnia in great numbers in a lake, into which, the inhabitants assured me, that the sea enters once a year, and sometimes oftener, and makes the water quite salt. I have no doubt many interesting facts, in relation to marine and freshwater animals, might be observed in this chain of lagoons, which scar at the coast of Brazil. M. Day, too, has stated that he found in the neighborhood of Rio, shells of the marine genera Solan and Mytilus, and freshwater Ampelarii, living together in brackish water. I also frequently observed in the lagoon near the Botanic Garden, where the water is only a little less salt than in the sea, a species of Hydrophilus, very similar to a water beetle common in the ditches of England, in the same lake the only shell belonged to a genus generally found in estuaries. Leaving the coast for a time, we again entered the forest. The trees were very lofty, and remarkable, compared with those of Europe, from the whiteness of their trunks. I see by my notebook, wonderful and beautiful, flowering parasites, invariably struck me as the most novel object in these grand scenes. Traveling onwards we passed through tracts of pasturage, much injured by the enormous conical ants' nests, which were nearly 12 feet high. They gave to the plain exactly the appearance of the mud volcanoes at Jarello, as figured by Humboldt. We arrived at Tenjinhato, after it was dark, having been 10 hours on horseback. I never ceased, during the whole journey, to be surprised at the amount of labor which the horses were capable of enduring. They appeared also to recover from any injury much sooner than those of their English breed. The vampire bat is often the cause of much trouble, by biting the horses on their withers. The injury is generally not so much owing to the loss of blood, as to the inflammation which the pressure of the saddle afterwards produces. The whole circumstance has lately been doubted in England, I was therefore fortunate, in being present when one, Desmodus or Bignai, what, was actually caught on a horse's back. 
We were bivouacking late one evening near Caquimpo, in Chile, when my servant, noticing that one of the horses was very restive, went to see what was the matter, and fancying he could distinguish something, suddenly put his hand on the beast's withers, and secured the vampire. In the morning the spot where the bite had been inflicted, was easily distinguished from being slightly swollen and bloody. The third day afterwards we rode the horse, without any ill effects. April 13th, after three days traveling we arrived at Sasego, the estate of San Hermanuel Figueroa, a relation of one of our party. The house was simple, and, though like a barn in form, was well suited to the climate. In the sitting room gilded chairs and sofas were oddly contrasted with the whitewashed walls, thatched roof, and windows without glass. The house, together with the granaries, the stables, and workshops for the blacks, who had been taught various trades, formed a rude kind of quadrangle, in the center of which a large pile of coffee was drying. These buildings stand on a little hill, overlooking the cultivated ground, and surrounded on every side by a wall of dark green luxuriant forest. The chief produce of this part of the country is coffee. Each tree is supposed to yield annually, on an average, two pounds, but some give as much as eight. Mandicoric acid is likewise cultivated in great quantity. Every part of this plant is useful, the leaves and stalks are eaten by the horses, and the roots are ground into a pulp, which, when pressed dry and baked, forms the farinha, the principal article of sustenance in the Brazils. It is a curious, though well-known fact, that the juice of this most nutritious plant is highly poisonous. A few years ago a cow died at this fazenda, in consequence of having drunk some of it. Said her figurita told me that he had planted, the year before, one back of Fijao or beans, and three of rice, the former of which produced 80, and the latter 320 fold. The pasturage supports a fine stock of cattle, and the woods are so full of game, that a deer had been killed on each of the three previous days. This profusion of food showed itself at dinner, where, if the tables did not groan, the guests surely did, for each person is expected to eat of every dish. One day, having, as I thought, nicely calculated so, that nothing should go away untasted, to my utter dismay roast turkey and a pig appeared in all their substantial reality. During the meals, it was the employment of a man, to drive out of the room sundry old hounds, and dozens of little black children, which crawled in together, at every opportunity. As long as the idea of slavery could be banished, there was something exceedingly fascinating in this simple and patriarchal style of living, it was such a perfect retirement and independence from the rest of the world. As soon as any stranger is seen arriving, a large bell is set tolling, and generally some small cannon are fired. The event is thus announced to the rocks and woods, but to nothing else. One morning I walked out an hour before daylight to admire the solemn stillness of the scene. At last, the silence was broken by the morning hymn, raised on high by the whole body of the blacks, and in this manner their daily work is generally begun. On such fazendas as these, I have no doubt the slaves pass happy and contented lives. On Saturday and Sunday they work for themselves, and in this fertile climate the labor of two days is sufficient to support a man and his family for the whole week. April 14, leaving Sasego, we rode to another estate on the Rio Maki, which was the last patch of cultivated ground in that direction. The estate was two and a half miles long, and the owner had forgotten how many broad. Only a very small piece had been cleared, yet almost every acre was capable of yielding all the various rich productions of a tropical land. Considering the enormous area of Brazil, the proportion of cultivated ground can scarcely be considered as anything, compared to that which is left in the state of nature, at some future age, how vast a population it will support. During the second day's journey we found the road so shut up, that it was necessary, that a man should go ahead with his sword to cut away the creepers. The forest abounded with beautiful objects, among which the tree ferns, though not large, were, from their bright green foliage, and the elegant garbature of their fronds, most worthy of admiration. In the evening it rained very heavily, and although the thermometer stood at 65 degs, I felt very cold. As soon as the rain ceased, it was curious to observe the extraordinary evaporation which commenced over the whole extent of the forest. At the height of a hundred feet the hills were buried in a dense white vapor, which rose like columns of smoke from the most thickly wooded parts, and especially from the valleys. I observed this phenomenon on several occasions. I suppose it is owing to the large surface of foliage, previously heated by the sun's rays. While staying at this estate, I was very nearly being an eyewitness to one of those atrocious acts which can only take place in a slave country. Owing to a quarrel and a lawsuit, the owner was on the point of taking all the women and children from the male slaves, and selling them separately at the public auction at Rio. Interest, and not any feeling of compassion, prevented this act. Indeed, I do not believe the inhumanity of separating thirty families, who had lived together for many years, even occurred to the owner. Yet I will pledge myself that in humanity and good feeling he was superior to the common run of men.
It may be said there exists no limit to the blindness of interest and selfish habit. I may mention one very trifling anecdote, which at the time struck me more forcibly than any story of cruelty. I was crossing a ferry with a Negro, who was uncommonly stupid. In endeavoring to make him understand, I talked loud, and made signs, in doing which I passed my hand near his face. He, I suppose, thought I was in a passion, and was going to strike him, for instantly, with a frightened look and half-shut eyes, he dropped his hands. I shall never forget my feelings of surprise, disgust, and shame, at seeing a great powerful man afraid even to ward off the blow, directed, as he thought, at his face. This man had been trained to a degradation lower than the slavery of the most helpless animal. April 18th, in returning we spent two days at Sasego, and I employed them, in collecting insects in the forest. The greater number of trees, although so lofty, are not more than three or four feet in circumference. There are, of course, a few of much greater dimensions. Said Her Manuel was then making a canoe 70 feet in length from a solid trunk, which had originally been 110 feet long, and of great thickness. The contrast of palm trees, growing amidst the common branching kinds, never fails to give the scene an intertropical character. Here the woods were ornamented by the cabbage palm, one of the most beautiful of its family. With the stem so narrow, that it might be clasped with the two hands, it waves its elegant head at the height of 40 or 50 feet above the ground. The woody creepers, themselves covered by other creepers, were of great thickness, some which I measured, were two feet in circumference. Many of the older trees presented a very curious appearance from the tresses of oleana hanging from their boughs, and resembling bundles of hay. If the eye was turned from the world of foliage above, to the ground beneath, it was attracted by the extreme elegance of the leaves of the ferns and mimosae. The latter, in some parts, covered the surface with the brushwood only a few inches high. In walking across these thick beds of mimosae, a broad track was marked by the change of shade, produced by the drooping of their sensitive petioles. It is easy to specify the individual objects of admiration in these grand scenes, but it is not possible to give an adequate idea of the higher feelings of wonder, astonishment, and devotion, which fill and elevate the mind. April 19th, leaving Sasego, during the two first days, we retraced our steps. It was very wearisome work, as the road generally ran across a glaring hot sandy plain, not far from the coast. I noticed that each time the horse put its foot on the fine silicious sand, a gentle chirping noise was produced. On the third day we took a different line, and passed through the gay little village of Mare de Dias. This is one of the principal lines of road in Brazil, yet it was in so bad a state, that no wheeled vehicle, excepting the clumsy bullock wagon, could pass along. In our whole journey we did not cross a single bridge built of stone, and those made of logs of wood were frequently so much out of repair, that it was necessary to go on one side to avoid them. All distances are inaccurately known. The road is often marked by crosses, in the place of milestones, to signify where human blood has been spilled. On the evening of the 23rd we arrived at Rio, having finished our pleasant little excursion. During the remainder of my stay at Rio, I resided in a cottage at Botafogo Bay. It was impossible to wish for anything more delightful than us, to spend some weeks in so magnificent a country. In England any person fond of natural history enjoys in his walks a great advantage, by always having something to attract his attention, but in these fertile climates, teeming with life, the attractions are so numerous, that he is scarcely able to walk at all. The few observations which I was enabled to make, were almost exclusively confined to the invertebrate animals. The existence of a division of the genus Planaria, which inhabits the dry land, interested me much. These animals are of so simple a structure, that Cuvier has arranged them with the intestinal worms, though never found within the bodies of other animals. Numerous species inhabit both salt and fresh water, but those to which I allude were found, even in the drier parts of the forest, beneath logs of rotten wood, on which I believe they feed. In general form they resemble little slugs, but are very much narrower in proportion, and several of the species are beautifully colored with longitudinal stripes. Their structure is very simple, near the middle of the under, or crawling surface there are two small transverse slits, from the interior one of which a funnel-shaped and highly irritable mouth can be protruded. For some time after the rest of the animal was completely dead from the effects of salt water or any other cause, this organ still retained its vitality. I found no less than 12 different species of terrestrial planarii in different parts of the southern hemisphere. 3. Some specimens which I obtained at Van Diemen's Land, I kept alive for nearly two months, feeding them on rotten wood. Having cut one of them transversely into two nearly equal parts, in the course of a fortnight both had the shape of perfect animals. I had, however, so divided the body, that one of the halves contained both the inferior orifices, and the other, in consequence, none. In the course of twenty-five days from the operation, the more perfect half could not have been distinguished from any other specimen. 
the other had increased much in size, and towards its posterior end, a clear space was formed in the parenchymatous mass, in which a rudimentary cup-shaped mouth could clearly be distinguished. On the under surface, however, no corresponding slit was yet open. If the increased heat of the weather, as we approach the equator, had not destroyed all the individuals, there can be no doubt that this last step would have completed its structure. Although so well known an experiment, it was interesting to watch the gradual production of every essential organ out of the simple extremity of another animal. It is extremely difficult to preserve these planarii, as soon as the cessation of life allows the ordinary laws of change to act, their entire bodies become soft and fluid, with the rapidity which I have never seen equal. I first visited the forest in which these planarii were found, in company with an old Portuguese priest who took me out to hunt with him. The sport consisted in turning into the cover a few dogs, and then patiently waiting to fire at any animal which might appear. We were accompanied by the son of a neighboring farmer, a good specimen of a wild Brazilian youth. He was dressed in a tattered old shirt and trousers, and had his head uncovered. He carried an old-fashioned gun and a large knife. The habit of carrying the knife is universal, and in traversing a thick wood it is almost necessary, on account of the creeping plants. The frequent occurrence of murder may be partly attributed to this habit. The Brazilians are so dexterous with the knife, that they can throw it to some distance with precision, and with sufficient force, to cause a fatal wound. I have seen a number of little boys practicing this art as a game of play, and from their skill, in hitting an uprise tech, they promised twelve or more earnest attempts. My companion, the day before, had shot two large bearded monkeys. These animals have prehensile tails, the extremity of which, even after death, can support the whole weight of the body. One of them has remained fast to a branch, and it was necessary to cut down a large tree to procure it. This was soon effected, and down came tree and monkey with an awful crash. Our day's sport, besides the monkey, was confined to sundry small green parrots and a few toucans. I profited, however, by my acquaintance with the Portuguese padre, for on another occasion he gave me a fine specimen of the Agaroundi cat. Everyone has heard of the beauty of the scenery near Botafogo. The house in which I lived was seated close beneath the well-known mountain of the Corcovado. It has been remarked, with much truth, that abruptly conical hills are a characteristic of the formation which Humboldt designates as Nisgrinite. Nothing can be more striking than the effect of these huge rounded masses of naked rock rising out of the most luxuriant vegetation. I was often interested by watching the clouds, which, rolling in from seaward, formed a bank just beneath the highest point of the Corcovado. This mountain, like most others, when thus partly veiled, appeared to rise to a far prouder elevation than its real height of 2300 feet. Mr. Daniel has observed, in his meteorological essays, that a cloud sometimes appears fixed on a mountain summit, while the wind continues to blow over it. The same phenomenon here presented a slightly different appearance. In this case a cloud was clearly seen to curl over, and rapidly pass by the summit, and yet was neither diminished, nor increased in size. The sun was setting, and a gentle southerly breeze, striking against the southern side of the rock, mingled its current with the colder air above, and the vapor was thus condensed, but as the light wreaths of cloud passed over the ridge, and came within the influence of the warmer atmosphere of the northern sloping bank, they were immediately redissolved. The climate, during the months of May and June, or the beginning of winter, was delightful. The mean temperature, from observations taken at 9 o'clock, both morning and evening, was only 72 degs. It often rained heavily, but the drying southerly winds soon again rendered the walks pleasant. One morning, in the course of six hours, 1.6 inches of rain fell. As this storm passed over the forests which surround the Corcovado, the sound produced by the drops pattering on the countless multitude of leaves was very remarkable. It could be heard at the distance of a quarter of a mile, and was like the rushing of a great body of water. After the hotter days, it was delicious to sit quietly in the garden and watch the evening pass into night. Nature, in these climes, chooses her vocalists from more humble performers than in Europe. A small frog, of the genus Villa, sits on a blade of grass about an inch above the surface of the water, and sends forth a pleasing chirp, when several are together they sing in harmony on different notes. I had some difficulty, in catching a specimen of this frog. The genus Villa has its toes terminated by small suckers, and I found this animal could crawl up a pane of glass, when placed absolutely perpendicular. Various siscity and crickets, at the same time, keep up a ceaseless shrill cry, but which, softened by the distance, is not unpleasant. Every evening after dark this great concert commenced, and often have I sat listening to it, until my attention has been drawn away by some curious passing insect. At these times the fireflies are seen flitting about from hedge to hedge. On a dark night the light can be seen at about 200 paces distant. 
It is remarkable that in all the different kinds of glowworms, shining elaters, and various marine animals, such as the Crustacea, Medusae, Neridae, a coralline of the genus Clisha, and Parasma, which I have observed, the light has been of a well-marked green color. All the fireflies, which I caught here, belong to the Lampyridae, in which family the English glowworm is included, and the greater number of specimens were of Lampyris occidentalis. Or, I found that this insect emitted the most brilliant flashes when irritated, in the intervals, the abdominal rings were obscured. The flash was almost co-instantaneous in the two rings, but it was just perceptible first in the interior one. The shining matter was fluid and very adhesive, little spots, where the skin had been torn, continued bright with the slight scintillation, whilst the uninjured parts were obscured. When the insect was decapitated the rings remained uninterruptedly bright, but not so brilliant as before, local irritation with the needle always increased the vividness of the light. The rings in one instance retained their luminous property nearly 24 hours after the death of the insect. From these facts it would appear probable that the animal has only the power of concealing or extinguishing the light for short intervals, and that at other times the display is involuntary. On the muddy and wet gravel walks I found the larvae of this lampress in great numbers, they resembled in general form the female of the English glowworm. These larvae possessed, but feeble luminous powers, very differently from their parents, on the slightest touch they feigned death, and ceased to shine, nor did irritation excite any fresh display. I kept several of them alive for some time, their tails are very singular organs, for they act, by well-fitted contrivance, as suckers or organs of attachment, and likewise as reservoirs for saliva, or some such fluid. I repeatedly fed them on raw meat, and I invariably observed, that every now and then the extremity of the tail was applied to the mouth, and a drop of fluid exuded on the meat, which was then in the act of being consumed. The tail, notwithstanding so much practice, does not seem to be able to find its way to the mouth, at least the neck was always touched first, and apparently as a guide. When we were at Bahia, an elator or beetle, Biriforus luminosus, illic, seemed the most common luminous insect. The light in this case, was also rendered more brilliant by irritation. I amused myself one day, by observing the spreading powers of this insect, which have not, as it appears to me, been properly described. 5. The elator, when placed on its back, and preparing to spring, moved its head and thorax backwards, so that the pectoral spine was drawn out, and rested on the edge of its sheath. The same backward movement being continued, the spine, by the full action of the muscles, was bent like a spring, and the insect at this moment, rested on the extremity of its head in weight cases. The effort being suddenly relaxed, the head and thorax flew up, and in consequence, the base of the weight cases struck the supporting surface with such force, that the insect by the reaction, was jerked upwards to the height of one or two inches. The projecting points of the thorax, and the sheath of the spine, served to steady the whole body during the spring. In the descriptions, which I have read, sufficient stress does not appear to have been laid on the elasticity of the spine, so sudden a spring could not be the result of simple muscular contraction, without the aid of some mechanical contrivance. On several occasions I enjoyed some short, but most pleasant excursions in the neighboring country. One day I went to the botanic garden, where many plants, well known for their great utility, might be seen growing. The leaves of the camphor, pepper, cinnamon, and clove trees were delightfully aromatic, and the breadfruit the jacca, and the mango, vied with each other in the magnificence of their foliage. The landscape in the neighborhood of Bahia almost takes its character from the two latter trees. Before seeing them, I had no idea that any trees could cast so black a shade on the ground. Both of them bear to the evergreen vegetation of these climates the same kind of relation which laurels and hollies in England, due to the lighter green of the deciduous trees. It may be observed that the houses within the tropics are surrounded by the most beautiful forms of vegetation, because many of them are at the same time most useful to man. Who can doubt that these qualities are united in the banana, the coconut, the many kinds of palm, the orange, and the breadfruit tree? During this day I was particularly struck with the remark of Humboldt's, who often alludes to the thin paper which, without changing the transparency of the air, renders its tints more harmonious and softens its effects. This is an appearance which I have never observed in the temperate zones. The atmosphere, seen through a short space of half or three quarters of a mile, was perfectly lucid, but at a greater distance all colors were blended into a most beautiful haze, of a pale French gray, mingled with a little blue. The condition of the atmosphere between the morning and about noon, when the effect was most evident, had undergone little change, excepting in its dryness. In the interval, the difference between the dew point and temperature had increased from 7.5 to 17 degs. On another occasion I started early, and walked to the Gavia, or Topsail Mountain. 
The air was delightfully cool and fragrant, and the drops of dew still glittered on the leaves of the large liliaceous plants, which shaded the streamlets of clear water. Sitting down on a block of granite, it was delightful to watch the various insects and birds as they flew past. The hummingbird seems particularly fond of such shady retired spots. Whenever I saw these little creatures buzzing round a flower, with their wings vibrating so rapidly as to be scarcely visible, I was reminded of the sphinx moths, their movements and habits are indeed in many respects very similar. Following a pathway, I entered a noble forest, and from a height of five or six hundred feet, one of those splendid views was presented, which are so common on every side of Rio. At this elevation the landscape attains its most brilliant tint, and every form, every shade, so completely surpasses in magnificence all that the European has ever beheld in his own country, that he knows not how to express his feelings. The general effect frequently recalled to my mind the gayest scenery of the opera house or the great theatres. I never returned from these excursions empty-handed. This day I found a specimen of a curious fungus, called Hominophallus. Most people know the English phallus, which in autumn taints the air with its odious smell. This, however, as the entomologist is aware, is, to some of our beetles a delightful fragrance. So is it here, for Estrangolus, attracted by the odor, alighted on the fungus as I carried it in my hand. We here see in two distant countries a similar relation between plants and insects of the same families, though the species of both are different. When man is the agent, in introducing into a country a new species, this relation is often broken, as one instance of this I may mention, that the leaves of the cabbages and lettuces, which in England, afford food to such a multitude of slugs and caterpillars, in the gardens near Rio are untouched. During our stay at Brazil I made a large collection of insects. A few general observations on the comparative importance of the different orders may be interesting to the English entomologist. The large and brilliantly colored Lepidoptera bespeak the zone they inhabit, far more plainly than any other race of animals. I allude only to the butterflies, for the moths, contrary to what might have been expected from the rankness of the vegetation, certainly appeared in much fewer numbers than in our own temperate regions. I was much surprised at the habits of Propyliophoronia. This butterfly is not uncommon, and generally frequents the orange groves. Although a high flyer, yet it very frequently alights on the trunks of trees. On these occasions its head is invariably placed downwards, and its wings are expanded in a horizontal plane, instead of being folded vertically, as is commonly the case. This is the only butterfly which I have ever seen, that uses its legs for running. Not being aware of this fact, the insect, more than once, as I cautiously approached with my forceps, shuffled on one side, just as the instrument was on the point of closing, and thus escaped. But a far more singular fact is the power which this species possesses of making a noise. 6. Several times when a pair, probably male and female, were chasing each other in an irregular course, they passed within a few yards of me, and I distinctly heard a clicking noise, similar to that produced by a tooth wheel passing under a spring catch. The noise was continued at short intervals, and could be distinguished at about 20 yards distance. I'm certain there is no error in the observation. I was disappointed in the general aspect of the Coleoptera. The number of minute, and obscurely colored beetles is exceedingly great. 7. The cabinets of Europe can, as yet, boast only of the larger species from tropical climates. It is sufficient to disturb the composure of an entomologist's mind, to look forward to the future dimensions of a complete catalogue. The carnivorous beetles, or carabidae, appear in extremely few numbers within the tropics. This is the more remarkable when compared to the case of the carnivorous quadrupeds, which are so abundant in hot countries. I was struck with this observation both on entering Brazil, and when I saw the many elegant and active forms of the Harpality reappearing on the temperate plains of La Plata. Do the very numerous spiders and rapacious hominoptera supply the place of the carnivorous beetles? The carrion feeders and brachelatria are very uncommon, on the other hand, the Rhyncophora and chrysomelidae, all of which depend on the vegetable world for subsistence, are present in astonishing numbers. I do not here refer to the number of different species, but to that of the individual insects, for on this it is that the most striking character in the entomology of different countries depends. The orders Orthotera and Hemitera are particularly numerous, as likewise is the stinging division of the Hymenoptera the bees, perhaps, being accepted. A person, on first entering a tropical forest, is astonished that the labors of the ants, well beaten paths branch off in every direction, on which an army of never-filling foragers may be seen, some going forth and others returning, burdened with pieces of green leaf, often larger than their own bodies. A small dark-colored ant sometimes migrates in countless numbers. One day, at Bahia, my attention was drawn by observing many spiders, cockroaches, and other insects, and some lizards, rushing in the greatest agitation across a bare piece of ground. A little way behind, every stalk and leaf was blackened by a small ant. 
this worm having crossed the bare space, divided itself, and descended an old wall. By this means many insects were fairly enclosed, and the efforts which the poor little creatures made to extricate themselves from such a death were wonderful. When the ants came to the road they changed their course, and in narrow files reascended the wall. Having placed a small stone, so as to intercept one of the lines, the whole body attacked it, and then immediately retired. Shortly afterwards another body came to the charge, and again having failed to make any impression, this line of march was entirely given up. By going an inch round, the file might have avoided the stone, and this doubtless would have happened, if it had been originally there, but having been attacked, the lion-hearted little warriors scorned the idea of yielding. Certain wasp-like insects, which construct in the corners of the verandas clay cells for their larvae, are very numerous in the neighborhood of Rio. These cells they stuff full of half-dead spiders and caterpillars, which they seem wonderfully, to know how to sting to that degree as to leave them paralyzed but alive, until their eggs are hatched, and the larvae feed on the horrid mass of powerless, half-killed victims a sight which has been described by an enthusiastic naturalist, 8, as curious and pleasing. I was much interested one day, by watching a deadly contest between a pepsis and a large spider of the genus Lycosa. The wasp made a sudden dash at its prey, and then flew away, the spider was evidently wounded. Or, trying to escape, it rolled down a little slope, but had still strength sufficient to crawl into a thick duft of grass. The wasp soon returned, and seemed surprised at not immediately finding its victim. It then commenced as regular a hunt as ever hound did after fox, making short semicircular casts, and all the time rapidly vibrating its wings and antennae. The spider, though well concealed, was soon discovered, and the wasp, evidently still afraid of its adversary's jaws, after much maneuvering, inflicted two stings on the underside of its thorax. At last, carefully examining with its antennae the now motionless spider, it proceeded to drag away the body. But I stopped both tyrant and prey. 9. The number of spiders, in proportion to other insects, is here compared with England very much larger, perhaps more so than with any other division of the articulate animals. The variety of species among the jumping spiders appears almost infinite. The genus, or rather family, of Ripera, is here characterized by many singular forms, some species have pointed coriaceous shells, others enlarged and spiny tibiae. Every path in the forest, is barricaded with the strong yellow web of a species, belonging to the same division with the upper clavipes of Fabricius, which was formerly said by Sloan to make, in the West Indies, webs so strong as to catch birds. A small and pretty kind of spider, with very long four legs, and which appears to belong to an undescribed genus, lives as a parasite on almost every one of these webs. I suppose it is too insignificant to be noticed by the great opera, and is therefore allowed to prey on the minute insects, which, adhering to the lines, would otherwise be wasted. When frightened, this little spider either feigns death, by extending its front legs, or suddenly drops from the web. A large epera of the same division with epera tuberculata and canica is extremely common, especially in dry situations. Its web, which is generally placed among the great leaves of the common agave, is sometimes strengthened near the center by a pair or even four zigzag ribbons, which connect two adjoining rays. When any large insect, as a grasshopper or wasp, is caught, the spider, by a dexterous movement, makes it revolve very rapidly, and at the same time emitting a bed of threads from its spinners, soon envelopes its prey in a case like the cocoon of a silkworm. The spider now examines the powerless victim, and gives the fatal bite on the hinder part of its thorax, then retreating, patiently waits till the poison has taken effect. The virulence of this poison may be judged up from the fact, that in half a minute I opened the mesh, and found a large wasp quite lifeless. The separa always stands with its head downwards near the center of the web. When disturbed, it acts differently according to circumstances. If there is a thicket below, it suddenly falls down, and I have distinctly seen the thread from the spinners, lengthened by the animal while yet stationary, as preparatory to its fall. If the ground is clear beneath, the opera seldom falls, but moves quickly through a central passage from one to the other side. When still further disturbed, it practices a most curious maneuver. Standing in the middle, it violently jerks the web, which it attached to elastic wings, till at last the whole acquires such a rapid vibratory movement, that even the outline of the spider's body becomes indistinct. It is well known, that most of the British spiders, when a large insect is caught in their webs, endeavor to cut the lines and liberate their prey, to save their nets from being entirely spoiled. I once, however, saw in a hot house in Shropshire a large female wasp caught in the irregular web of a quite small spider, and the spider, instead of cutting the web, most perseveringly continued to entangle the body, and especially the wings, of its prey. The wasp at first aimed in vain repeated thrusts with its sting at its little antagonist. Pitying the wasp, after allowing it to struggle for more than an hour, I killed it, and put it back into the web. 
The spider soon returned, and an hour afterwards I was much surprised to find a with its jaws, buried in the orifice, through which the sting is protruded by the living wasp. I drove the spider away two or three times, but for the next twenty-four hours I always found it again sucking at the same place. The spider became much distended by the juices of its prey, which was many times larger than itself. I may here just mention, that I found, near Street Fay Bajita, many large black spiders, with ruby-colored marks on their backs, having gregarious habits. The webs were placed vertically, as is invariably the case with the genus Separa. They were separated from each other by a space of about two feet, but were all attached to certain common lines, which were of great length, and extended to all parts of the community. In this manner the tops of some large bushes were encompassed by the united nets. Azura, 10, has described a gregarious spider in Paraguay, which Walkenator thinks, must be a Viridian, but probably it is an Epera, and perhaps even the same species with 9. I cannot, however, recollect seeing a central nest as large as a hat, in which during autumn, when the spiders die, Azura says the eggs are deposited. As all the spiders which I saw, were of the same size, they must have been nearly of the same age. This gregarious habit, in so typical a genus as Epera, among insects, which are so bloodthirsty and solitary, that even the two sexes attack each other, is a very singular fact. In the lofty valley of the Cordillera, near Mendoza, I found another spider with a singularly formed web. Strong lines radiated in a vertical plane from a common center, where the insect had its station, but only two of the rays were connected by a symmetrical meshwork, so that the net, instead of being, as is generally the case, circular, consisted of a wedge-shaped segment. All the webs were similarly constructed. July 5, 1832 in the morning we got underway, and stood out of the splendid harbor of Rio de Janeiro. In our passage to the Plata, we saw nothing particular, excepting on one day a great shoal of porpoises, many hundreds in number. The whole sea was in places furled by them, and a most extraordinary spectacle was presented, as hundreds, proceeding together by jumps, in which their whole bodies were exposed, thus cut the water. When the ship was running nine knots an hour, these animals could cross, and recross the pose with the greatest of ease, and then dash away right ahead. As soon as we entered the estuary of the Plata, the weather was very unsettled. One dark night we were surrounded by numerous seals and penguins, which made such strange noises, that the officer on watch, reported he couldn't hear the cattle bellowing on shore. On a second night we witnessed a splendid scene of natural fireworks, the masthead and yard arm ends shone with St. Elmo's light, and the form of the vein can almost be traced, as if it had been rubbed with phosphorus. The sea was so highly luminous, that the tracks of the penguins were marked by a fiery wake, and the darkness of the sky was momentarily illuminated by the most vivid lightning. When within the mouth of the river, I was interested by observing, how slowly the waters of the sea and river mixed. The latter, muddy and discolored, from its less specific gravity, floated on the surface of the salt water. This was curiously exhibited in the wake of the vessel, where a line of blue water was seen mingling in little eddies, with the adjoining fluid. July 26, we anchored at Monte Video. The Beagle was employed, in surveying the extreme southern and eastern coasts of America, south of the Plata, during the two succeeding years. To prevent useless repetitions, I will extract those parts of my journal which refer to the same districts without always attending to the order in which we visited them. Maldonado is situated on the northern bank of the Plata, and not very far from the mouth of the estuary. It is a most quiet forlorn little town, built, as is universally the case in these countries, with the streets running at right angles to each other, and having in the middle a large plaza or square, which, from its size, renders the scantiness of the population more evident. It possesses scarcely any trade, the exports being confined to a few hides and living cattle. The inhabitants are chiefly landowners, together with a few shopkeepers and the necessary tradesmen, such as blacksmiths and carpenters, who do nearly all the business for a circuit of 50 miles round. The town is separated from the river by a band of sand hillocks, about a mile broad, it is surrounded, on all other sides, by an open slightly undulating country, covered by one uniform layer of fine green turf, on which countless herds of cattle, sheep, and horses graze. There is very little land cultivated even close to the town. A few hedges, made of cacti and agave, mark out where some wheat or Indian corn has been planted. The features of the country are very similar along the whole northern bank of the Plata. The only difference is that here the granitic hills are a little bolder. The scenery is very uninteresting, there is scarcely a house, an enclosed piece of ground, or even a tree, to give it an air of cheerfulness yet, after being imprisoned for some time in a ship, there is a charm in the unconfined feeling of walking over boundless plains of turf. Moreover, if your view is limited to a small space, many objects possess beauty. 
Some of the smaller birds are brilliantly colored, and the bright green sward, browsed short by the cattle, is ornamented by dwarf flowers, among which a plant, looking like the daisy, claimed the place of an old friend. What would a florist say to whole tracts, so thickly covered by the verbena melanders, as, even at a distance, to appear of the most gaudy scarlet? I stay ten weeks at Maldonado, in which time a nearly perfect collection of the animals, birds, and reptiles, was procured. Before making any observations respecting them, I will give an account of a little excursion I made as far as the river Polanco, which is about seventy miles distant, in a northerly direction. I may mention, as a proof how cheap everything is in this country, that I paid only two dollars a day, or eight shillings, for two men, together with a troop of about a dozen riding horses. My companions were well armed with pistols and sabers, a precaution which I thought rather unnecessary, but the first piece of news we heard was, that, the day before, a traveler from Monte Video had been found dead on the road, with his throat cut. This happened close to a cross, the record of a former murder. On the first night we slept at a retired little country house, and there I soon found out, that I possessed two or three articles, especially a pocket compass, which created unbounded astonishment. In every house I was asked to show the compass, and by its aid, together with the map, to point out the direction of various places. It excited the liveliest admiration that I, a perfect stranger, should know the road, for direction and road are synonymous in this open country, to places where I had never been. At one house a young woman, who was ill in bed, said to entreat me to come and show her the compass. If their surprise was great, mine was greater, to find such ignorance among people who possessed their thousands of cattle, and a stanchius of great extent. It can only be accounted for by the circumstance, that this retired part of the country is seldom visited by foreigners. I was asked, whether the earth or sun moved, whether it was hotter or colder to the north, where Spain was, and many other such questions. The greater number of the inhabitants have an indistinct idea that England, London, and North America, were different names for the same place, but the better informed well knew, that London and North America were separate countries close together, and that England was a large town in London. I carried with me some Promethean matches, which I ignited by biting, it was thought so wonderful, that a man should strike fire with his teeth, that it was usual to collect the whole family to see it, I was once offered a dollar for a single one. Washing my face in the morning, caused much speculation at the village of Las Minas, a superior tradesman closely cross-questioned me about, so singular a practice, and likewise why on board we wore our beards, for he had heard from my guide, that we did so. He eyed me with much suspicion, perhaps he had heard of ablutions in the Mohammedan religion, and knowing me to be a heretic, probably he came to the conclusion, that all heretics were Turks. It is the general custom in this country, to ask for a night's lodging at the first convenient house. The astonishment at the compass, and my other feats of jugglery, was to a certain degree advantageous, as with that, and the long stories my guides told of my breaking stones, knowing venomous from harmless snakes, collecting insects, etc., I repaid them for their hospitality. I'm writing, as if I had been among the inhabitants of Central Africa, and Oriental would not be flattered by the comparison, but such were my feelings at the time. The next day we rode to the village of Las Minas. The country was rather more hilly, but otherwise continued the same, an inhabitant of the Pampas no doubt would have considered it as truly alpine. The country is so thinly inhabited, that during the whole day we scarcely met a single person. Los Minas is much smaller even than Maldonado. It is seated on a little plain, and is surrounded by low rocky mountains. It is of the usual symmetrical form, and with its whitewashed church standing in the center, had rather a pretty appearance. The outskirting houses rose out of the plain like isolated beings, without the accompaniment of gardens or courtyards. This is generally the case in the country, and all the houses have, in consequence, an uncomfortable aspect. At night we stopped at a pulperia, or drinking shop. During the evening a great number of cauchos came in, to drink spirits and smoke cigars, their appearance is very striking, they are generally tall and handsome, but with a proud and dissolute expression of countenance. They frequently wear their mustaches and long black hair curling down their backs. With their brightly colored garments, great spurs clanking about their heels, and knives stuck as daggers, and often so used, at their waists, they look a very different race of men from what might be expected from their name of cauchos, or simple countrymen. Their politeness is excessive, they never drink their spirits without expecting you to taste it, but whilst making their exceedingly graceful bow, they seem quite as ready, if occasion offered, to cut your throat. On the third day we pursued rather an irregular course, as I was employed, in examining some beds of marble. On the fine plains of turf we saw many ostriches, Strathiorea. Some of the flocks contained as many as twenty or thirty birds. These, when standing on any little eminence, and seen against the clear sky, presented a very noble appearance. 
I never met with such tame ostriches in any other part of the country, it was easy to gallop up within a short distance of them, but then, expanding their wings, they made all sail right before the wind, and soon left the horses turn. At night we came to the house of Don Wafunes, a rich landed proprietor, but not personally known to either of my companions. On approaching the house of a stranger, it is usual to follow several little points of etiquette, riding up slowly to the door, the salutation of Avenue Maria is given, and until somebody comes out, and asks you to alight, it is not customary even to get off your horse, the formal answer of the owner is, simpicato concepita, that is, conceived without sin. Having entered the house, some general conversation is kept up for a few minutes, till permission is asked to pass the night there. This is granted as a matter of course. The stranger then takes his meals with the family, and a room is assigned him, where with the horse clucks belonging to his recato, or saddle of the pampas, he makes his bed. It is curious how similar circumstances produce such similar results in manners. At the Cape of Good Hope the same hospitality, and very nearly the same points of etiquette, are universally observed. The difference, however, between the character of the Spaniard and that of the Dutch poor is shown by the former never asking his guest a single question beyond the strictest rule of politeness, whilst the honest Dutchman demands, where he has been, where he is going, what is his business, and even how many brothers, sisters, or children he may happen to have. Shortly after our arrival at Don Juan's, one of the largest herds of cattle was driven in towards the house, and three beasts were picked out, to be slaughtered for the supply of the establishment. These half-wild cattle are very active, and knowing full well the fatal lasso, they led the horses along in laborious chase. After witnessing the rude wealth displayed in the number of cattle, men, and horses, Don Juan's miserable house was quite curious. The floor consisted of hardened mud, and the windows were without glass, the sitting room boasted only of a few of the roughest chairs and stools, with a couple of tables. The supper, although several strangers were present, consisted of two huge piles, one of roast beef, the other of boiled, with some pieces of pumpkin, besides this latter there was no other vegetable, and not even a morsel of bread. For drinking, a large earthenware jug of water served the whole party. Yet this man was the owner of several square miles of land, of which nearly every acre would produce corn, and, with a little trouble, all the common vegetables. The evening was spent in smoking, with a little impromptu singing, accompanied by the guitar. The signoritas all sat together in one corner of the room, and did not sup with the men. So many works have been written about these countries, that it is almost superfluous to describe either the lazo or the bolas. The lazo consists of a very strong, but then well played a groat, made of rawhide. One end is attached to the broad surcingle, which fastens together the complicated gear of the rocato, or saddle used in the pampas, the other is terminated by a small ring of iron or brass, by which a noose can be formed. The gaucho, when he is going to use the lazo, keeps a small coil in his bridle hand, and in the other holds the running noose which is made very large, generally having a diameter of about eight feet. This he whirls round his head, and by the dexterous movement of his wrist keeps the noose open, then, throwing it, he causes it to fall on any particular spot he chooses. The lazo, when not used, is tied up in a small coil to the after part of the rocato. The bolas, or balls, are of two kinds. The simplest, which is chiefly used for catching ostriches, consists of two round stones, covered with leather, and united by a thin plated thong, about eight feet long. The other kind differs, only in having three balls united by the thongs to a common center. The caucho holds the smallest of the three in his hand, and whirls the other two round in round his head, then, taking aim, sends them like chain shots revolving through the air. The balls no sooner strike any object, than, winding round it, they cross each other, and become firmly hitched. The size and weight of the balls vary, according to the purpose for which they are made, what of stone, although not larger than an apple, they are sent with such force as sometimes, to break the leg even of a horse. I have seen the balls made of wood, and as large as a turnip, for the sake of catching these animals without injuring them. The balls are sometimes made of iron, and these can be hurled to the greatest distance. The main difficulty in using either lasso or bullets is to ride so well as to be able at full speed, and while suddenly turning about, to whirl them so steadily around the head, as to take aim, on foot any person would soon learn the art. One day, as I was amusing myself, by galloping and whirling the balls round my head, by accident the free one struck a bush, and its revolving motion being thus destroyed, it immediately fell to the ground, and, like magic, caught one hind leg of my horse, the other ball was then jerked out of my hand, and the horse fairly secured. Luckily he was an old practiced animal, and knew what it meant, otherwise he would probably have kicked till he had thrown himself down. The cowshows roared with laughter, they cried out, that they had seen every sort of animal caught, but had never before seen a man caught by himself. During the two succeeding days, I reached the furthest point which I was anxious to examine. 
the country wore the same aspect, till at last the fine green turf became more wearisome than a dusty turnpike road. We everywhere saw great numbers of partridges, not in a major. These birds do not go in copies, nor do they conceal themselves like the English kind. It appears a very silly bird. A man on horseback, by riding round and round in a circle, or rather in a spire, so as to approach closer each time, may knock on the head as many as he pleases. The more common method is to catch them with a running noose, or a little lasso, made of the stem of an ostrich's feather fastened to the end of a long stick. A boy on a quieted old horse will frequently thus catch thirty or forty in a day. In Arctic North America, one, the Indians catch the varying hare, by walking spirally around and round it, when on its form, the middle of the day is reckoned the best time, when the sun is high, and the shadow of the hunter not very long. On our return to Maldonado, we followed rather a different line of road. Near Pandiasakar, a landmark well known to all those who have sailed up the Plata, I stayed a day at the house of a most hospitable old Spaniard. Early in the morning we ascended the Sierra de los Animas. By the aid of the rising sun the scenery was almost picturesque. To the westward the view extended over an immense level plain as far as the mount, at Monte Video, and to the eastward, over the mammillated country of Maldonado. On the summit of the mountain there were several small heaps of stones, which evidently had lain there for many years. My companion assured me that they were the work of the Indians in the old time. The heaps were similar, but on a much smaller scale, to those so commonly found on the mountains of Wales. The desire to signalize any event, on the highest point of the neighboring land, seems an universal passion with mankind. At the present day, not a single Indian, either civilized or wild, exists in this part of the province, nor am I aware that the former inhabitants have left behind them any more permanent records than these insignificant piles on the summit of the Sierra de los Animas. The general and almost entire absence of trees in Bant Oriental is remarkable. Some of the rocky hills are partly covered by thickets, and on the banks of the larger streams, especially to the north of Las Minas, willow trees are not uncommon. Near the Arroyo Tapes I heard of a wood of palms, and one of these trees, of considerable size, I saw near the Pandiasacre, in latitude 35 degs. These, and the trees planted by the Spaniards, offer the only exceptions to the general scarcity of wood. Among the introduced kinds, may be enumerated poplars, olives, peach, and other fruit trees, the peaches succeed so well, that they afford the main supply of firewood to the city of Buenos Aires. Extremely level countries, such as the Pampas, seldom appear favorable to the growth of trees. This may possibly be attributed either to the force of the winds, or the kind of drainage. In the nature of the land, however, around Maldonado, no such reason is apparent, the rocky mountains afford protected situations, enjoying various kinds of soil, streamlets of water are common at the bottoms of nearly every valley, and the clay nature of the earth seems adapted to retain moisture. It has been inferred with much probability, that the presence of woodland is generally determined, too, by the annual amount of moisture, yet in this province abundant and heavy rain falls during the winter, and the summer, though dry, is not so in any excess of degree. 3. We see nearly the whole of Australia covered by lofty trees, yet that country possesses a far more arid climate. Hence we must look to some other and unknown cause confining our view to South America, we should certainly be tempted to believe, that trees flourished only under a very humid climate for the limit of the forest land follows, in a most remarkable manner, that of the damp winds. In the southern part of the continent, where the western gales, charged with moisture from the Pacific, prevail, every island on the broken west coast, from latitude 38 degs to the extreme point of Tierra del Fuego, is densely covered by impenetrable forests. On the eastern side of the Cordillera, over the same extent of latitude, where a blue sky and a fine climate prove that the atmosphere has been deprived of its moisture, by passing over the mountains, the arid plains of Patagonia support a most scanty vegetation. In the more northern parts of the continent, within the limits of the constant southeastern trade wind, the eastern side is ornamented by magnificent forests, whilst the western coast, from latitude 4 degs, s to latitude 32 degs, S may be described as a desert, on this western coast, northward of latitude 4 degs. S, where the Tradine loses its regularity, and heavy torrents of rain fall periodically, the shores of the Pacific, so utterly desert in Peru, assume near Cape Blanco the character of luxuriance so celebrated at Guayaquil and Panama. Hence in the southern and northern parts of the continent, the forest and desert lands occupy reversed positions with respect to the Cordillera, and these positions are apparently determined by the direction of the prevalent winds. In the middle of the continent there is a broad intermediate band, including central Chile and the provinces of La Plata, where the rain-bringing winds have not to pass over lofty mountains, and where the land is neither a desert, nor covered by forests. 
but even the rule, if confined to South America, of trees flourishing only in a climate rendered humid by rain-bearing winds, has a strongly marked exception in the case of the Falkland Islands. These islands, situated in the same latitude with Tierra del Fuego, and only between two and three hundred miles distant from it, having a nearly similar climate, with a geological formation almost identical, with favorable situations and the same kind of peaty soil, yet can boast a few plants deserving even the title of bushes, whilst in Tierra del Fuego it is impossible to find an acre of land not covered by the densest forest. In this case, both the direction of the heavy gales of wind, and of the currents of the sea are favorable to the transport of seeds from Tierra del Fuego, as is shown by the canoes and trunks of trees drifted from that country, and frequently thrown on the shores of the western Falkland. Hence perhaps it is, that there are many plants in common to the two countries, but with respect to the trees of Tierra del Fuego, even attempts made to transplant them have failed. During our stay at Maldonado I collected several quadrupeds, 80 kinds of birds, and many reptiles, including nine species of snakes. Of the indigenous mammalia, the only one now left of any size, which is common, is the service camp estress. This deer is exceedingly abundant, often in small herds, throughout the countries bordering the Plata, and in northern Patagonia. If a person crawling close along the ground, slowly advances towards a herd, the deer frequently, out of curiosity, approach to reconnoiter him. I have by this means, killed from one spot, three out of the same herd. Although so tame and inquisitive, yet when approached on horseback, they are exceedingly wary. In this country nobody goes on foot, and the deer knows man as its enemy, only when he is mounted and armed with the bolas. At Bahia Blanca, a recent establishment in northern Patagonia, I was surprised to find how little the deer cared for the noise of a gun. One day I fired ten times from within eighty yards at one animal, and I was much more startled at the ball cutting up the ground than at the report of the rifle. My powder being exhausted, I was obliged to get up, to my shame as a sportsman be it spoken, the well able to kill birds on the wing, and halloo till the deer ran away. The most curious fact with respect to this animal, is the overpoweringly strong and offensive odor which proceeds from the buck. It is quite indescribable, several times whilst skinning the specimen which is now mounted at the Zoological Museum, I was almost overcome by nausea. I tied up the skin in a silk pocket handkerchief, and so carried it home, this handkerchief, after being well washed, I continually used, and it was of course as repeatedly washed, yet every time, for a space of one year and seven months, when first unfolded, I distinctly perceived the odor. This appears an astonishing instance of the permanence of some matter, which nevertheless in its nature, must be most subtile and volatile. Frequently, when passing at the distance of half a mile to leeward of a herd, I have perceived the whole air tainted with the effluvium. I believe the smell from the buck is most powerful at the period when its horns are perfect, or free from the hairy skin. When in this state the meat is, of course, quite uneatable, but the gauchos assert that if buried for some time in fresh earth, the taint is removed. I have somewhere read that the islanders in the north of Scotland treat the rank carcasses of the fish-eating birds in the same manner. The order of is here very numerous in species, but my salon I obtained no less than eight kinds, or, the largest gnawing animal in the world, the Hydrotteres capybara, the water hog, is here also common. One which I shot at Monte Video weighed 98 pounds, its length from the end of the snout to the stump like tail, was 3 feet 2 inches, and its girth 3 feet 8. These great rodents occasionally frequent the islands in the mouth of the Plata, where the water is quite salt, but are far more abundant on the borders of freshwater lakes and rivers. Near Maldonado three or four generally live together. In the daytime they either lie among the aquatic plants, or openly feed on the turf plain. 5. When viewed at a distance, from their manner of walking, and color they resemble pigs, but when seated on their haunches, and attentively watching any object with one eye, they reassume the appearance of their congeners, caves and rabbits. Both the front and side view of their head is quite a ludicrous aspect, from the great depth of their jaw. These animals, at Maldonado, were very tame, by cautiously walking, I approached within three yards of four old ones. This tameness may probably be accounted for, by the jaguar having been banished for some years, and by the cow show not thinking it worth his while to hunt them. As I approached nearer and nearer they frequently made their peculiar noise, which is a low abrupt grunt, not having much actual sound, but rather arising from the sudden expulsion of air, the only noise I know at all like it, is the first horse bark of a large dog. Having watched the four from almost within arm's length, and they may, for several minutes, they rushed into the water at full gallop with the greatest impetuosity, and emitted at the same time their bark. After diving a short distance they came again to the surface, but only just to show the upper part of their heads. When a female is swimming in the water, and has young ones, they are said to sit on her back. These animals are easily killed in numbers, but their skins are of trifling value, and the meat is very indifferent. 
on the islands in the Rio Paraná they are exceedingly abundant, and afford the ordinary prey to the jaguar. The tucutuco, Xenomys brasilensis, is a curious small animal, which may be briefly described as an order, with the habits of a mole. It is extremely numerous in some parts of the country, but it is difficult to be procured, and never, I believe, comes out of the ground. It throws up at the mouth of its burrows hillocks of earth like those of the mole, but smaller. Considerable tracts of country are so completely undermined by these animals, that horses in passing over, sink above their fetlocks. The tukutukas appear, to a certain degree, to be gregarious, the man who procured the specimens from me had caught six together, and he said this was a common occurrence. They are nocturnal in their habits, and their principal food is the roots of plants, which are the object of their extensive and superficial burrows. This animal is universally known by a very peculiar noise which it makes when beneath the ground. A person, the first time he hears it, is much surprised, for it is not easy to tell whence it comes, nor is it possible to guess what kind of creature utters it. The noise consists in a short, but not rough nasal grunt, which is monotonously repeated about four times in quick succession. 6. The name Tukutuko is given an imitation of the sound. Where this animal is abundant, it may be heard at all times of the day, and sometimes directly beneath one's feet. When kept in a room, the tukutukas move both slowly and clumsily, which appears owing to the outward action of their hind legs, and they are quite incapable, from the socket of the thigh bone not having a certain ligament, of jumping even the smallest vertical height. They are very stupid, in making any attempt to escape, when angry or frightened they utter the tukutuko. Of those I kept alive several, even the first day, became quite tame, not attempting to bite, or to run away, others were a little wilder. The man who caught them asserted, that very many are invariably found blind. A specimen which I preserved in spirits was in this state, Mr. Reed considers it to be the effect of inflammation in the nictitating membrane. When the animal was alive I placed my finger within half an inch of its head, and not the slightest notice was taken, it made its way, however, about the room nearly as well as the others. Considering the strictly subterranean habits of the Tukutuko, the blindness, though so common, cannot be a very serious evil, yet it appears strange, that any animal should possess an organ frequently subject to be injured. Lamarck would have been delighted with this fact, had he known it, when speculating, 7, probably with more truth than usual with him, on the gradually acquired underscore blindness of the Asphalax, and utter living underground, and of the Proteus, a reptile living in dark caverns filled with water, in both of which animals the eye is in an almost rudimentary state, and is covered by a tendinous membrane and skin. In the common mole the eye is extraordinarily small but perfect, though many anatomists doubt whether it is connected with the true optic nerve, its vision must certainly be imperfect, though probably useful to the animal when it leaves its burrow. In the tukutuko, which I believe never comes to the surface of the ground, the eye is rather larger, but often rendered blind and useless, though without apparently causing any inconvenience to the animal, no doubt Lamarck would have said that the tukutuko is now passing into the state of the asphalax and proteus. Birds of many kinds are extremely abundant on the undulating, grassy plains around Maldonado. There are several species of a family allied in structure and manners to our starling. One of these, Molifris niger, is remarkable from its habits. Several may often be seen standing together on the back of a cow or horse, and while perched on a hedge, pluming themselves in the sun, they sometimes attempt to sing, or rather to hiss, the noise being very peculiar, resembling that of bubbles of air passing rapidly from a small orifice underwater, so as to produce an acute sound. According to Ezra, this bird, like the cuckoo, deposits its eggs in other birds' nests. I was several times told by the country people, that there certainly is some bird having this habit, and my assistant in collecting, who is a very accurate person, found a nest of the sparrow of this country, Zonotrichia matutin, with one egg in it larger than the others, and of a different color and shape. In North America there is another species of Molothrus, M. pacorus, which has a similar cuckoo-like habit, and which is most closely allied in every respect to the species from the Plata, even in such trifling peculiarities as standing on the backs of cattle, it differs only in being a little smaller, and in its plumage and eggs being of a slightly different shade of color. This close agreement in structure and habits, in representative species coming from opposite quarters of a great continent, always strikes one as interesting, though of common occurrence. Mr. Swainson has well remarked, 8, that with the exception of the Molothrus pecoris, to which must be added the M. niger, the cuckoos are the only birds which can be called truly parasitical, namely, such as fasten themselves, as it were, on another living animal, whose animal heat brings their young into life, whose food they live upon, and whose death would cause theirs during the period of infancy. 
It is remarkable that some of the species, but not all, both of the cuckoo and molothrus, should agree in this one strange habit of their parasitical propagation, whilst opposed to each other in almost every other habit. The molothrus, like our starling, is eminently sociable, and lives on open plains without art or disguise. The cuckoo, as everyone knows, is a singularly shy bird. It frequents the most retired thickets, and feeds on fruit and caterpillars. In structure also these two genera are widely removed from each other. Many theories, even phrenological theories, have been advanced to explain the origin of the cuckoo laying its eggs in other birds' nests. M. Prevo alone, I think, has thrown light by his observations. 9. On this puzzle, he finds that the female cuckoo, which, according to most observers, lays at least from four to six eggs, must bear with the male each time, after laying only one or two eggs. Now, if the cuckoo was obliged to sit on her own eggs, she would either have to sit on all together, and therefore leave those first laid so long, that they probably would become addled, or she would have to hatch separately each egg, or two eggs, as soon as laid, but as the cuckoo, stays a shorter time in this country than any other migratory bird, she certainly would not have time enough for the success of hatchings. Hence we can perceive in the fact of the cuckoo pairing several times, and laying her eggs at intervals, the cause of her depositing her eggs in other birds' nests, and leaving them to the care of his chirpurants. I'm strongly inclined to believe, that this view is correct, from having been independently led, as we shall hereafter see, to an analogous conclusion with regard to the South American ostrich, the females of which are parasitical, if I may so express it, on each other, each female laying several eggs in the nests of several other females, and the male ostrich undertaking all the cares of incubation. Like the strange foster parents with the cuckoo. I will mention only two other birds, which are very common, and render themselves prominent from their habits. The Serophagus sulfurinus is typical of the great American tribe of tire and flycatchers. In its structure it closely approaches the true shrugs, but in its habits, may be compared to many birds. I have frequently observed it, hunting a field, hovering over one spot like a hawk, and then proceeding on to another. When seen thus suspended in the air, it might very readily at a short distance be mistaken for one of the rapacious order. Its stoop, however, is very inferior in force and rapidity to that of a hawk. At other times the serophagus haunts a neighborhood of water, and there, like a fisher, remaining stationary, it catches any small fish which may come near the margin. These birds are not unfrequently kept either in cages or in courtyards, with their wings cut. They soon become tame, and are very amusing from their cunning odd manners, which were described to me as being similar to those of the common magpie. Their flight is undulatory, for the weight of the head and bill appears too great for the body. In the evening the serophagus takes its stand on the bush, often by the roadside, and continually repeats without a change a shrill and rather agreeable cry, which somewhat resembles articulate words. The Spaniards say it is like the words Pietaviciul, and accordingly have given it this name. A mockingbird, Mimosorpheus, called by the inhabitants Calandria, is remarkable, from possessing a song far superior to that of any other bird in the country, indeed, it is nearly the only bird in South America which I have observed to take its stand for the purpose of singing. The song may be compared to that of the sedge warbler, but is more powerful, some harsh notes and some very high ones, being mingled with a pleasant warbling. It is heard only during the spring. At other times its cry is harsh and far from harmonious. Near Maldonado these birds were tame and bold, they constantly attended the country houses in numbers, to pick the meat which was hung up on the posts or walls, if any other small bird joined the feast, the Calandria soon chased it away. On the wide uninhabited plains of Patagonia another closely allied species, O. Patagonica of Dorbigny, which frequents the valleys clothed with spiny bushes, is a wilder bird, and has a slightly different tone of voice. It appears to me a curious circumstance, as showing the fine shades of difference in habits, that judging from this latter respect alone, when I first saw this second species, I thought it was different from the Maldonado kind. Having afterwards procured a specimen, and comparing the two without particular care, they appeared so very similar, that I changed my opinion, but now Mr. Gould says, that they are certainly distinct, a conclusion in conformity with the trifling difference of habit, of which, of course, he was not aware. The number, tameness, and disgusting habits of the carrion feeding hawks of South America make them preeminently striking to anyone accustomed only to the birds of Northern Europe. In this list, may be included four species of the Caracara or Polyborus, the Turkey Buzzard, the Galanezo, and the Condor. The Caracaras are, from their structure, placed among the eagles, we shall soon see how they become so high a rank. In their habits they well supply the place of their carrying crows, magpies, and ravens, a tribe of birds widely distributed over the rest of the world, but entirely absent in South America. 
To begin with the Polyborus brasilensis, this is a common bird, and has a wide geographical range. It is most numerous on the grassy savannas of La Plata, where it goes by the name of Carantia, and is far from frequent throughout the sterile plains of Patagonia. In the desert between the rivers Negro and Colorado, numbers constantly attempt the line of road, to devour the carcasses of the exhausted animals which chance, to perish from fatigue and thirst. Although thus common in these dry and open countries, and likewise on the arid shores of the Pacific, it is nevertheless found inhabiting the damp impervious forests of West Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego. The Carantias, together with the Chimango, constantly attend in numbers the estancias and slaughtering houses. If an animal dies on the plain the Galanazo commences the feast, and then the two species of Polyborus pick the bones clean. These birds, although thus commonly feeding together, are far from being friends. When a Carantia is quietly seated on the branch of a tree, or on the ground, the Chimango often continues for a long time flying backwards and forwards, up, and down, in a semicircle, trying each time at the bottom of curve to strike its larger relative. The Carantia takes little notice, except by bobbing its head. Although the Carantias frequently assemble in numbers, they are not gregarious, for in desert places they may be seen solitary, or more commonly by bears. The Carantias are said to be very crafty, and to steal great numbers of eggs. They attempt, also, together with the chimango, to pick off the scabs from the sore backs of horses and mules. The poor animal, on the one hand, with its ears down, and its back arched, and, on the other, the hovering bird, eyeing at the distance of a yard the disgusting morsel, form a picture, which has been described by Captain Head with his own peculiar spirit and accuracy. These false eagles most rarely kill any living bird or animal, and their vulture-like, necrophagous habits are very evident to anyone, who has fallen asleep on the desolate plains of Patagonia, for when he wakes, he will see, on each surrounding hillock, one of these birds patiently watching him with an evil eye, it is a feature in the landscape of these countries, which will be recognized by every one, who has wandered over them. If a party of men go out hunting with dogs and horses, they will be accompanied, during the day, by several of these attendants. After feeding, the uncovered crop protrudes, at such times, and indeed generally, the Karadji is an inactive, tame, and cowardly bird. Its flight is heavy and slow, like that of an English rook. It seldom soars, but I have twice seen one at a great height gliding through the air with much ease. It runs, in contradistinction to hopping, but not quite so quickly as some of its congeners. At times the Karadji is noisy, but is not generally so, its cry is loud, very harsh and peculiar, and may be likened to the sound of the Spanish guttural G, followed by a rough double RR, when uttering this cry it elevates its head higher and higher, till at last, with its beak wide open, the crown almost attaches the lower part of the back. This fact, which has been doubted, is quite true, I have seen them several times with their heads backwards in a completely inverted position. To these observations I may add, on the high authority of Ezra, that the Carantia feeds on worms, shells, slugs, grasshoppers, and frogs, that it destroys young lambs, by tearing the umbilical cord, and that it pursues the Galanazo, till that bird is compelled to vomit up the carrion that may have recently gorged. Lastly, Ezra states that several Carantias, five or six together, will unite in chase of large birds, even such as herons. All these facts show that it is a bird of very versatile habits and considerable ingenuity. The Polyborus Jamango is considerably smaller than the last species. It is truly omnivorous, and will eat even bread, and I was assured, that it materially injures the potato crops in Chilo, by stocking up the roots when first planted. Of all the carrion feeders it is generally the last which leaves the skeleton of a dead animal, and may often be seen within the ribs of a cow or horse, like a bird in a cage. Another species is the Polyborus Novizlandii, which is exceedingly common in the Falkland Islands. These birds in many respects, resemble in their habits the Carantias. They live on the flesh of dead animals and on marine productions, and on the Ramirez rocks their whole sustenance must depend on the sea. They are extraordinarily tame and fearless, and haunt the neighborhood of houses for offal. If a hunting party kills an animal, a number soon collect and patiently await, standing on the ground on all sides. After eating, their uncovered cross are largely protruded, giving them a disgusting appearance. They readily attack wounded birds, a cormorant in this state having taken to the shore, was immediately seized on by several, and its death hastened by their blows. The beagle was at the Falklands only during the summer, but the officers of the adventure, who were there in the winter, mention many extraordinary instances of the boldness and rapacity of these birds. They actually pounced on a dog, that was lying fast asleep close by one of the party, and the sportsmen had difficulty, in preventing the wounded geese from being seized before their eyes. It is said that several together, in this respect resembling the Carantias, wait at the mouth of a rabbit hole, and together seize on the animal, when it comes out. 
They were constantly flying on board the vessel when in the harbor, and it was necessary to keep a good lookout to prevent the leather being torn from the rigging and the meat or game from the stern. These birds are very mischievous and inquisitive. They will pick up almost anything from the ground. A large black glazed hat was carried nearly a mile, as was a pair of the heavy balls used in catching cattle. Mr. Osborne experienced during the survey a more severe loss in their stealing a small cater's compass in a red morocco leather case, which was never recovered. These birds are, moreover, quarrelsome and very passionate, tearing up the grass with their bills from rage. They are not truly gregarious, they do not soar, and their flight is heavy and clumsy, on the ground they run extremely fast, very much like pheasants. They are noisy, uttering several harsh cries, one of which is like that of the English rook, hence the sailors always call them rooks. It is a curious circumstance that, when crying out, they throw their heads upwards and backwards, after the same manner as the Carantia. They built in the rocky cliffs of the sea coast, but only on the small adjoining islets, and not on the two main islands. This is a singular precaution in so tame and fearless a bird. The sealers say that the flesh of these birds, when cooked, is quite white and very good eating, but bold must the man be who attempts such a meal. We have now only to mention the turkey buzzard, Valter Ora, and the Galanazo. The former is found wherever the country is moderately damp, from Cape Horn to North America. Differently from the Polyborus brasiliensis and Chimango, it has found its way to the Falkland Islands. The turkey buzzard is a solitary bird, or at most goes in pairs. It may at once be recognized from a long distance, by its lofty, soaring, and most elegant flight lieutenant is well known to be a true carrion feeder. On the west coast of Patagonia, among the thickly wooded islets and broken land, it lays exclusively on what the sea throws up, and on the carcasses of dead seals. Wherever these animals are congregated on the rocks, there the vultures may be seen. The Galanazo, Catherine Satridus, has a different range from the last species, as it never occurs southward of latitude 41 degs. Azra states that there exists a tradition that these birds, at the time of the conquest, were not found near Monte Video, but that they subsequently followed the inhabitants from more northern districts at the present day they are numerous in the valley of the Colorado, which is 300 miles due south of Monte Video. It seems probable that this additional migration has happened since the time of Azara. The Galanazo generally prefers a humid climate, or rather the neighborhood of fresh water, hence it is extremely abundant in Brazil and La Plata, while it is never found on the desert and arid plains of northern Patagonia, excepting near some stream. These birds frequent the whole pampas to the foot of the Cordillera, but I never saw or heard of one in Chile, in Peru they are preserved as scavengers. These vultures certainly may be called gregarious, for they seem to have pleasure in society, and are not solely brought together by the attraction of a common prey. On a fine day a flock may often be observed at a great height, each bird wheeling round and round without closing its wings, in the most graceful evolutions. This is clearly performed for the mere pleasure of the exercise, or perhaps is connected with their matrimonial alliances. I have now mentioned all the carrion feeders, excepting the condor, an account of which will be more appropriately introduced when we visit a country more congenial to its habits than the plains of La Plata. In a broad band of sand hillocks which separate the Laguna del Petrero from the shores of the Plata, at the distance of a few miles from Maldonado, I found a group of those vitrified, siliceous tubes, which are formed by lightning entering loose sand. These tubes resemble in every particular those from Drake and Cumberland, described in the geological transactions, 10. The sand hillocks of Maldonado not being protected by vegetation, are constantly changing their position. From this cause the tubes projected above the surface, and numerous fragments lying near, showed that they had formerly been buried to a greater depth. Four sets centered the sand perpendicularly, by working with my hands I traced one of them two feet deep, and some fragments which evidently had belonged to the same tube, when added to the other part, measured five feet three inches. The diameter of the whole tube was nearly equal, and therefore we must suppose that originally it extended to a much greater depth. These dimensions are however small, compared to those of the tubes from Madrid, one of which was traced to a depth of not less than 30 feet. The internal surface is completely vitrified, glossy, and smooth. A small fragment examined under the microscope appeared, from the number of minute entangled there are perhaps steam bubbles, like an assay fused before the blowpipe. The scent is entirely, or in greater part, silicious, but some points are of a black color, and from their glossy surface, possess a metallic luster. The thickness of the wall of the tube varies from a thirtieth to a twentieth of an inch, and occasionally even equals a tenth. On the outside the grains of sand are rounded, and have a slightly glazed appearance, I could not distinguish any signs of crystallization. In a similar manner to that described in the geological transactions, the tubes are generally compressed, and have deep longitudinal furrows, so as closely to resemble a shriveled vegetable stalk, or the bark of the Elmora cork tree. 
Their circumference is about two inches, but in some fragments, which are cylindrical, and without any furrows, it is as much as four inches. The compression from the surrounding loose sand, acting while the tube was still softened from the effects of the intense heat, has evidently caused the creases or furrows. Judging from the uncompressed fragments, the measure or bore of the lightning, if such a term may be used, must have been about one inch and a quarter. At Paris, M. Hachette and M. Budent, 11, succeeded in making tubes, in most respects similar to these fulgurites, by passing very strong shocks of galvanism through vanilla powdered glass, when salt was added, so as to increase its feasibility, the tubes were larger in every dimension, they filled both with powdered felspar and quartz. One tube, formed with pounded glass, was very nearly an inch long, namely 0.982, and had an internal diameter of 0.019 of an inch. When we hear that the strongest battery in Paris was used, and that its powder on a substance of such easy feasibility as glass was to form tubes so diminutive, we must feel greatly astonished that the force of a shock of lightning, which, striking the sand in several places, has formed cylinders, in one instance of at least 30 feet long, and having an internal bore, where not compressed, of full an inch and a half, and this in a material so extraordinarily refractory as quartz. The tubes, as I have already remarked, enter the sand nearly in a vertical direction. One, however, which was less regular than the others, deviated from a right line, at the most considerable bend, to the amount of 33 degrees. From this same tube, two small branches, about a foot apart, were sent off, one pointed downwards, and the other upwards. This latter case is remarkable, as the electric fluid must have turned back at the acute angle of 26 eggs, to the line of its main course. Besides the four tubes which I found vertical, and traced beneath the surface, there were several other groups of fragments, the original sites of which without doubt were near. All occurred in a level area of shifting sand, 60 yards by 20, situated among some high sand hillocks, and at the distance of about half a mile from a chain of hills 4 or 500 feet in height. The most remarkable circumstance, as it appears to me, in this case as well as, in the Dvdrig, and in one described by M. Robentrop in Germany, is the number of tubes found within such limited spaces. At Rig, within an area of 15 yards, three were observed, and the same number occurred in Germany. In the case, which I have described, certainly more than four existed within the space of the 60 by 20 yards. As it does not appear probable that the tubes are produced by successive distinct shocks, we must believe that the lightning, shortly before entering the ground, divides itself into separate branches. The neighborhood of the Rio Plata seems peculiarly subject to electric phenomena. In the year 1793, 12, one of the most destructive thunderstorms perhaps on record, happened at Buenos Aires, 37 places within the city, were struck by lightning, and 19 people killed. From facts stated in several books of travels, I'm inclined to suspect, that thunderstorms are very common near the mouths of great rivers. Is it not possible, that the mixture of large bodies of fresh and salt water may disturb the electrical equilibrium? Even during our occasional visits to this part of South America, we heard of a ship, two churches, and a house having been struck. Both the church and the house I saw shortly afterwards, the house belonged to Mr. Hood, the consul general at Monte Video. Some of the effects were curious, the paper, for nearly a foot on each side of the line, where the bell wires had run, was blackened. The metal had been fused, and although the room was about 15 feet high, the globules, dropping on the chairs and furniture, had drilled in them a chain of minute holes. A part of the wall was shattered, as if by gunpowder, and the fragments had been blown off with force sufficient to dent the wall on the opposite side of the room. The frame of the looking glass was blackened, and the gilding must have been volatilized, for a smelling bottle, which stood on the chimney piece, was coated with bright metallic particles, which adhered as firmly, as if they had been enameled. July 24, 1833 The Beagle sailed from Maldonado, and on August the 3rd she arrived off the mouth of the Rio Negro. This is the principal river on the whole line of coast between the Strait of Magellan and the Plata. It enters the sea about 300 miles south of the estuary of the Plata. About 50 years ago, under the old Spanish government, a small colony was established here, and it is still the most southern position, latitude 41 degs, on this eastern coast of America inhabited by civilized man. The country near the mouth of the river is wretched in the extreme, on the south side along the line of perpendicular cliffs commences, which exposes a section of the geological nature of the country. The strata are of sandstone, and one layer was remarkable from being composed of a firmly cemented conglomerate of pumice pebbles, which must have traveled more than 400 miles, from the Andes. The surface is everywhere covered up by a thick bed of gravel, which extends far and wide over the open plain. Water is extremely scarce, and, where found, is almost invariably brackish. 
the vegetation is scanty, and although there are bushes of many kinds, all are armed with formidable thorns, which seem to warn the stranger not to enter on these inhospitable regions. The settlement is situated 18 miles up the river. The road follows the foot of the sloping cliff, which forms the northern boundary of the Great Valley, in which the Rio Negro flows. On the way we pass the ruins of some fine estancias, which a few years since had been destroyed by the Indians. They withstood several attacks. A man presented one gave me a very lively description of what took place. The inhabitants had sufficient notice to drive all the cattle and horses into the corral, one which surrounded the house, and likewise to mount some small cannon. The Indians were Araucanians from the south of Chile, several hundreds in number, and highly disciplined. They first appeared in two bodies on a neighboring hill, having their dismounted and taken off their fur mantles, they advanced naked to the charge. The only weapon of an Indian is a very long bamboo or chuzo, ornamented with ostrich feathers, and pointed by a sharp spearhead. My informer seemed to remember with the greatest horror the quivering of these chuzos as they approached near. When close, the cacique pitcher hailed the besieged to give up their arms, or he would cut all their throats. As this would probably have been the result of their entrance under any circumstances, the answer was given by a volley of musketry. The Indians, with great steadiness, came to the very fence of the corral, but to their surprise they found the posts fastened together by iron nails instead of leather thongs, and, of course, in vain attempted to cut them with their knives. This saved the lives of the Christians, many of the wounded Indians were carried away by their companions, and at last, one of the under caciques being wounded, the bugle sounded a retreat. They retired to their horses, and seemed to hold a council of war. This was an awful pause for the Spaniards, as all their ammunition, with the exception of a few cartridges, was expended. In an instant the Indians mounted their horses, and galloped out of sight. Another attack was still more quickly repulsed. A cool Frenchman managed the gun. He stopped till the Indians approached close, and then raked their line with great shot. He thus laid thirty-nine of them on the ground, and, of course, such a blow immediately routed the whole party. The town is indifferently called El Carmen or Patagones. It is built on the face of a cliff which fronts the river, and many of the houses are excavated even in the sandstone. The river is about two or three hundred yards wide, and is deep and rapid. The many islands, with their willow trees, and the flat headlands, seen one behind the other on the northern boundary of the broad green valley, form, by the aid of a bright sun, a view almost picturesque. The number of inhabitants does not exceed a few hundreds. These Spanish colonies do not, like our British ones, carry within themselves the elements of growth. Many Indians of pure blood reside here, the tribe of the Cacique Lucani constantly have their toldas, too, on the outskirts of the town. The local government partly supplies them with provisions, by giving them all the old worn-out horses, and they earn a little, by making horse rugs and other articles of riding gear. These Indians are considered civilized, but what their character may have gained by a lesser degree of ferocity, is almost counterbalanced by their entire immorality. Some of the younger men are, however, improving, they are willing to labor, and a short time, since a party went on a sealing voyage, and behaved very well. They were now enjoying the fruits of their labor, by being dressed in very gay, clean clothes, and by being very idle. The taste they showed in their dress was admirable, if you could have turned one of these young Indians into a statue of bronze, his drapery would have been perfectly graceful. One day I rode to a large salt lake, or Salina, which is distant fifteen miles from the town. During the winter it consists of a shallow lake of brine, which in summer, is converted into a field of snow-white salt. The layer near the margin, is from four to five inches thick, but towards the center its thickness increases. This lake was two and a half miles long, and one broad. Others occur in the neighborhood many times larger, and with a floor of salt, two and three feet in thickness, even when underwater during the winter. One of these brilliantly wide and level expanses in the midst of the brown and desolate plain, offers an extraordinary spectacle. A large quantity of salt is annually drawn from the salina, and great piles, some hundred tons in weight, were lying ready for exportation. The season for working the salinas forms the harvest of Patagones, for on it the prosperity of the place depends. Nearly the whole population encamps on the bank of the river, and the people are employed in drawing out the salt in bullock wagons. This salt is crystallized in great cubes, and is remarkably pure. Mr. Trentham Reeks has kindly analyzed some for me, and he finds in it only 0.26 of gypsum and 0.22 of earthy matter. It is a singular fact that it does not serve so well for preserving meat as sea salt from the Cape de Verde Islands, and a merchant at Buenos Aires told me that he considered it as 50% less valuable. Hence the Cape de Verde salt is constantly imported, and is mixed with that from these salinas. 
the purity of the Patagonian salt, or absence from it of those other saline bodies found in all sea water, is the only assignable cause for this inferiority, a conclusion which no one, I think, would have suspected, but which is supported by the fact lately ascertained, 3, that those salts answer best for preserving cheese which contain most of the deliquescent chlorides. The border of this lake is formed of mud, and in this numerous large crystals of gypsum, some of which are three inches long, lie embedded, whilst on the surface others of sulfate of soda lie scattered about. The cauchos call the former the Padre del Sol, and the latter the Madre. They state that these progenitive salts always occur on the borders of the salinas, when the water begins to evaporate. The mud is black, and has a fetid odor. I could not at first imagine the cause of this, but I afterwards perceived that the froth which the wind drifted on shore was colored green, as if by confer V. I attempted to carry home some of this green matter, but from an accident failed. Parts of the lake seen from a short distance appeared of a reddish color, and this perhaps was owing to some infuse or elanomalcula. The mud in many places was thrown up by numbers of some kind of worm, or an elitous animal. How surprising it is, that any creatures should be able to exist in brine, and that they should be crawling among crystals of sulfate of soda and lime. And what becomes of these worms when, during the long summer, the surface is hardened into a solid layer of salt? Flamingos in considerable numbers inhabit this lake, and breed here, throughout Patagonia, in northern Chile and at the Galapagos Islands, I met with these birds, wherever there were lakes of brine. I saw them here waiting about in search of food, probably for the worms which burrow in the mud, and these latter probably feed on infusoria or confervi. Thus we have a little living world within itself adapted to these inland lakes of brine. A minute crustaceous animal, Cancer salinus, is said, or, to live in countless numbers in the brine pans at Lymington, but only in those in which the fluid is attained, from evaporation, considerable strength, namely, about a quarter of a pound of salt to a pint of water. Well may we affirm, that every part of the world is habitable. Whether lakes of brine, or those subterranean ones hidden beneath volcanic mountains warm mineral springs the wide expanse and depths of the ocean the upper regions of the atmosphere, and even the surface of perpetual snow, all support organic beings. To the northward of the Rio Negro, between it and the inhabited country near Buenos Aires, the Spaniards have only one small settlement, recently established at Bahia Blanca. The distance in a straight line to Buenos Aires is very nearly 500 British miles. The wandering tribes of horse Indians, which have always occupied the greater part of this country, having of late much harassed the outlying estancias, the government at Buenos Aires equipped some time, since an army under the command of General Rosas for the purpose of exterminating them. The troops were now encamped on the banks of the Colorado, a river lying about 80 miles northward of the Rio Negro when General Rosas left Buenos Aires he struck in a direct line across the unexplored plains, and as the country was thus pretty well cleared of Indians, he left behind him, at wide intervals, a small party of soldiers with a troop of horses, a posta, so as to be enabled to keep up a communication with the capital. As the Beagle intended to call at Mejia Blanca, I determined to proceed there by land, and ultimately I extended my plan, to travel the whole way by the Postas to Buenos Aires. August 11th, Mr. Harris, an Englishman residing at Patagones, a guide, and five cauchos who were proceeding to the army on business, were my companions on the journey. The Colorado, as I have already said, is nearly 80 miles distant, and as we traveled slowly, we were two days and a half on the road. The whole line of country deserves scarcely a better name than that of a desert. Water is found only in two small wells, it is called fresh, but even at this time of the year, during the rainy season, it was quite brackish. In the summer this must be a distressing passage, for now it was sufficiently desolate. The valley of the Rio Negro, broad as it is, has merely been excavated out of the sandstone plain, for immediately above the bank on which the town stands, a level country commences, which is interrupted only by a few trifling valleys and depressions. Every one of the landscape wears the same sterile aspect, a dry gravelly soil supports tufts of brown withered grass, and low scattered bushes, armed with thorns. Shortly after passing the first spring we came inside of a famous tree, which the Indians reverence as the altar of Walichu. It is situated on a high part of the plain, and hence is a landmark visible at a great distance. As soon as a tribe of Indians come inside of it, they offer their adorations by loud shouts. The tree itself is low, much branched, and thorny, just above the root it has a diameter of about three feet. It stands by itself without any neighbor, and was indeed the first tree we saw, afterwards we met with a few others of the same kind, but they were far from common. Being winter the tree had no leaves, but in their place numberless threads, by which the various offerings, such as cigars, bread, meat, pieces of cloth, etc., had been suspended. Pure Indians, not having anything better, only pull a thread out of their ponchos, and fasten it to the tree. 
richer Indians are accustomed to pour spirits and made it to a certain hole, and likewise to smoke upwards, thinking thus to afford all possible gratification to Walichu. To complete the scene, the tree was surrounded by the bleached bones of horses which had been slaughtered as sacrifices. All Indians of every age and sex make their offerings, they then think that their horses will not tire, and that they themselves shall be prosperous. The Paucho who told me this, said that in the time of peace he had witnessed this scene, and that he and others used to wait till the Indians had passed by, for the sake of stealing from Walichu the offerings. The Pauchos think that the Indians consider the tree as the god itself, but it seems for more probable that they regard it as the altar. The only cause which I can imagine for this choice is its being a landmark and a dangerous passage. The Sierra de la Ventana is visible at an immense distance, and a gaucho told me that he was once riding with an Indian a few miles to the north of the Rio Colorado, when the Indian commenced making the same loud noise which is usual at the first sight of the distant tree, putting his hand to his head, and then pointing in the direction of the Sierra. Upon being asked the reason of this, the Indian said in broken Spanish, first see the Sierra. About two leagues beyond this curious tree we halted for the night, at this instant an unfortunate cow was spied by the lynx-eyed cowshows, who set off in full chase, and in a few minutes dragged her in with their lazos, and slaughtered her. We here had the four necessaries of life and el campo, pasture for the horses, water, only a muddy puddle, meat, and firewood. The cowshows were in high spirits at finding all these luxuries, and we soon set to work at the poor cow. This was the first night which I passed under the open sky, with the gear of the rocado for my bed. There is high enjoyment in the independence of the gaucho life, to be able at any moment, to pull up your horse, and say, here we will pass the night. The death-like stillness of the plain, the dogs keeping watch, the gypsy group of gauchos making their beds round the fire, have left in my mind a strongly marked picture of this first night, which will never be forgotten. The next day the country continued similar to that above described. It is inhabited by few birds or animals of any kind. Occasionally a deer, or a guanaco, bald llama, may be seen but the agati, cavia patagonica, is the commonest quadruped. This animal here represents our hares. It differs, however, from that genus in many essential respects, for instance, it is only three does behind. It is also nearly twice the size, weighing from 20 to 25 pounds. The agati is a true friend of the desert, it is a common feature of the landscape, to see two or three hopping quickly one after the other in a straight line across these wild plains. They are found as far north as the Sierra Tapal Dune, latitude 37 degs 30 feet, where the plain rather suddenly becomes greener and more humid, and their southern limit is between Port Desire and St. Julian, where there is no change in the nature of the country. It is a singular fact, that although the Agati is not now found as far south as Port St. Julian, yet that Captain Wood, in his voyage in 1670, talks of them as being numerous there. What cause can have altered, in a wide, uninhabited, and rarely visited country, the range of an animal like this? It appears also, from the number shot by Captain Wood in one day at Port Desire, that they must have been considerably more abundant there formerly than at present. Where the biscuit arrives, and makes its burrows, the agati uses them, but where, as at Bahia Blanca, the biscuit is not found, the agati burrows for itself. The same thing occurs with the little owl of the pampas, Athene Cuticularia, which has so often been described as standing like a sentinel at the mouth of the burrows, foreign band oriental, owing to the absence of the biscuita, it is obliged to hollow out its own habitation. The next morning, as we approached the Rio Colorado, the appearance of the country changed, we soon came on a plain covered with turf, which, from its flowers, to all clover, and little owls, resembled the pampas. We passed to also a muddy swamp of considerable extent, which in summer dries, and becomes encrusted with various salts, and hence is called a salatrol. It was covered by low succulent plants, of the same kind with those growing on the seashore. The Colorado, at the pass where we crossed it, is only about 60 yards wide, generally it must be nearly double that width. Its course is very tortuous, being marked by willow trees and beds of reeds, in a direct line the distance to the mouth of the river is said to be 9 leagues, but by water 25. We were delayed crossing in the canoe by some immense troops of mares, which were swimming the river, in order to follow a division of troops into the interior. A more ludicrous spectacle I never beheld than the hundreds and hundreds of heads, all directed one way, with pointed ears, and distended snorting nostrils, appearing just above the water like a great shoal of some amphibious animal. Mares' flesh is the only food which the soldiers have when on an expedition. This gives them a great facility of movement, for the distance to which horses can be driven over these plains is quite surprising. I have been assured that an unloaded horse can travel a hundred miles a day for many days successively. The encampment of General Rosas was close to the river. It consisted of a square formed by wagons, artillery, straw huts, etc. 
The soldiers were nearly all cavalry, and I should think such a villainous banditti like army was never before collected together. The greater number of men were of a mixed breed, between Negro, Indian, and Spaniard. I know not the reason, but men of such origin seldom have a good expression of countenance. I called on the secretary to show my passport. He began to cross-question me in the most dignified and mysterious manner. By good luck I had a letter of recommendation from the government of Buenos Aires, 5, to the commandant of Patagones. This was taken to General Rosas, who sent me a very obliging message, and the secretary returned all smiles and graciousness. We took up our residence in the Prancho underscore, or hovel, of a curious old Spaniard, who had served with Napoleon in the expedition against Russia. We stayed two days at the Colorado, I had little to do, for the surrounding country was a swamp, which in summer, December, when the snow melts on the Cordillera, is overflowed by the river. My chief amusement was watching the Indian families as they came to buy little articles at the rancho where we stayed. It was supposed that General Rosas had about 600 Indian allies. The men were a tall fine race, yet it was afterwards easy to see in the Fujian savage the same countenance rendered hideous by cold, want of food, and less civilization. Some authors, in defining the primary races of mankind, have separated these Indians into two classes, but this is certainly incorrect. Among the young women or Chinas, some deserve to be called even beautiful. Their hair was coarse, but bright and black, and they wore it in two plates hanging down to the waist. They had a high color, and eyes that glistened with brilliancy, their legs, feet, and arms were small and elegantly formed, their ankles, and sometimes their wrists, were ornamented by broad bracelets of blue beads. Nothing could be more interesting than some of the family groups. A mother with one or two daughters would often come to our rancho, mounted on the same horse. They ride like men, but with their knees, tucked up much higher. This habit, perhaps, arises from their being accustomed, while traveling, to ride the loaded horses. The duty of the women is to load, and unload the horses, to make the tents for the night, in short to be, like the wives of all savages, useful slaves. The men fight, hunt, take care of the horses, and make the riding gear. One of their chief inner occupations is to knock two stones together till they become round, in order to make the bolas. With this important weapon the Indian catches his game, and also his horse, which roams free over the plain. In fighting, his first attempt is to throw down the horse of his adversary with the bolas, and when entangled by the fall, to kill him with the chuzo. If the balls only catch the neck or body of an animal, they are often carried away and lost. As the making the stones round is the labor of two days, the manufacture of the balls is a very common employment. Several of the men and women had their faces painted red, but I never saw the horizontal beds which are so common among the Fujians. Their chief pride consists in having everything made of silver. I have seen a cacique with his spurs, stirrups, handle of his knife, and bridle made of this metal, the heads tall and reins being of wire, were not thicker than whipcord, and to see a fiery steed wheeling about under the command of so light a chain, gave to the horsemanship a remarkable character of elegance. General Rose has intimated a wish to see me, a circumstance which I was afterwards very glad of. He is a man of an extraordinary character, and has a most predominant influence in the country, which it seems he will use to its prosperity and advancement. 6. He is said to be the owner of 74 square leagues of land, and to have about 300,000 head of cattle. His estates are admirably managed, and are far more productive of corn than those of others. He first gained his celebrity by his loss for his own estancias, and by disciplining several hundred men, so as to resist with success the attacks of the Indians. There are many stories current about the rigid manner in which his laws were enforced. One of these was, that no man, on penalty of being put into the stocks, should carry his knife on a Sunday, this being the principal day for gambling and drinking, many quarrels arose, which from the general manner of fighting with the knife often proved fatal. One Sunday the governor came in great form, to pay the estancia a visit, and General Rosas, in his hurry, walked out to receive him with his knife, as usual, stuck in his pelt. The steward touched his arm, and reminded him of the law, upon which turning to the governor, he said he was extremely sorry, but that he must go into the stocks, and that till let out, he possessed no power even in his own house. After a little time the steward was persuaded to open the stocks, and to let him out, but no sooner was this done, than he turned to the steward and said, You now have broken the laws, so you must take my place in the stocks. Such actions as these delighted the gauchos, who all possess high notions of their own equality and dignity. General Rosas is also a perfect horseman, an accomplishment of no small consequence in a country where an assembled army elected its general by the following trial, a troop of unbroken horses being driven into a corral, were led out through a gateway, above which was a crossbar, it was agreed whoever, should drop from the bar on one of these wild animals, as it rushed out, and should be able, 
without saddle or bridle, not only to ride it, but also to bring it back to the door of the corral, should be their general. The person who succeeded was accordingly elected, and doubtless made a fit general for such an army. This extraordinary feat has also been performed by Rosas. By these means, and by conforming to the dress and habits of the gauchos, he has obtained an unbounded popularity in the country, and in consequence a despotic power. I was assured by an English merchant, that a man who had murdered another, when arrested and questioned concerning his motive, answered, he spoke disrespectfully of General Rosas, so I killed him. At the end of the week the murderer was at liberty. This doubtless was the act of the general's party, and not of the general himself. In conversation he is enthusiastic, sensible, and very grave. His gravity is carried to a high pitch. I heard one of his mad buffoons, for he keeps to, like the barons of old, relate the following anecdote. I wanted very much to hear a certain piece of music, so I went to the general two or three times to ask him. He said to me, go about your business, for I'm engaged. I went a second time. He said, if you come again I will punish you. A third time I asked, and he laughed. I rushed out of the tent, but it was too late he ordered two soldiers, to catch and stake me. I begged by all the saints in heaven he would let me off, but it would not do, when the general laughs he spares neither mad man nor sound. The poor flighty gentleman looked quite dolorous, at the very recollection of the staking. This is a very severe punishment, for posts are driven into the ground, and the man is extended by his arms and legs horizontally, and they're left to stretch for several hours. The idea is evidently taken from the usual method of drawing hides. My interview passed away, without a smile, and I obtained a passport and order for the government post horses, and this he gave me in the most obliging and ready manner. In the morning we started for Bahia Blanca, which we reached in two days. Leaving the regular encampment, we passed by the Toldas of the Indians. These are round like ovens, and covered with hides, by the mouth of each, a tapering shoe hole was stuck in the ground. The Toldas were divided into separate groups, which belonged to the different Kasik tribes, and the groups were again divided into smaller ones, according to the relationship of the owners. For several miles we traveled along the valley of the Colorado. The alluvial plains on the side appeared fertile, and it is supposed, that they are well adapted to the growth of corn. Turning northward from the river, we soon entered on a country, differing from the plains south of the river. The land still continued dry and sterile, but it supported many different kinds of plants, and the grass, though brown and withered, was more abundant, as the forty bushes were less so. These latter in a short space entirely disappeared, and the plains were left without a thicket to cover their nakedness. This change in the vegetation marks the commencement of the Grand Calcare Argillaceous Deposit, which forms the wide extent of the Pampas, and covers the granitic rocks of Bandan Oriental. From the Strait of Magellan to the Colorado, a distance of about 800 miles, the face of the country is everywhere composed of shingle, the pebbles are chiefly of porphyry, and probably owe their origin to the rocks of the Cordillera. North of the Colorado this bed thins out, and the pebbles become exceedingly small, and here the characteristic vegetation of Patagonia ceases. Having ridden about 25 miles, we came to a broad belt of sand dunes, which stretches, as far as the eye can reach, to the east and west. The sand hillocks resting on the clay, allow small pools of water to collect, and thus afford in this dry country an invaluable supply of fresh water. The great advantage arising from depressions and elevations of the soil, is not often brought home to the mind. The two miserable springs in the long passage between the Rio Negro and Colorado were caused, by trifling inequalities in the plain, without them not a drop of water would have been found. The belt of sand dunes is about eight miles wide, at some former period, it probably formed the margin of a grand estuary, where the Colorado now flows. In this district, where absolute proofs of the recent elevation of the land occur, such speculations can hardly be neglected by anyone, although merely considering the physical geography of the country. Having crossed the sandy tract, we arrived in the evening at one of the post houses, and, as the fresh horses were grazing at a distance we determined to pass the night there. The house was situated at the base of a ridge between one and two hundred feet high, a most remarkable feature in this country. This posta was commanded by a Negro lieutenant, born in Africa, to his credit be it said, there was not a ranch between the Colorado and Buenos Aires in nearly such neat order as his. He had a little room for strangers, and a small corral for the horses, all made of sticks and reeds. He had also dug a ditch around his house as a defense in case of being attacked. This would, however, have been of little avail, if the Indians had come, but his chief comfort seemed to rest in the thought of selling his life dearly. A short time before, a body of Indians had traveled past in the night, if they had been aware of the pasta, our black friend and his four soldiers would assuredly have been slaughtered. I did not anywhere meet a more civil, and obliging man than this negro, it was therefore the more painful to see, that he would not sit down, and eat with us. 
In the morning we sent for the horses very early, and started for another exhilarating gallop. We passed the Capiza del Buai, an old name given to the head of a large marsh, which extends from Bahia Blanca. Here we changed horses, and passed through some leagues of swamps and saline marshes. Changing horses for the last time, we again began wading through the mud. My animal fell, and I was well soused in black mire a very disagreeable accident when one does not possess a change of clothes. Some miles from the fort we met a man, who told us, that a great gun had been fired, which is a signal, that Indians are near. We immediately left the road, and followed the edge of a marsh, which when chased offers the best mode of escape. We were glad to arrive within the walls, when we found all the alarm was about nothing, for the Indians turned out to be friendly ones, who wished to join General Rosas. Bahia Blanca scarcely deserves the name of a village. A few houses and the barracks for the troops are enclosed by a deep ditch and fortified wall. The settlement is only of recent standing, since 1828, and its growth has been one of trouble. The government of Buenos Aires unjustly occupied it by force, instead of following the wise example of the Spanish viceroys, who purchased the land near the older settlement of the Rio Negro, from the Indians. Hence the need of the fortifications, hence the few houses and little cultivated land without the limits of the walls, even the cattle are not safe from the attacks of the Indians beyond the boundaries of the plain, on which the fortress stands. The part of the harbor, where the Beagle intended to anchor, being distant twenty-five miles, I obtained from the commandant a guide and horses, to take me to see whether she had arrived. Leaving the plain of green turf, which extended along the course of a little brook, we soon entered on a wide level waste consisting either of sand, saline marshes, or bare mud. Some parts were clothed by low thickets, and others with those succulent plants, which luxuriate only where salt abounds. Bad as the country was, ostriches, deer, agudas, and armadillos were abundant. My guide told me that two months before he had a most narrow escape of his life, he was out hunting with two other men at no great distance from this part of the country when they were suddenly met by a party of Indians who, giving chase, soon overtook and killed his two friends. His own horse's legs were also caught by the bolas, but he jumped off and with his knife cut them free. While doing this he was obliged to dodge round his horse and received two severe wounds from their chooses. Springing on the saddle, he managed, by a most wonderful exertion, just to keep ahead of the long spears of his pursuers, who followed him to within sight of the fort. From that time there was an order that no one should stray far from the settlement. I did not know of this when I started, and was surprised to observe how earnestly my guide watched the deer, which appeared to have been frightened from a distant quarter. We found the beagle had not arrived, and consequently set out on our return, but the horses soon tiring, we were obliged to bivouac on the plain. In the morning we had caught an armadillo, which although a most excellent dish when roasted in its shell, did not make a very substantial breakfast and dinner for two hungry men. The ground at the place where we stopped for the night was encrusted with a layer of sulfate of soda, and hence, of course, was without water. Yet many of the smaller rodents managed to exist even here, and the tukutuko was making its odd little grunt beneath my head during half the night. Our horses were very poor ones, and in the morning they were soon exhausted from not having had anything to drink, so that we were obliged to walk. About noon the dogs killed a kid, which we roasted. I ate some of it, but it made me intolerably thirsty. This was the more distressing as the road, from some recent rain, was full of little puddles of clear water, yet not a drop was drinkable. I had scarcely been twenty hours without water, and only part of the time under a hot sun, yet the thirst rendered me very weak. How people survive two or three days under such circumstances, I cannot imagine, at the same time, I must confess, that my cut did not suffer at all, and was astonished, that one day's deprivation should be so troublesome to me. I have several times alluded to the surface of the ground being encrusted with salt. This phenomenon is quite different from that of the Salinas, and more extraordinary. In many parts of South America, wherever the climate is moderately dry, these encrustations occur, but I have nowhere seen them so abundant as near Bahia Blanca. The salt here, and in other parts of Patagonia, consists chiefly of sulfate of soda with some common salt. As long as the ground remains moist in the salatrails, as the Spaniards improperly call them, mistaking this substance for saltpeter, nothing is to be seen, but an extensive plain composed of a black muddy soil, supporting scattered tufts of succulent plants. On returning through one of these tracks, after a week's hot weather, one is surprised to see square miles of the plain white, as if from a slight fall of snow, here and there heaped up by the wind into little drifts. This latter appearance is chiefly caused by the salts being drawn up, during the slow evaporation of the moisture, round blades of dead grass, stumps of wood, and pieces of broken earth, instead of being crystallized at the bottoms of the puddles of water. 
The salad trails occurred either on level tracts elevated only a few feet above the level of the sea, or on alluvial and bordering rivers. M. Parkap, 7, found that the selenium crustacean on the plain, at the distance of some miles from the sea, consisted chiefly of sulfate of soda, with only 7% of common salt, whilst nearer to the coast, the common salt increased to 37 parts in a hundred. This circumstance would tempt one to believe that the sulfate of soda is generated in the soil from the muriate left on the surface during the slow and recent elevation of this dry country. The whole phenomenon is well worthy the attention of naturalists. Have the succulent salt-loving plants, which are well known to contain much soda, the power of decomposing the muriate? Does the black fetid mud, abounding with organic matter, yield the sulfur and ultimately the sulfuric acid? Two days afterwards I again rode to the harbor, when not far from our destination, my companion, the same man as before, spied three people hunting on horseback. He immediately dismounted, and watching them intently, said, they don't ride like Christians, and nobody can leave the fort. The three hunters joined company, and likewise dismounted from their horses. At last one mounted again, and rode over the hill out of sight. My companion said, we must now get on our horses, load your pistol, and he looked to his own sword. I asked, are they Indians, Queen Sabe? Who knows, if there are no more than three, it does not signify. It then struck me, that the one man had gone over the hill, to fetch the rest of his tribe. I suggested this, but all the answer I could extort was, Queen Sabe. His head and I never for a minute ceased scanning slowly the distant horizon. I thought his uncommon coolness too good a joke, and asked him, why he did not return home. I was startled when he answered, we are returning, but in a line, so as to pass near a swamp, into which we can gallop the horses as far as they can go, and then trust to our own legs, so that there is no danger. I did not feel quite so confident of this, and wanted to increase our pace. He said, no, not until they do. When any little inequality concealed us, we galloped, but when in sight, continued walking. At last we reached the valley, and turning to the left, galloped quickly to the foot of a hill. He gave me his horse to hold, made the dogs lie down, and then crawled on his hands and knees to reconnoiter. He remained in this position for some time, and at last, bursting out in laughter, exclaimed, Mijiers, women. He knew them to be the wife and sister-in-law of the major's son, hunting for ostrich's eggs. I have described this man's conduct, because he acted under the full impression that they were Indians. As soon, however, as the absurd mistake was found out, he gave me a hundred reasons, why they could not have been Indians, but all these were forgotten at the time. We then rode on in peace and quietness to a low point called Puntalta, whence we could see nearly the whole of the great harbor of Bahia Blanca. The wide expanse of water is choked up by numerous great mud banks, which the inhabitants call kangaroos or crabberies underscore, from the number of small crabs. The mud is so soft that it is impossible to walk over them, even for the shortest distance. Many of the banks have their surfaces covered with long rushes, the tops of which alone are visible at high water. On one occasion, when in the boat, we were so entangled by these shallows, that we could hardly find our way. Nothing was visible, but the flat beds of mud, the day was not very clear, and there was much refraction, or as the sailors expressed it, things limped high. The only object within our view, which was not level was the horizon, rushes looked like bushes unsupported in the air, and water like mud banks, and mud banks like water. We passed the night in Punta Alta, and I employed myself in searching for fossil bones, this point being a perfect catacomb for monsters have extinct traces. The evening was perfectly calm and clear, the extreme monotony of the view gave it an interest even in the midst of mud banks and gulls sand hillocks and solitary vultures. In riding back in the morning we came across a very fresh track of a puma, but did not succeed in finding it. We saw also a couple of zerillus, or skunks, odious animals, which are far from uncommon. In general appearance, the Zerillo resembles a polecat, but it is rather larger, and much thicker in proportion. Conscious of its power, it roams by day about the open plain, and fears neither dog nor man. If a dog is urged to the attack, its courage is instantly checked by a few drops of the fetid oil, which brings on violent sickness, and running at the nose. Whatever is once polluted by it, is forever useless. Azra says the smell can be perceived at a league distant, more than once, when entering the harbor of Monte Video, the wind being offshore, we have perceived the odor on board the beagle. Certain it is, that every animal most willingly makes room for the Zerillo. The beagle arrived here on the 24th of August, and a week afterwards sailed for the Plata. With Captain Fitzroy's consent I was left behind, to travel by land to Buenos Aires. I will here add some observations, which were made during this visit, and on a previous occasion, when the Beagle was employed in surveying the harbor, the plain, at the distance of a few miles from the coast, 
belongs to the Great Pampian Formation, which consists in part of a reddish clay and in part of a highly calcareous marly rock. Nearer the coast there are some plains formed from the wreck of the upper plain, and from mud, gravel, and sand thrown up by the sea during the slow elevation of the land, of which elevation we have evidence, in upraised beds of recent shells, and in rounded pebbles of pumice scattered over the country. At Punta Alta we have a section of one of these later formed little plains, which is highly interesting from the number and extraordinary character of the remains of gigantic land animals embedded in it. These have been fully described by Professor Owen in the Zoology of the Voyage of the Beagle and are deposited in the College of Surgeons. I will here give only a brief outline of their nature. First, parts of three heads and other bones of the Megatherium, the huge dimensions of which are expressed by its name. Secondly, the Megalonyx, a great allied animal. Thirdly, the Celetotherium, also an allied animal, of which I obtained a nearly perfect skeleton. It must have been as large as a rhinoceros, in the structure of its head it comes according to Mr. Owen, nearest to the Cape Anteater, but in some other respects it approaches to the armadillos. Fourthly, the Myelid and Darwinii, a closely related genus of little inferior size. Fifthly, another gigantic dental quadruped. Sixthly, a large animal, with an osseous coat and compartments, very like that of an armadillo. Seventhly, an extinct kind of horse, to which I shall have again to refer. Eighthly, a tooth of a Pachydermatous animal, probably the same with the Macrochenia, a huge beast with a long neck like a camel, which I shall also refer to again. Lastly, the Toxidon, perhaps one of the strangest animals ever discovered, in size it equaled an elephant or megatherium, but the structure of its teeth, as Mr. Owen states, proves indisputably that it was intimately related to the Norse, the order which, at the present day, includes most of the smallest quadrupeds, in many details it is allied to the Pachydermata judging from the position of its eyes, ears, and nostrils. It was probably aquatic, like the dugong and manatee, to which it is also allied. How wonderfully are the different orders, at the present time so well separated, blended together in different points of the structure of the toxidon. The remains of these nine great quadrupeds, and many detached bones, were found embedded on the beach, within the space of about 200 yards square. It is a remarkable circumstance that so many different species should be found together, and it proves how numerous and kind the ancient inhabitants of this country must have been. At the distance of about 30 miles from Pantalta, in a cliff of red earth, I found several fragments of bones, some of large size. Among them were the teeth of an or, equaling in size and closely resembling those of the capybara, whose habits have been described, and therefore, probably, an aquatic animal. There was also part of the head of a tinamace, the species being different from the tukutuko, but with a close general resemblance. The red earth, like that of the pampas, in which these remains were embedded, contains, according to Professor Ehrenberg, a fresh water and one salt water infusory and malacule, therefore, probably, it was an estuary deposit. The remains of Punta Alta were embedded, in stratified gravel and reddish mud, just such as the sea might now wash up on a shallow bank. They were associated with 23 species of shells, of which 13 are recent and 4 others very closely related to recent forms, 1, from the bones of the Celetotherium, including even the kneecap, being adopted in their proper relative positions, and from the osseous armor of the great armadillo-like animal being so well preserved. Together with the bones of one of its legs, we may feel assured that these remains were fresh and united by their ligaments when deposited in the gravel together with the shells, too. Hence we have good evidence that the above enumerated gigantic quadrupeds, more different from those of the present date than the oldest of the tertiary quadrupeds of Europe, lived whilst the sea was peopled with most of its present inhabitants, and we have confirmed that remarkable law so often insisted on by Mr. Little, namely, that the longevity of the species in the mammalia is upon the whole inferior to that of the testacea. 3. The great size of the bones of the megatheroid animals, including the megatherium, megalonyx, celetotherium, and myelodon, is truly wonderful. The habits of life of these animals were a complete puzzle to naturalists, until Professor Owen, 4, solved the problem with remarkable ingenuity. The teeth indicate, by their simple structure, that these megatheroid animals lived on vegetable food, and probably on the leaves and small twigs of trees. Their ponderous forms and great strong curved claws seem so little adapted for locomotion, that some eminent naturalists have actually believed, that, like the sloths, to which they are intimately related, they subsisted by climbing back downwards on trees, and feeding on the leaves. It was a bold, not to say preposterous, idea to conceive even antediluvian trees, with branches strong enough to bear animals as large as elephants. Professor Owen, with far more probability, believes that, instead of climbing on the trees, they pulled the branches down to them, and tore up the smaller ones by the roots, and so fed on the leaves. 
the colossal breadth and weight of their hinder quarters, which can hardly be imagined without having been seen, become on this view of obvious service. Instead of being an encumbrance, their apparent clumsiness disappears. With their great tails and their huge heels firmly fixed like a tripod on the ground, they could freely exert the full force of their most powerful arms and great claws. Strongly rooted, indeed, must that tree have been, which could have resisted such force. The myelodon, moreover, was furnished with a long extensile tongue like that of the giraffe, which, by one of those beautiful provisions of nature, thus reaches with the aid of its long neck its leafy food. I may remark, that in Abyssinia the elephant, according to Bruce, when it cannot reach with its proboscis the branches, deeply scores with its jusks the trunk of the tree, up and down and all round, till it is sufficiently weakened to be broken down. The beds including the above fossil remains, stand only from 15 to 20 feet above the level of high water, and hence the elevation of the land has been small, without there has been an intercalated period of subsidence, of which we have no evidence, since the great quadrupeds wandered over the surrounding plains, and the external features of the country must then have been very nearly the same as now. What, it may naturally be asked, was the character of the vegetation at that period, was the country as wretchedly sterile as it now is? As so many of the coal-embedded shells are the same with those now living in the bay, I was at first inclined to think that the former vegetation was probably similar to the existing one, but this would have been an erroneous inference for some of these same shells live on the luxuriant coast of Brazil, and generally, the character of the inhabitants of the sea are useless as guides, to judge of those on the land. Nevertheless, from the following considerations, I do not believe that the simple fact of many gigantic quadrupeds having lived on the plains round Bahia Blanca is any sure guide that they formerly were clothed with the luxuriant vegetation. I have no doubt that the sterile country a little southward, near the Rio Negro, with its scattered forty trees, would support many and large quadrupeds. That large animals require a luxuriant vegetation has been a general assumption which has passed from one word to another, but I do not hesitate to say that it is completely false, and that it has vitiated the reasoning of geologists on some points of great interest in the ancient history of the world. The prejudice has probably been derived from India and the Indian islands, where troops of elephants, noble forests, and impenetrable jungles are associated together in everyone's mind. If However, we refer to any work of travels through the southern parts of Africa, we shall find allusions in almost every page either to the desert character of the country, or to the numbers of large animals inhabiting it. The same thing is rendered evident by the many engravings which have been published of various parts of the interior. When the Beagle was at Cape Town, I made an excursion of some days length into the country, which at least was sufficient to render that which I had read more fully intelligible. Dr. Andrew Smith who, at the head of his adventurous party, has lately succeeded in passing the Tropic of Capricorn, informs me that, taking into consideration the whole of the southern part of Africa, there can be no doubt of its being a sterile country. On the southern and southeastern coasts there are some fine forests, but with these exceptions, the traveler may pass for days together through open plains, covered by a poor and scanty vegetation. It is difficult to convey any accurate idea of degrees of comparative fertility, but it may be safely said that the amount of vegetation supported at any one time, five, by Great Britain, exceeds, perhaps even tenfold, the quantity on an equal area in the interior parts of southern Africa. The fact that bullock wagons can travel in any direction, excepting near the coast, without more than occasionally half an hour's delay in cutting down bushes, gives, perhaps, a more definite notion of the scantiness of the vegetation. Now, if we look to the animals inhabiting these wide plains, we shall find their numbers extraordinarily great, and their bulk immense. We must enumerate the elephant, three species of rhinoceros, and probably, according to Dr. Smith, two others, the hippopotamus, the giraffe, the bus heifer as large as a full-grown bull, and the ala, but little less, two zebras, and the quacka, two news, and several antelopes even larger than these latter animals. It may be supposed that, although the species are numerous, the individuals of each kind are few. By the kindness of Dr. Smith, I am enabled to show that the case is very different. He informs me that in latitude 24 degs, in one day's march with the bullock wagons, he saw, without wandering to any great distance on either side, between 100 and 150 rhinoceroses, which belong to three species, the same day he saw several herds of giraffes, amounting together to nearly a hundred, and that although no elephant was observed, yet they are found in this district. At the distance of a little more than one hour's march from their place of encampment on the previous night, his party actually killed at one spot eight hippopotamuses, and saw many more. In the same river there were likewise crocodiles. Of course it was a case quite extraordinary, to see so many great animals crowded together but it evidently proves that they must exist in great numbers. 
Dr. Smith describes the country passed through that day as being thinly covered with grass and bushes about four feet high and still more thinly with mimosa trees. The wagons were not prevented traveling in a nearly straight line. Besides these large animals, everyone the least acquainted with the natural history of the Cape has read of the herds of antelopes, which can be compared only with the flocks of migratory birds. The numbers indeed of the lion, panther, and hyena, and the multitude of birds of prey, plainly speak of the abundance of the smaller quadrupeds. One evening seven lions were counted at the same time prowling round Dr. Smith's encampment. As this able naturalist remarked to me, the carnage each day in southern Africa must indeed be terrific. I confess it is truly surprising how such a number of animals can find support in a country producing so little food. The larger quadrupeds no doubt roam over wide tracts in search of it, and their food chiefly consists of underwood, which probably contains much nutriment in a small bulk. Dr. Smith also informs me that the vegetation has a rapid growth, no sooner is a part consumed than its place is supplied by a fresh stock. There can be no doubt, however, that our ideas respecting the apparent amount of food necessary for the support of large quadrupeds are much exaggerated. It should have been remembered that the camel, an animal of no mean bulk, has always been considered as the emblem of the desert. The belief that where large quadrupeds exist, the vegetation must necessarily be luxuriant, is the more remarkable, because the converse is far from true. Mr. Burkle observed to me that when entering Brazil, nothing struck him more forcibly than the splendor of the South American vegetation contrasted with that of South Africa, together with the absence of all large quadrupeds. In his travels, 6, he has suggested that the comparison of the respective weights, if there were sufficient data, of an equal number of the largest herbivorous quadrupeds of each country would be extremely curious. If we take on the one side, the elephant, 7, hippopotamus, giraffe, Boss Kaffir, Ella, certainly three, and probably five species of rhinoceros, and on the American side, two tapers, the guanaco, three deer, the vicuna, peccary, capybara, after which we must choose from the monkeys to complete the number, and then place these two groups alongside each other. It is not easy to conceive ranks more disproportionate in size. After the above facts, we are compelled to conclude, against anterior probability, 8 that among the mammalia there exists no close relation between the bulk of the species and the quantity underscore of the vegetation in the countries which they inhabit. With regard to the number of large quadrupeds, there certainly exists no quarter of the globe which will bear comparison with southern Africa. After the different statements which have been given, the extremely desert character of that region will not be disputed. In the European division of the world, we must look back to the tertiary epochs to find a condition of things among the mammalia, resembling that now existing at the Cape of Good Hope. Those tertiary epochs, which we are apt to consider as abounding to an astonishing degree with large animals, because we find the remains of many ages accumulated at certain spots, could hardly boast of more large quadrupeds than southern Africa does at present. If we speculate on the condition of the vegetation during these epochs we are at least bound so far to consider existing analogies as not to urge as absolutely necessary a luxuriant vegetation when we see a state of things so totally different at the Cape of Good Hope. We know, 9, that the extreme regions of North America, many degrees beyond the limit where the ground at the depth of a few feet remains perpetually congealed, are covered by forests of large and tall trees. In like manner, in Siberia, we have woods of birch. For aspen and larch growing in a latitude 10, 64 degs, where the mean temperature of the air falls below the freezing point, and where the earth is so completely frozen that the carcass of an animal embedded in it is perfectly preserved. With these facts, we must grant, as far as quantity alone underscore of vegetation is concerned, that the great quadrupeds of the later tertiary epochs might, in most parts of northern Europe and Asia, have lived on the spots where their remains are now found. I do not here speak of the kind of vegetation necessary for their support, because, as there is evidence of physical changes, and as the animals have become extinct, so may we suppose that the species of plants have likewise been changed. These remarks, I may be permitted to add, directly bear on the case of the Siberian animals preserved in ice. The firm conviction of the necessity of the vegetation possessing a character of tropical luxuriance to support such large animals, and the impossibility of reconciling this with the proximity of perpetual congelation, was one chief cause of the several theories of sudden revolutions of climate, and of overwhelming catastrophes, which were invented to account for their entombment. I'm far from supposing that the climate has not changed since the period when those animals lived, which now lie buried in the ice. At present I only wish to show that as far as quantity underscore of food alone underscore is concerned, the ancient rhinoceroses might have roamed over the steppes underscore of central Siberia, the northern parts probably being underwater, even in their present condition, as well as the living rhinoceroses and elephants over the Karas underscore of southern Africa.
I will now give an account of the habits of some of the more interesting birds which are common on the wild plains of northern Patagonia, and first for the largest, or South American ostrich. The ordinary habits of the ostrich are familiar to everyone. They live on vegetable matter, such as roots and grass, but at Mejia Blanca I have repeatedly seen three or four come down at low water to the extensive mud banks, which are then dry, for the sake, as the gauchos say, of feeding on small fish. Although the ostrich in its habits is so shy, wary, and solitary, and although so fleet in its pace, it is caught without much difficulty by the Indian or gaucho armed with the bolas. When several horsemen appear in a semicircle, it becomes confounded, and does not know which way to escape. They generally prefer running against the wind, yet at the first start they expand their wings, and like a vessel make all sail. On one fine hot day I saw several ostriches enter a bed of dull rushes, where they squatted concealed, till quite closely approached. It is not generally known, that ostriches readily take to the water. Mr. King informs me that at the Bay of San Blas, and at Port Pauls in Patagonia, he saw these birds swimming several times from island to island. They ran into the water both when driven down to a point, and likewise of their own accord when not frightened, the distance crossed, was about 200 yards. When swimming, very little of their bodies appear above water, their necks are extended a little forward, and their progress is slow. On two occasions I saw some ostriches swimming across the Santa Cruz River, where its course was about 400 yards wide, and the stream rapid. Captain Sturt, 11, when descending the Murrumbidgee, in Australia, saw two emus in the act of swimming. The inhabitants of the country readily distinguish, even at a distance, the cockbird from the hen. The former is larger and darker colored, 12, and has a bigger head. The ostrich, I believe the cock, emits a singular, detoned, hissing note. When first I heard it, standing in the midst of some sand hillocks I thought it was made by some wild beast, for it is a sound that one cannot tell whence it comes, or from how far distant. When we were at Bahia Blanca in the months of September and October, the eggs, in extraordinary numbers, were found all over the country. They lie either scattered and single, in which case they are never hatched, and are called by the Spaniards huiches, or they are collected together into a shallow excavation, which forms the nest. Out of the four nests which I saw, three contained 22 eggs each, and the fourth 27. In one day's hunting on horseback 64 eggs were found, 44 of these were in two nests, and the remaining 20, scattered huiches. The cauchos unanimously affirm, and there is no reason to doubt their statement, that the male bird alone hatches the eggs, and for some time afterwards accompanies the young. The cock when on the nest lies very close, I have myself almost ridden over one. It is asserted that at such times they are occasionally fierce, and even dangerous, and that they have been known to attack a man on horseback, trying to keck, and leap on him. My informer pointed out to me an old man, whom he had seen much terrified by one chasing him. I observe in Burkill's travels in South Africa, that he remarks, having killed a male ostrich, and the feathers being dirty, it was said by the Hittentids to be a nest bird. I understand that the male emu in the zoological gardens, takes charge of the nest, this habit, therefore, is common to the family. The cauchos unanimously affirm, that several females lay in one nest. I have been positively told, that four or five hen birds have been watched to go in the middle of the day, one after the other, to the same nest. I may add, also, that it is believed in Africa, that two or more females lay in one nest, 13. Although this habit at first appears very strange, I think the cause may be explained in a simple manner. The number of eggs in the nest varies from 20 to 40, and even to 50, and according to Ezra, sometimes to 70 or 80. Now, although it is most probable, from the number of eggs found in one district being so extraordinarily great in proportion to the parent birds, and likewise from the state of the avarium of the hen, that she may in the course of the season lay a large number, yet the time required, must be very long. Azra states, 14, that a female in a state of domestication laid 17 eggs, each at the interval of three days one from another. If the hen was obliged to hatch her own eggs, before the last was laid the first probably would be addled, but if each laid a few eggs at successive periods, in different nests, and several hens, as is stated to be the case, combined together, then the eggs in one collection would be nearly of the same age. If the number of eggs in one of these nests is, as I believe, not greater on an average than the number laid by one female in the season, then there must be as many nests as females, and each cockbird will have its fair share of the labor of incubation, and that during a period when the females probably could not sick, from not having finished laying, 15, I have before mentioned the great numbers of huiches, or deserted eggs, so that in one day's hunting twenty were found in this state. It appears odd that so many should be wasted. Does it not arise from difficulty of several females associating together, and finding a male ready to undertake the office of incubation? 
it is evident that there must at first be some degree of association between at least two females, otherwise the eggs would remain scattered over the white plain, at distances far too great to allow of the male collecting them into one nest. Some authors have believed that the scattered eggs were deposited for the young birds to feed on. This can hardly be the case in America, because the huiches, although often found at Old and Putrid, are generally whole. When at the Rio Negro in northern Patagonia, I repeatedly heard the gauchos talking of a very rare bird which they called a vestras batis. They described it as being less than the common ostrich, which is their abundant, but with a very close and general resemblance. They said its color was dark and mottled, and that its legs were shorter, and feathered lower down than those of the common ostrich. It is more easily caught by the bulls than the other species. The few inhabitants who had seen both kinds, affirmed they could distinguish them apart from a long distance. The eggs of the small species appeared, however, more generally known, and it was remarked, with surprise, that they were very little less than those of the rhea, but of a slightly different form, and with a tinge of pale blue. This species occurs most rarely on the plains bordering the Rio Negro, but about a degree and a half further south they are tolerably abundant. When at Port Desire, in Patagonia, latitude 48 eggs, Mr. Martin's shot an ostrich, and I looked at it, forgetting at the moment, in the most unaccountable manner, the whole subject of the petises, and thought it was a not full-grown bird of the common sort. It was cooked and eaten before my memory returned. Fortunately the head, neck, legs, wings, many of the larger feathers, and a large part of the skin, had been preserved, and from these a very nearly perfect specimen has been put together, and is now exhibited in the Museum of the Zoological Society. Mr. Gould, in describing this new species, has done me the honor of calling it after my name. Among the Patagonian Indians in the Strait of Magellan, we found a half-Indian, who had lived some years with the tribe, but had been born in the northern provinces. I asked him if he had ever heard of the Avestras Batis. He answered by saying, Why, there are none others in these southern countries. He informed me that the number of eggs in the nest of the Batis is considerably less than in that of the other kind, namely, not more than 15 on an average, but he asserted that more than one female deposited them. At Santa Cruz we saw several of these birds. They were excessively wary, I think they could see a person approaching, went too far off to be distinguished themselves. In ascending the river few were seen, but in our quieted and rapid descent, many, in pairs and by fours or fives, were observed. It was remarked that this bird did not expand its wings when first starting at full speed, after the manner of the northern kind. In conclusion I may observe that the Strathio Rhea inhabits the country of La Plata as far as a little south of the Rio Negro in latitude 41 degs, and that the Strathio Darwinii takes its place in southern Patagonia, the part about the Rio Negro being neutral territory. M.A. Dorbigny, 16, when at the Rio Negro, made great exertions to procure this bird, but never had the good fortune to succeed. Tobrizhefer, 17, long ago was aware of there being two kinds of ostriches, he says, you must know, moreover, that emus differ in size and habits in different tracts of land, for those that inhabit the plains of Buenos Aires and Tucumán are larger, and have black, white, and gray feathers, those near to the Strait of Magellan are smaller and more beautiful, for their white feathers are tipped with black at the extremity, and their black ones, in like manner terminate in white. A very singular little bird, Tinochorus rumosivorus, is here common, in its habits and general appearance, it nearly equally partakes of the characters, different as they are, of the quail and snipe. The Tinochorus is found in the whole of southern South America, wherever there are sterile plains, or open dry pasture land. It frequents in pairs or small flocks the most desolate places, where scarcely another living creature can exist. A pomp being approached they squat close, and then are very difficult to be distinguished from the ground. When feeding they walk rather slowly, with their legs wide apart. They dust themselves in roads and sandy places, and frequent particular spots, where they may be found day after day, like partridges, they take wing in a flock. In all these respects, in the muscular gizzard adapted for vegetable food, in the arched beak and fleshy nostrils, short legs and form of foot, the Tinochorus has a close affinity with quails. But as soon as the bird is seen flying, its whole appearance changes, the long pointed wings, so different from those in the gallinaceous order, the irregular manner of flight, and plaintive cry uttered at the moment of rising, recall the idea of a snipe. The sportsmen of the beagle unanimously called it the short-billed snipe. To this genus, or rather to the family of the waiters, its skeleton shows that it is really related. The Tinochorus is closely related to some other South American birds. Two species of the genus Atagis are in almost every respect Darmagans in their habits, one lives in Tierra del Fugo, above the limits of the forest land, and the other just beneath the snow line on the Cordillera of central Chile. 
a bird of another closely allied genus, Chinus alba, is an inhabitant of the Antarctic regions, it feeds on seaweed and shells on the tidal rocks. Although not web-footed, from some unaccountable habit, it is frequently met with far out at sea. This small family of birds is one of those which, from its varied relations to other families, although at present offering only difficulties to the systematic naturalist, ultimately may assist in revealing the grand scheme, common to the present and past ages, on which organized, beings have been created. The genus Fernarius contains several species, all small birds, living on the ground, and inhabiting open dry countries. In structure they cannot be compared to any European form. Ornithologists have generally included them among the creepers, although opposed to that family in every habit. The best known species is the common oven bird of La Plata, the casserin or housemaker of the Spaniards. The nest, once it takes its name, is placed in the most exposed situations, as on the top of a post, a bare rock, or on a cactus. It is composed of mud and bits of straw, and has strong thick walls, in shape it precisely resembles an oven, or depressed beehive. The opening is large and arched, and directly in front, within the nest, there is a partition, which reaches nearly to the roof, thus forming a passage or antechamber to the true nest. Another and smaller species of Fernarius, F. Cuticularius, resembles the oven bird in the general reddish tint of its plumage, in a peculiar shrill reiterated cry, and in an odd manner of running by starts. From its affinity, the Spaniards call it Caserta, or a little house builder, although its notification is quite different. The Caserta builds its nest at the bottom of a narrow cylindrical hole, which is said to extend horizontally to nearly six feet underground. Several of the country people told me that when boys, they had attempted to dig out the nest, but had scarcely ever succeeded in getting to the end of the passage. The bird chooses an yellow bank of firm sandy soil by the side of a road or stream. Here, at the Blanca, the walls round the houses are built of hard and mud, and I noticed that one, which enclosed the courtyard where I lodged, was bored through by round holes in a score of places. On asking the owner the cause of this, he bitterly complained of the little caserta, several of which I afterwards observed at work. It is rather curious to find how incapable these birds must be of acquiring any notion of thickness, for although they were constantly flitting over the low wall, they continued vainly to bore through it, thinking of an excellent bank for their nests. I do not doubt that each bird, as often as it came to daylight on the opposite side, was greatly surprised at the marvelous fact. I have already mentioned nearly all the mammalia common in this country. Of armadillos three species occur namely, the Dasypus minutus or pitchy underscore, the Divilisus or, Paluto underscore, and the Apra underscore. The first extends ten degrees further south than any other kind, a fourth species, the Mulet underscore, does not come as far south as Bahia Blanca. The four species have nearly similar habits, the Peludo underscore, however, is nocturnal, while the others wander by day over the open plains, feeding on beetles, larvae, roots, and even small snakes. The Apra underscore, commonly called Mataco underscore, is remarkable by having only three movable bends, the rest of its tessellated covering being nearly inflexible. It is the power of rolling itself into a perfect sphere, like one kind of English woodlouse. In this state it is safe from the attack of dogs, for the dog not being able to take the hole in its mouth, tries to bite one side, and the ball slips away. The smooth hard covering of the Mataco underscore offers a better defense than the sharp spines of the hedgehog. The Pitchy underscore prefers a very dry soil, and the sand dunes near the coast, where for many months it can never taste water, as its favorite resort, it often tries to escape notice, by squatting close to the ground. In the course of a day's ride, near Bahia Blanca, several were generally met with, the instant one was perceived, it was necessary, in order to catch it, almost to tumble off one's horse, for in soft soil the animal burrowed so quickly, that its hinder quarters would almost disappear before one could alight. It seems almost a pity, to kill such nice little animals, for as a gaucho said, while sharpening his knife on the back of one, Santa and Mansus they are so quiet. Of reptiles there are many kinds, one snake, a trigonocephalus, or a coffeus, eighteen from the size of the poison channel in its fangs, must be very deadly. Cuvier, in opposition to some other naturalists, makes this a subgenus of the rattlesnake, and intermediate between it and the viper. In confirmation of this opinion, I observed a fact, which appears to me very curious and instructive, as showing how every character, even though it may be in some degree independent of structure, has a tendency to vary by slow degrees. The extremity of the tail of this snake is terminated by a point, which is very slightly enlarged, and as the animal glides along, it constantly vibrates the last inch, and this part striking against the dry grass and brushwood, produces a rattling noise, which can be distinctly heard at the distance of six feet. As often as the animal was irritated or surprised, its tail was shaken, and the vibrations were extremely rapid. 
Even as long as the body retained its irritability, a tendency to this habitual movement was evident. The stringencephalus has, therefore, in some respects the structure of a viper, with the habits of a rattlesnake, the noise, however, being produced by a simpler device. The expression of this snake's face was hideous and fierce, the pupil consisted of a vertical slit and a mottled in copper iris, the jaws were broad at the base, and the nose terminated in a triangular projection. I do not think I ever saw anything more ugly, excepting, perhaps, some of the vampire bats. I imagine this repulsive aspect originates from the features being placed in positions, with respect to each other, somewhat proportional to those of the human face, and thus we obtain a scale of hideousness. Amongst the Batrachian reptiles, I found only one little toad, Phryniscus nigricans, which was most singular from its color. If we imagine, first, that it had been steeped in the blackest ink, and then, when dry, allowed to crawl over a board, freshly painted with the brightest vermilion, so as to color the soles of its feet and parts of its stomach, a good idea of its appearance will be gained. If it had been an unnamed species, surely it ought to have been called Diabolicus underscore, for it is a fit toad, to preach in the year of Eve. Instead of being nocturnal in its habits, as other toads are, and living in damp obscure recesses, it crawls during the heat of the day about the dry sand hillocks and arid plains, where not a single drop of water can be found. It must necessarily depend on the dew for its moisture, and this probably is absorbed by the skin, for it is known that these reptiles possess great powers of cutaneous absorption. At Maldonado, I found one in a situation nearly as dry as at Bahia Blanca, and thinking to give it a great treat, carried it to a pool of water. Not only was the little animal unable to swim, but I think without help it would soon have been drowned. Of lizards there were many kinds, but only one, Proctotritus multimaculatus, remarkable from its habits. It lies on the bare sand near the sea coast, and from its mottled color, the brownish scales being speckled with white, yellowish red, and dirty blue, can hardly be distinguished from the surrounding surface. When frightened, it attempts to avoid discovery by feigning death, with outstretched legs, depressed body, and closed eyes, if further molested, it buries itself with great quickness in the loose sand. This lizard, from its flattened body and short legs, cannot run quickly. I will here add a few remarks on the hibernation of animals in this part of South America. When we first arrived at Bahia Blanca, September 7, 1832, we thought nature had granted scarcely a living creature to this sandy and dry country. By digging, however, in the ground, several insects, large spiders, and lizards were found in a half torpid state. On the 15th, a few animals began to appear, and by the 18th, three days from the equinox, everything announced the commencement of spring. The plains were ornamented by the flowers of a pink wood sorrel, wild peas, cynothery, and geraniums, and the birds began to lay their eggs. Numerous lamellicorn and heteromerous insects, the latter remarkable for their deeply sculptured bodies, were slowly crawling about, while the lizard tribe, the constant inhabitants of a sandy soil, darted about in every direction. During the first eleven days, whilst nature was dormant, the mean temperature taken from observations made every two hours on board the Beagle, was 51 degs, and in the middle of the day the thermometer seldom ranged above 55 degs. On the eleven succeeding days, in which all living things became so animated, the mean was 58 degs, and the range in the middle of the day seven between 60 and 70 degs. Here, then, an increase of seven degrees in mean temperature, but a greater one of extreme heat, was sufficient to awake the functions of life. At Montevideo, from which we had just before sailed, in the 23 days included between the 26th of July and the 19th of August, the mean temperature from 276 observations was 58.4 degs, the mean hottest day being 65.5 degs, and the coldest 46 degs. The lowest point to which the thermometer fell was 41.5 degs, and occasionally in the middle of the day it rose to 69 or 70 degs. Yet with this high temperature, almost every beetle, several genera of spiders, snails, and land shells, toads and lizards were all lying torpid beneath stones. But we have seen that at Bahia Blanca, which is four degrees southward, and therefore with the climate only a very little colder, this same temperature with a rather less extreme heat, was sufficient to awake all orders of animated beings. This shows how nicely the stimulus required to arouse hibernating animals is governed by the usual climate of the district, and not by the absolute heat. It is well known that within the tropics, the hibernation, or more properly estivation, of animals is determined not by the temperature, but by the times of drought. Near Rio de Janeiro, I was at first surprised to observe that, a few days after some little depressions had been filled with water, they were peopled by numerous full-grown shells and beetles, which must have been lying dormant. Humboldt has related the strange accident of a hubble having been erected over a spot where a young crocodile lay buried in the hardened mud. 
He adds, the Indians often find enormous bodas, which they call Yuji or water serpents, in the same lethargic state. To reanimate them, they must be irritated, or wetted with water. I will only mention one other animal, a zoophyte, I believe Virgilaria patagonica, a kind of sea pen. It consists of a thin, straight, fleshy stem, with alternate rows of polypi on each side, and surrounding an elastic stony axis, varying in length from 8 inches to 2 feet. The stem at one extremity is trichate, but at the other is terminated by a vermiform fleshy appendage. The stony axis which gives strength to the stem, may be traced at this extremity into a mere vessel filled with granular matter. At low water hundreds of these zoophytes might be seen, projecting like stubble, with the truncate end upwards, a few inches above the surface of the muddy sand. What touched or pulled they suddenly drew themselves in with force, so as nearly or quite to disappear. By this action, the highly elastic axis must be bent at the lower extremity, where it is naturally slightly curved, and I imagine it is by this elasticity alone, that the zoophyte is enabled to rise again through the mud. Each polypus, though closely united to its brethren, has a distinct mouth, body, and tentacula. Of these polypi, in a large specimen, there must be many thousands, yet we see, that they act by one movement, they have also one central axis connected with the system of obscure circulation, and the ova are produced in an organ distinct from the separate individuals, 19. Well may one be allowed to ask, what is an individual? It is always interesting to discover the foundation of the strange tales of the old voyagers, and I have no doubt, but that the habits of this regularia explain one such case. Captain Lancaster, in his voyage, 20, in 1601, narrates that on the sea sands of the island of Sombrero, in the East Indies, he found a small twig growing up like a young tree, and on offering to pluck it up it shrinks down to the ground, and sinks, and less held very hard. On being plucked up, a great worm is found to be its root, and as the tree groweth in greatness, so doth the worm diminish, and as soon as the worm is entirely turned into a tree it rooteth in the earth, and so becomes great. This transformation is one of the strangest wonders that I saw in all my travels, for if this tree is plucked up while young, and the leaves and bark stripped off, it becomes a hard stone when dry, much like white coral, thus is this worm twice transformed into different natures. Of these we gathered, and brought home many. During my stay at the Hiablanca, while waiting for the beagle, the place was in a constant state of excitement, from rumors of wars and victories, between the troops of Rosas and the wild Indians. One day an account came, that a small party forming one of the postes on the line to Buenos Aires, had been found all murdered. The next day 300 men arrived from the Colorado, under the command of Commandant Miranda. A large portion of these men were Indians, masses, or tame, belonging to the tribe of Cacique Bernaccio. They passed the night here, and it was impossible to conceive anything more wild and savage than the scene of their bivouac. Some drank till they were intoxicated, others swallowed the steaming blood of the cattle slaughtered for their suppers, and then, being sick from drunkenness, they cast it up again, and were besmeared with filth and gore. Nam simul expletus dapibus, vitex apultus servisum inflexum posut, jacket perantrum immensus, sani miractans, ac frosta crunta persomnum commixta marrow. In the morning they started for the scene of the murder, with orders to follow the rastro, or track, even if it led them to Chile. We subsequently heard that the wild Indians had escaped into the Great Pampas, and from some cause the track had been missed. One glance at the rastro tells these people a whole history. Supposing they examine the track of a thousand horses, they will soon guess the number of mounted ones, by seeing how many have cantered, by the depth of the other impressions, whether any horses were loaded with cargoes, by the irregularity of the footsteps, how far tired, by the manner in which the food has been cooked, whether the pursuit traveled in haste, by the general appearance, how long it has been since they passed. They consider a rastro of ten days or a fortnight, quite recent enough to be hunted out. We also heard that Miranda struck from the west end of the Sierra Ventana, in a direct line to the island of Cholichol, situated 70 leagues up the Rio Negro. This is a distance up between two and three hundred miles, through a country completely unknown. What other troops in the world are so independent? With the sun for their guide, mares flesh for food, their saddle cloths for beds, as long as there is a little water, these men would penetrate to the end of the world. A few days afterwards I saw another troop of these banditti-like soldiers start on an expedition against a tribe of Indians at the small Salinas, who had been betrayed by a prisoner cacique. The Spaniard who brought the orders for this expedition was a very intelligent man. He gave me an account of the last engagement at which he was present. Some Indians, who had been taken prisoners, gave information of a tribe living north of the Colorado. Two hundred soldiers were sent, and they first discovered the Indians by a cloud of dust from their horses' feet, as they chanced to be traveling. The country was mountainous and wild, and it must have been far in the interior, for the Cordillera were in sight. 
The Indians, men, women, and children, were about 110 in number, and they were nearly all taken or killed, for the soldiers saber every man. The Indians are now so terrified, that they offer no resistance in a body, but each flies, neglecting even his wife and children, but when overtaken, like wild animals, they fight against any number to the last moment. One dying Indian seized with his teeth the thumb of his adversary, and allowed his own eye, to be forced out sooner than relinquish his hold. Another, who was wounded, feigned death, keeping a knife ready to strike one more fatal blow. My informer said, when he was pursuing an Indian, the man cried out for mercy, at the same time, that he was covertly losing the bullets from his waist, meaning to whirl it round his head, and so strike his pursuer. I however struck him with my saber to the ground, and then got off my horse, and cut his throat with my knife. This is a dark picture, but how much more shocking, is the unquestionable fact, that all the women who appear above twenty years old are massacred in cold blood. When I exclaimed, that this appeared rather inhuman, he answered, why, what can be done, they breed so. Everyone here is fully convinced, that this is the most just war, because it is against barbarians. Who would believe in this age, that such atrocities could be committed in a Christian civilized country? The children of the Indians are saved, to be sold or given away as servants, or rather slaves for as long a time as the owners can make them believe themselves slaves, but I believe in their treatment there is little to complain of. In the battle four men ran away together. They were pursued, one was killed, and the other three were taken alive. They turned out to be messengers or ambassadors from a large body of Indians, united in the common cause of defense, near the Cordillera. The tribe to which they had been sent, was on the point of holding a grand council, the feast of mare's flesh was ready, and the dance prepared, in the morning the ambassadors were to have returned to the Cordillera. They were remarkably fine men, very fair, above six feet high, and all under thirty years of age. The three survivors of course possessed very valuable information and to extort this they were placed in a line. The two first being questioned, answered, no say I do not know, and were one after the other shot. The third also said no say, adding, fire, I'm a man, and can tie. Not one syllable would they breathe to injure the united cause of their country. The conduct of the above-mentioned cacique was very different, he saved his life, by betraying the intended plan of warfare, and the point of union in the Andes. It was believed, that there were already six or seven hundred Indians together, and that in summer their numbers would be doubled. Ambassadors were to have been sent to the Indians at the small Salinas, near Bahia Blanca, who might have mentioned, that this same cacique had betrayed. The communication, therefore, between the Indians, extends from the Cordillera to the coast of the Atlantic. General Rosas's plan is to kill all stragglers, and having driven the remainder to a common point, to attack them in a body, in the summer, with the assistance of the Chilinus. This operation is to be repeated for three successive years. I imagine the summer is chosen as the time for the main attack, because the plains are then without water, and the Indians can only travel in particular directions. The escape of the Indians to the south of the Rio Negro, where in such a vast and known country they would be safe, is prevented by a treaty with the Tehuelches to this effect, that Troz has praised them so much to slaughter every Indian who passes to the south of the river, but if they fail in so doing, they themselves are to be exterminated. The war is waged chiefly against the Indians near the Cordillera, for many of the tribes on this eastern side, are fighting with Rosas. The general, however, like Lord Chesterfield, thinking that his friends may in a future day become his enemies, always places them in the front ranks, so that their numbers may be thinned. Since leaving South America we have heard, that this war of extermination completely failed. Among the captive girls taken in the same engagement, there were two very pretty Spanish ones who had been carried away by the Indians when young, and could now only speak the Indian tongue. From their account they must have come from Salta, a distance in a straight line of nearly 1,000 miles. This gives one a grand idea of the immense territory over which the Indians roam, yet, great as it is, I think there will not, in another half century, be a wild Indian northward of the Rio Negro. The warfare is too bloody to last, the Christians killing every Indian, and the Indians doing the same by the Christians. It is melancholy to trace how the Indians have given way before the Spanish invaders. Chernel, 21, says that in 1535, when Buenos Aires was founded, there were villages containing two and three thousand inhabitants. Even in Falconer's time, 1750, the Indians made inroads as far as Luxon, Erico, and Duresife, but now they are driven beyond the Salado. Not only have whole tribes been exterminated, but the remaining Indians have become more barbarous, instead of living in large villages, and being employed in the arts of fishing, as well as of the chase, they now wander about the open plains, without home or fixed occupation. I heard also some account of an engagement which took place, a few weeks previously to the one mentioned, at Chalichal. 
This is a very important station on account of being a pass for horses, and it was, in consequence, for some time the headquarters of a division of the army. When the troops first arrived there they found a tribe of Indians, of whom they killed twenty or thirty. The cacique escaped in a manner which astonished everyone. The chief Indians always have one or two picked horses, which they keep ready for any urgent occasion. On one of these, an old white horse, the cacique sprung, taking with him his little son. The horse had neither saddle nor bridle. To avoid the shots, the Indian rode in the peculiar method of his nation namely, with an arm round the horse's neck, and one leg only on its back. Thus hanging on one side, he was seen patting the horse's head, and talking to him. The pursuers urged every effort in the chase, the commandant three times changed his horse, but all in vain. The old Indian father and his son escaped, and were free. What a fine picture one can form in one's mind, the naked bronze-like figure of the old man with his little boy, riding like a mazeppa on the white horse, thus leaving far behind him the host of his pursuers. I saw one day a soldier striking fire with a piece of flint, which I immediately recognized as having been a part of the head of an arrow. He told me it was found near the island of Jolichal, and that they are frequently picked up there. It was between two and three inches long, and therefore twice as large as those now used in Tierra del Fuego. It was made of opaque cream-colored flint, but the point and barbs had been intentionally broken off. It is well known that no Pampas Indians now use bows and arrows. I believe a small tribe and band Oriental must be accepted, but they are widely separated from the Pampas Indians, and border close on those tribes that inhabit the forest and live on foot. It appears, therefore, that these arrowheads are antiquarian, 22, relics of the Indians, before the great change in habits consequent on the introduction of the horse into South America. September 18th, I hired a gaucho to accompany me on my ride to Buenos Aires, though with some difficulty, as the father of one man was afraid to let him go, and another, who seemed willing, was described to me as so fearful that I was afraid to take him for I was told that even if he saw an ostrich at a distance, he would mistake it for an Indian, and would fly like the wind away. The distance to Buenos Aires is about 400 miles, and nearly the whole way through an uninhabited country. We started early in the morning, ascending a few hundred feet from the basin of green turf on which Bahia Blanca stands, we entered on a wide desolate plain. It consists of a crumbling argillacea calcareous rock, which, from the dry nature of the climate, supports only scattered tufts of withered grass, without a single bush or tree, to break the monotonous uniformity. The weather was fine, but the atmosphere remarkably hazy, I thought the appearance foreboded a gale, but the gauchos said it was owing to the plain, at some great distance in the interior, being on fire. After a long gallop, Having changed horses twice, we reached the Rio Sauce, it is a deep, rapid, little stream, not above 25 feet wide. The second posta on the road to Buenos Aires stands on its banks, a little above there is a ford for horses, where the water does not reach to the horse's belly, but from that point, in its course to the sea, it is quite impassable, and hence makes a most useful barrier against the Indians. Insignificant as this stream is, the Jesuit Falconer, whose information is generally so very correct, figures it is a considerable river, rising at the foot of the Cordillera. With respect to its source, I do not doubt that this is the case for the Gauchos assured me that in the middle of the dry summer, this stream, at the same time with the Colorado has periodical floods, which can only originate in the snow melting on the Andes. It is extremely improbable that a stream so small as the Sauce then was should traverse the entire width of the continent, and indeed, if it were the residue of a large river, its waters, as in other ascertained cases, would be saline. During the winter we must look to the springs round the Sierra Ventana as the source of its pure and limpid stream. I suspect the plains of Patagonia like those of Australia, are traversed by many water courses which only perform their proper parts at certain periods. Probably this is the case with the water, which flows into the head of Fort Desire, and likewise with the Rio Chupit, on the banks of which masses of highly cellular scoriae were found by the officers employed in the survey. As it was early in the afternoon when we arrived, we took fresh horses, and to soldier for a guide, and started for the Sierra de la Ventana. This mountain is visible from the anchorage at Bahia Blanca, and Captain Fitzroy calculates its height to be 3340 feet, an altitude very remarkable on this eastern side of the continent. I am not aware that any foreigner, previous to my visit, had ascended this mountain, and indeed very few of the soldiers at Bahia Blanca knew anything about it. Hence we heard of beds of coal, of gold and silver, of caves, and of forests, all of which inflamed my curiosity, only to disappoint it. The distance from the posta was about six leagues over a level plain of the same character as before. The ride was, however, interesting, as the mountain began to show its true form. When we reached the foot of the main ridge, we had much difficulty in finding any water, and we thought we should have been obliged to have passed the night without any. At last we discovered some 
by looking close to the mountain, for at the distance even of a few hundred yards the streamlets were buried, and entirely lost in the friable calcareous stone and loose detritus. I do not think nature ever made a more solitary desolate pile of rock, it well deserves its name of her tattoo underscore, or separated. The mountain is steep, extremely rugged, and broken, and so entirely destitute of trees, and even bushes, that we actually could not make a scooter, to stretch out our meat over the fire of thistle stalks. 1. The strange aspect of this mountain is contrasted by the sea-like plain, which not only abuts against its steep sides, but likewise separates the parallel ranges. The uniformity of the coloring gives an extreme quietness to the view, the whitish gray of the quartz rock, and the light brown of the weathered grass of the plain, being unrelieved by any brighter tint. From custom, one expects to see in the neighborhood of a lofty and pulled mountain, a broken country strewn over with huge fragments. Here nature shows that the last movement before the bed of the sea is changed into dry land may sometimes be one of tranquility. Under these circumstances I was curious to observe how far from the parent rock any pebbles could be found. On the shores of Bahia Blanca, and near the settlement, there were some of quartz, which certainly must have come from this source, the distance is 45 miles. The dew, which in the early part of the night wetted the saddle cloths under which we slept, was in the morning frozen. The plain, though appearing horizontal, had insensibly sloped up to a height of between 800 and 900 feet above the sea. In the morning, 9th of September, the guy told me to ascend the nearest ridge, which he thought, would lead me to the four peaks that crown the summit. The climbing up such rough rocks was very fatiguing, the sides were so indented, that what was gained in one five minutes was often lost in the next. At last, when I reached the ridge, my disappointment was extreme, in finding a precipitous valley as deep as the plain, which cut the chain transversely in two, and separated me from the four points. This valley is very narrow, but flat-bottomed, and it forms a fine horse pass for the Indians, as it connects the plains on the northern and southern sides of the range. Having descended, and while crossing it, I saw two horses grazing, I immediately hid myself in the long grass, and began to reconnoiter, but as I could see no signs of Indians I proceeded cautiously on my second ascent. It was late in the day, and this part of the mountain, like the other, was steep and rugged. I was on the top of the second peak by two o'clock, but got there with extreme difficulty, every twenty yards I had the cramp in the upper part of both thighs, so that I was afraid I should not have been able to have got down again. It was also necessary to return by another road, as I was out of the question, to pass over the saddleback. I was therefore obliged to give up the two higher peaks. Their altitude was but little greater, and every purpose of geology had been answered, so that the attempt was not worth the hazard of any further exertion. I presume the cause of the cramp was the great change in the kind of muscular action, from that of hard riding to that of still harder climbing. It is a lesson worth remembering, as in some cases it might cause much difficulty. I have already said the mountain is composed of white quartz rock, and with it a little glossy clay slate is associated. At the height of a few hundred feet above the plain patches of conglomerate adhered in several places to the solid rock. They resembled in hardness, and in the nature of the cement, the masses which may be seen daily forming on some coasts. I do not doubt these pebbles were in a similar manner aggregated, at a period when the great calcareous formation was depositing beneath the surrounding sea. We may believe that the jagged and battered forms of the hard quartz yet showed the effects of the waves of an open ocean. I was, on the whole, disappointed with this ascent. Even the view is insignificant, or plain like the sea, but without its beautiful color and defined outline. The scene, however, was novel, and the little danger, like salt meat, gave it a relish. That the danger was very little was certain, for my two companions made a good fire a thing which is never done, when it is suspected, that Indians are near. I reached the place of our bivouac by sunset, and drinking much mate, and smoking several cigarettes, soon made up my bed for the night. The wind was very strong and cold, but I never slept more comfortably. September 10th, in the morning, having fairly scudded before the gale, we arrived by the middle of the day at the sauce pasta. In the road we saw great numbers of deer, and near the mountain Iguanaco. The plain, which abuts against the Sierra, is traversed by some curious gullies, of which one was about 20 feet wide, and at least 30 deep, we were obliged in consequence, to make a considerable circuit, before we could find a pass. We stayed the night at the pasta, the conversation, as was generally the case, being about the Indians. The Sierra Ventana was formerly a great place of resort, and three or four years ago there was much fighting there. My guide had been present when many Indians were killed, the women escaped to the top of the ridge, and fought most desperately with great stones, many thus saving themselves. September 11th, proceeded to the third posted in company with the lieutenant who commanded it. The distance is called 15 leagues, but it is only guesswork, and isn't generally overstated. 
the road was uninteresting, over a dry grassy plain, and on our left hand at a greater or less distance there were some low hills, a continuation of which we crossed close to the posta. Before our arrival we met a large herd of cattle and horses, guarded by fifteen soldiers, but we were told many had been lost. It is very difficult to drive animals across the plains, for if in the night a puma, or even a fox, approaches, nothing can prevent the horses dispersing in every direction, and a storm will have the same effect. A short time since, an officer left Buenos Aires with 500 horses, and when he arrived at the army he had under 20. Soon afterwards we perceived by the cloud of dust, that a party of horsemen were coming towards us, when far distant my companions knew them to be Indians, by their long hair streaming behind their backs. The Indians generally have a fillet round their heads, but never any covering, and their black hair blowing across their swarthy faces, heightens to an uncommon degree the wildness of their appearance. They turned out to be a party of Bernaccio's friendly tribe, going to a salina for salt. The Indians eat much salt, their children sucking it like sugar. This habit is very different from that of the Spanish cauchos, who, leading the same kind of life, eat scarcely any, according to Mungo Park, too, it is people who live on vegetable food who have an unconquerable desire for salt. The Indians gave us good-humored nods as they passed at full gallop, driving before them a troop of horses, and followed by a train of Lanka dogs. September 12th and 13th, I stayed at this post two days, waiting for a troop of soldiers, which General Rosas had the kindness to send to inform me, would shortly travel to Buenos Aires, and he advised me to take the opportunity of the escort. In the morning we rode to some neighboring hills to view the country, and to examine the geology. After dinner the soldiers divided themselves into two parties for a trial of skill with the bolas. Two spears were stuck in the ground twenty-five yards apart but they were struck, and entangled only once in four or five times. The balls can be thrown fifty or sixty yards, but with little certainty. This, however, does not apply to a man on horseback, for when the speed of the horse is added to the force of the arm, it is said, that they can be whirled with effect to the distance of eighty yards. As a proof of their force, I may mention, that at the Falkland Islands, when the Spaniards murdered some of their own countrymen and all the Englishmen, a young friendly Spaniard was running away, when a great tall man, by name Luciano, came at full gallop after him, shouting to him to stop, and saying that he only wanted to speak to him. Just as the Spaniard was on the point of reaching the boat, Luciano threw the pulse, they struck him on the legs with such a jerk, as to throw him down, and to render him for some time insensible. The man, after Luciano had had his talk, was allowed to escape. He told us that his legs were marked by great wheels, where the thong had wound round, as if he had been flogged with a whip. In the middle of the day two men arrived, who brought a parcel from the next posta to be forwarded to the general, so that besides these two, our party consisted this evening of my guide and self, the lieutenant, and his four soldiers. The latter were strange beings, the first a fine young Negro, the second half Indian and Negro, and the two others nondescripts, namely, an old Chilean miner, the color of mahogany, and another partly a mulatto, but two such mongrels with such detestable expressions, I never saw before. At night, when they were sitting round the fire, and playing at cards, I retired to view such a Salvador Rosa scene. They were seated under a low cliff, so that I could look down upon them, around the party were lying dogs, arms, remnants of deer and ostriches, and their long spears were stuck in the turf. Further in the dark background, their horses were tied up, ready for any sudden danger. If the stillness of the desolate plain was broken by one of the dogs barking, a soldier, leaving the fire, would place his head close to the ground, and thus slowly scan the horizon. Even if the noisy Tarutero uttered its scream, there would be a pause in the conversation, and every head, for a moment, a little inclined. What a life of misery these men appeared to us to lead. They were at least ten leagues from the Sospasta, and since the murder committed by the Indians, twenty from another. The Indians are supposed to have made their attack in the middle of the night, for very early in the morning after the murder, they were luckily seen approaching this posta. The whole party here, however, escaped, together with the troop of horses, each one taking a line for himself, and driving with him as many animals as he was able to manage. The little hovel, built of thistle stalks, in which they slept, neither kept out the wind nor rain, indeed in the latter case the only effect the roof had, was to condense it into larger drops. They had nothing to eat excepting what they could catch, such as ostriches, deer, armadillos, etc., and their only fuel was the dry stalks of a small plant, somewhat resembling an aloe. The sole luxury which these men enjoyed was smoking the little paper cigars and sucking mate. I used to think that the carrion vultures, man's constant attendants on these dreary plains, while seated on the little neighboring cliff seemed by their very patience to say, ah, when the Indians come we shall have a feast. 
In the morning we all sallied forth to hunt, and although we had not much success, there were some animated chases. Soon after starting the party separated, and so arranged their plans, that at a certain time of the day, in guessing which they show much skill, they should all meet from different points of the compass on a plain piece of ground, and thus drive together the wild animals. One day I went out hunting at Bahia Blanca, but the men there merely rode in a crescent, each being about a quarter of a mile apart from the other. A fine male ostrich being turned by the headmost riders, tried to escape on one side. The cauchos pursued at a reckless pace, whisting their horses about with the most admirable command, and each man whirling the balls round his head. At length the foremost threw them, revolving through the air. In an instant the ostrich rolled over and over, its legs fairly lashed together by the thong. The plains abound with three kinds of partridge, three, two of which are as large as hen pheasants. Their destroyer, a small and pretty fox, was also singularly numerous. In the course of the day we could not have seen less than forty or fifty. They were generally near the earths, but the dogs killed one. When we returned to the pasta, we found two of the party returned who had been hunting by themselves. They had killed a puma, and had found an ostrich's nest with twenty-seven eggs in it. Each of these is said to equal in weight eleven hen's eggs, so that we obtained from this one nest as much food as two hundred ninety-seven hen's eggs would have given. September 14th, as the soldiers belonging to the next pasta meant to return, and we should together make a party of five, and all armed, I determined not to wait for the expected troops. My host, the lieutenant, pressed me much to stop. As he had been very obliging, not only providing me with food, but lending me his private horses I wanted to make him some remuneration. I asked my guide whether I might do so, but he told me certainly not, that the only answer I should receive probably would be, we have meat for the dogs in our country, and therefore do not grudge it to a Christian. It must not be supposed that the rank of lieutenant in such an army would at all prevent the acceptance of payment. It was only the high sense of hospitality, which every traveler is bound to acknowledge as nearly universal throughout these provinces. After galloping some leagues, we came to a low swampy country, which extends for nearly 80 miles northward, as far as the Sierra Tapal Dune. In some parts there were fine damp plains, covered with grass, while others had a soft, black, and peaty soil. There were also many extensive but shallow lakes, and large beds of reeds. The country on the whole, resembled the better parts of the Cambridgeshire Fens. At night we had some difficulty, in finding amidst the swamps, a dry place for our bivouac. September 15th rose very early in the morning, and shortly after passed the post to where the Indians had murdered the five soldiers. The officer had eighteen shoes or wounds in his body. By the middle of the day, after a hard gallop, we reached the fifth posta, on account of some difficulty, in procuring horses we stayed there the night. As this point was the most exposed on the whole line, twenty-one soldiers were stationed here. At sunset they returned from hunting, bringing with them seven deer, three ostriches, and many armadillos and partridges. When riding through the country, it is a common practice to set fire to the plain, and hence at night, as on this occasion, the horizon was illuminated in several places by brilliant conflagrations. This is done, partly for the sake of puzzling many stray Indians, but chiefly for improving the pasture. In grassy plains unoccupied by the larger ruminating quadrupeds, it seems necessary to remove the superfluous vegetation by fire, so as to render the New Year's growth serviceable. The rancho at this place, did not boast even of a roof but merely consisted of a ring of thistle stalks, to break the force of the wind. It was situated on the borders of an extensive but shallow lake, swarming with wild fowl, among which the black-necked swan was conspicuous. The kind of plover, which appears as if mounted on stilts, Himantopus nigricollis, is here common in flocks of considerable size. It has been wrongfully accused of inelegance, when wading about in shallow water, which is its favorite resort, its gait is far from awkward. These birds in a flock utter a noise that singularly resembles the cry of a pack of small dogs in full chase, waking in the night, I have more than once been for a moment startled at the distant sound. The teru teru, Vanellus canis, is another bird, which often disturbs the stillness of the night. In appearance and habits it resembles in many respects our peewits, its wings, however, are armed with sharp spurs, like those on the legs of the common cock. As our peewit takes its name from the sound of its voice, so does the teru teru. While riding over the grassy plains, one is constantly pursued by these birds, which appear to hate mankind, and I'm sure deserve to be hated for their never-ceasing, unvaried, harsh screams. To the sportsman they are most annoying, by telling every other bird and animal of his approach, to the traveler in the country, they may possibly, as Molinus says, do good, by warning him of the midnight robber. During the breeding season, they attempt, like our peewits, by feigning to be wounded, to draw away from their nests dogs and other enemies. The eggs of this bird are esteemed a great delicacy. September 16th, 
to the seventh pasta at the foot of the Sierra Tapajun. The country was quite level, with a coarse herbage and a soft peaty soil. The hubble was here remarkably neat, the posts and rafters being made of about a dozen dry thistle stalks bound together with thongs of hide, and by the support of these ionic-like columns, the roof and sides were thatched with reeds. We were here told a fact, which I would not have credited, if I had not had partly ocular proof of it, namely, that, during the previous night hail as large as small apples, and extremely hard, had fallen with such violence, as to kill the greater number of the wild animals. One of the men had already found thirteen deer, service campestres, lying dead, and I saw their fresh hides, another of the party, a few minutes after my arrival brought in seven more. Now I well know, that one man without dogs, could hardly have killed seven deer in a week. The men believed they had seen about fifteen ostriches, part of one of which we had for dinner, and they said, that several were running about evidently blind in one eye. Numbers of smaller birds, as ducks, hawks, and partridges, were killed. I saw one of the latter with a black mark on its back, as if it had been struck with the paving stone. A fence of thistle stalks round the hubble was nearly broken down, and my informer, putting his head out to see what was the matter, received a severe cut, and now wore a bandage. The storm was said to have been of limited extent, we certainly saw from our last night's bivouac a dense cloud, and lightning in this direction. It is marvelous how such strong animals as deer could thus have been killed, but I have no doubt, from the evidence I have given, that the story is not in the least exaggerated. I am glad, however, to have its credibility supported by the Jesuit Lo Brisefen, for, who, speaking of a country much to the northward, says, hell fell of an enormous size, and killed vast numbers of cattle, the Indians hence called the place Lalagrake of Alki underscore, meaning the little white things. Dr. Malcolmson, also, informs me that he witnessed in 1831 in India, a hailstorm, which killed numbers of large birds and much injured the cattle. These hailstones were flat, and one was ten inches in circumference, and another weighed two ounces. They plowed up a gravel walk like musket balls, and passed through glass windows, making round holes, but not cracking them. Having finished our dinner, of hail stricken meat, we crossed the Sierra Tapaljun, a low range of hills, a few hundred feet in height, which commences at Cape Carines. The rock in this part is pure quartz, further eastward I understand it is granitic. The hills are of a remarkable form, they consist of flat patches of table land, surrounded by low perpendicular cliffs, like the outliers of a sedimentary deposit. The hill which I ascended was very small, not above a couple of hundred yards in diameter, but I saw others larger. One which goes by the name of the Corral, is said to be two or three miles in diameter, and encompassed by perpendicular cliffs, between thirty and forty feet high, excepting at one spot, where the entrance lies. Falconer, five, gives a curious account of the Indians driving troops of wild horses into it, and then by guarding the entrance, keeping them secure. I have never heard of any other instance of table land in a formation of quartz, and which, in the hill I examined, had neither cleavage nor stratification. I was told, that the rock of the corral was white, and would strike fire. We did not reach the post on the Rio Tapalgunt Hill, after it was dark. At supper, from something which was said, I was suddenly struck with horror at thinking, that I was eating one of the favorite dishes of the country namely, a half-formed calf, long before its proper time of birth. It turned out to be puma, the meat is very white and remarkably like veal in taste. Dr. Shaw was left at for stating, that the flesh of the lion is in great esteem having no small affinity with veal, both in color, taste, and flavor. Such certainly is the case with the puma. The cauchos differ in their opinion, whether the jaguar is good eating, but are unanimous in saying, that cat is excellent. September 17th, we followed the course of the Rio Tapaljun, through a very fertile country, to the ninth pasta. Tapaljun, itself, or the town of Tapaljun, if it may be so called, consists of a perfectly level plain, studded over, as far as the eye can reach, with the toldas or oven-shaped huts of Indians. The families of the friendly Indians, who were fighting on the side of Rosas, resided here. We met and passed many young Indian women, riding by two or three together on the same horse, they, as well as many of the young men, were strikingly handsome, their fine ruddy complexions being the picture of health. Besides the toldas, there were three ranches, one inhabited by the commandant, and the two others by Spaniards with small shops. We were here able to buy some biscuit. I had now been several days without tasting anything besides meat, I did not at all dislike this near regimen, but I felt as if it would only have agreed with me with hard exercise. I have heard that patients in England, when desired to confine themselves exclusively to an animal diet, even with the hope of life before their eyes, have hardly been able to endure it. Yet the gaucho in the pampas, for months together, touches nothing but beef. 
but they eat, I observe, a very large proportion of fat, which is of a less animalized nature, and they particularly dislike dry meat, such as that of the agouti. Dr. Richardson, 6, also, has remarked, that when people have fed for a long time solely upon lean animal food, the desire for fat becomes so insatiable, that they can consume large quantity of unmixed, and even oily fat without nausea, this appears to me a curious physiological fact. It is, perhaps, from their mutra to men that the gauchos, like other carnivorous animals, can abstain long from food. I was told that at Dandil, some troops voluntarily pursued a party of Indians for three days, without eating or drinking. We saw in the shops many articles, such as horse cloths, belts, and garters, woven by the Indian women. The patterns were very pretty, and the colors brilliant. The workmanship of the garters was so good, that an English merchant at Buenos Aires maintained they must have been manufactured in England, till he found the tassels had been fastened by split sinew. September 18th, we had a very long ride this day. At the 12th Pasta, which is seven leagues south of the Rio Salado, we came to the first estancia with the cattle and white women. Afterwards we had to ride for many miles through a country flooded with water above our horses' knees. By crossing the stirps, and riding Arab like with our legs bent up, we contrived to keep tolerably dry. It was nearly dark, when we arrived at the Salado, the stream was deep, and about forty yards wide, in summer, however, its bed becomes almost dry, and the little remaining water nearly as salt as that of the sea. We slept at one of the greatest stanchias of General Rosas. It was fortified, and of such an extent, that arriving in the dark I thought it was a town and fortress. In the morning we saw immense herds of cattle, the general here having 74 square leagues of land. Formerly nearly 300 men were employed about this estate, and they defied all the attacks of the Indians. September 19th, past the Guardia del Monte. This is a nice scattered little town, with many gardens, full of peach and quince trees. The plain here looked like that around Buenos Aires, the turf being short and bright green, with beds of clover and thistles, and with biscuit holes. I was very much struck with the marked change in the aspect of the country, after having crossed the Salado. From a coarse herbage we passed onto a carpet of fine green verdure. I at first attributed this to some change in the nature of the soil, but the inhabitants assured me that here, as well as in Bent Oriental, where there is as great a difference between the country around Montevideo and the thinly inhabited savannas of Colonia, the whole was to be attributed to the manuring and grazing of the cattle. Exactly the same fact has been observed in the prairies, 7, of North America, where coarse grass, between 5 and 6 feet high, when grazed by cattle, changes into common pasture land. I'm not botanist enough to say whether the change here is owing to the introduction of new species, to the altered growth of the same, or to a difference in their proportional numbers. Azra has also observed with astonishment this change. He is likewise much perplexed by the immediate appearance of plants not occurring in the neighborhood, on the borders of any track, that leads to a newly constructed hovel. In another part he says, 8, says Chavot, Savages, Unt la mani de profertor le camens, et la bord roots pour de poser leurs excrements, dont un draft de mon substance says androids. Does this not partly explain the circumstance? We thus have lines of richly manured land serving as channels of communication across wide districts. Near the Guardia we find the southern limit of two European plants, now become extraordinarily common. The fennel in great profusion covers the ditch banks in the neighborhood of Buenos Aires, Montevideo, and other towns. But the cardoon, Cinera cardunculus, has a far wider range. 9. It occurs in these latitudes on both sides of the Cordillera, across the continent. I saw it in unfrequented spots in Chile, Enter Rios, and Band Oriental. In the latter country alone, very many, probably several hundred, square miles are covered by one mass of these prickly plants, and are impenetrable by man or beast. Over the undulating plains, where these great beds occur, nothing else can now live. Before their introduction, however, the surface must have supported, as in other parts, a rank herbage. I doubt whether any case is on record of an invasion on so grand a scale of one plant over the Aborigines. As I have already said, I know where saw the Cardoon south of the Salado, but it is probable that in proportion as that country becomes inhabited, the Cardoon will extend its limits. The case is different with the giant thistle, with variegated leaves, of the pampas, for I met with it in the valley of the sauce. According to the principles so well laid down by Mr. Little, few countries have undergone more remarkable changes since the year 1535, when the first colonist of La Plata landed with 72 horses. The countless herds of horses, cattle, and sheep, not only have altered the whole aspect of the vegetation, but they have almost banished the guanaco, deer and ostrich. 
numberless other changes must likewise have taken place. The wild pig in some parts probably replaces the peccary, packs of wild dogs may be heard howling on the wooded banks of the less frequented streams, and the common cat, altered into a large and fierce animal, inhabits rocky hills. As M. Dorbigny has remarked, the increase in numbers of the carrion vulture, since the introduction of the domestic animals, must have been infinitely great, and we have given reasons for believing that they have extended their southern range. No doubt many plants, besides the cardoon and fennel, are naturalized, thus the islands near the mouth of the Paraná are thickly clothed with peach and orange trees, springing from seeds carried there by the waters of the river. While changing horses at the Guardia several people questioned us much about the army, I never saw anything like the enthusiasm for Rosas, and for the success of the most just of all warriors, because against barbarians. This expression, it must be confessed, is very natural, for till lately, neither man, woman nor horse, was safe from the attacks of the Indians. We had a long day's ride over the same rich green plain, abounding with various flocks, and with here and there a solitary estancia, and its one up underscore tree. In the evening it rained heavily, on arriving at a post house we were told by the owner, that if we had not a regular passport we must pass on, for there were, so many robbers he would trust no one. When he read, however, my passport, which began with all naturalist to Don Carlos, his respect and civility were as unbounded as his suspicions had been before. What a naturalist might be, neither he nor his countrymen, I suspect, had any idea, but probably my title lost nothing of its value from that cause. September 20th. We arrived by the middle of the day at Buenos Aires. The outskirts of the city looked quite pretty, with the agave hedges, and groves of olive, peach and willow trees, all just throwing out their fresh green leaves. I rode to the house of Mr. Lum, an English merchant, to whose kindness and hospitality, during my stay in the country, I was greatly indebted. The city of Buenos Aires is large, ten, and I should think one of the most regular in the world. Every street is at right angles to the one it crosses, and the parallel ones being equidistant, the houses are collected into solid squares of equal dimensions, which are called quadras. On the other hand, the houses themselves are hollow squares, all the rooms opening into a neat little courtyard. They are generally only one story high, with flat roofs, which are fitted with seats, and are much frequented by the inhabitants in summer. In the center of the town is the plaza, where the public offices, fortress, cathedral, etc., stand. Here also, the old viceroys, before the revolution, had their palaces. The general assemblage of buildings possesses considerable architectural beauty, although none individually can boast of any. The great, corral, where the animals are kept for slaughter, to supply food to this befeeding population, is one of the spectacles best worth seeing. The strength of the horse as compared to that of the bullock is quite astonishing, a man on horseback having thrown his lasso around the horns of a beast, can drag it anywhere he chooses. The animal plowing up the ground with outstretched legs, in vain efforts to resist the force, generally dashes at full speed to one side, but the horse immediately turning to receive the shock, stands so firmly, that the bullock is almost thrown down, and it is surprising, that their necks are not broken. The struggle is not, however, one of fair strength, the horse's girth being matched against the bullock's extended neck. In a similar manner a man can hold the wildest horse, if caught with the lasso, just behind the ears. When a bullock has been dragged to the spot where it is to be slaughtered, the matador with great caution cuts the hamstrings. Then is given the death bellow, and always more expressive of fierce agony than any I know. I have often distinguished it from a long distance, and have always known that the struggle was then drawing to a close. The whole side is horrible and revolting, the ground is almost made of bones, and the horses and riders are drenched with gore. September 27th, in the evening I set out on an excursion to Street Fay, which is situated nearly 300 English miles from Buenos Aires, on the banks of the Paraná. The roads in the neighborhood of the city after the rainy weather, were extraordinarily bad. I should never have thought it possible for a bullock wagon to have crawled along, as it was, they scarcely went at the rate of a mile an hour, and a man was kept ahead, to survey the best line for making the attempt. The bullocks were terribly jaded, it is a great mistake, to suppose that with improved roads, and an accelerated rate of traveling, the sufferings of the animals increase in the same proportion. We passed a train of wagons and a troop of beasts on their road to Mendoza. The distance is about 580 geographical miles, and the journey is generally performed in 50 days. These wagons are very long, narrow, and thatched with reeds, they have only two wheels, the diameter of which in some cases, is as much as 10 feet. Each is drawn by six bullocks, which are urged on by a goat at least 20 feet long, this is suspended from within the roof, for the wheel bullocks a smaller one is kept, and for the intermediate bear, a point projects at right angles from the middle of the long one. The whole apparatus looked like some implement of war. 
September 28th, we passed the small town of Luxon where there is a wooden bridge over the river, a most unusual convenience in this country. We passed also Rico. The plains appeared level, but were not so in fact, for in various places the horizon was distant. The estancias are here wide apart, for there is little good pasture, owing to the land being covered, by beds either of an acrid clover, or of the great thistle. The latter, well known from the animated description given by Sir F. Head, were at this time of the year two-thirds grown, in some parts they were as high as the horse's back, but in others they had not yet sprung up, and the ground was barren dusty as on a turn by road. The clumps were of the most brilliant green, and they made a pleasing miniature likeness of broken forest land. When the thistles are full grown, the great beds are impenetrable, except by a few tracks, as intricate as those in a labyrinth. These are only known to the robbers, who at this season inhabit them, and sally forth at night, to rob and cut throats with impunity. Upon asking at a house, whether robbers were numerous, I was answered, the thistles are not up yet, the meaning of which reply was not at first very obvious. There is little interest, in passing over these tracks, for they are inhabited by few animals or birds, excepting the biscuit and its friend the little owl. The biscuit, one, is well known to form a prominent feature in the zoology of the pampas. It is found as far south as the Rio Negro, in latitude 41 degs, but not beyond. It cannot, like the agouti, subsist on the gravelly and desert plains of Patagonia, but prefers a clay or sandy soil, which produces a different and more abundant vegetation. Near Mendoza, at the foot of the Cordillera, it occurs in close neighborhood with the allied alpine species. It is a very curious circumstance in its geographical distribution, that it has never been seen. Fortunately for the inhabitants of Band Oriental, to the eastward of the river Uruguay, yet in this province there are plains which appear admirably adapted to its habits. The Uruguay has formed an insuperable obstacle to its migration, although the broader barrier of the Paraná has been passed, and the Biscuit is common in Entre Rios, the province between these two great rivers. Near Buenos Aires these animals are exceedingly common. Their most favorite resort appears to be those parts of the plain which during one half of the year are covered with giant thistles, to the exclusion of other plants. The cow shows a fern, that it lives on roots, which, from the great strength of its nine teeth, and the kind of places frequented by it, seems probable. In the evening the biscuits come out in numbers, and quietly sit at the mouths of their burrows on their haunches. At such times they are very tame, and a man on horseback passing, by seems only to present an object for their grave contemplation. They run very awkwardly, and when running out of danger, from their elevated tails and short front legs much resemble great rats. Their flesh, when cooked, is very wide and good, but it is seldom used. The biscuit has one very singular habit, namely, dragging every hard object to the mouth of its burrow, around each group of holes many bones of cattle, stones, thistle stalks, hard lumps of earth, dry dung, etc., are collected into an irregular heap, which frequently amounts to as much as a wheelbarrow would contain. I was credibly informed that a gentleman, when riding on a dark night, dropped his watch, he returned in the morning, and by searching the neighborhood of every biscuit hole on the line of road, as he expected, he soon found it. This habit of picking up whatever may be lying on the ground anywhere near its habitation, must cost much trouble. For what purpose it is done, I am quite unable to form even the most remote conjecture, it cannot be for defense, because the rubbish is chiefly placed above the mouth of the burrow, which enters the ground at a very small inclination. No doubt there must exist some good reason, but the inhabitants of the country are quite ignorant of it. The only fact which I know analogous to it, is the habit of that extraordinary Australian bird, the Colotera maculata, which makes an elegant vaulted passage of twigs for playing in, and which collects near the spot, land and seashells, bones and the feathers of birds, especially brightly colored ones. Mr. Gould, who has described these facts, informs me, that the natives, when they lose any hard object, search the playing passages, and he has known a tobacco pipe thus recovered. The little owl, Athenkiticularia, which has been so often mentioned, on the plains of Buenos Aires exclusively inhabits the holes of the Biscacha, but in Bent Oriental it is its own workman. During the open day, but more especially in the evening, these birds may be seen in every direction standing frequently by pairs on the hillock near their burrows. If disturbed they either enter the hole, or, uttering a shrill harsh cry, move with a remarkably undulatory flight to a short distance, and then turning round, steadily gaze at their pursuer. Occasionally in the evening they may be heard hooting. I found in the stomachs of two which I opened the remains of mice, and I one day saw a small snake killed and carried away. It is said, that snakes are their common prey during the daytime. I may here mention, as showing on what various kinds of food owls subsist, that a species killed among the islets of the Chanas archipelago, had its stomach full of good-sized crabs. In India, too, there is a fishing genus of owls, which likewise catches crabs. 
In the evening we crossed the Rio Arecife on a simple raft made of barrels lashed together, and slipped at the post house on the other side. I this day paid horse hire for thirty-one leagues, and although the sun was glaring hot I was but little fatigued. When Captain Head talks of riding fifty leagues a day, I do not imagine the distance is equal to one hundred fifty English miles. At all events, the thirty own leagues was only seventy-six miles in a straight line, and in an open country I should think four additional miles for turnings would be a sufficient allowance twenty-ninth and thirtieth. We continued to ride over plains of the same character. At San Nicolas I first saw the noble river of the Paraná. At the foot of the cliff on which the town stands, some large vessels were at anchor. Before arriving at Trezario, we crossed the Saladillo, a stream of fine clear running water, but too saline to drink. Rosario is a large town built on a dead level plain, which forms a cliff about 60 feet high over the Paraná. The river here is very broad, with many islands, which are alone and wooded, as is also the opposite shore. The view would resemble that of a great lake, if it were not for the linear-shaped islets, which alone give the idea of running water. The cliffs are the most picturesque part, sometimes they are absolutely perpendicular, and of a red color, at other times in large broken masses, covered with cacti and mimosa trees. The real grandeur, however, of an immense river like this, is derived from reflecting, how important the means of communication and commerce it forms between one nation and another, to what a distance it travels, and from how vast a territory it drains the great body of fresh water which flows past your feet. For many leagues north and south of San Nicolas and Rosario, the country is really level. Scarcely anything which travelers have written about its extreme flatness, can be considered as exaggeration. Yet I could never find a spot where, by slowly turning round, objects were not seen at greater distances in some directions than in others, and this manifestly proves inequality in the plain. At sea, a person's eye being six feet above the surface of the water, his horizon is two miles and four-fifths distant. In like manner, the more level the plain, the more nearly does the horizon approach within these narrow limits, and this, in my opinion, entirely destroys that grandeur which one would have imagined, that a vast level plain would have possessed. October 1st, we started by moonlight, and arrived at the Rio Tercero by sunrise. The river is also called the Saladillo, and it deserves the name, for the water is brackish. I stayed here the greater part of the day, searching for fossil bones. Besides a perfect tooth of the toxidin, and many scattered bones, I found two immense skeletons near each other, projecting in bold relief from the perpendicular cliff of the Paraná. They were, however, so completely decayed, that I could only bring away small fragments of one of the great molar teeth, but these are sufficient to show, that the remains belong to a mastodon, probably to the same species with that, which formerly must have inhabited the Cordillera in Upper Peru in such great numbers. The men who took me in the canoe, said they had long known of these skeletons, and had often wondered how they had got there. The necessity of a theory being felt, they came to the conclusion that, like the Biscata, the mastodon was formerly a burrowing animal. In the evening we rode another stage, and crossed the Munch, another brackish stream, bearing the dregs of the washings of the Pampas. October 2nd, we passed through Corunda, which, from the luxuriance of its gardens, was one of the prettiest villages I saw. From this point to Street Fay the road is not very safe. The western side of the Paraná northward, ceases to be inhabited, and hence the Indians sometimes come down this far, and waylay travelers. The nature of the country also favors this, for instead of a grassy plain, there is an open woodland, composed of low prickly mimosas. We passed some houses, that had been ransacked and since deserted, we saw also a spectacle, which my guides viewed with high satisfaction, it was the skeleton of an Indian with the dry skin hanging on the bones, suspended to the branch of a tree. In the morning we arrived at Street Fay. I was surprised to observe how great a change of climate a difference of only three degrees of latitude between this place and Buenos Aires had caused. This was evident from the dress and complexion of the men, from the increased size of the obi trees, number of new cacti and other plants, and especially from the birds. In the course of an hour I remarked half a dozen birds, which I had never seen at Buenos Aires. Considering that there is no natural boundary between the two places, and that the character of the country is nearly similar, the difference was much greater than I should have expected. October 3rd and 4th, I was confined for these two days to my bed by a headache. A good-natured old woman, who attended me, wished me to try many odd remedies. A common practice is, to bind an orange leaf or a bit of black plaster to each temple, and to still more general plant is, to split a bean into halves, noisen them, and place one on each temple, where they will easily adhere. It is not thought proper ever to remove the beans or plaster, but to allow them to drop off, and sometimes, if a man, with patches on his head, is asked, what is the matter, he will answer, I had a headache the day before yesterday. Many of the remedies used by the people of the country are ludicrously strange, but too disgusting to be mentioned. 
One of the least nasty is to kill and cut open two puppies and bind them on each side of a broken limb. Little hairless dogs are in great request to sleep at the feet of invalids. Street Fay is a quiet little town and is kept clean and in good order. The governor, Lopez, was a common soldier at the time of the revolution, but has now been 17 years in power. The stability of government is owing to his tyrannical habits, for tyranny seems as yet better adapted to these countries than republicanism. The governor's favorite occupation is hunting Indians, a short time, since he slaughtered 48, and sold the children at the rate of 3 or 4 pounds apiece. October 5th, we crossed the Paranata Street Fay Bagida, a town on the opposite shore. The passage took some hours, as the river here consisted of a labyrinth of small streams, separated by low-wooded islands. I had a letter of introduction to an old Catalonian Spaniard, who treated me with the most uncommon hospitality. The Bagida is the capital of Entre Rios. In 1825 the town contained 6,000 inhabitants, and the province 30,000, yet, few as the inhabitants are, no province has suffered more from bloody and desperate revolutions. They boast here of representatives, ministers, a standing army, and governors, so it is no wonder that they have their revolutions. At some future day this must be one of the richest countries of La Plata. The soil is varied and productive, and its almost insular form gives it two grand lines of communication by the rivers Paranat and Uruguay. I was delayed here five days, and employed myself in examining the geology of the surrounding country, which was very interesting. We here see at the bottom of the cliffs, beds containing sharks' teeth and seashells of extinct species, passing above it to an indurated marl, and from that into the red clay earth of the pampas, with its calcareous concretions and the bones of terrestrial quadrupeds. This vertical section clearly tells us of a large bay of pure salt water, gradually encroached on, and at last converted into the bed of a muddy estuary, into which floating carcasses were swept. At Punta Gorda, in Band Oriental, I found an alternation of the Pampian estuary deposit, with the limestone containing some of the same extinct seashells, and this shows either a change in the former currents, or more probably an oscillation of level in the bottom of the ancient estuary. Until lately, my reasons for considering the Pampian formation to be an estuary deposit were, its general appearance, its position at the mouth of the existing Great River the Plata, and the presence of, so many bones of terrestrial quadrupeds, but now Professor Aaron Burt has had the kindness, to examine for me a little of the red earth, taken from low down in the deposit, close to the skeletons of the mastodon, and he finds in it many infusoria. Partly salt water and partly fresh water forms, with the latter rather preponderating, and therefore, as he remarks, the water must have been brackish. M. A. Dorbigny found on the banks of the Paraná, at the height of a hundred feet, great beds of an estuary shell, now living a hundred miles lower down near the sea, and I found similar shells at a less height on the banks of the Uruguay, this shows that just before the pampas was slowly elevated into dry land, the water covering it was brackish. Below Buenos Aires there are appraised beds of seashells of existing species, which also proves that the period of elevation of the pampas was within the recent period. In the Pampian deposit of the Bagida I found the osseous summer of a gigantic armadillo-like animal, the inside of which, when the earth was removed, was like a great cauldron. I found also teeth of the toxidon and mastodon, and one tooth of a horse, in the same stand and decayed state. This latter tooth greatly interested me, three, and I took scrupulous care in ascertaining that it had been embedded contemporaneously with the other remains, for I was not then aware that amongst the fossils from Bahia Blanca there was a horse's tooth hidden in the matrix, nor was it then known with certainty that the remains of horses are common in North America. Mr. Little has lately brought from the United States a tooth of a horse, and it is an interesting fact that Professor Owen could find in no species, either fossil or recent, a slight but peculiar curvature characterizing it, until he thought of comparing it with my specimen found here, he has named this American horse Equus curvidens. Certainly it is a marvelous fact in the history of the mammalia, that in South America a native horse should have lived and disappeared, to be succeeded in after ages by the countless herds, descended from the few introduced with the Spanish colonists. The existence in South America of a fossil horse, of the mastodon, possibly of an elephant, or, and of a hollow horned ruminant, discovered by millimeters. Lund and Glossen in the caves of Brazil, are highly interesting facts with respect to the geographical distribution of animals. At the present time, if we divide America, not by the Isthmus of Panama, but by the southern part of Mexico, 5 and latitude 20 degs, where the great table and presence an obstacle to the migration of species, by affecting the climate, and by forming, with the exception of some valleys, and of a fringe of lowland on the coast, a broad barrier, we shall then have the two zoological provinces of North and South America strongly contrasted with each other.
Some few species alone have passed the barrier, and may be considered as wanderers from the south, such as the puma, or possum, kikajou, and peccary. South America is characterized by possessing many peculiar nors, a family of monkeys, the llama, peccary, tapir, possums, and, especially, several genera of identita, the order which includes the sloths, anteaters, and armadillos. North America, on the other hand, is characterized, putting on one side a few wandering species, by numerous peculiar nors, and by four genera, the ox, sheep, goat, and antelope, the polo horned ruminants, of which great division South America is not known to possess a single species. Formerly, but within the period when most of the now existing shells were living, North America possessed, besides hollow horned ruminants, the elephant, mastodon, horse, and three genera of identita, namely, the megatherium, megalonyx, and myelodon. Within nearly the same period, as proved by the shells at Bahia Blanca, South America possessed, as we have just seen, a mastodon, horse, hollow horned ruminant, and the same three genera, as well as several others, of the identita. Hence it is evident that North and South America, in having within a late geological period these several genera in common, were much more closely related in the character of their terrestrial inhabitants than they now are. The more I reflect on this case, the more interesting it appears, I know of no other instance, where we can almost mark the period and manner of the splitting up of one great region into two well-characterized zoological provinces. The geologist, who is fully impressed with the vast oscillations of level which have affected the Earth's crust within late periods, will not fear to speculate on the recent elevation of the Mexican platform, or, more probably, on the recent submergence of land in the West Indian archipelago, as the cause of the present zoological separation of North and South America. The South American character of the West Indian mammals, 6, seems to indicate that this archipelago was formerly united to the southern continent, and that it has subsequently been an area of subsidence. When America, and especially North America, possessed its elephants, mastodons, horse, and hollow-horned ruminants, it was much more closely related in its zoological characters to the temperate parts of Europe and Asia than it now is. As the remains of these genera are found on both sides of Bering Straits, 7, and on the plains of Siberia, we are led to look to the northwestern side of North America as the former point of communication between the old and so-called New World. And as so many species, both living and extinct, of these same genera inhabit, and have inhabited the old world, it seems most probable, that the North American elephants, mastodons, horse, and hollow-horned ruminants migrated, on land since submerged near Bering Straits, from Siberia into North America, and thence, on land since submerged in the West Indies, into South America, where for a time they mingled with the forms characteristic of that southern continent, and have since become extinct. While traveling through the country, I received several vivid descriptions of the effects of a late great drought, and the account of this may throw some light on the cases where vast numbers of animals of all kinds have been embedded together. The period included between the years 1827 and 1830 is called the Grand Seco, or the Great Drought. During this time so little rain fell, that the vegetation, even to the thistles, failed, the brooks were dried up, and the whole country assumed the appearance of a dusty high road. This was especially the case in the northern part of the province of Buenos Aires and the southern part of Street Fe. Very great numbers of birds, wild animals, cattle, and horses perished from the want of food and water. A man told me that the deer, eight, used to come into his courtyard to the well, which he had been obliged to dig to supply his own family with water, and that the partridges had hardly strength to fly away when pursued. The lowest estimation of the loss of cattle in the province of Buenos Aires alone was taken at one million head. A proprietor at San Pedro had previously to these years 20,000 cattle, at the end not one remained. San Pedro is situated in the middle of the finest country, and even now abounds again with animals, yet during the latter part of the Grand Seco, live cattle were brought in vessels for the consumption of the inhabitants. The animals roamed from their estancias, and, wandering far southward, were mingled together in such multitudes, that a government commission was sent from Buenos Aires, to settle the disputes of the owners. Sir Woodbine Parish informed me of another and very curious source of dispute, the ground being so long dry such quantities of dust were blown about, that in this open country the landmarks became obliterated, and people could not tell the limits of their states. I was informed by an eyewitness, that the cattle and herds of thousands rushed into the Paraná, and being exhausted by hunger they were unable to crawl up the muddy banks, and thus were drowned. The arm of the river which runs by San Pedro was so full of putrid carcasses, that the master of a vessel told me, that the smell rendered it quite impassable. Without doubt several hundred thousand animals thus perished in the river, their bodies when putrid were seen floating down the stream, and many in all probability, were deposited in the estuary of the Plata. All the small rivers became highly saline, 
and this caused the death of vast numbers in particular spots, for when an animal drinks of such water it does not true cover. Azra describes, 9, the fury of the wild horses on a similar occasion, rushing into the marshes, those which arrived first being overwhelmed, and crushed by those which followed. He adds that more than once he has seen the carcasses of upwards of a thousand wild horses thus destroyed. I noticed that the smaller streams in the pampas were paved with the Brexit of bones but this probably is the effect of a gradual increase, rather than of the destruction at any one period. Subsequently to drought of 1827 to 1832, a very rainy season followed which caused great floods. Hence it is almost certain that some thousands of the skeletons were buried by the deposits of the very next year. What would be the opinion of a geologist, viewing such an enormous collection of bones, of all kinds of animals, and of all ages, thus embedded in one thick earthy mass? Would he not attribute it to a flood having swept over the surface of the land, rather than to the common order of things? 10. October 12th I had intended to push my excursion further, but not being quite well, I was compelled to return by a balandra, or one-masted vessel of about a hundred tons burden, which was bound to Buenos Aires. As the weather was not fair, we moored early in the day to a branch of a tree on one of the islands. The Paranat is full of islands, which undergo a constant round of decay and renovation. In the memory of the master several large ones had disappeared, and others again had been formed and protected by vegetation. They are composed of muddy sand, without even the smallest pebble, and were then about four feet above the level of the river, but during the periodical floods they are inundated. They all present one character, numerous willows and a few other trees are bound together by a great variety of creeping plants, thus forming a thick jungle. These thickets afford a retreat for capybaras and jaguars. The fear of the latter animal quite destroyed all pleasure in scrambling through the woods. This evening I had not proceeded a hundred yards, before finding indubitable signs of the recent presence of the tiger, I was obliged to come back. On every island there were tracks, and as on the former excursion El Rastro de los Indias had been the subject of conversation, so in this was El Rastro del Tigre. The wooded banks of the great rivers appear to be the favorite haunts of the jaguar, but south of the Plata, I was told, that they frequented the reeds bordering lakes, wherever they are, they seem to require water. Their common prey is the capybara, so that it is generally said, where capybaras are numerous there is little danger from the jaguar. Falconer states that near the southern side of the mouth of the Plata there are many jaguars, and that they chiefly live on fish, this account I have heard repeated. On the Paraná they have killed many woodcutters, and have even entered vessels at night. There is a man now living in the Bajada, who, coming up from below, when it was dark, was seized on the deck. He escaped, however, with the loss of the use of one arm. When the floods drive these animals from the islands, they are most dangerous. I was told, that a few years, since a very large one found its way into a church at Street Fay, two padres entering one after the other were killed, and a third, who came to see what was the matter, escaped with difficulty. The beast was destroyed, by being shot from the corner of the building which was unroofed. They commit also at these times great ravages among cattle and horses. It is said, that they kill their prey by breaking their necks. If driven from the carcass, they seldom return to it. The cauchos say that the jaguar, when wandering about at night, is much tormented by the foxes yelping as they follow him. This is a curious coincidence with the fact, which is generally affirmed of the jackals accompanying, in a similarly officious manner, the East Indian tiger. The jaguar is a noisy animal, roaring much by night, and especially before bad weather. One day, when hunting on the banks of the Uruguay, I was shown certain trees, to which these animals constantly recur for the purpose, as it is said, of sharpening their claws. I saw three well-known trees, in front, the bark was worn smooth, as if by the breast of the animal, and on each side there were deep scratches, or rather grooves, extending in an oblique line, nearly a yard in length. The scars were of different ages. A common method of ascertaining whether a jaguar is in the neighborhood is to examine these trees. I imagine this habit of the jaguar is exactly similar to one which may any day be seen in the common cat, as with outstretched legs and exerted claws it scrapes the leg of a chair, and I have heard of young fruit trees in an orchard in England, having been thus much injured. Some such habit must also be common to the puma, for on the bare hard soil of Patagonia I have frequently seen scores, so deep that no other animal could have made them. The object of this practice is, I believe, to tear off the ragged points of their claws, and not, as the gauchos think, to sharpen them. The jaguar is killed, without much difficulty, by the aid of dogs baying and driving him up a tree, where he is dispatched with bullets. Owing to bad weather we remained two days at our moorings. Our only amusement was catching fish for our dinner, there were several kinds, and all good eating. A fish called the Armadonacillaris is remarkable from a harsh grating noise which it makes when caught by hook and line, and which can be distinctly heard when the fish is beneath the water.
This same fish has the power of firmly catching hold of any object, such as the blade of an oar or the fishing line, with the strong spine both of its pectoral and dorsal fin. In the evening the weather was quite tropical, the thermometer standing at 79 eggs. Numbers of fireflies were hovering about, and the mosquitoes were very troublesome. I exposed my hand for five minutes, and it was soon black with them. I do not suppose there could have been less than 50, all busy sucking. October 15th, we got underway, and passed Punta Gorda, where there is a colony of tame Indians from the province of Missions. We sailed rapidly down the current, but before sunset, from a silly fear of bad weather, we brought to in a narrow arm of the river. I took the boat, and rowed some distance up this creek. It was very narrow, winding, and deep, on each side a wall thirty or forty feet high, formed by trees entwined with creepers, gave to the canal a singularly gloomy appearance. I here saw a very extraordinary bird, called the Cicer beak, Rhinchops nigra. It has short legs, webbed feet, extremely long pointed wings, and is of about the size of a tern. The beak is flattened laterally, that is, in a plane at right angles to that of a spoonbill or duck. It is as flat and elastic as an ivory paper cutter, and the lower mandible, differing from every other bird, is an inch and a half longer than the upper. Then a lake near Maldonado, from which the water had been nearly drained, and which, in consequence, swarmed with small fry, I saw several of these birds, generally in small flocks, flying rapidly backwards and forwards close to the surface of the lake. They kept their bills wide open, and the lower mandible half buried in the water. Thus scheming the surface, they plotted in their course, the water was quite smooth, and it formed a most curious spectacle to behold a flock, each bird leaving its narrow wake on the mirror-like surface. In their flight they frequently whisk about with extreme quickness, and dexterously manage with their projecting lower mandible to plot up small fish, which are secured by the upper and shorter half of their scissor-like, picture bills. This fact I repeatedly saw, as, like swallows, they continue to fly backwards and forwards close before me. Occasionally when leaving the surface of the water their flight was wild, irregular, and rapid, they then uttered loud harsh cries. When these birds are fishing, the advantage of the long primary feathers of their wings, in keeping them dry, is very evident. When thus employed, their forms resemble the symbol by which many artists represent marine birds. Their tails are much used, in steering their irregular course. These birds are common far inland along the course of the Rio Paraná, it is said, that they remain here during the whole year, and breed in the marshes. During the day they rest in flocks on the grassy plains at some distance from the water. Being a tanker, as I have said, in one of the deep creeks between the islands of the Paraná, as the evening grew to a close, one of these sisorbics suddenly appeared. The water was quite still, and many little fish were rising. The bird continued for a long time to scheme the surface, flying in its wild and irregular manner up and down the narrow canal, now dark with the growing night and the shadows of the overhanging trees. At Montevideo, I observed that some large flocks during the day remained on the mud banks at the head of the harbor, in the same manner as on the grassy plains near the Paraná, and every evening they took flights seaward. From these facts I suspect that the Rhinchops generally fishes by night, at which time many of the lower animals come most abundantly to the surface. M. Lesson states that he has seen these birds opening the shells of the mech tree buried in the sand banks on the coast of Chile, from their weak bills, with the lower mandible so much projecting, their short legs and long wings, it is very improbable that this can be a general habit. In our course down the Paraná, I observed only three other birds, whose habits are worth mentioning. One is a small kingfisher, Sarail americana, it has a longer tail than the European species, and hence does not sit in so stiff and upright a position. Its flight also, instead of being direct and rapid, like the course of an arrow, is weak and undulatory, as among the soft-billed birds. It utters a low note, like the clicking together of two small stones. A small green parrot, Canurus murinus, with a grey breast, appears to prefer the dull trees on the islands to any other situation for its building place. A number of nests are placed so close together as to form one great mass of sticks. These parrots always live in flocks, and commit great ravages on the cornfields. I was told that near a colonia 2500 were killed in the course of one year. A bird with a forked tail, terminated by two long feathers, Tyrannus savanna, and named by the Spaniard scissor tail, is very common near Buenos Aires. It commonly sits on a branch of the Abu underscore tree, near a house, and then stakes a short flight in pursuit of insects, and returns to the same spot. When on the wing it presents in its manner of flight and general appearance a caricature likeness of the common swallow. It is the power of turning very shortly in the air, and in so doing opens and shuts its tail, sometimes in a horizontal or lateral, and sometimes in a vertical direction, just like a pair of scissors. October 16th, 
Simile Explorazario, the western shore of the Paraná is pounded by perpendicular cliffs, which extend in a long line to below San Nicolas, hence it more resembles a sea coast than that of a freshwater river. It is a great drawback to the scenery of the Paraná, that, from the soft nature of its banks, the water is very muddy. The Uruguay, flowing through a granitic country, is much clearer, and where the two channels unite at the head of the Plata, the waters may for a long distance be distinguished by their black and red colors. In the evening, the wind being not quite fair, as usual we immediately moored, and the next day, as it blew rather freshly, though with a favoring current, the master was much too indolent to think of starting. At Bajada, he was described to me as hombre muy aflicto a man always miserable to get on, but certainly he bore all delays with admirable resignation. He was an old Spaniard, and had been many years in this country. He professed a great liking to the English, but stoutly maintained that the Battle of Trafalgar was merely won by the Spanish captains having been all bought over, and that the only really gallant action on either side was performed by the Spanish admiral. It struck me as rather characteristic that this man should prefer his countrymen being thought the worst of traitors, rather than unskillful or cowardly 18th and 19th. We continued slowly to sail down the noble stream. The current helped us but little. We met, during our descent, very few vessels. One of the best gifts of nature, in so grand a channel of communication, seems here willfully thrown away, a river in which ships might navigate from a temperate country, as surprisingly abundant in certain productions as destitute of others, to another possessing a tropical climate, and to soil which, according to the best of judges, M. Bond planned, is perhaps unequaled in fertility in any part of the world. How different would have been the aspect of this river, if English colonists had by good fortune first sailed up the Plata? What noble towns would now have occupied its shores? Till the death of Francia, the dictator of Paraguay, these two countries must remain distinct, as if placed on opposite sides of the globe. And when the old bloody-minded tyrant is gone to his long account, Paraguay will be torn by revolutions, violent in proportion to the previous unnatural calm. That country will have to learn, like every other South American state, that a republic cannot succeed till it contains a certain body of men imbued with the principles of justice and honor. October 20th being arrived at the mouth of the Paraná, and as I was very anxious to reach the Buenos Aires, I went on shore at Las Conchas, with the intention of riding there. Upon landing, I found to my great surprise, that I was to a certain degree a prisoner. A violent revolution having broken out, all the ports were laid under an embargo. I could not return to my vessel, and as for going by land to the city, it was out of the question. After a long conversation with the commandant, I obtained permission to go the next day to General Roller, who commanded a division of the rebels on this side the capital. In the morning I rode to the encampment. The general, officers, and soldiers, all appeared, and I believe really were, great villains. The general, the very evening, before he left the city, voluntarily went to the governor, and with his hand to his heart, pledged his word of honor, that he at least would remain faithful to the last. The general told me that the city was in a state of close blockade, and that all he could do was to give me a passport to the commander-in-chief of the rebels at Quilms. We had therefore to take a great sweep round the city, and it was with much difficulty that we procured horses. My reception at the encampment was quite civil, but I was told it was impossible that I could be allowed to enter the city. I was very anxious about this, as I anticipated the Beagle's departure from the Rio plot earlier than it took place. Having mentioned, however, General Rosas's obliging kindness to me when at the Colorado, magic itself could not have altered circumstances quicker than did this conversation. I was instantly told that, though they could not give me a passport, if I chose to leave my kind and horses, I might pass their sentinels. I was too glad to accept of this, and an officer was sent with me to give directions that I should not be stopped at the bridge. The road for the space of a league was quite deserted. I met one party of soldiers who were satisfied by gravely looking at an old passport, and at length I was not a little pleased to find myself within the city. This revolution was supported by scarcely any pretext of grievances, but in a state which, in the course of nine months, from February to October, 1820, underwent fifteen changes in its government each governor, according to the Constitution, being elected for three years it would be very unreasonable to ask for pretexts. In this case, a party of men who, being attached to Rosas, were disgusted with the governor Balcars to the number of seventy left the city, and with the cry of Rosas the whole country took arms. The city was then blockaded, no provisions, cattle or horses, were allowed to enter, besides this, there was only a little skirmishing, and a few men daily killed. The outside party well knew that, by stopping the supply of meat they would certainly be victorious. General Rosas could not have known of this rising, but it appears to be quite consonant with the plans of his party. A year ago he was elected governor, 
but he refused it, unless the Sala would also confer on him extraordinary powers. This was refused, and since then his party have shown that no other governor can keep his place. The warfare on both sides was evidently protracted till it was possible to hear from Rosas. A note arrived a few days after I left Buenos Aires, which stated that the general disapproved of peace having been broken, but that he thought the outside party had justice on their side. On the bare reception of this, the governor, ministers, and part of the military, to the number of some hundreds, fled from the city. The rebels entered, elected a new governor, and were paid for their services to the number of 5,500 men. From these proceedings, it was clear that Rosas ultimately would become the dictator to the term king. The people in this, as in other republics, have a particular dislike. Since leaving South America, we have heard that Rosas has been elected with powers and for a time altogether opposed to the constitutional principles of the republic. Having been delayed for nearly a fortnight in the city, I was glad to escape on board a packet bound for Montevideo. A town in a state of blockade must always be a disagreeable place of residence, in this case moreover there were constant apprehensions from robbers within. The sentinels were the worst of all, for, from their office, and from having arms in their hands, they robbed with the degree of authority which other men could not imitate. Our passage was a very long and tedious one. The plot looks like a noble estuary on the map, but is in truth a poor affair. A wide expanse of muddy water has neither grandeur nor beauty. At one time of the day, the two shores, both of which are extremely low, could just be distinguished from the deck. On arriving at Monte Video I found that the Beagle would not sail for some time, so I prepared for a short excursion in this part of Banton Oriental. Everything which I have said about the country near Maldonado is applicable to Monte Video, but the land, with the one exception of the Green Mount 450 feet high, from which it takes its name, is far more level. Very little of the undulating grassy plain is enclosed, but near the town there are a few hedge banks, covered with agaves, cacti, and fennel. November 14th, we left Montevideo in the afternoon. I intended to proceed to Colonia del Sacramento, situated on the northern bank of the Plata and opposite to Buenos Aires, and thence, following up the Uruguay, to the village of Mercedes on the Rio Negro, one of the many rivers of this name in South America, and from this point, to return direct to Montevideo. We slept at the house of my guide at Canalones. In the morning we rose early, in the hopes of being able to ride a good distance, but it was a vain attempt, for all the rivers were flooded. We passed in boats the streams of Canalones, St. Lucia, and San Jose, and thus lost much time. On a former excursion I crossed the Lucia near its mouth, and I was surprised to observe how easily our horses, although not used to swim, passed over a width of at least 600 yards. On mentioning this at Monte Video, I was told that a vessel containing some mountebanks and their horses, being wrecked in the Plata, one horse swam seven miles to the shore. In the course of the day I was amused by the dexterity with which a gaucho forced a restive horse to swim river. He stripped off his clothes, and jumping on its back, rode into the water till it was out of its depth, then slipping off over the crupper, he caught hold of the tail, and as often as the horse turned drowned the man frightened it back, by splashing water on its face. As soon as the horse touched the bottom on the other side, the man pulled himself on, and was firmly seated, bridle in hand, before the horse gained the bank. A naked man on a naked horse is a fine spectacle, I had no idea how well the two animals suited each other. The tail of a horse is a very useful appendage, I'd have passed a river in a boat with four people in it, which was ferried across in the same way as the gaucho. If a man and horse have to cross a broad river, the best plan is for the man to catch hold of the pommel or mane and help himself with the other arm. We slept and stayed the following day at the post of cover. In the evening the postman or letter carrier arrived. He was a day after his time, owing to the Rio Rosario being flooded. It would not, however, be of much consequence, for, although he had passed through some of the principal towns in Bent Oriental, his luggage consisted of two letters. The view from the house was pleasing, an undulating green surface, with distant glimpses of the Plata. I find that I look at this province with very different eyes from what I did upon my first arrival. I recollect I then thought it singularly level, but now, after galloping over the Pampas, my only surprise is what could have induced me ever to call it level. The country is a series of undulations, in themselves perhaps not absolutely great, but, as compared to the plains of Street Fay, real mountains. From these inequalities there is an abundance of small rivulets, and the turf is green and luxuriant. November 17th, we crossed the Rosario, which was deep and rapid, and passing the village of Cala, arrived at midday at Colonia del Sacramento. The distance is 20 leagues, through a country covered with fine grass, but purely stocked with the cattle or inhabitants. I was invited to sleep at Colonia, and to accompany on the following day a gentleman to his estancia, where there were some limestone rocks. 
The town is built on a stony promontory something in the same manner as at Monte Video. It is strongly fortified, but both fortifications and town suffered much in the Brazilian War. It is very ancient, and the irregularity of the streets, and the surrounding groves of old orange and peach trees, give it a pretty appearance. The church is a curious ruin, it was used as a powder magazine, and was struck by lightning in one of the 10,000 thunderstorms of the Rio Plata. Two-thirds of the building were blown away to the very foundation, and the rest stands a shattered and curious monument of the United Powers of lightning and gunpowder. In the evening I wandered about the half-demolished walls of the town. It was the chief seat of the Brazilian War, a war most injurious to this country, not so much in its immediate effects, as in being the origin of a multitude of generals and all other grades of officers. More generals are numbered, but not paid, in the United Provinces of La Plata than in the United Kingdom of Great Britain. These gentlemen have learned to like power, and do not object to a little skirmishing. Hence there are many always on the watch, to create disturbance and to overturn a government which as yet has never rested on any stable foundation. I noticed, however, both here and in other places, a very general interest in the ensuing election for the president, and this appears a good sign for the prosperity of this little country. The inhabitants do not require much education in their representatives, I heard some men discussing the merits of those for Colonia, and it was said that, although they were not men of business, they could all sign their names, with this they seemed to think every reasonable man ought to be satisfied 18th road with my host to his estancia, at the Arroyo de San Juan. In the evening we took a ride round the estate, it contained two square leagues and a half, and was situated in what is called a rincon, that is, one side was fronted by the plata, and the two others guarded by impassable brooks. There was an excellent port for little vessels, and an abundance of small wood, which is valuable as supplying fuel to Buenos Aires. I was curious to know the value of so complete an estancia. Of cattle there were 3,000, and it would well support three or four times that number, of mares 800, together with 150 broken-in horses, and 600 sheep. There was plenty of water and limestone, a rough house, excellent corrals, and a peach orchard. For all this, he had been offered 2,000 pounds, and he only wanted 500 pounds additional, and probably would sell it for less. The chief trouble with an estancia is driving the cattle twice a week to a central spot, in order to make them tame, and to count them. This latter operation would be thought difficult, where there are 10 or 15,000 head together. It is managed on the principle that the cattle invariably divide themselves into little troops up from 40 to 100. Each troop is recognized by a few peculiarly marked animals, and its number is known, so that, one being lost out of 10,000, it is perceived by its absence from one of the tripillus. During a stormy night the cattle all mingle together, but the next morning the tripillus separate as before, so that each animal must know its fellow out of 10,000 others. On two occasions I met within this province some oxen of a very curious breed, called Nata or Nida. They appear externally to hold nearly the same relation to other cattle, which below are pot dogs to other dogs. Therefore it is very short and broad, with the nasal end turned up, and the upper lip much drawn back, their lower jaws project beyond the upper, and have a corresponding upward curve, hence their teeth are always exposed. Their nostrils are seated high up, and are very open, their eyes project outwards. When walking they carry their heads low, on a short neck, and their hinder legs are rather longer compared with the front legs than is usual. Their bare teeth, their short heads, and upturned nostrils give them the most ludicrous self-confident air of defiance imaginable. Since my return, I have procured a skeleton head, through the kindness of my friend Captain Sullivan, R.N., which is now deposited in the College of Surgeons, one, Don F. Muniz, of Luxon, has kindly collected for me all the information which he could respecting this breed. From his account it seems that about 80 or 90 years ago, they were rare, and kept as curiosities at Buenos Aires. The breed is universally believed to have originated amongst the Indians southward of the Plata, and that it was with them the commonest kind. Even to this day, those reared in the provinces near the Plata, show their less civilized origin, in being fiercer than common cattle, and in the cow easily deserting her first calf, if visited too often or molested. It is a singular fact, that an almost similar structure to the abnormal, too, one of the Nyota breed, characterizes, as I'm informed by Dr. Falconer, that great extinct ruminant of India, the Savitherium. The breed is very, true, and a Nyota bull and cow invariably produce Nyota calves. A Nyota bull with a common cow, or the reverse cross, produces offspring having an intermediate character, but with the Nyota characters strongly displayed, according to Senor Muniz, there is the clearest evidence, contrary to the common belief of agriculturists in analogous cases, that the Nyota cow when crossed with the common bull transmits her peculiarities more strongly than the Nyota bull when crossed with the common cow.
When the pasture is tolerably long, the Naida cattle feed with the tongue and palate as well as common cattle, but during the great droughts, when so many animals perish, the Naida breed is under a great disadvantage, and would be exterminated, if not attended to, for the common cattle, like horses, are able just to keep alive, by browsing with their lips on twigs of trees and reeds, this the Naidas cannot so well do, as their lips do not join, and hence they are found to perish before the common cattle. This strikes me as a good illustration of how little we are able to judge from the ordinary habits of life, on what circumstances, occurring only at long intervals, the rarity or extinction of a species may be determined. November 19th, passing the valley of Las Vacas, we slept at a house of a North American, who worked a lime kiln on the Arroyo de Los Bavores. In the morning we rode to a protecting headland on the banks of the river, called Punta Gorda. On the way we tried to find a jaguar. There were plenty of fresh tracks, and we visited the trees, on which they are said to sharpen their claws, but we did not succeed in disturbing one. From this point the Rio Uruguay presented to our view a noble volume of water. From the clearness and rapidity of the stream, its appearance was far superior to that of its neighbor the Paraná. On the opposite coast, several branches from the latter river entered the Uruguay. As the sun was shining, the two colors of the waters could be seen quite distinct. In the evening we proceeded on our road towards Mercedes on the Rio Negro. At night we asked permission to sleep at an estancia at which we happened to arrive. It was a very large estate, being ten leagues square, and the owner is one of the greatest landowners in the country. His nephew had charge of it, and with him there was a captain in the army, who the other day ran away from Buenos Aires. Considering their station, their conversation was rather amusing. They expressed, as was usual, unbounded astonishment at the globe being round, and could scarcely credit that a hole would, if deep enough, come out on the other side. They had, however, heard of a country where there were six months of light and six of darkness, and where the inhabitants were very tall and thin. They were curious about the price and condition of horses and cattle in England. Upon finding out we did not catch our animals with the lasso, they cried out, Ah, then, you use nothing but the bolas. The idea of an enclosed country was quite new to them. The captain at last said, he had one question to ask me, which he should be very much obliged, if I would answer with all truth. I trouble to think how deeply scientific it would be, it was, whether the ladies of Buenos Aires were not the handsomest in the world. I replied, like a renegade, charmingly so. He added, I have one other question, do ladies in any other part of the world wear such large combs? I solemnly assured him, that they did not. They were absolutely delighted. The captain exclaimed, look there, a man who has seen half the world says it is the case, we always thought so, but now we know it. My excellent judgment in combs and beauty procured me a most hospitable reception. The captain forced me to take his bed, and he would sleep on his recado when he first started at sunrise, and rode slowly during the whole day. The geological nature of this part of the province was different from the rest, and closely resembled that of the Pampas. In consequence, there were immense beds of the thistle, as well as of the cardoon. The whole country, indeed, may be called one great bed of these plants. The two sorts grow separate, each plant in company with its own kind. The cardoon is as high as a horse's back, but the pampas thistle is often higher than the crown of the rider's head. To leave the road for a yard is out of the question, and the road itself is partly, and in some cases entirely closed. Pasture, of course there is none, if cattle or horses once enter the bed, they are for the time completely lost. Hence it is very hazardous to attempt to drive cattle at this season of the year, for when jaded enough to face the thistles, they rush among them, and are seen no more. In these districts there are very few estancias, and these few are situated in the neighborhood of damp valleys, where fortunately neither of these overwhelming plants can exist. As night came on before we arrived at our journey's end, we slept at a miserable little hovel inhabited by the purest people. The extreme though rather formal courtesy of our host and hostess, considering their grade of life, was quite delightful. November 22nd, arrived at an estancia on the Brequello belonging to a very hospitable Englishman, to whom I had a letter of introduction from my friend Mr. Lum. I stayed here three days. One morning I rode with my host to the Sierra del Prado Flaco, about 20 miles up the Rio Negro. Nearly the whole country was covered with good though coarse grass, which was as high as a horse's belly, yet there were square leagues without a single head of cattle. The province of Band Oriental, if well stocked, would support an astonishing number of animals, at present the annual export of hides from Monte Video amounts to 300,000, and the home consumption, from waste, is very considerable. And Aston Ciro told me, that he often had to send large herds of cattle a long journey to a salting establishment, and that the tire beasts were frequently obliged to be killed and skinned, but that he could never persuade the gauchos to eat of them, and every evening a fresh beast was slaughtered for their suppers. 
The view of the Rio Negro from the Sierra was more picturesque than any other which I saw in this province. The river, broad, deep, and rapid, wound at the foot of a rocky precipitous cliff, a belt of wood followed its course, and the horizon terminated in the distant undulations of the turf plain. When in this neighborhood, I several times heard of the Sierra de las Cuntas, a hill distant many miles to the northward. The name signifies Hill of Beads. I was assured that vast numbers of little round stones, of various colors, each with a small cylindrical hole, are found there. Formerly the Indians used to collect them, for the purpose of making necklaces and bracelets of taste, I may observe, which is common to all savage nations, as well as to the most polished. I did not know what to understand from this story, but upon mentioning it at the Cape of Good Hope to Dr. Andrew Smith, he told me that he recollected finding on the southeastern coast of Africa, about 100 miles to the eastward of St. John's River, some quartz crystals with their edges blunted from attrition and mixed with gravel on the sea beach. Each crystal was about five lines in diameter and from an inch to an inch and a half in length. Many of them had a small canal extending from one extremity to the other, perfectly cylindrical, and of a size that readily admitted a coarse thread or a piece of fine catgut. Their color was red or dull white. The natives were acquainted with this structure and crystals. I have mentioned these circumstances because, although no crystallized body is at present known to assume this form, it may lead some future traveler to investigate the real nature of such stones. While staying at this estancia, I was amused with what I saw and heard of the shepherd dogs of the country. 3. When riding, it is a common thing to meet a large flock of sheep guarded by one or two dogs at the distance of some miles from any house or man. I often wondered how so firm a friendship had been established. The method of education consists in separating the puppy, while very young, from the bitch, and in accustoming it to its future companions. N.U. is held three or four times a day for the little thing to suck, and a nest of wool is made for it in the sheep pen, at no time is it allowed to associate with other dogs, or with the children of the family. The puppy is, moreover, generally castrated, so that, when grown up, it can scarcely have any feelings in common with the rest of its kind. From this education it has no wish to leave the flock, and just as another dog will defend its master, man, so will these the sheep. It is amusing to observe, when approaching a flock, how the dog immediately advances barking, and the sheep are close in his rear, as if round the oldest ram. These dogs are also easily taught to bring home the flock, at a certain hour in the evening. Their most troublesome fault, when young, is their desire of playing with the sheep, for in their sport they sometimes gallop their poor subjects most unmercifully. The shepherd dog comes to the house every day for some meat, and as soon as it is given him, he skulks away, as if ashamed of himself. On these occasions the house dogs are very tyrannical, and the least of them will attack and pursue the stranger. The minute, however, the latter has reached the flock, he turns round, and begins to bark, and then all the house dogs take very quickly to their heels. In a similar manner a whole pack of the hungry wild dogs will scarcely ever, and I was told by some never venture to attack a flock guarded by even one of these faithful shepherds. The whole account appears to me a curious instance of the pliability of the affections in the dog, and yet, whether wild or however educated, he has a feeling of respect or fear for those that are fulfilling their instinct of association. For we can understand on no principle the wild dogs being driven away by the single one with its flock, except that they consider, from some confused notion, that the one thus associated gains power, as if in company with its own kind. F. Q. Veer has observed that all animals that readily enter into domestication consider man as a member of their own society and thus fulfill their instinct of association. In the above case the shepherd dog ranks the sheep as its fellow brethren and thus gains confidence and the wild dogs, though knowing that the individual sheep are not dogs but are good to eat, yet partly consent to this view when seeing them in a flock with the shepherd dog at their head. One evening a domitor a subduer of horses came for the purpose of breaking in some colts. I will describe the preparatory steps, for I believe they have not been mentioned by other travelers. A troop of wild young horses is driven into the corral, or large enclosure of stakes, and the door is shut. We will suppose that one man alone has to catch and mount a horse, which as yet had never felt bridle or saddle. I conceive, except by a gaucho, such a feat would be utterly impracticable. The gaucho picks out a full-grown colt, and as the beast rushes round the circus he throws his lasso, so as to catch both the front legs. Instantly the horse rolls over with a heavy shock, and whilst struggling on the ground, the gaucho, holding the lasso tight, makes a circle, so as to catch one of the hind legs just beneath the fetlock, and draws it close to the two front legs, he then hitches the lasso, so that the three are bound together. Then sitting on the horse's neck, he fixes a strong bridle, without a bit, to the lower jaw, 
This he does by passing a narrow thong through the eye holes at the end of the reins, and several times round both joint tongue. The two front legs are now tied closely together with a strong leathered thong, fastened by a slip knot. The lasso, which bound the three together, being then loosed, the horse rises with difficulty. The poucho now holding fast the bridle fixed to the lower jaw, leads the horse outside the corral. If a second man is present, otherwise the trouble is much greater, he holds the animal's head, whilst the first puts on the horse cliffs and saddle, and girths the whole together. During this operation, the horse, from dread and astonishment at thus being bound round the waist, throws himself over, and over again on the ground, and, till beaten, is unwilling to rise. At last, when the saddling is finished, the poor animal can hardly breathe from fear, and is white with foam and sweat. The man now prepares to mount, by pressing heavily on the stirrup, so that the horse may not lose its balance, and at the moment, that he throws his leg over the animal's back, he pulls the slip knot binding the front legs, and the beast is free. Some dometers pull the knot, while the animal is lying on the ground, and, standing over the saddle, allow him to rise beneath them. The horse, walled with dread, gives a few most violent pounds, and then starts off at full gallop, when quite exhausted, the man, by patience, brings him back to the corral, where, reeking hot and scarcely alive, the poor beast is left free. Those animals which will not gallop away, but obstinately throw themselves on the ground, are by far the most troublesome. This process is tremendously severe, but in two or three trials the horse is tamed. It is not, however for some weeks, that the animal is ridden with the iron bit and solid ring for it must learn to associate the will of its rider with the fill of the rein, before the most powerful bridle can be of any service. Animals are so abundant in these countries, that humanity and self-interest are not closely united, therefore I fear it is, that the former is here scarcely known. One day, riding in the pampas with the very respectable Estancero, my horse, being tired, lagged behind. The man often shouted to me to spur him. When I remonstrated, that it was a pity, for the horse was quite exhausted, he cried out, why not, never mind spur him, it is my horse. I had then some difficulty in making him comprehend, that it was for the horse's sake, and not on his account, that I did not choose to use my spurs. He exclaimed, with a look of great surprise, ah, Don Carlos, Cucosa. It was clear that such an idea had never before entered his head. The cauchos are well known to be perfect riders the idea of being thrown, let the horse do what it likes, never enters their head. Their criterion of a good rider is, a man who can manage an untamed colt, or who, if his horse falls, alights on his own feet, or can perform other such exploits. I have heard of a man betting, that he would throw his horse down twenty times, and that nineteen times he would not fall himself. I recollect seeing a coucho riding a very stubborn horse, which three times successively reared so high as to fall backwards with great violence. The man judged with uncommon coolness the proper moment for slipping off, not an instant before, or after the right time, and as soon as the horse got up, the man jumped on his back, and at last they started at a gallop. The caucho never appears to exert any muscular force. I was one day watching a good rider, as we were galloping along at a rapid pace, and thought to myself, surely if the horse starts, you appear so careless on your seat, you must fall. At this moment, a male ostrich sprang from its nest right beneath the horse's nose, the young colt bounded on one side like a stag, but as for the man, all that could be said was, that he started, and took fright with his horse. In Chile and Peru more pains are taken with the mouth of the horse than in La Plata, and this is evidently a consequence of the more intricate nature of the country. In Chile a horse is not considered perfectly broken, till he can be brought up standing, in the midst of his full speed, on any particular spot, for instance, on a cloak thrown on the ground, or, again, he will charge a wall, and rearing, scrape the surface with his hoofs. I have seen an animal bounding with spirit, yet merely reined by a forefinger and thumb, taken at full gallop across a courtyard, and then made to wheel around the post of a veranda with great speed, but at so equal a distance, that the rider, with outstretched arm, all the while kept one finger rubbing the post, then making a demi-volt in the air, with the other arm outstretched in a like manner, he will drown, with astonishing force, in an opposite direction. Such a horse is well broken, and although this at first may appear useless, it is far otherwise. It is only carrying, that which is daily necessary into perfection. When a bullock is checked and caught by the lasso, it will sometimes gallop round and round in a circle, and the horse being alarmed at the great strain, if not well broken, will not readily turn like the pivot of a wheel. In consequence many men have been killed, for if the lasso once takes a twist round a man's body, it will instantly, from the power of the two opposed animals, almost cut him and wane. On the same principle the races are managed, the course is only two or three hundred yards long, the wish being to have horses, that can make a rapid dash.
The racehorses are trained, not only to stand with their hoofs touching a line, but to draw all four feet together, so as at the first spring, to bring it to play the full action of the hindquarters. In Chile I was told an anecdote, which I believe was true, and it offers a good illustration of the use of a well-broken animal. A respectable man riding one day met two others, one of whom was mounted on a horse, which he knew to have been stolen from himself. He challenged them, they answered him by drawing their sabers and giving chase. The man, on his good and fleet beast, kept just ahead, as he passed a thick bush he wheeled round it, and brought up his horse to a dead check. The pursuers were obliged to shoot on one side and ahead. Then instantly dashing on, right behind them, he buried his knife in the back of one, wounded the other, recovered his horse from the dying robber, and rode home. For these feats of horsemanship two things are necessary, a most severe bit, like the mameluke, the power of which, though seldom used, the horse knows full well, and large blunt spurs, that can be applied either as a mere touch, or as an instrument of extreme pain. I conceive that with English spurs the slightest touch of which pricks the skin, it would be impossible to break in a horse after the South American fashion at an estancia near Las Vacas large numbers of mares are weakly slaughtered, for the sake of their hides, although worth only five paper dollars, or about half a crown apiece. It seems at first strange, that it can answer to kill mares for such a trifle, but as it is thought ridiculous in this country ever to break in, or ride a mare, they are of no value except for breeding. The only thing for which I ever saw mares used, was to tread out wheat from the ear, for which purpose they were driven round a circular enclosure, where the wheat cheese were strewed. The man employed for slaughtering the mares happened to be celebrated for his dexterity with the lasso. Standing at the distance of twelve yards from the mouth of the corral, he has laid a wager, that he would catch by the legs every animal, without missing one, as it rushed past him. There was another man who said he would enter the corral on foot, catch a mare, fasten her front legs together, drive her out, throw her down, kill, skin, and stake the hide for drying, which latter is a tedious job, and he engaged, that he would perform this whole operation on twenty-two animals in one day. Or he would kill and take the skin off fifty in the same time. This would have been a prodigious task, for it is considered a good day's work to skin, and stake the hides of fifteen or sixteen animals. November 26, I set out on my return in a direct line for Monte Video. Having heard of some giant's bones at a neighboring farmhouse on the Sarandas, a small stream entering the Rio Negro, I rode there accompanied by my host, and purchased for the value of eighteen pence the head of the toxidin, or, when found it was quite perfect, but the boys knocked out some of the teeth with stones, and then set up the head as a mark to throw at. By a most fortunate chance I found a perfect tooth, which exactly fitted one of the sockets in this skull, embedded by itself on the banks of the Rio Tercero, at the distance of about 180 miles from this place. I found remains of this extraordinary animal at two other places, so that it must formerly have been common. I found here, also, some large portions of the armor of a gigantic armadillo-like animal, and part of the great head of a myelodon. The bones of this head are so fresh, that they contain, according to the analysis by Mr. T. Reeks, 7% of animal matter, and when placed in a spiral lamp, they burn with a small flame. The number of the remains embedded in the Grand Estuary deposit which forms the pampas and covers the granitic rocks of Band Oriental, must be extraordinarily great. I believe a straight line drawn in any direction through the pampas would cut through some skeleton or bones. Besides those which I found during my short excursions, I heard of many others, and the origin of such names as the stream of the animal, the hill of the giant, is obvious. At other times I heard of the marvelous property of certain rivers, which had the power of changing small bones into large, or, as some maintained, the bones themselves grew. As far as I'm aware, not one of these animals perished, as was formerly supposed, in the marshes or muddy river beds of the present land, but their bones have been exposed by the streams intersecting the subaqueous deposit in which they were originally embedded. We may conclude, that the whole area of the pampas is one wide sepulcher of these extinct gigantic quadrupeds. By the middle of the day, on the 28th, we arrived at Monte Video, having been two days and a half on the road. The country for the whole way was of a very uniform character, some parts being rather more rocky and hilly than near the Plata. Not far from Monte Video we passed through the village of Las Petras, so named from some large rounded masses of Sinite. Its appearance was rather pretty. In this country a few fig trees round a group of houses, and to side elevated a hundred feet above the general level, ought always to be called picturesque. During the last six months I have had an opportunity of seeing a little of the character of the inhabitants of these provinces. The gauchos, or countrywomen, are very superior to those who reside in the towns. The gaucho is invariably most obliging, polite, and hospitable. I did not meet with even one instance of rudeness or inhospitality. He is modest, both respecting himself and country, but at the same time a spirited, bold fellow. 
On the other hand, many robberies are committed, and there is much bloodshed, the habit of constantly wearing the knife is the chief cause of the latter. It is lamentable to hear how many lives are lost in trifling quarrels. In fighting, each party tries to mark the face of his adversary, by slashing his nose or eyes, as is often attested by deep and horrid-looking scars. Robberies are a natural consequence of universal gambling, much tricking, and extreme indolence. At Mercedes I asked two men, why they did not work. One gravely said the days were too long, the other that he was too poor. The number of horses and the profusion of food are the destruction of all industry. Moreover, there are so many feast days, and again, nothing can succeed without it be begun, when the moon is on the increase, so that half the month is lost from these two causes. Police and justice are quite inefficient. If a man who is poor commits murder and is taken, he will be imprisoned, and perhaps even shot, but if he is rich and has friends, he may rely on it no very severe consequence will ensue. It is curious, that the most respectable inhabitants of the country invariably assist a murderer to escape, they seem to think, that the individual sins against the government, and not against the people. A traveler has no protection besides his firearms, and the constant habit of carrying them is the main check to more frequent robberies. The character of the higher and more educated classes who reside in the towns, partakes, but perhaps in a lesser degree, of the good parts of the gaucho, but is, I fear, stained by many vices of which he is free. Sensuality, mockery of all religion, and the grossest corruption, are far from uncommon. Nearly every public officer can be bribed. The headman in the post office sold forged government francs. The governor and prime minister openly combined to plunder the state. Justice, where gold came into play, was hardly expected by anyone. I knew an Englishman, who went to the chief justice, he told me, that not then understanding the ways of the place, he trembled as he entered the room, and said, Sir, I have come to offer you two hundred, paper, dollars, value about five pounds sterling, if you will arrest before a certain time a man who has cheated me. I know it is against the law, but my lawyer, naming him, recommended me to take this step. The chief justice smiled acquiescence, thanked him, and the man before night was safe in prison. With this entire want of principle in many of the leading men, with the country full of ill-paid turbulent officers, the people yet hope that a democratic form of government can succeed. On first entering society in these countries, two or three features strike one as particularly remarkable. The polite and dignified manners pervading every rank of life, the excellent taste displayed by the women in their dresses, and the equality amongst all ranks. At the Rio Colorado some men who kept the humblest shops used to dine with the General Rosas. A son of a major at Mejia Blanca gained his livelihood by making paper cigars, and he wished to accompany me, as kind or servant, to Buenos Aires, but his father objected on the score of the danger alone. Many officers in the army can neither read nor write, yet all meet in society as equals. In Rios, the sala consisted of only six representatives. One of them kept a common shop, and evidently was not degraded by the office. All this is what would be expected in a new country, nevertheless the absence of gentlemen by profession, appears to an Englishman something strange. When speaking of these countries, the manner in which they have been brought up by their unnatural parent, Spain, should always be borne in mind. On the whole, perhaps, more credit is due for what has been done, than blame for, that which may be deficient. It is impossible to doubt, but that the extreme liberalism of these countries must ultimately lead to good results. The very general toleration of foreign religions, the regard paid to the means of education, the freedom of the press, the facilities offered to all foreigners, and especially, as I'm bound to add, to every one professing the humblest pretensions to science, should be recollected with gratitude by those who have visited Spanish South America. December 6, the Beagle sailed from the Rio Plata, never again to enter its muddy stream. Our course was directed to Port Desire, on the coast of Patagonia. Before proceeding any further, I will here put together a few observations made at sea. Several times when the ship has been some miles off the mouth of the Plata, and at other times when off the shores of northern Patagonia, we have been surrounded by insects. One evening, when we were about ten miles from the Bay of San Blas, vast numbers of butterflies, in bands or flocks of countless myriads, extended as far as the eye could range. Even by the aid of a telescope it was not possible to see a space free from butterflies. The seamen cried out it was snowing butterflies, and such in fact was the appearance. More species than one were present, but the main part belonged to a kind very similar to, but not identical with, the common English Calia sedusa. Some moths and hymenoptera accompanied the butterflies, and a fine beetle, Calisoma, flew on board. Other instances are known of this beetle having been caught far out at sea, and this is the more remarkable, as the greater number of the Carabidae seldom, or never take wing. The day had been fine and calm, and the one previous to it equally so, with light and variable airs. 
hence we cannot suppose that the insects were blown off the land, but we must conclude that they voluntarily took a flight. The great bands of the Collius seem at first to afford an instance like those on record of the migrations of another butterfly, Vanessa Cardu, 5, but the presence of other insects makes the case distinct and even less intelligible. Before sunset a strong breeze sprung up from the north, and this must have caused tens of thousands of the butterflies and other insects to have perished. On another occasion, when 17 miles off Cape Carines, I had a net overboard to catch pelagic animals. Upon drawing it up, to my surprise, I found a considerable number of beetles in it, and although in the open sea, they did not appear much injured by the salt water. I lost some of the specimens, but those which I preserved belonged to the genera column beets, Hydroporus, Hydrobius, two species, Nautophus, Sanucus, Adamonia, and Scarabarius. At first I thought that these insects had been blown from the shore, but upon reflecting that out of the eight species four were aquatic, and two others partly so in their habits, it appeared to me most probable that they were floated into the sea by a small stream which drains a lake near Cape Acarines. On any supposition it is an interesting circumstance to find live insects swimming in the open ocean 17 miles from the nearest point of land. There are several accounts of insects having been blown off the Patagonian shore. Captain Cook observed it, as did more lately Captain King of the Adventure. The cause probably is due to the want of shelter, both of trees and hills, so that an insect on the wing with an offshore breeze would be very apt to be blown out to sea. The most remarkable instance I have known of an insect being caught far from the land was that of a large grasshopper, a critium, which flew on board when the beagle was to windward of the Cape de Verde Islands, and when the nearest point of land, not directly opposed to the trade wind, was Cape Blanco on the coast of Africa, 370 miles distant, 6. On several occasions, when the beagle has been within the mouth of the Plata, the rigging has been coated with the web of the gossamer spider. One day, November 1, 1832, I paid particular attention to this subject. The weather had been fine and clear, and in the morning the air was full of patches of the flocculent web, as on an autumnal day in England. The ship was sixty miles distant from the land, in the direction of a steady though light breeze. Fast numbers of a small spider, about one-tenth of an inch in length, and of a dusky red color, were attached to the webs. There must have been, I should suppose, some thousands on the ship. The little spider, when first coming in contact with the rigging, was always seated on a single thread, and not on the flocculent mass. This latter seems merely to be produced by the entanglement of the single threads. The spiders were all of one species, but of both sexes, together with young ones. These latter were distinguished by their smaller size and more dusky color. I will not give the description of this spider, but merely state that it does not appear to me to be included in any of Latrill's genera. The little aeronaut, as soon as it arrived on board was very active, running about, sometimes letting itself fall, and then reascending the same thread, sometimes employing itself in making a small and very irregular mesh in the corners between the ropes. It could run with facility on the surface of the water. When disturbed it lifted up its front legs, in the attitude of attention. On its first arrival it appeared very thirsty, and with exerted maxillae drank eagerly of drops of water. This same circumstance has been observed by Strack. May it not be in consequence of the little insect having passed through a dry and rarefied atmosphere. Its stock of webs seemed inexhaustible. While watching some that were suspended by a single thread, I several times observed that the slightest breath of air bore them away out of sight, in a horizontal line. On another occasion, 25th. Under similar circumstances, I repeatedly observed the same kind of small spider, either when placed, or having crawled on some little eminence, elevate its abdomen, send forth a thread, and then sail away horizontally, but with rapidity which was quite unaccountable. I thought I could perceive that the spider, before performing the above preparatory steps, connected its legs together with the most delicate threads, but I'm not sure whether this observation was correct. One day, at Street Fay, I had a better opportunity of observing some similar facts. A spider which was about three-tenths of an inch in length, and which in its general appearance resembled a citigrade, therefore quite different from the gossamer, while standing on the summit of a post, darted forth four or five threads from its spinners. These, glittering in the sunshine, might be compared to diverging rays of light, they were not, however, straight, but in undulations, like films of silk blown by the wind. They were more than a yard in length, and diverged in an ascending direction from the orifices. The spider then suddenly let go its hold of the post, and was quickly borne out of sight. The day was hot and apparently calm, yet under such circumstances, the atmosphere can never be so tranquil as not to affect a vein so delicate as the thread of a spider's web. 
If during a warm day we look either at the shadow of any object cast on a bank, or over a level plain at a distant landmark, the effect of an ascending current of heated air is almost always evident. Such upward currents, it has been remarked, are also shown by the ascent of soap bells, which will not rise in an indoors room. Hence I think there is not much difficulty in understanding the ascent of the fine lines projected from a spider's spinners, and afterwards of the spider itself. The divergence of the lines has been attempted to be explained, I believe by Mr. Murray, by their similar electrical condition. The circumstance of spiders of the same species, but of different sexes and ages, being found on several occasions at the distance of many leagues from the land, attached in vast numbers to the lines, renders it probable that the habit of sailing through the air is as characteristic of this tribe, as that of diving, is of the Argerinida. We may then reject Latrell's supposition, that the gossamer owes its origin indifferently to the young of several genera of spiders, although, as we have seen, the young of other spiders do possess the power of performing aerial voyages. 7. During our different passages south of the Plata, I often towed a stern and that made of bunting, and thus caught many curious animals. Of Crustacea there were many strange and undescribed genera. 1. Which in some respects, is allied to the Nautipons, or those crabs which have their posterior legs placed almost on their backs, for the purpose of adhering to the underside of rocks, is very remarkable from the structure of its hind pair of legs. The penultimate joint, instead of terminating in a simple claw, ends in three bristle-like appendages of dissimilar lengths, the longest equaling that of the entire leg. These claws are very thin, and are serrated with the finest teeth directed backwards, their curved extremities are flattened, and on this part five most minute cups are placed which seem to act in the same manner as the suckers on the arms of the cuttlefish. As the animal lives in the open sea, and probably wants a place of rest, I suppose this beautiful and most anomalous structure is adapted to take hold of floating marine animals. In deep water, far from the land, the number of living creatures is extremely small, south of the latitude 35 degs, I never succeeded in catching anything besides some burrow, and a few species of Minidentomostricus crustacea. In shoaler water, at the distance of a few miles from the coast, very many kinds of crustacea and some other animals are numerous, but only during the night. Between latitudes 56 and 57 degs south of Cape Horn, the net was put astern several times, it never, however, brought up anything besides a few of two extremely minute species of Entromostrica. Yet whales and seals, petrels and albatross, are exceedingly abundant throughout this part of the ocean. It has always been a mystery to me on what the albatross, which lives far from the shore, can subsist. I presume that, like the condor, it is able to fast long, and that one good feast on the carcass of a putrid whale lasts for a long time. The central and intertropical parts of the Atlantic swarm with terracotta, crustacea, and radita, and with their devourers the flying fish, and again with their devourers the bonitos and albacores. I presume that the numerous lower pelagic animals feed on the infusoria, which are now known from the researches of Ehrenberg, to abound in the open ocean, but on what, in the clear blue water, do these infusoria subsist? While sailing a little south of the Plata on one very dark night, the sea presented a wonderful and most beautiful spectacle. There was a fresh breeze and every part of the surface, which during the day, is seen as foam, now glowed with a pale light. The vessel drove before her bows two billows of liquid phosphorus, and in her wake she was followed by a milky train. As far as the eye reached, the crest of every wave was bright, and the sky above the horizon, from the reflected glare of these livid flames, was not so utterly obscure as over the vault of the heavens. As we proceed further southward the sea is seldom phosphorescent, and off Cape Horn I do not recollect more than once having seen it so, and then it was far from being brilliant. This circumstance probably has a close connection with the scarcity of organic beings in that part of the ocean. After the elaborate paper, 8. By Ehrenberg, on the phosphorescence of the sea, it is almost superfluous on my part, to make any observations on the subject. I may however add, that the same torn, and irregular particles of gelatinous matter, described by Ehrenberg, seem in the southern as well as in the northern hemisphere, to be the common cause of this phenomenon. The particles were so minute as easily, to pass through fine gauze, yet many were distinctly visible by the naked eye. The water when placed in a tumbler and agitated, gave out sparks, but a small portion in a watch glass scarcely ever was luminous. Ehrenberg states that these particles all retain a certain degree of irritability. My observations, some of which were made directly, after taking up the water, gave a different result. I may also mention, that having used the net during one night, I allowed it to become partially dry, and having occasion twelve hours afterwards to employ it again, I found the whole surface sparkled as brightly as when first taken out of the water. It does not appear probable in this case, that the particles could have remained so long alive. 
On one occasion having kept the jellyfish of the genus Dianya till it was dead, the water in which it was placed became luminous. When the waves scintillate with bright green sparks, I believe it isn't generally owing to minute crustacea. But there can be no doubt that very many other pelagic animals, when alive, are phosphorescent. On two occasions I have observed the sea luminous at considerable depths beneath the surface. Near the mouth of the plot are some circular and oval patches, from two to four yards in diameter, and with defined outlines, shown with the steady but pale light, while the surrounding water only gave out a few sparks. The appearance resembled the reflection of the moon, or some luminous body, for the edges were sinuous from the undulations of the surface. The ship, which drew thirteen feet of water, passed over, without disturbing these patches. Therefore we must suppose, that some animals were congregated together at a greater depth than the bottom of the vessel. Near Fernando Naranjo the sea gave out light and flashes. The appearance was very similar to, that which might be expected from a large fish moving rapidly through a luminous fluid. To this cause the sailors attributed it, at the time, however, I entertained some doubts, on account of the frequency and rapidity of the flashes. I have already remarked, that the phenomenon is very much more common in warm than in cold countries, and I have sometimes imagined, that a disturbed electrical condition of the atmosphere was most favorable to its production. Certainly I think the sea is most luminous after a few days of more calm weather than ordinary, during which time it is swarmed with various animals. Observing that the water charged with gelatinous particles is in an impure state, and that the luminous appearance in all common cases, is produced by the agitation of the fluid in contact with the atmosphere, I am inclined to consider, that the phosphorescence is the result of the decomposition of the organic particles, by which process, one is tempted, almost to call it a kind of respiration, the ocean becomes purified. December 23rd, we arrived at Port Desire, situated in latitude 47 degs, on the coast of Patagonia. The creek runs for about 20 miles inland, with an irregular width. The Beagle anchored a few miles within the entrance, in front of the ruins of an old Spanish settlement. The same evening I went on shore. The first landing in any new country is very interesting, and especially when, as in this case, the whole aspect bears the stamp of a marked and individual character. At the height of between two and three hundred feet above some masses of porphyry a wide plain extends, which is truly characteristic of Patagonia. The surface is quite level, and is composed of well-rounded shingle mixed with a whitish earth. Here and there scattered tufts of brown wiry grass are supported, and still more rarely, some low thorny bushes. The weather is dry and pleasant, and the fine blue sky is but seldom obscured. When standing in the middle of one of these desert plains, and looking towards the interior, the view is generally bounded by the escarpment of another plain, rather higher, but equally level and desolate, and in every other direction the horizon is indistinct from the trembling rush, which seems to rise from the heated surface. In such a country the fate of the Spanish settlement was soon decided, the dryness of the climate during the greater part of the year, and the occasional hostile attacks of the wandering Indians, compelled the colonists to desert their half-finished buildings. The style, however, in which they were commenced, shows the strong and liberal hand of Spain in the old time. The result of all the attempts to colonize this side of America south of 41 degs has been miserable. Port famine expresses by its name the lingering and extreme sufferings of several hundred wretched people, of whom one alone survived to relate their misfortunes. At St. Joseph's Bay, on the coast of Patagonia, a small settlement was made, but during one Sunday the Indians made an attack, and massacred the whole party, excepting two men, who remained captives during many years. At the Rio Negro I conversed with one of these men, now in extreme old age the zoology of Patagonia is as limited as its flora, nine, on the arid plains a few black beetles, heteromera, might be seen slowly crawling about, and occasionally a lizard darted from side to side. Of birds we have three carrion hawks, and in the valleys a few finches and insect feeders. An ibis, Theristicus melanopsis species said to be found in Central Africa, is not uncommon on the most desert parts, in their stomachs I found grasshoppers, cicadae, small lizards, and even scorpions, ten, at one time of the year these birds go in flocks, at another in pairs, their cry is very loud and singular, like the neighing of the guanaco. The guanaco, or wild llama, is the characteristic quadruped of the plains of Patagonia, it is the South American representative of the camel of the East. It is an elegant animal in a state of nature, with the long slender neck and fine legs. It is very common over the whole of the temperate parts of the continent, as far south as the islands near Cape Horn. It generally lives in small herds up from half a dozen to thirty in each, but on the banks of the street cruise we saw one herd which must have contained at least five hundred. They are generally wild and extremely wary. Mr. Stokes told me that he one day saw through a glass a herd of these animals which evidently had been frightened and were running away at full speed, although their distance was so great that he could not distinguish them with his naked eye. 
The sportsman frequently receives the first notice of their presence, by hearing from a long distance their peculiar shrill neighing note of alarm. If he then looks attentively, he will probably see the herd standing in a line on the side of some distant hill. On approaching nearer, a few more squeals are given, and off they set at an apparently slow, but really quick canter, along some narrow beaten track to a neighboring hill. If, however, by chance he abruptly meets a single animal, or several together, they will generally stand motionless and intently gaze at him, then perhaps move on a few yards, turn round, and look again. What is the cause of this difference in their shyness? Do they mistake a man in the distance for their chief enemy the puma? Or does curiosity overcome their timidity? That they are curious is certain, for if a person lies on the ground, and plays strange antics, such as throwing up his feet in the air, they will almost always approach by degrees to reconnoiter him. It was an artifice, that was repeatedly practiced by our sportsmen with success, and it had moreover the advantage of allowing several shots to be fired, which were all taken as parts of the performance. On the mountains of Tierra del Fugo, I have more than once seen a guanaco, on being approached, not only neigh and squeal, but prance and leap about in the most ridiculous manner, apparently in defiance as a challenge. These animals are very easily domesticated, and I have seen some have kept a northern Patagonian ill house, though not under any restraint. They are in this state very bold, and readily attack a man, by striking him from behind with both knees. It is asserted, that the motive for these attacks is a jealousy on account of their females. The wild guanacas, however, have no idea of defense, even a single dog will secure one of these large animals, till the huntsman can come up. In many of their habits they are like sheep in a flock. Thus when they see men approaching in several directions on horseback, they soon become bewildered, and know not which way to run. This greatly facilitates the Indian method of hunting, for they are thus easily driven to a central point, and are encompassed. The guanacas readily take to the water, several times at Port Falls they were seen swimming from island to island. Byron, in his voyage says he saw them drinking salt water. Some of our officers likewise saw a herd apparently drinking the briny fluid from a salina near Cape Blanco. I imagine in several parts of the country, if they do not drink salt water, they drink none at all. In the middle of the day they frequently roll in the dust, in saucer-shaped hollows. The males fight together, two one day passed quite close to me, squealing and trying to bite each other, and several were shot with their hides deeply scored. Herds sometimes appear to set out on exploring parties, at the Hiablanca, where, within 30 miles of the coast, these animals are extremely infrequent. I one day saw the tracks of 30 or 40, which had come in a direct line to a muddy salt water creek. They then must have perceived, that they were approaching the sea, for they had wheeled with the regularity of cavalry, and had returned back in a straight line as they had advanced. The Guanacas have one singular habit, which is to me quite inexplicable, namely, that on successive days they drop their dung in the same defined heap. I saw one of these heaps which was eight feet in diameter, and was composed of a large quantity. This habit, according to M. A. Dorbigny, is common to all the species of the genus. It is very useful to the Peruvian Indians, who use the dung for fuel, and are thus saved the trouble of collecting it. The guanacas appear to have favorite spots for lying down to die. On the banks of the street crews, in certain circumscribed spaces, which were generally bushy and all near the river, the ground was actually white with bones. On one such spot I counted between 10 and 20 heads. I particularly examined the bones, they did not appear, as some scattered ones which I had seen, not, or broken, as if dragged together by beasts of prey. The animals in most cases must have crawled, before dying, beneath and amongst the bushes. Mr. Bino informs me that during a former voyage he observed the same circumstance on the banks of the Rio Galagas. I do not at all understand the reason of this, but I may observe, that the wounded guanacas at the street cruise invariably walk towards the river. At Street Jago in the Cape de Verde Islands, I remember having seen in a ravine a retired corner covered with bones of the goat, we at the time, exclaimed that it was the burial ground of all the goats in the island. I mention these trifling circumstances, because in certain cases they might explain the occurrence of a number of uninjured bones in a cave, or buried under alluvial accumulations, and likewise the cause, why certain animals are more commonly embedded than others in sedimentary deposits. One day the oil was sent under the command of Mr. Chaffers with three days provisions to survey the upper part of the harbor. In the morning we searched for some watering places mentioned in an old Spanish chart. We found one creek, at the head of which there was a trickling rill, the first we had seen, of brackish water. Here the tide compelled us to wait several hours, and in the interval I walked some miles into the interior. The plain as usual consisted of gravel, mingled with soil resembling chalk in appearance, but very different from utter nature. From the softness of these materials it was worn into many gullies. 
there was not a tree, and, excepting the guanaco, which stood on the hilltop the watchful sentinel over its third, scarcely an animal or a bird. All was stillness and desolation. Yet in passing over these scenes, without one bright object near, an ill-defined but strong sense of pleasure is vividly excited. One asked how many ages the plane had thus lasted, and how many more it was doomed thus to continue. None can reply, all seems eternal now. The wilderness has a mysterious young, which teaches awful doubt. Eleven, in the evening we sailed a few miles further up, and then pitched the tents for the night. By the middle of the next day the all was aground, and from the shoalness of the water could not proceed any higher. The water being found partly fresh, Mr. Chaffers took the dingy, and went up two or three miles further, where she also grounded, but in a fresh water river. The water was muddy, and though the stream was most insignificant in size, it would be difficult to account for its origin, except from the melting snow on the Cordillera. At the spot where we bivouacked, we were surrounded by bold cliffs and steep pinnacles of porphyry. I do not think I ever saw a spot which appeared more secluded from the rest of the world, than this rocky crevice in the white plain. The second day after our return to the anchorage, a party of officers and myself went to ransack an old Indian grave, which I had found on the summit of a neighboring hill. Two immense stones, each probably weighing at least a couple of tons, had been placed in front of a ledge of rock about six feet high. At the bottom of the grave on the hard rock there was a layer of earth about a foot deep, which must have been brought up from the plain below. Above it a pavement of flat stones was placed, on which others were piled, so as to fill up the space between the ledge and the two great blocks. To complete the grave, the Indians had contrived to detach from the ledge a huge fragment, and to throw it over the pile, so as to rest on the two blocks. We undermined the grave on both sides, but could not find any relics, or even bones. The latter probably had decayed long since, in which case the grave must have been of extreme antiquity, for I found in another place some smaller heaps beneath which a very few crumbling fragments could yet be distinguished as having belonged to a man. Falconer states that where an Indian dies he is buried, but that subsequently his bones are carefully taken up and carried, let the distance be ever so great, to be deposited near the sea coast. This custom, I think, may be accounted for by recollecting that before the introduction of horses, these Indians must have led nearly the same life as the Fugians now do, and therefore generally have resided in the neighborhood of the sea. The common prejudice of lying where one's ancestors have lain would make the now roaming Indians bring the less perishable part of their dead to their ancient burial ground on the coast. January 9, 1834 Before it was dark the Beagle anchored in the fine spacious harbor of Port St. Julian, situated about 110 miles to the south of Port Desire. We remained here eight days. The country is nearly similar to that of Port Desire, but perhaps rather more sterile. One day a party accompanied Captain Fitzroy on a long walk round the head of the harbor. We were eleven hours without tasting any water, and some of the party were quite exhausted. From the summit of a hill, since well named Thirsty Hill, a fine lake was spied, and two of the party proceeded with concerted signals to show whether it was fresh water. What was our disappointment to find a snow white expanse of salt, crystallized in great cubes? We attributed our extreme thirst to the dryness of the atmosphere, but whatever the cause might be, we were exceedingly glad late in the evening to get back to the boats. Although we could nowhere find, during our whole visit, a single drop of fresh water, yet some must exist, for by an odd chance I found on the surface of the salt water, near the head of the bay, a column beats not quite dead, which must have lived in some not far distant pool. Three other insects, a cincindula, like a hybrida, a cimindus, and a harpilus, which all live on mighty flats occasionally overflowed by the sea, and one other found dead on the plain, complete the list of the beetles. A good-sized fly, Tabinus, was extremely numerous, and tormented us by its painful bite. The common horsefly, which is so troublesome in the shady lanes of England, belongs to the same genus. We here have the puzzle that so frequently occurs in the case of musquitoes, on the blood, of what animals do these insects commonly feed. The guanaco is nearly the only warm-blooded quadruped, and it is found in quite inconsiderable numbers compared with the multitude of flies. The geology of Patagonia is interesting. Differently from Europe, where the tertiary formations appear to have accumulated in bays, here along hundreds of miles of coast we have one great deposit, including many tertiary shells, all apparently extinct. The most common shell is a massive gigantic oyster, sometimes even a foot in diameter. These beds are covered by others of a peculiar soft white stone, including much gypsum, and resembling chalk, but really of a pumicious nature. It is highly remarkable, from being composed, to at least one-tenth of its bulk, of infusoria. Professor Ehrenberg has already ascertained in it 30 oceanic forms. This bed extends for 500 miles along the coast, and probably for a considerably greater distance. At Port St. Julian its thickness is more than 800 feet. 
These white beds are everywhere capped by a mass of gravel, forming probably one of the largest beds of shingle in the world. It certainly extends from near the Rio Colorado to between 600 and 700 nautical miles southward. At Santa Cruz, a river a little south of St. Julian, it reaches to the foot of the Cordillera. Halfway up the river, its thickness is more than 200 feet. It probably everywhere extends to this great chain. Once the well-rounded pebbles of porphyry have been derived, we may consider its average breadth as 200 miles, and its average thickness as about 50 feet. If this great bed of pebbles, without including the mud necessarily derived from their attrition, was piled into a mound, it would form a great mountain chain. When we consider that all these pebbles, countless as the grains of sand in the desert, have been derived from the slow falling of masses of rock on the old coastlines and banks of rivers, and that these fragments have been dashed into smaller pieces, and that each of them has since been slowly rolled, rounded, and far transported the mind is stupefied, in thinking over the long, absolutely necessary, lapse of years. Yet all this gravel has been transported, and probably rounded, subsequently to the deposition of the white heads, and long subsequently to the underlying beds with the tertiary shells. Everything in this southern continent has been affected on a grand scale. The land, from the Rio Plata to Tierra del Fuego, a distance of 1200 miles, has been raised in mass, and in Patagonia to a height of between 300 and 400 feet, within the period of the now existing seashells. The old and weathered shells left on the surface of the upraised plain still partially retain their colors. The uprising movement has been interrupted by at least eight long periods of rest, during which the sea ate deeply back into the land, forming its successive levels the long lines of cliffs, or escarpments, which separate the different plains as they rise like steps one behind the other. The elevatory movement, and the eating back power of the sea during the periods of rest, have been equable over long lines of coast, for I was astonished to find that the steppe-like plains stand at nearly corresponding heights at far distant points. The lowest plain is 90 feet high, and the highest, which I ascended near the coast, is 950 feet, and of this, only relics are left in the form of flat gravel-capped hills. The upper plain of Santa Cruz slopes up to a height of 3,000 feet at the foot of the Cordillera. I have said that within the period of existing seashells, Patagonia has been upraised 300 to 400 feet. I may add that within the period when icebergs transported boulders over the upper plain of Santa Cruz, the elevation has been at least 1500 feet. More has Patagonia been affected only by upward movements. The extinct tertiary shells from Port St. Julian and Santa Cruz cannot have lived, according to Professor E. Forbes, in a greater depth of water than from 40 to 250 feet, but they are now covered with sea deposited strata from 800 to 1,000 feet. In thickness, hence the bed of the sea, on which these shells once lived, must have sunk downwards several hundred feet, to allow of the accumulation of the superincumbent strata. What a history of geological changes does the simply constructed coast of Patagonia reveal? At Port St. Julian, 12, in some red mud capping the gravel on the 90-feet plain, I found half the skeleton of the Macrocinia patachonica, a remarkable quadruped, full as large as a camel. It belongs to the same division of the Pachyderma with the rhinoceros, taper, and polyotherium, but in the structure of the bones of its long neck it shows a clear relation to the camel, or rather to the guanacodin lemma. From recent seashells being found on two of the higher step formed plains, which must have been modeled and upraised before the mud was deposited in which the Macrocinia was entombed, it is certain that this curious quadruped lived long after the sea was inhabited by its present shells. I was at first much surprised how a large quadruped could so lately have subsisted, in latitude 49 degs 15 feet, on these wretched gravel plains, with their stunted vegetation, but the relationship of the Macrocinia to the Guanaco, not an inhabitant of the most sterile parts, partly explains this difficulty. The relationship, though distant, between the Macrocinia and the Guanaco, between the Toxidon and the Capybara, the closer relationship between the many extinct identity and the living sloths, anteaters, and armadillos, now so eminently characteristic of South American zoology, and the still closer relationship between the fossil and living species of Tinamis and Hydrotaurus. Our most interesting facts. This relationship is shown wonderfully, as wonderfully as between the fossil and extinct marsupial animals of Australia, by the great collection lately brought to Europe from the caves of Brazil by millimeters. Lund and Glossen. In this collection there are extinct species of all the 32 genera, excepting four, of the terrestrial quadrupeds now inhabiting the provinces in which the caves occur, and the extinct species are much more numerous than those now living. There are fossil anteaters, armadillos, tapers, peccaries, quanicus, opossums, and numerous South American doors and monkeys, and other animals. This wonderful relationship in the same continent between the dead and the living will, I do not doubt, hereafter throw more light on the appearance of organic beings on our earth, and their disappearance from it, than any other class of facts.
it is impossible to reflect on the changed state of the American continent without the deepest astonishment. Formerly it must have swarmed with great monsters, now we find mere pygmies, compared with the antecedent, allied races. If Parfin had known of the gigantic sloth and armadillo canamels, and of the lost Pachydermida, he might have said with a greater semblance of truth, that the creative force in America, had lost its power, rather than that it had never possessed great vigor. The greater number, if not all, of these extinct quadrupeds lived at a late period, and were the contemporaries of most of the existing seashells. Since they lived, no very great change in the form of the land can have taken place. What, then, has exterminated so many species and whole genera? The mind at first is irresistibly hurried into the belief of some great catastrophe, but thus to destroy animals, both large and small, in southern Patagonia, in Brazil, on the Cordillera of Peru, in North America up to Bering Straits, we must shake the entire framework of the globe. An examination, moreover, of the geology of La Plata and Patagonia, leads to the belief that all the features of the land result from slow and gradual changes. It appears from the character of the fossils in Europe, Asia and Australia, and in North and South America, that those conditions which favor the life of the larger quadrupeds were lately coextensive with the world, what those conditions were, no one has yet even conjectured. It could hardly have been a change of temperature, which had about the same time, destroyed the inhabitants of tropical, temperate, and arctic latitudes on both sides of the globe. In North America we positively know from Mr. Little, that the large quadrupeds lived subsequently to that period, when boulders were brought into latitudes at which icebergs now never arrive, from conclusive but indirect reasons we may feel sure, that in the southern hemisphere the Macrochenia, also, lived long subsequently to the ice-transporting boulder period. Did man, after his first inroad into South America, destroy, as has been suggested, the unwieldy Megapherium and the other identita? We must at least look to some other cause for the destruction of the little 2Q2 coat Bahia Blanca, and of the many fossil mice and other small quadrupeds in Brazil. No one will imagine that a drought, even far severer than those which cause such losses in the provinces of La Plata, could destroy every individual of every species from southern Patagonia to Bering Straits. What shall we say of the extinction of the horse? That those plains fill of pasture, which have since been overrun by thousands and hundreds of thousands of the descendants of the stock introduced by the Spaniards. Have the subsequently introduced species consumed the food of the great antecedent races? Can we believe, that the Capibra has taken the food of the Toxidin, the Guanaco of the Macrochenia, the existing small identity of their numerous gigantic prototypes? Certainly, no fact in the long history of the world is so startling as the wide, and repeated exterminations of its inhabitants. Nevertheless, if we consider the subject under another point of view, it will appear less perplexing. We do not steadily bear in mind, how profoundly ignorant we are of the conditions of existence of every animal, nor do we always remember, that some check is constantly preventing the too rapid increase of every organized, being left in a state of nature. The supply of food, on an average, remains constant, yet the tendency in every animal to increase by propagation is geometrical, and its surprising effects have nowhere been more astonishingly shown, than in the case of the European animals run wild during the last few centuries in America. Every animal in a state of nature regularly breeds, yet in a species long established, any, great, increase in numbers is obviously impossible, and must be checked by some means. We are, nevertheless, seldom able with certainty, to tell in any given species, at what period of life, or at what period of the year, or whether only at long intervals, the check falls, or, again, what is the precise nature of the check. Hence probably it is, that we feel so little surprise at one, of two species closely allied in habits, being rare and the other abundant in the same district, or, again, that one should be abundant in one district, and another, filling the same place in the economy of nature, should be abundant in a neighboring district differing very little in its conditions. If asked how this is, one immediately replies, that it is determined by some slight difference, in climate, food, or the number of enemies, yet how rarely, if ever, we can point out the precise cause and manner of action of the check. We are therefore, driven to the conclusion, that causes generally quite inappreciable by us, determine whether a given species shall be abundant or scanty in numbers. In the cases, where we can trace the extinction of a species through men, either wholly or in one limited district, we know that it becomes rarer and rarer, and is then lost, it would be difficult to point out any just distinction, 13, between a species destroyed by men, or by the increase of its natural enemies. The evidence of rarity preceding extinction, is more striking in the success of tertiary strata, as remarked by several able observers, it has often been found, that a shell very common in a tertiary stratum is now most rare, and has even long been thought extinct. 
If then, as appears probable, species first become rare, and then extinct, if the too rapid increase of every species, even the most favored, is steadily checked, as we must admit, though what end, when it is hard to say, and if we see, without the smallest surprise, though unable to assign the precise reason, one species abundant and another closely allied species rare in the same district why? Should we feel such great astonishment at the rarity, being carried one step further to extinction? An action going on, on every side of us, and yet barely appreciable, might surely be carried a little further, without exciting our observation. We would feel any great surprise at hearing, that the megalonyx was formerly rare compared with the megatherium, or that one of the fossil monkeys was few in number, compared with one of the now living monkeys, and yet in this comparative rarity, we should have the plainest evidence of less favorable conditions for their existence. To admit that species in generally become rare, before they become extinct to feel no surprise at the comparative rarity of one species with another, and yet to call it some extraordinary agent and to marvel greatly when a species ceases to exist, appears to me much the same as to admit that sickness in the individual is the prelude to death, to feel no surprise at sickness, but when a sick man dies to wander, and to believe that he died through violence. April 13, 1834 The Beagle anchored within the mouth of the Santa Cruz. This river is situated about 60 miles south of Port St. Julian. During the last voyage Captain Stokes proceeded 30 miles up it, but then, from the want of provisions, was obliged to return. Excepting what was discovered at that time, scarcely anything was known about this large river. Captain Fitzroy now determined to follow its course as far as time would allow. On the 18th three whale boats started, carrying three weeks' provisions, and the party consisted of 25 souls, a force which would have been sufficient to have defied a host of Indians. With the strong flood tide and defined day we made a good run, soon drank some of the fresh water, and were at night nearly above the tidal influence the river here assumed a size and appearance which, even at the highest point we ultimately reached, was scarcely diminished. It was generally from three to four hundred yards broad, and in the middle about seventeen feet deep. The rapidity of the current, which in its whole course, runs at the rate up from four to six knots an hour, is perhaps its most remarkable feature. The water is of a fine blue color, but with a slight milky tinge, and not so transparent as at first sight would have been expected. It flows over a bed of pebbles, like those which compose the beach and the surrounding plains. It runs in a winding course through a valley, which extends in a direct line westward. This valley varies from 5 to 10 miles in breadth, it is bounded by step-formed terraces, which rise in most parts, one above the other, to the height of 500 feet, and have on the opposite sides a remarkable correspondence. April 19th, against so strong a current it was, of course, quite impossible to row or sail, consequently the three boats were fastened together head and stern, two hands left in each, and the rest came on shore to track. As the general arrangements made by Captain Fitzroy were very good for facilitating the work of all, and as all had a share in it, I will describe the system. The party including every one, was divided into two spells, each of which held at the tracking line alternately for an hour and a half. The officers of each boat lived with, ate the same food, and slept in the same tent with their crew, so that each boat was quite independent of the others. After sunset the first level spot where any bushes were growing, was chosen for our night's lodging. Each of the crew took it, in turns to be cook. Immediately the boat was hauled up, the cook made his fire, two others pitched the tent, the coxswain handed the things out of the boat, the rest carried them up to the tents and collected firewood. By this order, in half an hour everything was ready for the night. A watch of two men and an officer was always kept, whose duty it was to look after the boats, keep up the fire, and guard against Indians. Each in the party had his one hour every night. During this day we tracked, but a short distance for there were many islets, covered by forty bushes, and the channels between them were shallow. April 20th, we passed the islands and set to work. Our regular day's march, although it was hard enough, carried us on an average only ten miles in a straight line, and perhaps fifteen or twenty altogether. Beyond the place, where we slept last night, the country is completely, terra incognita underscore, for it was there, that Captain Stokes turned back. We saw in the distance a great smoke, and found the skeleton of a horse, so we knew that Indians were in the neighborhood. On the next morning, 21st, tracks of a party of horse, and marks left by the trailing of the chooses, or long spears, were observed on the ground. It was generally thought that the Indians had reconnoitered us during the night. Shortly afterwards we came to a spot where, from the fresh footsteps of men, children, and horses, it was evident that the party had crossed the river. April 22nd, the country remained the same, and was extremely uninteresting. The complete similarity of the productions throughout Patagonia is one of its most striking characters. The level plains of arid shingle support the same stunted and dwarfed plants, and in the valleys the same fort bring bushes grow. 
everywhere we see the same birds and insects. Even the very banks of the river, and of the clear streamlets which entered it, were scarcely enlivened by a brighter tint of green. The curse of sterility is on the land, and the water flowing over a bed of pebbles partakes of the same curse. Hence the number of waterfowl is very scanty, for there is nothing to support life in the stream of this barren river. Patagonia, pure as she is in some respects, can however boast of a greater stock of small rodents, one, than perhaps any other country in the world. Several species of mice are externally characterized by large thin ears and a very fine fur. These little animals swarm amongst the thickets in the valleys, where they cannot for months together taste a drop of water excepting the dew. They all seem to be cannibals, for no sooner was a mouse caught in one of my traps than it was devoured by others. A small and delicately shaped fox, which is likewise very abundant, probably derives its entire support from these small animals. The guanaco is also in his proper district. Birds of fifty or a hundred were common, and, as I have stated, we saw one which must have contained at least five hundred. The puma, with the condor and other carrion hawks in its train, follows and preys upon these animals. The footsteps of the puma were to be seen almost everywhere on the banks of the river, and the remains of several guanacas, with their necks dislocated and bones broken, showed down they had met their death. April 24th, like the navigators of old when approaching in a known land, we examined and watched for the most trivial sign of a change. The drifted trunk of a tree, or a boulder of primitive rock, was held with joy, as if we had seen a forest growing on the flanks of the Cordillera. The top, however, of a heavy bank of clouds, which remained almost constantly in one position, was the most promising sign, and eventually turned out a true harbinger. At first the clouds were mistaken for the mountains themselves, instead of the masses of paper condensed by their icy summits. April 26, we this day met with the marked change in the geological structure of the plains. From the first starting I had carefully examined the gravel in the river, and for the two last days had noticed the presence of a few small pebbles of a very cellular basalt. These gradually increased in number and in size, but none were as large as a man's head. This morning, however, pebbles of the same rock, but more compact, suddenly became abundant, and in the course of half an hour we saw, at the distance of five or six miles, the angular edge of a great basaltic platform. When we arrived at its base we found the stream bubbling among the fallen blocks. For the next 28 miles the river course was encumbered with these basaltic masses. Above that limit immense fragments of primitive rocks, derived from its surrounding boulder formation, were equally numerous. None of the fragments of any considerable size had been washed more than three or four miles down the river below their parent source, considering the singular rapidity of the great body of water in the Santa Cruz, and that no still reaches occur in any part. This example is a most striking one, of the inefficiency of rivers, in transporting even moderately sized fragments. The basalt is only lava, which has flowed beneath the sea, but the eruptions must have been on the grandest scale. At the point where we first met this formation it was 120 feet in thickness, following up the river course, the surface imperceptibly rose and the mass became thicker, so that at 40 miles above the first station it was 320 feet thick. What the thickness may be close to the Cordillera, I have no means of knowing, but the platform there attains a height of about 3,000 feet above the level of the sea, we must therefore look to the mountains of that great chain for its source, and worthy of such a source are streams that have flowed over the gently inclined bed of the sea to a distance of 100 miles. At the first glance of the basaltic cliffs on the opposite sides of the valley, it was evident that the strata once were united. What power, then, has removed along a whole line of country, a solid mass of very hard rock, which had an average thickness of nearly 300 feet, and a breadth varying from rather less than 2 miles to 4 miles. The river, though it is, so little power in transporting even inconsiderable fragments, yet in the lapse of ages might produce by its gradual erosion an effect, of which it is difficult to judge the amount. But in this case, independently of the insignificance of such an agency, good reasons can be assigned for believing that this valley was formerly occupied by an arm of the sea. It is needless in this work to detail the arguments leading to this conclusion, derived from the form and the nature of the step-formed terraces on both sides of the valley, from the manner in which the bottom of the valley near the Andes expands into a great estuary-like plain with sand hillocks on it, and from the occurrence of a few seashells lying in the bed of the river. If I had space I could prove that South America was formerly here cut off by a strait, joining the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, like that of Magellan. But it may yet be asked, how has the solid basalt been moved? Geologists formerly would have brought into play the violent action of some overwhelming debacle, but in this case such a supposition would have been quite inadmissible, because the same step-like plains with existing seashells lying on their surface, which front the long line of the Patagonian coast, sweep up on each side of the Valley of Santa Cruz. 
no possible action of any flood could thus have modeled the land, either within the valley, or along the open coast, and by the formation of such step-like plains or terraces the valley itself had been hollowed out. Although we know, that there are tides, which run within the narrows of the Strait of Magellan at the rate of eight knots an hour, yet we must confess, that it makes the head almost giddy to reflect on the number of years, century after century, which the tides, unaided by a heavy surf, must have required to have corroded so vast an area in thickness of solid basaltic lava. Nevertheless, we must believe, that the strata undermined by the waters of this ancient strait, were broken up into huge fragments, and these lying scattered on the beach, were reduced first to smaller blocks, then to pebbles, and lastly to the most impalpable mud, which the tides drifted far into the eastern or western ocean. With the change in the geological structure of the plains the character of the landscape likewise altered. While rambling up some of the narrowed and rocky defiles, I could almost have fancied myself transported back again to the barren valleys of the island of Street Jago. Among the basaltic cliffs, I found some plants which I had seen nowhere else, but others I recognized as being wanderers from Tierra del Fuego. These porous rocks serve as a reservoir for the scanty rainwater, and consequently on the line where the igneous and sedimentary formations unite, some small springs, most rare occurrences in Patagonia, burst forth and they could be distinguished at a distance by the circumscribed patches of bright green herbage. April 27, the bed of the river became rather narrower, and hence the stream more rapid. It here ran at the rate of six knots an hour. From this cause, and from the many great angular fragments, tracking the boats became both dangerous and laborious. This day I shot a condor. It measured from tip to tip of the wings, eight and a half feet, and from beak to tail, four feet. The spurt is known to have a wide geographical range, being found on the west coast of South America, from the Strait of Magellan along the Cordillera as far as 8 degrees north of the equator. The steep cliff near the mouth of the Rio Negro is its northern limit on the Patagonian coast, and they have there wandered about 400 miles from the great central line of their habitation in the Andes. Further south, among the bold precipices at the head of Port Desire, the condor is not uncommon, yet only a few stragglers occasionally visit the seacoast. A line of cliff near the mouth of the Santa Cruz is frequented by these birds, and about 80 miles up the river, where the sides of the valley are formed by steep basaltic precipices, the condor reappears. From these facts, it seems that the condors require perpendicular cliffs. In Chile, they haunt, during the greater part of the year, the lower country near the shores of the Pacific, and at night several roost together in one tree, but in the early part of summer, they retire to the most inaccessible parts of the inner cordillera, there to breed in peace. With respect to their propagation, I was told by the country people in Chile, that the condor makes no sort of nest, but in the months of November and December lays two large white eggs on a shelf of bare rock. It is said, that the young condors cannot fly for an entire year, and long after they are able, they continue to roost by night, and hunt by day with their parents. The old birds generally live in pairs, but among the inland basaltic cliffs of the Santa Cruz, I found a spot, where scores must usually haunt. On coming suddenly to the brow of the precipice, it was a grand spectacle, to see between 20 and 30 of these great birds start heavily from their resting place, and wheel away in majestic circles. From the quantity of dung on the rocks, they must long, have frequented this cliff for roosting and breeding. Having gorged themselves with carrion on the plains below, they retire to these favorite ledges to digest their food. From these facts, the condor, like the galinazo, must to a certain degree be considered as a gregarious bird. In this part of the country they live altogether on the guanacas which have died a natural death, or as more commonly happens, have been killed by the pumas. I believe, from what I saw in Patagonia, that they do not on ordinary occasions extend their daily excursions to any great distance from their regular sleeping places. The condors may oftentimes be seen at a great height, soaring over a certain spot in the most graceful circles. On some occasions I'm sure, that they do this only for pleasure, but on others, the Chileno countryman tells you, that they are watching a dying animal, or the puma devouring its prey. If the condors glide down, and then suddenly all rise together, the Chileno knows, that it is the puma which, watching the carcass, has sprung out to drive away the robbers. Besides feeding on carrion, the condors frequently attack young goats and lambs, and the shepherd dogs are trained, whenever they pass over, to run out, and looking upwards to bark violently. The chillinous destroy and catch numbers. Two methods are used, one is to place a carcass on a level piece of ground within an enclosure of sticks with an opening, and when the condors are gorged, to gallop up on horseback to the entrance, and thus enclose them, for when this bird has not space to run, it cannot give its body sufficient momentum, to rise from the ground. The second method is to mark the trees in which, frequently to the number of five or six together, they roost, and then at night, to climb up and noose them. 
They are such heavy sleepers, as I have myself witnessed, that this is not a difficult task. At Valparaiso, I have seen a living condor sold for sixpence, but the common price is eight or ten shillings. One which I saw brought in, had been tied with rope, and was much injured, yet, the moment the line was cut by which its bill was secured, although surrounded by people, it began ravenously to tear a piece of carrion. In the garden at the same place, between twenty and thirty were kept alive. They were fed only once a week, but they appeared in pretty good health, too, the Chileno countrymen assert that the condor will live, and retain its vigor, between five and six weeks without eating, I cannot answer for the truth of this, but it is a cruel experiment, which very likely has been tried. When an animal is killed in the country, it is well known that the condors, like other carrion vultures, soon gain intelligence of it, and congregate in an inexplicable manner. In most cases it must not be overlooked, that the birds have discovered their prey, and have picked the skeleton clean, before the flesh is in the least degree tainted. Remembering the experiments of M. Audubon, on the little smelling powers of carrion hawks, I tried in the above-mentioned garden the following experiment, the condors were tied, each by a rope, in a long row at the bottom of a wall, and having folded up a piece of meat in white paper, I walked backwards and forwards, carrying it in my hand at the distance of about three yards from them, but no notice whatever was taken. I then threw it on the ground, within one yard of an old male bird, he looked at it for a moment with attention, but then regarded it no more. With the stick I pushed it closer and closer, until at last he touched it with his beak, the paper was then instantly torn off with fury, and at the same moment, every bird in the long row, began struggling and flapping its wings. Under the same circumstances, it would have been quite impossible to have deceived a dog. The evidence in favor of, and against the acute smelling powers of carrion vultures is singularly balanced. Professor Owen has demonstrated that the olfactory nerves of the turkey buzzard, Catherzora, are highly developed, and on the evening when Mr. Owen's paper was read at the Zoological Society, it was mentioned by a gentleman that he had seen the carrion hawks in the West Indies on two occasions collect on the roof of a house, when the corpse had become offensive from not having been buried. In this case, the intelligence could hardly have been acquired by sight. On the other hand, Besides the experiments of Audubon, and that one by myself, Mr. Batchman has tried in the United States many varied plants, showing that neither the turkey buzzard, the species dissected by Professor Owen, nor the Gallinazo find their food by smell. He covered portions of highly offensive offal with a thin canvas cloth, and strewed pieces of meat on it, these the carrion vultures ate up, and then remained quietly standing, with their beaks within the eighth of an inch of the putrid mess, without discovering it. A small rent was made in the canvas, and the offal was immediately discovered, the canvas was replaced by a fresh piece, and meat again put on it, and was again devoured by the vultures without their discovering the hidden mass on which they were trampling. These facts are attested by the signatures of six gentlemen, besides that of Mr. Batchman, three, often when lying down, to rest on the open plains, on looking upwards, I have seen carrion hawks sailing through the air at a great height. Where the country is level I do not believe a space of the heavens, but more than 15 degrees above the horizon, is commonly viewed with any attention by a person either walking or on horseback. If such be the case, and the vulture is on the wing at a height of between three and 4,000 feet, before it could come within the range of vision, its distance in a straight line from the beholder's eye, would be rather more than two British miles. Might it not thus readily be overlooked? When an animal is killed by the sportsman in a lonely valley, may he not all the while be watched from above by the sharp-sided bird? And will not the manner of its descent proclaim throughout the district to the whole family of carrion feeders, that their prey is at hand? When the conners are wheeling in a flock round and round any spot, their flight is beautiful. Except when rising from the ground, I do not recollect ever having seen one of these birds flap its wings. Near Lima, I watched several for nearly half an hour, without once taking off my eyes, they moved in large curves, sweeping in circles, descending and ascending without giving a single flap. As they glided close over my head, I intently watched from an oblique position, the outlines of the separate and great terminal feathers of each wing, and these separate feathers, if there had been the least vibratory movement, would have appeared as if blended together, but they were seen distinct against the blue sky. The head and neck were moved frequently, and apparently with force, and the extended wings seemed to form the fulcrum on which the movements of the neck, body, and tail acted. If the bird wished to descend, the wings were for a moment collapsed, and when again expanded with an altered inclination, the momentum gained by the rapid descent seemed to urge the bird upwards with the even and steady movement of a paper kite. In the case of any bird soaring, its motion must be sufficiently rapid, so that the action of the inclined surface of its body on the atmosphere may counterbalance its gravity. The force to keep up the momentum of a body moving in a horizontal plane in the air, in which there is so little friction, cannot be great, and this force is all that is wanted. 
the movement of the neck and body of the condor, we must suppose, is sufficient for this. However this may be, it is truly wonderful and beautiful to see so great a bird, honor after hour, without any apparent exertion, wheeling and gliding over mountain and river. April 29th, from some highland we hailed with joy the wide summits of the Cordillera, as they were seen occasionally peeping through their dusky envelope of clouds. During the few succeeding days we continued to get on slowly, for we found the river course very tortuous, and strewed with immense fragments of various ancient slatty rocks, and of granite. The plain bordering the valley had here attained an elevation of about 1100 feet above the river, and its character was much altered. The well-rounded pebbles of porphyry were mingled with many immense angular fragments of basalt, and of primary rocks. The first of these erratic boulders which I noticed, was 67 miles distant from the nearest mountain, another which I measured, was 5 yards square, and projected 5 feet above the gravel. Its edges were so angular, and its size so great, that I at first mistook it for a rock, in situ underscore, and took out my compass, to observe the direction of its cleavage. The plain here was not quite, so level as that near the coast, but yet it betrayed no signs of any great violence. Under these circumstances it is, I believe, quite impossible to explain the transportal of these gigantic masses of rock, so many miles from their parent source, on any theory, except by that of floating icebergs. During the two last days we met with signs of horses, and with several small articles, which had belonged to the Indians, such as parts of a mantle and a bunch of ostrich feathers, but they appeared to have been lying long on the ground. Between the place, where the Indians had so lately crossed the river and this neighborhood, though so many miles apart, the country appears to be quite infrequented. At first, considering the abundance of the Guanacos, I was surprised at this, but it is explained by the stony nature of the plains, which would soon disable an unshod horse from taking part in the chase. Nevertheless, in two places in this very central region, I found small heaps of stones, which I do not think, could have been accidentally thrown together. They were placed on points, projecting over the edge of the highest lava cliff, and they resembled, but on a small scale, those near Port Desire. May 4th, Captain Fitzroy determined to take the boats no higher. The river had a winding course, and was very rapid, and the appearance of the country offered no temptation to proceed any further. Everywhere we met with the same productions, and the same dreary landscape. We were now 140 miles distant from the Atlantic, and about 60 from the nearest arm of the Pacific. The valley in this upper part, expanded into a wide basin, bounded on the north and south by the basaltic platforms, and fronted by the long range of the snow-clad Cordillera. But we viewed these grand mountains with regret, for we were obliged to imagine their nature and productions, instead of standing, as we had hoped, on their summits. Besides the useless loss of time which an attempt, to ascend the river any higher would have cost us, we had already been for some days on half allowance of bread. This, although really enough for reasonable men, was, after a hard day's march, rather scanty food, a light stomach and an easy digestion are good things to talk about, but very unpleasant in practice. Fifth, before sunrise we commenced our descent. We shot down the stream with great rapidity, generally at the rate of ten knots an hour. In this one day we effected what had cost us five and a half hard days labor in ascending. On the eighth, we reached the Beagle after our twenty-one days expedition. Everyone, excepting myself, had cause to be dissatisfied, but to me the ascent afforded a most interesting section of the great tertiary formation of Patagonia. On March 1, 1833, and again on March 16, 1834, the Beagle anchored in Berkeley Sound, in East Falkland Island. This archipelago is situated in nearly the same latitude with the mouth of the Strait of Magellan, it covers a space of 120 by 60 geographical miles, and is a little more than half the size of Ireland. After the possession of these miserable islands had been contested by France, Spain, and England, they were left uninhabited. The government of Buenos Aires then sold them to a private individual, but likewise used them, as old Spain had done before, for a penal settlement. England claimed her right and seized them. The Englishman who was left in charge of the flag was consequently murdered. A British officer was next sent, unsupported by any power, and when we arrived, we found him in charge of a population, of which rather more than half were runaway rebels and murderers. The theater is worthy of the scenes acted on it. An undulating land, with a desolate and wretched aspect, is everywhere covered by a peaty soil and wiry grass, of one monotonous brown color. Here and there a peak or ridge of grey quartz rock breaks through the smooth surface. Everyone has heard of the climate of these regions, it may be compared to, that which is experienced at the height of between 1 and 2,000 feet, on the mountains of North Wales, having however less sunshine and less frost, but more wind and rain. Or, 16th I will now describe a short excursion which I may drown a part of this island. 
In the morning I started with six horses and two gauchos, the latter were capital men for the purpose, and well accustomed to living on their own resources. The weather was very boisterous and cold, with heavy hailstorms. We got on, however, pretty well, but, except the geology, nothing could be less interesting than our day's ride. The country is uniformly the same undulating moorland, the surface being covered by light brown withered grass and a few very small shrubs, all springing out of an elastic peaty soil. In the valleys here and there might be seen a small flock of wild geese, and everywhere the ground was so soft that the snipe were able to feed. Besides these two birds there were few others. There is one main range of hills, nearly 2,000 feet in height, and composed of quartz rock, the rugged and barren crests of which gave us some trouble to cross. On the south side we came to the best country for wild cattle, we met, however, no great number, for they had been lately much harassed. In the evening we came across a small herd. One of my companions, Street Jacko by name, soon separated a fat cow, he threw the bolas, and it struck her legs, but fell in becoming entangled. Then ropping his hat to mark the spot where the balls were left, while at full gallop, he uncoiled his lasso, and after a most severe chase, again came up to the cow, and caught around the horns. The other cowshow had gone on ahead with the spare horses, so that Street Jacko had some difficulty in killing the furious beast. He managed to get her on a level piece of ground, by taking advantage of her as often as she rushed at him, and when she would not move, my horse, from having been trained, would canter up, and with his chest give her a violent push. But when on level ground it does not appear an easy job for one man, to kill a beast mad with terror. Nor would it be so, if the horse, when left to itself without its rider, did not soon learn, for its own safety, to keep the lasso tight, so that, if the cow or ox moves forward, the horse moves, just as quickly forward, otherwise, it stands motionless leaning on one side. This horse, however, was a young one, and would not stand still, but gave it to the cow as she struggled. It was admirable to see with what dexterity Street Jago dodged behind the beast, till at last he contrived to give the fatal touch to the main tendon of the hind leg after which, without much difficulty, he drove his knife into the head of the spinal marrow, and the cow dropped, as if struck by lightning. He cut off pieces of flesh with the skin to it, but without any bones, sufficient for our expedition. We then rode unto our sleeping place, and had for supper carn con curo, or meat roasted with the skin on it. This is as superior to common beef as venison is to mutton. A large circular piece taken from the back is roasted on the embers with the hide downwards, and in the form of a saucer, so that none of the gravy is lost. If any were the alderman had supped with us that evening, Karin Con Kuro, without doubt, would soon have been celebrated in London during the night it rained, and the next day, 17th, was very stormy, with much hill and snow. We rode across the island to the neck of land which adjoins the Rincon del Toro, the great peninsula at the SW extremity, to the rest of the island. From the great number of cows which have been killed, there is a large proportion of bulls. These wander about single, or two and three together, and are very savage. I never saw such magnificent beasts, they equaled in the size of their huge heads and necks the Grecian marble sculptures. Captain Sullivan informs me that the height of an average sized bull weighs 47 pounds, whereas a height of this weight, less thoroughly dried, is considered as a very heavy one at Monte Video. The young bulls generally run away, for a short distance, but the old ones do not stir a step, except to rush at man and horse, and many horses have been thus killed. An old bull crossed a boggy stream, and took his stand on the opposite side to us, we in vain tried to drive him away, and failing, were obliged to make a large circuit. The cow chose in revenge, determined to emasculate him, and render him for the future harmless. It was very interesting to see how art completely mastered force. One lasso was thrown over his horns as he rushed at the horse, and another round his hind legs, in a minute the monster was stretched powerless on the ground. After the lasso has once been drawn tightly around the horns of a furious animal, it does not at first appear an easy thing, to disengage it again without killing the beast, nor, I apprehend, would it be so, if the man was by himself. By the aid, however, of a second person throwing his lasso, so as to catch both hind legs, it is quickly managed, for the animal, as long as its hind legs are kept outstretched, is quite helpless, and the first man can with his hands loosen his lasso from the horns, and then quietly mount his horse, but the moment the second man, by backing ever so little, relaxes the strain, the lasso slips off the legs of the struggling beast, which then rises free, shakes himself, and vainly rushes at his antagonist. During our whole ride we saw only one troop of wild horses. These animals, as well as the cattle, were introduced by the French in 1764, since which time both have greatly increased. It is a curious fact, that the horses have never left the eastern end of the island, although there is no natural boundary to prevent them from roaming, and that part of the island is not more tempting than the rest. 
the Kaushos whom I asked, though asserting this to be the case, were unable to account for it, except from the strong attachment which horses have to any locality to which they are accustomed. Considering that the island does not appear fully stocked, and that there are no beasts of prey, I was particularly curious to know how to check their originally rapid increase. That in a limited island some check would sooner or later supervene, is inevitable, but why has the increase of the horse been checked sooner than that of the cattle? Captain Sullivan has taken much pains for me in this inquiry. The cow shows employed here attributed chiefly to the stallions constantly roaming from place to place, and compelling the mares to accompany them, whether or not the young foals are able to follow. One cow show told Captain Sullivan that he had watched a stallion for a whole hour, violently kicking and biting a mare till he forced her to leave her foal to its fate. Captain Sullivan can so far corroborate this curious account that he has several times found young foals dead, whereas he has never found a dead calf. Moreover, the dead bodies of full-grown horses are more frequently found, as if more subject to disease or accidents, than those of the cattle. From the softness of the ground their hoofs often grow irregularly to a great length, and this causes lameness. The predominant colors are own and iron gray. All the horses bred here, both tame and wild, are rather small-sized, though generally in good condition, and they have lost so much strength that they are unfit to be used in taking wild cattle with the lasso. In consequence, it is necessary to go to the great expense of importing fresh horses from the Plata. At some future period the southern hemisphere probably will have its breed of Falkland ponies, as the northern has its Shetland breed. The cattle, instead of having degenerated like the horse, seem, as before remarked, to have increased in size, and they are much more numerous than the horses Captain Sullivan informs me, that they vary much less in the general form of their bodies, and in the shape of their horns than English cattle. In color they differ much, and it is a remarkable circumstance, that in different parts of this one small island, different colors predominate. Round Mount Esborn, at a height of from 1,000 to 1,500 feet above the sea, about half of some of the herds are mouse or lead colored, a tint which is not common in other parts of the island. Near Port Pleasant dark brown prevails, whereas south of Choisul Sound, which almost divides the island into two parts, white beasts with black heads and feet are the most common, in all parts black, and some spotted animals may be observed. Captain Sullivan remarks that the difference in the prevailing colors was so obvious that in looking for the herds near Port Pleasant, they appeared from a long distance like black spots, whilst south of Choisul Sound they appeared like white spots on the hillsides. Captain Sullivan thinks that the herds do not mingle, and it is a singular fact that the mouse-colored cattle, though living on the highland, came about a month earlier in the season than the other colored beasts on the lower land. It is interesting thus to find the once domesticated cattle breaking into three colors, of which some one color would in all probability ultimately prevail over the others if the herds were left undisturbed for the next several centuries. The rabbit is another animal which has been introduced and has succeeded very well, so that they abound over large parts of the island. Yet, like the horses, they are confined within certain limits, for they have not crossed the central chain of hills, nor would they have extended even so far as its pace, if, as the gauchos informed me, small colonies had not been carried there. I should not have supposed that these animals, natives of northern Africa, could have existed in a climate so humid as this, and which enjoys so little sunshine, that even we tripons only occasionally. It is asserted that in Sweden, which anyone would have thought a more favorable climate, the rabbit cannot live out of doors. The first few pairs, moreover, had here to contend against pre-existing enemies, in the fox and some large hawks. The French naturalists have considered the black variety a distinct species, and called it Leplus Magellanicus. 5. They imagined that Magellan, when talking of an animal under the name of Canegis in the Strait of Magellan, referred to this species, but he was alluding to a small cavi, which to this day, is thus called by the Spaniards. The Cauchos laughed at the idea of the black kind being different from the grey, and they said that at all events it had not extended its range any further than the grey kind, that the two were never found separate, and that they readily bred together, and produced bipod offspring. Of the latter I now possess a specimen, and it is marked about the head differently from the French specific description. This circumstance shows how cautious naturalists should be in making species, for even Cuvier, on looking at the skull of one of these rabbits, thought it was probably distinct. The only quadruped native to the island, 6, is a large wolf-like fox, Canis antarcticus, which is common to both East and West Falkland. I have no doubt it is a peculiar species, and confined to this archipelago, because many sealers, cauchos, and Indians, who have visited these islands, all maintain that no such animal is found in any part of South America. Molina, from a similarity in habits, thought that this was the same with his Calpiu, 7, but I have seen both, and they are quite distinct. These wolves are well known from Byron's account of their tameness and curiosity, 
which the sailors, who ran into the water to avoid them, mistook for fierceness. To this day their manners remain the same. They have been observed to enter a tent, and actually pull some meat from beneath the head of a sleeping seaman. The Kauchos also have frequently in the evening killed them, by holding out a piece of meat in one hand, and in the other a knife ready to stick them. As far as I'm aware, there is no other instance in any part of the world, of so small a mass of broken land, distant from a continent, possessing so large an aboriginal quadruped peculiar to itself. Their numbers have rapidly decreased, they are already banished from that half of the island which lies to the eastward of the neck of land between St. Salvador Bay and Berkeley Sound. Within a very few years after these islands shall have become regularly settled, in all probability this fox will be classed with the dodo, as an animal which has perished from the face of the earth. At night, 17th, we slept on the neck of land at the head of Choisul Sound, which forms the southwest peninsula. The valley was pretty well sheltered from the cold wind, but there was very little brushwood for fuel. The gauchos, however, soon found what, to my great surprise, made nearly as hot a fire as coals. This was the skeleton of a bullock lately killed, from which the flesh had been picked by the carrion hawks. They told me that in winter they often killed a beast, gleaned the flesh from the bones with their knives, and then with these same bones, roasted the meat for their suppers 18th drain during nearly the whole day. At night we managed, however, with our saddle cloths to keep ourselves pretty well dry and warm. But the ground on which we slept, was on each occasion nearly in the state of a bog, and there was not a dry spot to sit down on after our day's ride. I have in another part stated how singular it is, that there should be absolutely no trees on these islands, although Tierra del Fugo was covered by one large forest. The largest bush in the island, belonging to the family of Composity, is scarcely so tall as our gorse. The best fuel is afforded by a green little bush about the size of common heath, which has the useful property of burning, while fresh and green. It was very surprising to see the gauchos, in the midst of rain and everything soaking wet, with nothing more than a tinder box and a piece of rag, immediately make a fire. They sought beneath the tufts of grass and bushes for a few dry twigs, and these they rubbed into fibers, then surrounding them with coarser twigs, something like a bird's nest, they put the rag with its spark of fire in the middle, and covered it up. The nest being then held up to the wind, by degrees it smoked more and more, and at last burst out in flames. I do not think any other method would have had a chance of succeeding with such damp materials 19th, each morning, from not having ridden for some time previously, I was very stiff. I was surprised to hear the gauchos, who have from infancy almost lived on horseback, say that, under similar circumstances, they always suffer. Street Jacko told me, that having been confined for three months by illness, he went out hunting wild cattle, and in consequence, for the next two days, his thighs were, so stiff that he was obliged to lie in bed. This shows that the gauchos, although they do not appear to do so, yet really must exert much muscular effort in riding. The hunting wild cattle, in a country so difficult to pass as this is on account of the swampy ground, must be very hard work. The gauchos say they often pass at full speed over ground, which would be impassable at a slower pace, in the same manner as a man is able to skate over thin ice. When hunting, the party endeavors to get as close as possible to the herd without being discovered. Each man carries four or five pair of the bolas, these he throws one after the other at as many cattle, which, when once entangled, are left for some days till they become a little exhausted by hunger and struggling. They are then left free, and driven towards a small herd of tame animals, which have been brought to the spot on purpose. From their previous treatment, being too much terrified to leave the herd, they are easily driven, if their strength lasts out, to the settlement. The weather continued so very bad, that we determined to make a push, and try to reach the vessel before night. From the quantity of rain which had fallen, the surface of the whole country was swampy. I suppose my horse fell at least a dozen times, and sometimes the whole six horses were floundering in the mud together. All the little streams are bordered by soft peat, which makes it very difficult for the horses to leap them without falling. To complete our discomforts we were obliged to cross the head of a creek of the sea, in which the water was as high as our horses' backs, and the little waves, owing to the violence of the wind, broke over us, and made us very wet and cold. Even the iron-framed cauchos professed themselves glad, when they reached the settlement, after our little excursion. The geological structure of these islands is in most respects simple. The lower country consists of glace-laden sandstone, containing fossils, very closely related to, but not identical with, those found in the Silurian formations of Europe, the hills are formed of white granular quartz rock. The strata of the latter are frequently arched with perfect symmetry, and the appearance of some of the masses is in consequence most singular. Pernity, 8 has devoted several pages to the description of a hill of ruins, the successive strata of which he has justly compared to the seats of an amphitheater. 
the quartz rock must have been quite pristy when it underwent such remarkable flexures without being shattered into fragments. As the quartz insensibly passes into the sandstone, it seems probable that the former owes its origin to the sandstone having been heated to such a degree that it became viscid and to punctuling crystallized. While in the soft state it must have been pushed up through the overlying beds. In many parts of the island the bottoms of the valleys are covered in an extraordinary manner by myriads of great loose angular fragments of the quartz rock, forming streams of stones. These have been mentioned with surprise by every voyager since the time of Pernity. The blocks are not waterworn, their angles being only a little blunted, they vary in size from 1 or 2 feet in diameter to 10, or even more than 20 times as much. They are not thrown together into irregular piles, but are spread out into level sheets or great streams. It is not possible to ascertain their thickness, but the water of small streamlets can be heard trickling through the stones many feet below the surface. The actual depth is probably great, because the crevices between the lower fragments must long ago have been filled up with sand. The width of these sheets of stones varies from a few hundred feet to a mile, but the peaty soil daily encroaches on the borders and even forms islets wherever a few fragments happen to lie close together. In a valley south of Berkeley Sound, which some of our party called the Great Valley of Fragments, it was necessary to cross an uninterrupted band half a mile wide, by jumping from one pointed stone to another. So large were the fragments, that being overtaken by a shower of rain, I readily found shelter beneath one of them. Their little inclination is the most remarkable circumstance in these streams of stones. On the hillsides I have seen them sloping at an angle of 10 degrees with the horizon, but in some of the level, broad bottom valleys, the inclination is only just sufficient to be clearly perceived. On so rugged a surface there was no means of measuring the angle, but to give a common illustration, I may say, that the slope would not have checked the speed of an English mail coach. In some places, a continuous stream of these fragments followed up the course of a valley, and even extended to the very crest of the hill. On these crests huge masses, exceeding in dimensions any small building, seem to stand arrested in their headlong course, there, also, the curved strata of the archways lay piled on each other, like the ruins of some vast and ancient cathedral. In endeavouring to describe these scenes of violence one is tempted to pass from one simile to another. We may imagine that streams of white lava had flowed from many parts of the mountains into the lower country, and that when solidified they had been rent by some enormous convulsion into myriads of fragments. The expression streams of stones, which immediately occurred to everyone, conveys the same idea. These scenes are on the spot rendered more striking by the contrast of the low-rounded forms of the neighboring hills. I was interested by finding on the highest peak of one range, about 700 feet above the sea, a great arched fragment, lying on its convex side, or back downwards. Must we believe, that it was fairly pitched up in the air, and thus turned? Or, with more probability, that there existed formerly a part of the same range more elevated than the point on which this monument of a great convulsion of nature now lies. As the fragments in the valleys, are neither rounded nor the crevices filled up with sand, we must infer, that the period of violence was subsequent to the land, having been raised above the waters of the sea. In a transverse section within these valleys, the bottom is nearly level, or rises but very little towards either side. Hence the fragments appear to have traveled from the head of the valley, but in reality it seems more probable that they have been hurled down from the nearest slopes, and that since, by a vibratory movement of overwhelming force, 9, the fragments have been leveled into one continuous sheet. If during the earthquake, 10, which in 1835 overthrew Conception, in Chile, it was thought wonderful that small bodies should have been pitched a few inches from the ground, what must we say to a movement which has cost fragments many tons in weight? to move onwards like so much sand on a vibrating board, and find their level. I have seen, in the Cordillera of the Andes, the evident marks, where stupendous mountains have been broken into pieces like so much thin crust, and the strata thrown on their vertical edges, but never did any scene, like these streams of stones, so forcibly convey to my mind the idea of a convulsion, of which in historical records we might in vain seek for any counterpart, yet the progress of knowledge will probably someday give a simple explanation of this phenomenon, as it already has of the so long thought inexplicable transportal of the erratic boulders, which are strewed over the plains of Europe. I have little to remark on the zoology of these islands. I have before described the carrion vulture of Polyborus. There are some other hawks, owls, and a few small land birds. The waterfowl are particularly numerous, and they must formerly, from the accounts of the old navigators, have been much more so. One day I observed a cormorant playing with a fish which it had caught. Eight times successively the bird let its prey go, then dived after it, and although in deep water, brought it each time to the surface. In the zoological gardens I have seen the otter treat a fish in the same manner, much as a cat does a mouse, I do not know of any other instance, where Dame Nature appears so willfully cruel.
Another day, having placed myself between a penguin, a tenedice de mersa, and the water, I was much amused by watching its habits. It was a brave bird, until reaching the sea, it regularly fought, and drove me backwards. Nothing less than heavy blows would have stopped him, every inch he gained he firmly kept, standing close before me erect and determined. When I supposed he continually rolled his head from side to side, in a very odd manner, as if the power of distinct vision lay only in the interior and basal part of each eye. The spurt is commonly called the jackass penguin, from its habit, while on shore, of throwing its head backwards, and making a loud strange noise, very like the braying of an ass, but while at sea, and undisturbed, its note is very deep and solemn, and is often heard in the night time. In diving, its little wings are used as fins, but on the land, as front legs. When crawling, it may be set on four legs, through the tussocks, or on the side of a grassy cliff, it moves so very quickly, that it might easily be mistaken for a quadruped. When at sea and fishing, it comes to the surface for the purpose of breathing with such a spring, and dives again so instantaneously, that I defy anyone at first sight to be sure, that it was not a fish leaping for sport. Two kinds of geese frequent the Falklands. The upland species, Anas Magellanica, is common, in pairs and in small flocks, throughout the island. They do not migrate, but build on the small outlying islets. This is supposed to be from fear of the foxes, and it is perhaps from the same cause that these birds, though very tame by day, are shy and wild in the dusk of the evening. They live entirely on vegetable matter. The rock goose, so called from living exclusively on the sea beach, on his Antarctica, is common both here, and on the west coast of America, as far north as Chile. In the deep, and retired channels of Tierra del Fuego, the snout white gander, invariably accompanied by his darker consort, and standing close by each other on some distant rocky point, is a common feature in the landscape. In these islands a great liger-headed duck or goose, on his brachyptera, which sometimes weighs 22 pounds, is very abundant. These birds were in former days called, from their extraordinary manner of paddling and splashing upon the water, race horses, but now they are named, much more appropriately, steamers. Their wings are too small and weak to allow of flight, but by their aid, partly swimming and partly flapping the surface of the water, they move very quickly. The manner is something like that by which the common house duck escapes when pursued by a dog, but I'm nearly sure that the steamer moves its wings alternately, instead of both together, as in other birds. These glumsy, liger-headed ducks make such a noise and splashing, that the effect is exceedingly curious. Thus we find in South America three birds which use their wings for other purposes besides flight, the penguins as fins, the steamer as paddles, and the ostrich as sails, and the aptor as of New Zealand, as well as its gigantic extinct prototype the Dinornis, possess only rudimentary representatives of wings. The steamer is able to dive only to a very short distance. It feeds entirely on shellfish from the kelp and tidal rocks, and the beak and head, for the purpose of breaking them, are surprisingly heavy and strong. The head is so strong, that I have scarcely been able to fracture it with my geological hammer, and all our sportsmen soon discovered how tenacious these birds were of life. When in the evening pluming themselves in a flock, they make the same odd mixture of sounds which bullfrogs do within the tropics. In Tierra del Fuego, as well as in the Falkland Islands, I made many observations on the lower marine animals, 11, but they are of little general interest. I will mention only one class of facts, relating to certain zoophytes and the more highly organized division of that class. Several genera, Flustra, Eschera, Celeria, Crisha, and others, agree in having singular movable organs, like those of Flustra Navicularia, found in the European seas, attached to their cells. The organ, in the greater number of cases, very closely resembles the head of a vulture, but the lower mandible can be opened much wider than in a real bird's beak. The head itself possesses considerable powers of movement, by means of a short neck. In one zoophyte the head itself was fixed, but the lower jaw free, in another it was replaced by a triangular hood, with a beautifully fitted trap door, which evidently answered to the lower mandible. In the greater number of species, each cell was provided with one head, but in others each cell had two. The young cells at the end of the branches of these corallines contain quite a mature polypi, yet the vulture heads attached to them, though small, are in every respect perfect. When the polypus was removed by a needle from any of the cells, these organs did not appear in the least affected. When one of vulture-like heads was cut off from the cell, the lower mandible retained its power of opening and closing. Perhaps the most singular part of their structure is that when there were more than two rows of cells on a branch, the central cells were furnished with these appendages, of only one-fourth the size of the outside ones. Their movements varied according to the species, but in some I never saw the least motion, while others, with the lower mandible generally wide open, oscillated backwards and forwards at the rate of about five seconds each turn, others moved rapidly and by starts. 
when touched with the needle, the beak generally seized the point so firmly that the whole branch might be shaken. These bodies have no relation whatever with the production of the eggs or gemmules, as they are formed before the young polypi appear in the cells at the end of the growing branches, as they move independently of the polypi, and do not appear to be in any way connected with them, and as they differ in size on the outer and inner rows of cells, I have little doubt, that in their functions, they are related rather to the horny axis of the branches, than to the polypi in the cells. The fleshy appendage at the lower extremity of the sea pen, described at Bahia Blanca, also forms part of the zoophyte, as a whole, in the same manner as the roots of a tree form part of the whole tree, and not of the individual leaf or flower buds. In another elegant little coralline, Krisha, each cell was furnished with a long toothed bristle, which had the power of moving quickly. Each of these bristles and each of the vulture-like heads generally moved quite independently of the others, but sometimes all on both sides of a branch, sometimes only those on one side, moved together constantaneously, sometimes each moved in regular order one after another. In these actions we apparently behold as perfect a transmission of wool in the zoophyte, though composed of thousands of distinct polypi, as in any single animal. The case, indeed, is not different from that of the sea pence, which, when touched, threw themselves into the sand on the coast of Bahia Blanca. I will state one other instance of uniform action, though of a very different nature, in a zoophyte closely allied to Quisha, and therefore very simply organized. Having kept a large duft of it in a basin of salt water, when it was dark I found that as often as I rubbed any part of a branch, the whole became strongly phosphorescent with a green light, I do not think I ever saw any object more beautifully so. But the remarkable circumstance was, that the flashes of light always proceeded up the branches, from the base towards the extremities. The examination of these compound animals was always very interesting to me. What can be more remarkable than to see a plant-like body producing an egg, capable of swimming about, and of choosing a proper place to adhere to, which then sprouts into branches, each crowded with innumerable distinct animals, often of complicated organizations. The branches, moreover, as we have just seen, sometimes possess organs capable of movement and independent of the polypi. Surprising as this union of separate individuals in a common stock must always appear, every tree displays the same fact, for buds must be considered as individual plants. It is, however, natural to consider a polypus, furnished with the mouth, intestines, and other organs, as a distinct individual, whereas the individuality of the leaf bud is not easily realized, so that the union of separate individuals in a common body is more striking in a coralline than in a tree. Our conception of a compound animal, where in some respects the individuality of each is not completed, may be aided, by reflecting on the production of two distinct creatures, by bisecting a single one with a knife, or where nature herself performs the task of bisection. We may consider the polypi in a zoophyte, or the buds in a tree, as cases where the division of the individual has not been completely affected. Certainly in the case of trees, and judging from analogy, in that of corallines, the individuals propagated by buns seem more intimately related to each other than eggs or seeds are to their parents. It seems now pretty well established that plants propagated by buds all partake of a common duration of life, and it is familiar to everyone what singular and numerous peculiarities are transmitted with certainty by buds, layers, and grafts, which by seminal propagation never or only occasionally reappear. 1. The deserts of Syria are characterized, according to Volney, Dom I.P. 351, by woody bushes, numerous rats, gazelles, and hares. In the landscape of Patagonia, the guanaco replaces the gazelle, and the agouti the hare, too. I noticed that several hours before any one of the conners died, all the lice, with which it was infested, crawled to the outside feathers. I was assured, that this always happens. 3. London's Magazine of Nat. Best, Volume VI, 4. From accounts published since our voyage, and more especially from several interesting letters from Captain Sullivan, R.N., employed on the survey, it appears that we took an exaggerated view of the badness of the climate on these islands. But when I reflect on the almost universal covering of peat, and on the fact of wheat seldom ripening here, I can hardly believe that the climate in summer is so fine and dry as it has lately been represented. 5. Lesson Zoology of the Voyage of the Kekwil, draw my page 168. All the early voyagers, and especially Bougainville, distinctly state that the wolf-like fox was the only native animal on the island. The distinction of the rabbit as a species is taken from peculiarities in the fur, from the shape of the head, and from the shortness of the ears. I may here observe that the difference between the Irish and English hair rests upon nearly similar characters, only more strongly marked. 6. I have reason, however, to suspect that there is a field mouse. The common European rat and mouse have roamed far from the habitations of settlers. 
The common hog has also run wild on one islet, a lar of a black color. The boars are very fierce, and have great trunks. 7. The Kalpu is the Canis Magellanicus brought home by Captain King from the Strait of Magellan. It is common in Chile. 8. Pernity. Voyage of Isles Malawines. Page 526. 9. Now snap and spawn eat moins sasis de tronment a la pudil imbribble quantite de pierres de thouts grangers, how all overseas leon sir leoners, et sependent ranges, com cls of ayantita monsolis negligem and poor and plurid ampens. Un esse lasso et pot et myra lefets prodigux de la nature, printedy. Page 526, 10, an inhabitant of Mendoza, and hence well capable of judging, assured me that, during the several years he had resided on these islands, he had never felt the slightest shock of an earthquake. 11, I was surprised to find, on counting the eggs of a large white taurus, this sea slug was three and a half inches long, how extraordinarily numerous they were. From two to five eggs, each three thousandths of an inch in diameter, were contained in spherical little case. These were arranged too deep in transverse rows forming a ribbon. The ribbon adhered by its edge to the rock in an oval spire. One which I found, measured nearly twenty inches in length and half in breadth. By counting how many balls were contained in a tenth of an inch in the row, and how many rows in an equal length of the ribbon, on the most moderate computation there were six hundred thousand eggs. Yet this torus was certainly not very common, although I was often searching under the stones, I saw only seven individuals. No fallacy is more common with naturalists than that the numbers of an individual species depend on its powers of propagation. December 17, 1832 Having now finished with Patagonia and the Falkland Islands, I will describe our first arrival in Tierra del Fuego. A little after noon we doubled Cape Street Diego and entered the famous Strait of Lemaire. We kept close to the Fujian shore, but the outline of the rugged and hospitable Staten Land was visible amidst the clouds. In the afternoon we anchored in the Bay of Good Success. While entering we were saluted in a manner becoming the inhabitants of this savage land. A group of Fujians partly concealed by the entangled forest, were perched on a wild point overhanging the sea, and as we passed by, they sprang up, and waving their tattered cloaks sent forth a loud and sonorous shout. The savages followed the ship, and just before dark we saw their fire, and again heard their wild cry. The harbor consists of a fine piece of water half surrounded by low-rounded mountains of clay slate, which are covered to the water's edge by one dense gloomy forest. A single glance at the landscape was sufficient to show me how widely different it was from anything I had ever beheld. At night it blew a gale of wind, and heavy squalls from the mountains swept past us. It would have been a bedtime out at sea, and we, as well as others, may call this good success day. In the morning the captain sent a party to communicate with the Fugians. When we came within hail, one of the four natives who were present advanced to receive us, and began to shout most vehemently, wishing to direct us where to land. When we were on shore the party looked rather alarmed, but continued talking and making gestures with great rapidity. It was without exception the most curious and interesting spectacle I ever beheld. I could not have believed how wide was the difference between savage and civilized men. It is greater than between a wild and domesticated animal, inasmuch as in man there is a greater power of improvement. The chief spokesman was old, and appeared to be the head of the family. The three others were powerful young men, about six feet high. The women and children had been sent away. These Fugians are a very different race from the stunted, miserable wretches farther westward, and they seem closely allied to the famous Patagonians of the Strait of Magellan. Their only garment consists of a mantle made of guanaco skin, with the wool outside, this they wear just thrown over their shoulders, leaving their persons as often exposed as covered. Their skin is of a dirty copper red color. The old man had a fillet of white feathers tied round his head, which partly confined his black, coarse, and entangled hair. His face was crossed by two broad transverse spars, one, painted bright red, reached from ear to ear, and included the upper lip, the other, white like chalk, extended above and parallel to the first, so that even his eyelids were thus colored. The other two men were ornamented by streaks of black powder, made of charcoal. The party altogether closely resembled the devils which come on the stage, in plays like Dare Free Shots. Their very attitudes were abject, and the expression of their countenances distrustful, surprised, and startled. After we had presented them with some scarlet cloth, which they immediately tied round their necks, they became good friends. This was shown by the old man patting our breasts, and making a shuckling kind of noise, as people do when feeding chickens. I walked with the old man, and this demonstration of friendship was repeated several times. It was concluded by three hard slaps, which were given me on the breast, and back at the same time. He then bared his bosom for me to return the compliment, which being done, he seemed highly pleased. The language of these people, according to our notions, scarcely deserves to be called articulate. 
Captain Cook has compared it to a man clearing his throat, but certainly no European ever cleared his throat with so many hoarse, guttural, and clicking sounds. They are excellent mimics. As often as we coughed or yawned, or made any odd motion, they immediately imitated us. Some of our party began to squint and look her eye, but one of the young Fujians, whose whole face was painted black, excepting a white band across his eyes, succeeded in making far more hideous grimaces. They could repeat with perfect correctness each word in any sentence we addressed them, and they remembered such words for some time. Yet we Europeans all know how difficult it is to distinguish apart the sounds in a foreign language. Which of us, for instance, could follow an American Indian through a sentence of more than three words? All savages appear to possess, to an uncommon degree, this power of mimicry. I was told, almost in the same words, of the same ludicrous habit among the Kaffirs, the Australians, likewise, have long been notorious for being able to imitate and describe the gait of any man, so that he may be recognized. How can this faculty be explained, is it a consequence of the more practiced habits of perception and keener senses, common to all men in a savage state, as compared with those long civilized? When a song was struck up by our party, I thought the Fugians would have fallen down with astonishment. With equal surprise they viewed our dancing, but one of the young men, when asked, had no objection to a little waltzing. Little accustomed to Europeans as they appeared to be, yet they knew, and dreaded our firearms, nothing would tempt them to take a gun in their hands. They begged for knives, calling them by the Spanish word cachilla. They explained also what they wanted, by acting as if they had a piece of blubber in their mouth, and then pretending to cut instead of tear it. I have not as yet noticed the Fugians whom we had on board. During the former voyage of the Adventure and Beagle in 1826-1830, Captain Fitzroy seized on a party of natives, as hostages for the loss of a boat, which had been stolen, to the great jeopardy of the party employed on the survey, and some of these natives, as well as a child whom he bought for a pearl button, he took with him to England. Determining to educate them, and instruct them in religion at his own expense. To settle these natives in their own country, was one chief inducement, to Captain Fitzroy, to undertake our present voyage, and before the Admiralty had resolved to send out this expedition, Captain Fitzroy had generously chartered a vessel, and would himself have taken them back. The natives were accompanied by a missionary, R. Matthews, of whom and of the natives, Captain Fitzroy has published the full and excellent account. Two men, one of whom died in England of the small box, a boy and a little girl, were originally taken, and we had not on board. York Minster, Jemmy Button, whose name expresses his purchase money, and Fuji a basket. York Minster was a full-grown, short, thick, powerful man, his disposition was reserved, taciturn, morose, and when excited violently passionate, his affections were very strong towards a few friends on board, his intellect good. Jemmy Button was an universal favorite, but likewise passionate, the expression of his face at once showed his nice disposition. He was merry and often laughed, and was remarkably sympathetic with anyone in pain, when the water was rough, I was often a little seasick, and he used to come to me, and say in a plaintive voice, pure poor fellow, but the notion, after his aquatic life, of a man being seasick, was too ludicrous, and he was generally obliged to turn on one side, to hide a smile or laugh, and then he would repeat his poor, pure fellow. He was of a patriotic disposition, and he liked to praise his own tribe and country, in which he truly said there were plenty of trees, and he abused all the other tribes, he stoutly declared, that there was no devil in his land. Jemmy was short, thick, and fat, but vain of his personal appearance, he used always to wear gloves, his hair was neatly cut, and he was distressed, if his well-polished shoes were dirtied. He was fond of admiring himself in a looking-glass, and a merry-faced little Indian boy from the Rio Negro, whom we had for some months on board, soon perceived this, and used to mock him. Jemmy, who was always rather jealous of the attention paid to this little boy, did not at all like this, and used to say, with rather a contemptuous twist of his head, too much skylark. It seems yet wonderful to me, when I think over all his many good qualities, that he should have been of the same race, and doubtless partaken of the same character, with the miserable degraded savages whom we first met here. Lastly, Fujia Basca was a nice, modest, reserved young girl, with rather pleasing, but sometimes sullen expression, and very quick in learning anything, especially languages. This she showed in picking up some Portuguese and Spanish, when left on shore for only a short time at Rio de Janeiro and Montevideo, and in her knowledge of English. York Minster was very jealous of any attention paid to her, for it was clear he determined to marry her, as soon as they were settled on shore. Although all three could both speak and understand a good deal of English, it was singularly difficult to obtain much information from them, concerning the habits of their countrymen, this was partly owing to their apparent difficulty in understanding the simplest alternative. 
everyone accustomed to very young children, knows how seldom one can get an answer even to so simple a question, as whether a thing is black or white, the idea of black or white seems alternately to fill their minds. So it was with these fugions, and hence it was generally impossible to find out, by cross-questioning, whether one had rightly understood anything which they had asserted. Their sight was remarkably acute. It is well known that sailors, from long practice, can make out a distant object much better than landsmen, but both York and Jemmy were much superior to any sailor on board. Several times they have declared what some distant object has been, and though doubted by every one, they have proved right when it has been examined through a telescope. They were quite conscious of this power, and Jemmy, when he had any little quarrel with the officer on watch, would say, Me see ship, me no tell. It was interesting to watch the conduct of the savages, when we landed, towards Jemmy Button, they immediately perceived the difference between him and ourselves, and held much conversation one with another on the subject. The old man addressed a long harangue to Jemmy, which it seems, was to invite him to stay with them, but Jemmy understood very little of their language, and was, moreover, thoroughly ashamed of his countrymen. When York Minster afterwards came on shore, they noticed him in the same way, and told him he ought to shave, yet he had not twenty dwarf hairs on his face, whilst we all wore our untrimmed beards. They examined the color of his skin, and compared it with ours. One of our arms being bared, they expressed the liveliest surprise and admiration at its whiteness, just in the same way in which I have seen the orang outang at the zoological gardens. We thought that they must hook two or three of the officers, who were rather shorter and fairer, who adorned with large beards for the ladies of their party. The tallest amongst the Fugians was evidently much pleased at his height being noticed. When placed back to back with the tallest of the boat's crew, he tried his best to edge on higher ground and to stand on tiptoe. He opened his mouth to show his teeth and turned his face for a side view, and all this was done with such alacrity that I dare say he thought himself the handsomest man in Tierra del Fugo. After our first feeling of grave astonishment was over, nothing could be more ludicrous than the odd mixture of surprise and imitation which these savages every moment exhibited. The next day I attempted to penetrate some way into the country. Tierra del Fugo may be described as a mountainous land, partly submerged in the sea, so that deep inlets and bays occupy the place where valleys should exist. The mountainsides, except on the exposed western coast, are covered from the water's edge upwards by one great forest. The trees reach to an elevation of between 1,000 and 1,500 feet, and are succeeded by a band of peat, with minute alpine plants, and this again is succeeded by the line of perpetual snow, which, according to Captain King, in the Strait of Magellan descends to between 3,000 and 4,000 feet. To find an acre of level land in any part of the country is most rare. I recollect only one little flat piece near Port Famine, and another of rather larger extent near Go Road. In both places, and everywhere else, the surface is covered by a thick bed of swampy peat. Even within the forest, the ground is concealed by a mass of slowly putrefying vegetable matter, which, from being soaked with water, yields to the foot. Finding it nearly hopeless to push my way through the wood, I followed the course of a mountain torrent. At first, from the waterfalls and number of dead trees, I could hardly crawl along, but the bed of the stream soon became a little more open, from the floods having swept the sides. I continued slowly to advance for an hour along the broken and rocky banks, and was amply repaid by the grandeur of the scene. The gloomy depth of the ravine well accorded with the universal signs of violence. On every side, were lying irregular masses of rock and torn up trees, other trees, though still erect, were decayed to the heart and ready to fall. The entangled mass of the thriving and the fallen reminded me of the forests within the tropics, yet there was a difference, for in these still solitudes, death, instead of life, seemed the predominant spirit. I followed the watercourse till I came to a spot where a great slip had cleared a straight space down the mountainside. By this road I ascended to a considerable elevation, and obtained a good view of the surrounding woods. The trees all belong to one kind, the Fagus spiculoides, for the number of the other species of Fagus, and of the winter's bark, is quite inconsiderable. The speech keeps its leaves throughout the year, but its foliage is of a peculiar brownish-green color, with a tinge of yellow. As the whole landscape is thus colored, it has a somber dull appearance, nor is it often enlivened by the rays of the sun. December 20th, one side of the harbor is formed by a hill about 1500 feet high, which Captain Fitzroy has called after Sir J. Banks, in commemoration of his disastrous excursion, which proved fatal to two men of his party, and nearly so to Dr. Solander. The snowstorm, which was the cause of their misfortune, happened in the middle of January, corresponding to our July, and in the latitude of Drum. I was anxious to reach the summit of this mountain to collect alpine plants, for flowers of any kind in the lower parts, are few in number. We followed the same watercourse as on the previous day, till it dwindled away, and we were then compelled to crawl blindly among the trees. 
these, from the effects of the elevation, and of the impetuous winds, were low, thick and crooked. At length we reached that which from a distance appeared like a carpet of fine green turf, but which, to our vexation, turned out to be a compact mass of little peach trees about four or five feet high. They were as thick together as box in the border of a garden, and we were obliged to struggle over the flat but treacherous surface. After a little more trouble we gained the peat, and then the bare slate rock. A ridge connected this hill with another, distant some miles, and more lofty, so that patches of snow were lying on it. As the day was not far advanced, I determined to walk there, and collect plants along the road. It would have been very hard work, had it not been for a well-beaten and straight path made by the guanacus, for these animals, like sheep, always follow the same line. When we reached the hill we found it the highest in the immediate neighborhood, and the waters flowed to the sea in opposite directions. We obtained a wide view over the surrounding country, to the north a swampy moorland extended, but to the south we had a scene of savage magnificence, well becoming Tierra del Fuego. There was a degree of mysterious grandeur and mountain behind mountain, with the deep intervening valleys, all covered by one thick, dusky mass of forest. The atmosphere, likewise, in this climate, where gale succeeds gale, with rain, gale, and sleet, seems blacker than anywhere else. In the Strait of Magellan looking due southward from Port Famine, the distant channels between the mountains appeared from their gloominess to lead beyond the confines of this world. December 21st, the Beagle got under way, and on the succeeding day, favored to an uncommon degree by a fine easterly breeze, we closed in with the Barnevelts, and running past the Cape the Deceit with its stony peaks, about three o'clock doubled the weather-beaten Cape Horn. The evening was calm and bright, and we enjoyed a fine view of the surrounding isles. Cape Horn, however, demanded his tribute, and before night sent us a gale of wind directly in our teeth. We stood out to sea, and on the second day again made the land, when we saw in our weather bow this notorious promontory in its proper form, veiled in a mist, and its dim outline surrounded by a storm of wind and water. Great black clouds were rolling across the heavens, and squalls of rain, with hail, swept by us with such extreme violence, that the captain determined to run into Wigwam Cove. This is a snug little harbor, not far from Cape Horn, and here, at Christmas Eve, we anchored in smooth water. The only thing which reminded us of the gale outside, was every now, and then a puff from the mountains, which made the ship surge at her anchors. December 25th, close by the cove, or pointed hill, called Cater's Peak, rises to the height of 1700 feet. The surrounding islands all consist of conical masses of greenstone, associated sometimes with less regular hills of baked and altered clay slate. This part of Tierra del Fuego may be considered as the extremity of the submerged chain of mountains already alluded to. The cove takes its name of Wigwam from some of the Fujian habitations, but every bay in the neighborhood might be so called with equal propriety. The inhabitants, living chiefly upon shellfish, are obliged constantly to change their place of residence, but they return at intervals to the same spots, as is evident from the piles of oak shells, which must often amount to many tons in freight. These heaps can be distinguished at a long distance by the bright green color of certain plants, which invariably grow on them. Among these may be enumerated the wild celery and scarvy grass, two very serviceable plants, the use of which has not been discovered by the natives. The Fujian wigwam resembles, in size and dimensions, a haycock. It merely consists of a few broken branches stuck in the ground, and very imperfectly thatched on one side with a few tufts of grass and rushes. The hole cannot be the work of an hour, and it is only used for a few days. At Gori Roads I saw a place where one of these naked men had slept, which absolutely offered no more a cover than the form of a hare. The man was evidently living by himself, and York Minster said he was very bad man, and that probably he had stolen something. On the west coast, however, the wigwams are rather better, for they are covered with sealskins. We were detained here several days by the bad weather. The climate is certainly wretched, the summer solstice was now past, yet every day snow fell on the hills, and in the valleys there was rain, accompanied by sleet. The thermometer generally stood about 45 degs, but in the night, fell to 38 or 40 degs. From the damp and boisterous state of the atmosphere, not cheered by a gleam of sunshine, one fancied the climate even worse than it really was. While going one day on shore near Willaston Island, we pulled alongside a canoe with six fugitives. These were the most abject and miserable creatures I anywhere beheld. On the east coast the natives, as we have seen, have guanaco cloaks, and on the west they possess seal skins. Amongst these central tribes the men generally have an otter skin, or some small scrap about as large as a pocket handkerchief, which is barely sufficient to cover their backs as low down as their loins. It is laced across the breast by strings, and according as the wind blows, it is shifted from side to side. But these fugians in the canoe were quite naked, and even one full-grown woman was absolutely so. 
It was raining heavily, and the fresh water, together with the spray, trickled down her body. In another harbor not far distant, a woman, who was suckling a recently born child, came one day alongside the vessel, and remained there out of mere curiosity, whilst the sleet fell, and thawed on her naked bosom, and on the skin of her naked baby. These poor wretches were stunted in their growth, their hideous faces bedogged with white paint, their skins filthy and greasy, their hair entangled, their voices discordant, and their gestures violent. Viewing such men, one can hardly make oneself believe that they are fellow creatures and inhabitants of the same world. It is a common subject of conjecture, what pleasure in life some of the lower animals can enjoy, how much more reasonably the same question may be asked with respect to these barbarians. At night, five or six human beings, naked and scarcely protected from the wind and rain of this tempestuous climate, sleep on the wet ground, coiled up like animals. Whenever it is low water, winter, or summer, night, or day, they must rise to pick shellfish from the rocks, and the women either dive to collect sea eggs, or sit patiently in their canoes, and with abated hairline without any hook, jerk out little fish. If a seal is killed, or the floating carcass of a putrid whale is discovered, it is a feast, and such miserable food is assisted by a few tasteless berries and fungi. They often suffer from famine, I heard Mr. Lowe, a sealing master intimately acquainted with the natives of this country, give a curious account of the state of a party of 150 natives on the west coast, who were very thin, and in great distress. A succession of gales prevented the women from getting shellfish on the rocks, and they could not go out in their canoes to catch seal. A small party of these men one morning set out, and the other Indians explained to him that they were going a four days journey for food. On their return, Lo went to meet them, and he found them excessively tired, each man carrying a great square piece of putrid whale's blubber with a hole in the middle, through which they put their heads, like the gauchos do through their ponchos or cloaks. As soon as the blubber was brought into a wigwam, an old man cut off thin slices, and muttering over them, broiled them for a minute, and distributed them to the famished party, who during this time, preserved a profound silence. Mr. Lowe believes that, whenever a whale is cast on shore, the natives bury large pieces of it in the sand, as a resource in time of famine, and a native boy, whom he had on board, once found a stock thus buried. The different tribes when at war are cannibals. From the concurrent, but quite independent evidence of the boy taken by Mr. Lowe, and of Jemmy Button, it is certainly true, that when pressed in winter by hunger, they kill and devour their old women, before they kill their dogs, the boy, being asked by Mr. Lowe, why they did this, answered, doggies catch otters, old women no. This boy described the manner in which they are killed, by being held over smoke and piss choked, he imitated their screams as a joke, and described the parts of their bodies which are considered best to eat. For it is such a death by the hands of their friends and relatives must be, the fears of the old women, when hunger begins to press, are more painful to think of, we are told, that they then often run away into the mountains, but that they are pursued by the men, and brought back to the slaughterhouse at their own firesides. Captain Fitzroy could never ascertain, that the Fugians have any distinct belief in a future life. They sometimes bury their dead in caves, and sometimes in the mountain forests, we do not know what ceremonies they perform. Jemmy Button would not eat land birds, because eat dead men they are unwilling even to mention their dead friends. We have no reason to believe that they perform any sort of religious worship, though perhaps the muttering of the old man, before he distributed the putrid blubber to his famished party, may be of this nature. Each family or tribe has a wizard or a conjuring doctor, whose office we could never clearly ascertain. Jemmy believed in dreams, though not, as I have said, in the devil, I do not think that our fugians were much more superstitious than some of the sailors, for an old quartermaster firmly believed that the success of heavy gales, which we encountered off Cape Horn, were caused by our having the fugians on board. The nearest approach to a religious feeling which I had heard of was shown by York Minster, who, when Mr. Bino shot some very young ducklings as specimens, declared in the most solemn manner, Oh, Mr. Bino, much rain, snow, blow much. This was evidently a retributive punishment for wasting human food. In a wild and excited manner he also related that his brother, one day whilst returning to pick up some dead birds which he had left on the coast, observed some feathers blown by the wind. His brother said, York imitating his manner, what that, and crawling onwards, he peeped over the cliff, and saw a wild man picking his birds, he crawled a little nearer, and then hurled down a great stone and killed him. York declared for a long time afterwards storms raged, and much rain and snow fell. As far as we could make out, he seemed to consider the elements themselves as the avenging agents, it is evident in this case, how naturally, in a race a little more advanced in culture, the elements would become personified. 
what the bad wild men were, has always appeared to me most mysterious, from what York said, when we found the place like the form of a hare, where a single man had slept the night before, I should have thought, that they were thieves who had been driven from their tribes, but other obscure speeches made me doubt this, I have sometimes imagined, that the most probable explanation was, that they were insane. The different tribes have no government or chief, yet each is surrounded by other hostile tribes, speaking different dialects, and separated from each other only by a deserted border or neutral territory, the cause of their warfare appears to be the means of subsistence. Their country is a broken mass of wild rocks, lofty hills, and useless forests, and these are viewed through mists and endless storms. The habitable land is reduced to the stones on the beach, in search of food they are compelled unceasingly, to wander from spot to spot, and so steep is the coast, that they can only move about in their wretched canoes. They cannot know the feeling of having a home, and still less, that of domestic affection, for the husband is to the wife a brutal master to a laborious slave. Was a more horrid deed ever perpetrated, than that witnessed on the west coast by Byron, who saw a wretched mother pick up her bleeding dying infant boy, whom her husband had mercilessly dashed on the stones for dropping a basket of sea eggs. How little can the higher powers of the mind be brought into play, what is there for imagination to picture, for reason to compare, or judgment to decide upon, to knock Olympic from the rock? does not require even cunning, that lowest power of the mind. Their skill in some respects, may be compared to the instinct of animals, for it is not improved by experience, the canoe, their most ingenious work, pure as it is, has remained the same, as we know from Drake, for the last two hundred and fifty years. Whilst beholding these savages, one asks, whence have they come? What could have tempted, or what change compelled a tribe of men, to leave the fine regions of the north? to travel down the Cordillera or backbone of America, to invent and build canoes, which are not used by the tribes of Chile, Peru, and Brazil, and then to enter on one of the most inhospitable countries within the limits of the globe. Although such reflections must at first seize on the mind, yet we may feel sure, that they are partly erroneous. There is no reason to believe, that the Fugians decrease in number, therefore we must suppose, that they enjoy a sufficient share of happiness, of whatever kind it may be, to render life worth having. Nature by making habit omnipotent, and its effects hereditary, has fitted the Fugian to the climate and the productions of his miserable country. After having been detained six days in Wigwam Cove by very bad weather, we put to sea on the 30th of December. Captain Fitzroy wished to get westward, to land York and Fugian in their own country. When at sea we had a constant succession of gales, and the current was against us, we drifted to 57 degs 23 foot south. On the 11th of January, 1833, by carrying a press of sail, we fetched within a few miles of the great rugged mountain of York Minster, so called by Captain Cook, and the origin of the name of the elder Fugian, when a violent squall compelled us to shorten sail, and stand out to sea. The surf was breaking fearfully on the coast, and the spray was carried over a cliff estimated to 200 feet in height. On the 12th the gale was very heavy, and we did not know exactly where we were, it was a most unpleasant sound to hear constantly repeated, keep a good look out to leeward. On the 13th the storm raged with its full fury, our horizon was narrowly limited by the sheets of spray borne by the wind. The sea looked ominous, like a dreary waving plain with patches of drifted snow, whilst the ship labored heavily, the albatross glided with its expanded wings right up the wind. At noon a great sea broke over us, and filled one of the whale boats, which was obliged to be instantly cut away. The poor beagle trembled at the shock, and for a few minutes would not obey her helm, but soon, like a good ship that she was, she righted and came up to the wind again. Had another sea followed the first, our fate would have been decided soon, and forever. We had now been twenty-four days trying in vain to get westward, the men were worn out with fatigue, and they had not had for many nights or days a dry thing to put on. Captain Fitzroy gave up the attempt, to get westward by the outside coast. In the evening we ran in behind false Cape Horn, and dropped our anchor and forty-seven fathoms, fire flashing from the windlass as the chain rushed round it. How delightful was that still night, after having been so long involved in the din of the warring elements. January 15, 1833 The Beagle anchored and go railroads. Captain Fitzroy having resolved to settle the Fugians, according to their wishes, in Ponsonby Sound, four boats were equipped to carry them there through the Beagle Channel. This channel, which was discovered by Captain Fitzroy during the last voyage, is a most remarkable feature in the geography of this, or indeed of any other country, it may be compared to the Valley of Loch Ness in Scotland, with its chain of lakes and friths. It is about 120 miles long, with an average breadth, not subject to any very great variation, of about two miles, and is throughout the greater part so perfectly straight, that the view, bounded on each side by a line of mountains, gradually becomes indistinct in the long distance. 
It crosses the southern part of Tierra del Fuego in an east and west line, and in the middle is joined at right angles on the south side by an irregular channel, which has been called Ponson B Sound. This is the residence of Jemmy Button's tribe and family 19th, three whale boats and the all, with a party of 28, started under the command of Captain Fitzroy. In the afternoon we entered the eastern mouth of the channel, and shortly afterwards found a snug little cove concealed by some surrounding islets. Here we pitched our tents, and lighted our fires. Nothing could look more comfortable than this scene. The glassy water of the little harbor, with the branches of the trees hanging over the rocky beach, the boats at anchor, the tents supported by the cross doors, and the smoke curling up the wooded valley, formed a picture of quiet retirement. The next day, 20th. We smoothly glided onwards in our little fleet, and came to a more inhabited district. Few if any of these natives could ever have seen a white man, certainly nothing could exceed their astonishment at the apparition of the four boats. Fires were lighted on every point, hence the name of Tierra del Fugo, or the Land of Fire, both to attract our attention, and to spread far and wide the news. Some of the men ran for miles along the shore. I shall never forget how wild and savage one group appeared, suddenly four or five men came to the edge of an overhanging cliff, they were absolutely naked, and their long hair streamed about their faces, they held rugged staffs in their hands, and, springing from the ground, they waved their arms round their heads, and sent forth the most hideous yells. At dinner time we landed among a party of fugians. At first they were not inclined to be friendly, for until the captain pulled in ahead of the other boats, they kept their slings in their hands. We soon... However, delighted them by trifling presents, such as tying red tape round their heads. They liked our biscuit, but one of the savages touched with his finger some of the meat preserved in tin cases which I was eating, and feeling it soft and cold, showed as much disgust at it, as I should have done at putrid blubber. Jemmy was thoroughly ashamed of his countrymen, and declared his own tribe were quite different, in which he was woefully mistaken. It was as easy to please as it was difficult to satisfy these savages. Young and old, men and children, never ceased repeating the word Yammerskinner, which means give me. After pointing to almost every object, one after the other, even to the buttons on our coats, and saying their favorite word in as many intonations as possible, they would then use it in a neuter sense, and patently repeat Yammerskinner. After Yammerskinnering for any article very eagerly, they would by a simple artifice point to their young women or little children, as much as to say, if you will not give it me, surely you will to such as these. At night we endeavored in vain to find an uninhabited cove, and at last were obliged to bivouac not far from a party of natives. They were very inoffensive as long as they were few in numbers, but in the morning, 21st, being joined by others they showed symptoms of hostility, and we thought that we should have come to a skirmish. An European labors under great disadvantages when treating with savages like these, who have not the least idea of the power of firearms. In the very act of leveling his musket he appears to the savage far inferior to a man armed with a bow and arrow, a spear, or even a sling. Nor is it easy to teach them our superiority, except by striking a fatal blow. Like wild beasts, they do not appear to compare numbers, for each individual, if attacked, instead of retiring, will endeavor to dash your brains out with a stone, as certainly as a tiger under similar circumstances would tear you. Captain Fitzroy on one occasion being very anxious, from good reasons, to frighten away a small party, first flourished a cutlass near them, at which they only laughed, he then twice fired his pistol close to a native. The man both times looked astounded, and carefully but quickly rubbed his head, he then stared a while, and gabbled to his companions, but he never seemed to think of running away. We can hardly put ourselves in the position of these savages and understand their actions. In the case of this fugion, the possibility of such a sound as the report of a gun close to his ear could never have entered his mind. He perhaps literally did not for a second know whether it was a sound or a blow, and therefore very naturally rubbed his head. In a similar manner, when a savage sees a mark struck by a bullet, it may be some time before he is able at all to understand how it is affected, for the fact of a body being invisible from its velocity would perhaps be to him an idea totally inconceivable. Moreover, the extreme force of a bullet, that penetrates a hard substance without tearing it, may convince the savage, that it is no force at all. Certainly I believe, that many savages of the lowest grade, such as these of Tierra del Fugo, have seen objects struck, and even small animals killed by the musket, without being in the least aware how deadly an instrument it is twenty-second, after having passed an unmolested night, in what would appear to be neutral territory between Jemmy's tribe and the people whom we saw yesterday. We sailed pleasantly along. I do not know anything which shows more clearly the hostile state of the different tribes, than these wide border or neutral tracks. Although Jemmy Button well knew the force of their party, he was, at first, unwilling to land amidst the hostile tribe nearest to his own. 
He often told us how the Savage Jones men when the leaf red, crossed the mountains from the eastern coast of Tierra del Fuego and made inroads on the natives of this part of the country. It was most curious to watch him when thus talking and see his eyes gleaming and his whole face assume a new and wild expression. As we proceeded along the Beagle Channel, the scenery assumed a peculiar and very magnificent character, but the effect was much lessened from the lowness of the point of view in a boat and from looking along the valley and thus losing all the beauty of a succession of ridges. The mountains were here about 3,000 feet high and terminated in sharpened jagged joints. They rose in one unbroken sweep from the water's edge and were covered to the height of 14 or 1500 feet by the dusky colored forest. It was most curious to observe, as far as the eye could range, how level and truly horizontal the line on the mountainside was, at which trees ceased to grow, it precisely resembled the high water mark of driftweed on a sea beach. At night we slept close to the junction of Ponce and Besond with the Beagle Channel. A small family of Fugians, who were living in the cove, were quieted and inoffensive, and soon joined our party around a blazing fire. We were well clothed, and though sitting close to the fire were far from too warm, yet these naked savages, though further off, were observed, to our great surprise, to be streaming with perspiration at undergoing such a roasting. They seemed, however, very well pleased, and all joined in the chorus of the seamen's songs, but the manner in which they were invariably a little behind hand was quite ludicrous during the night the news had spread, and early in the morning, 23rd, a fresh party arrived, belonging to the Tekanuka, or Jemmy's tribe. Several of them had run so fast that their noses were bleeding, and their mouths frothed from the rapidity with which they talked, and with their naked bodies all bedogged with black, white, one, and red, they looked like so many demoniacs who had been fighting. We then proceeded, accompanied by twelve canoes, each holding four or five people, down Ponce and Bisson to the spot where poor Jemmy expected to find his mother and relatives. He had already heard that his father was dead, but as he had had a dream in his head to that effect, he did not seem to care much about it, and repeatedly comforted himself with the very natural reflection, me no help it. He was not able to learn any particulars regarding his father's death, as his relations would not speak about it. Jemmy was now in a district well known to him, and invited the boats to a quiet pretty cove named Wulaya, surrounded by islets, every one of which, and every point had its proper native name. We found here a family of Jemmy's tribe, but not his relations, we made friends with them, and in the evening they sent a canoe, to inform Jemmy's mother and brothers. The cove was bordered by some acres of good sloping land, not covered, as elsewhere, either by peat or by forest trees. Captain Fitzroy originally intended, as before stated, to have taken York Minster and Fuji to their own tribe on the west coast, but as they expressed a wish to remain here, and as the spot was singularly favorable. Captain Fitzroy determined to settle here the whole party, including Matthews, the missionary. Five days were spent in building for them three large wigwams, in landing their goods, in digging two gardens, and sowing seeds. The next morning after our arrival, the 24th, the Fugians began to pour in, and Jemmy's mother and brothers arrived. Jemmy recognized the stentorian voice of one of his brothers at a prodigious distance. The meeting was less interesting than that between a horse turned out into a field when he joins an old companion. There was no demonstration of affection, they simply stared for a short time at each other, and the mother immediately went to look after her canoe. We heard, however, through York that the mother has been inconsolable for the loss of Jemmy, and had searched everywhere for him, thinking that he might have been left, after having been taken in the boat. The women took much notice of, and were very kind to Fujia. We had already perceived that the Jemmy had almost forgotten his own language. I should think there was scarcely another human being with so small a stock of language, for his English was very imperfect. It was laughable, but almost pitiable, to hear him speak to his wild brother in English, and then ask him in Spanish, no save, whether he did not understand him. Everything went on peaceably during the three next days whilst the gardens were digging in wigwams building. We estimated the number of natives at about 120. The women worked hard, whilst the men lounged about all day long, watching us. They asked for everything they saw, and stole what they could. They were delighted at our dancing and singing, and were particularly interested at seeing us wash in a neighboring brook. They did not pay much attention to anything else, not even to our boats. Of all the things which York saw, during his absence from his country, nothing seems more to have astonished him than an ostrich. Near Maldonado, breathless with astonishment he came running to Mr. Bino, with him he was out walking. Oh, Mr. Bino, oh, bird all same horse. Much as our wide skins surprised the natives, by Mr. Lowe's account the negro cute to a sealing vessel, did so more effectually, and the poor fellow was so mobbed and shouted at, that he would never go on shore again. Everything went on so quietly, that some of the officers and myself took long walks in the surrounding hills and woods. 
Suddenly, however, on the 27th, every woman and child disappeared. We were all uneasy at this, as neither York nor Jemmy could make out the cause. It was thought by some, that they had been frightened by our cleaning and firing off our muskets on the previous evening, by others, that it was owing to offense taken by an old savage, who, what old to keep further off, had coolly spit in the sentry's face, and had then, by gestures acted over a sleeping fujin, plainly showed, as it was said, that he should like to cut up, and eat our man. Captain Fitzroy, to avoid the chance of an encounter, which would have been fatal to so many of the fujins, thought it advisable for us to sleep at a cove a few miles distant. Matthews, with his usual quiet fortitude, remarkable in a man apparently possessing little energy of character, determined to stay with the Fugians, who evinced no alarm for themselves, and so we left them to pass their first awful night. On our return in the morning, 28th, we were delighted to find all quiet, and the men employed in their canoes spearing fish. Captain Fitzroy determined to send the all and one whale boat back to the ship, and to proceed with the two other boats, one under his own command, in which he most kindly allowed me to accompany him, and one under Mr. Hammond, to survey the western parts of the Beagle Channel, and afterwards to return, and visit the settlement. The day to our astonishment was overpoweringly hot, so that our skins were scorched, with this beautiful weather, the view in the middle of the Beagle Channel was very remarkable. Looking towards either hand, no object intercepted the vanishing points of this long canal between the mountains. The circumstance of its being an arm of the sea was rendered very evident by several huge whales, too, spouting in different directions. On one occasion I saw two of these monsters, probably male and female, slowly swimming one after the other, within less than a stone's throw of the shore, over which the beech tree extended its branches. We sailed until it was dark, and then pitched our tents in a quiet creek. The greatest luxury was to find for our beds a beach of pebbles, for they were dry, and yielded to the body. Peaty soil is damp, rock is uneven and hard, sand gets into one's meat, what you can eat in both fashion, but when lying in our blanket bags, on a good bed of smooth pebbles, we passed most comfortable nights. It was my watch till one o'clock. There is something very solemn in these scenes. At no time, does the consciousness in what a remote corner of the world you are then standing, come so strongly before the mind. Everything tends to this effect, the stillness of the night is interrupted only by the heavy breathing of the seamen beneath the tents, and sometimes by the cry of a night bird. The occasional barking of a dog, heard in the distance, reminds one that it is the land of the savage. January 20th, early in the morning we arrived at the point, where the Beagle Channel divides into two arms, and we entered the northern one. The scenery here becomes even grander than before. The lofty mountains on the north side compose the granitic axis, or backbone of the country and boldly rise to a height of between three and four thousand feet, with one peak above six thousand feet. They are covered by a wide mantle of perpetual snow, and numerous cascades pour their waters, through the woods, into the narrow channel below. In many parts, magnificent glaciers extend from the mountain side to the water's edge. It is scarcely possible to imagine anything more beautiful than the barrel-like blue of these glaciers, and especially as contrasted with the dead white of the upper expanse of snow. The fragments which had fallen from the glacier into the water were floating away, and the channel with its icebergs presented, for the space of a mile, a miniature likeness of the polar sea. The boats being hauled on shore at our dinner hour, we were admiring from the distance of half a mile a perpendicular cliff of ice, and were wishing that some more fragments would fall. At last, down came a mass with a roaring noise, and immediately we saw the smooth outline of the wave traveling towards us. The men ran down as quickly as they could to the boats, for the chance of their being dashed to pieces was evident. One of the seamen just caught hold of the bows, as the curling breaker reached it, he was knocked over and over, but not hurt, and the boats, though thrice lifted on high and let fall again, received no damage. This was most fortunate for us, for we were a hundred miles distant from the ship, and we should have been left without provisions or firearms. I had previously observed that some large fragments of rock on the beach had been lately displaced, but until seeing this wave, I did not understand the cause. One side of the creek was formed by a spur of micaslet, the head by a cliff of ice about 40 feet high, and the other side by a promontory 50 feet high, built up of huge rounded fragments of granite and mica slate, out of which old trees were growing. This promontory was evidently a moraine, heaped up at a period when the glacier had greater dimensions. When we reached the western mouth of this northern branch of the Beagle Channel, we sailed amongst many unknown desolate islands, and the weather was wretchedly bad. We met with no natives. The coast was almost everywhere so steep that we had several times to pull many miles before we could find space enough to pitch our two tents. One night we slept on large round boulders with putrefying seaweed between them, and when the tide rose, we had to get up and move our blanket bags. 
The farthest point westward which we reached was Stewart Island, a distance of about 150 miles from our ship. We returned into the Beagle Channel by the southern arm, and thence proceeded, with no adventure, back to Ponsonby Sound. February 6, we arrived at Woolaya. Matthews gave so bad an account of the conduct of the Fugians that Captain Fitzroy determined to take him back to the Beagle, and ultimately he was left at New Zealand, where his brother was a missionary. From the time of their leaving, a regular system of plunder commenced, fresh parties of the natives kept arriving, York and Jemmy lost many things, and Matthews almost everything which had not been concealed underground. Every article seemed to have been thorn up and divided by the natives. Matthews described the watch he was obliged always to keep as most harassing, night and day he was surrounded by the natives, who tried to tire him out by making an incessant noise close to his head. One day an old man, whom Matthews asked to leave his wigwam, immediately returned with a large stone in his hand. Another day a whole party came armed with stones and stakes, and some of the younger men and Jemmy's brother were crying. Matthews met them with presents. Another party showed by signs that they wished to strip him naked and pluck all the hairs out of his face and body. I think we arrived just in time to save his life. Jemmy's relatives had been so vain and foolish that they had showed to strangers their plunder and their manner of obtaining it. It was quite melancholy leaving the three fugians with their savage countrymen, but it was a great comfort that they had no personal fears. York, being a powerful resolute man, was pretty sure to get unwell, together with his wife Fugia. Pure Jemmy looked rather disconsolate, and would then, I have little doubt, have been glad to have returned with us. His own brother had stolen many things from him, and as he remarked, what fashion called it, he abused his countrymen, all bad men, no save, no, nothing, and, though I never heard him swear before, am fools. Our three fugians, though they had been only three years with civilized men, would, I'm sure, have been glad to have retained their new habits, but this was obviously impossible. I fear it is more than doubtful whether their visit will have been of any use to them. In the evening, with Matthews on board, we made sail back to the ship, not by the Beagle Channel, but by the southern coast. The boats were heavily laden and the sear off, and we had a dangerous passage. By the evening of the 7th we were on board the Beagle after an absence of 20 days, during which time we had gone 300 miles in the open boats. On the 11th, Captain Fitzroy paid a visit by himself to the Fugians, and found them going on well, and that they had lost very few more things. On the last day of February in the succeeding year, 1834, the Beagle anchored in a beautiful little cove at the eastern entrance of the Beagle Channel. Captain Fitzroy determined on the bold, and as it proved successful, attempted to beat against the westerly winds by the same route, which we had followed in the boats to the settlement at Woolaya. We did not see many natives, until we were near Ponsonby Sound, where we were followed by ten or twelve canoes. The natives did not at all understand the reason of their tacking, and, instead of meeting us at each tack, vainly strove to follow us in our zigzag course. I was amused at finding what a difference the circumstance of being quite superior in force made in the interest of beholding these savages. While in the boats I got to hate the very sound of their voices, so much trouble did they give us. The first and last word was Yammerskinner. When, entering some quiet little cove, we have looked round and thought to pass a quiet night, the odious word Yammerskinner has shrilly sounded from some gloomy nook, and then the little signal smoke has curled up to spread the news far and wide. On leaving some place we have said to each other, thank heaven, we have at last fairly left these wretches, when one more faint hallow from an all-powerful voice, heard at a prodigious distance, would reach our ears, and clearly could we distinguish, Yammerskinner. But now, the more fugions the merrier, and very merry work it was. Both parties laughing, wondering, gaping at each other, we pitying them, for giving us good fish and crabs for rags, etc., they grasping at the chance of finding people so foolish as to exchange such splendid ornaments for a good supper. It was most amusing to see the undisguised smile of satisfaction with which one young woman with her face painted black, tied several bits of scarlet cloth round her head with rushes. Her husband, who enjoyed the very universal privilege in this country of possessing two wives, evidently became jealous of all the attention paid to his young wife, and, after a consultation with his naked beauties, was paddled away by them. Some of the fugians plainly showed that they had a fair notion of barter. I gave one man a large nail, a most valuable present, without making any signs for a return, but he immediately picked out two fish and handed them up on the point of his spear. If any present was designed for one canoe, and it fell near another, it was invariably given to the right owner. The Fugian boy, whom Mr. Lowe had on board showed, by going into the most violent passion, that he quite understood the reproach of being called a liar, which in truth he was. We were this time, as on all former occasions, much surprised at the little notice, or rather none whatever, which was taken of many things, the use of which must have been evident to the natives. 
simple circumstances, such as the beauty of scarlet cloth or blue beads, the absence of women, our care in washing ourselves, excited their admiration far more than any grand or complicated object, such as our ship. Bougainville has well remarked concerning these people, that they treat the chef stirred deal industry humane, Camille's trade and leoix deal on nature et ses phenomenes on the 5th of March, we anchored in a cove at Rulaya, but we saw not a soul there. We were alarmed at this, for the natives in Ponce and Bisson showed by gestures, that there had been fighting, and we afterwards heard, that the dreaded owns men had made a descent. Sudakanyu, with a little flag flying, was seen approaching, with one of the men in a washing the paint off his face. This man was poor Jemmy, now a thin, haggard savage, with long disordered hair, and naked, except a bit of blanket round his waist. We did not recognize him till he was close to us, for he was ashamed of himself, and turned his back to the ship. We had left him plump, fat, clean, and well-dressed, I never saw so complete and grievous a change. As soon, however, as he was clothed, and the first flurry was over, things wore a good appearance. He dined with Captain Fitzroy, and ate his dinner as tightly as formerly. He told us, that he had too much meaning enough, to eat, that he was not cold, that his relations were very good people, and that he did not wish to go back to England, in the evening we found out the cause of this great change in Jemmy's feelings, in the arrival of his young and nice looking wife. With his usual good feeling he brought two beautiful otter skins for two of his best friends, and some spearheads and arrows made with his own hands for the captain. He said he had built a canoe for himself, and he boasted, that he could talk a little of his own language. But it is a most singular fact, that he appears to have taught all his tribe some English, an old man spontaneously announced Jemmy Button's wife. Jemmy had lost all his property. He told us, that York Minster had built a large canoe, and with his wife Fujia, three, had several months since got to his own country, and had taken farewell by an act of consummate villainy, he persuaded Jemmy and his mother to come with him, and then on the way, deserted them by night, stealing every article of their property. Jemmy went to sleep on shore, and in the morning returned, and remained on board till the ship got underway, which frightened his wife, who continued crying violently till he got into his canoe. He returned loaded with valuable property. Every soul on board, was heartily sorry to shake hands with him for the last time. I do not now doubt, that he will be as happy as, perhaps happier, than, if he had never left his own country. Everyone must sincerely hope that Captain Fitzroy's noble hope may be fulfilled, of being rewarded for the many generous sacrifices which he made for these Fujians, by some shipwrecked sailor being protected by the descendants of Jemmy Button and his tribe. When Jemmy reached the shore, he lighted a signal fire, and the smoke curled up, bidding as a last and long farewell, as the ship stood on her course into the open sea. The perfect equality among the individuals composing the Fujian tribes must for a long time retard their civilization. As we see those animals, whose instinct compels them to live in society, and obey a chief, are most capable of improvement, so is it with the races of mankind. Whether we look at it as a cause or a consequence, the more civilized always have the most artificial governments. For instance, the inhabitants of Atehanite, who, when first discovered, were governed by hereditary kings, had arrived at a far higher grade than another branch of the same people, the New Zealanders, who, although benefited by being compelled to turn their attention to agriculture, were republicans in the most absolute sense. In Tierra del Fugo, until some chief shall arise with power sufficient to secure any acquired advantage, such as the domesticated animals, it seems scarcely possible that the political state of the country can be improved. At present, even a piece of cloth given to one is torn into shreds and distributed, and no one individual becomes richer than another. On the other hand, it is difficult to understand but a chief can arise till there is property of some sort by which he might manifest his superiority and increase his power. I believe, in this extreme part of South America, man exists in a lower state of improvement than in any other part of the world. The South Sea Islanders, of the two races inhabiting the Pacific, are comparatively civilized. The Esquimau in his subterranean hut, enjoys some of the comforts of life, and in his canoe, when fully equipped, manifests much skill. Some of the tribes of southern Africa prowling about in search of roots, and living concealed on the wild and arid plains, are sufficiently wretched. The Australian, in the simplicity of the arts of life, comes nearest the Fujian, he can, however, boast of his boomerang, his spear and throwing stick, his method of climbing trees, of tracking animals, and of hunting. Although the Australian may be superior in acquirements, it by no means, follows that he is likewise superior in mental capacity, indeed, from what I saw of the Fujians when on board, and from what I have read of the Australians, I should think the case was exactly the reverse. And the end of May, 1834, we entered for a second time the eastern mouth of the Strait of Magellan.
The country on both sides of this part of the strait consists of nearly level plains, like those of Patagonia. Cape Negro, a little within the second narrows, may be considered as the point where the land begins to assume the marked features of Tierra del Fuego. On the east coast, south of the strait, broken park-like scenery in a like manner connects these two countries, which are opposed to each other in almost every feature. It is truly surprising to find in a space of 20 miles such a change in the landscape. If we take a rather greater distance, as between Port Famine and Gregory Bay, that is about 60 miles, the difference is still more wonderful. At the former place, we have rounded mountains concealed by impervious forests, which are drenched with the rain, brought by an endless succession of gales, while at Cape Gregory, there is a clear and bright blue sky over the dry and sterile plains. The atmospheric currents, one, although rapid, turbulent, and unconfined by any apparent limits, yet seem to follow, like a river in its bed, a regularly determined course during our previous visit. In January, we had an interview at Cape Gregory with the famous so-called gigantic Patagonians, who gave us a cordial reception. Their height appears greater than it really is, from their large guanaco mantles, their long flowing hair, and general figure. On an average, their height is about six feet, with some men taller and only a few shorter, and the women are also tall, altogether they are certainly the tallest race which we anywhere saw. In features they strikingly resemble the more northern Indians whom I saw with roses, but they have a wilder and more formidable appearance, their faces were much painted with red and black, and one man was ringed and dotted with white like a fusion. Captain Fitzroy offered to take any three of them on board, and all seemed determined to be of the three. It was long, before we could clear the boat, at last we got on board with our three giants, who dined with the captain, and behaved quite like gentlemen, helping themselves with knives, forks, and spoons, nothing was so much relished as sugar. This tribe has had so much communication with sailors and whalers, that most of the men can speak a little English and Spanish, and they are half civilized, and proportionally demoralized. The next morning a large party went on shore, to barter for skins and ostrich feathers, firearms being refused, tobacco was in greatest request, far more so than axes or tools. The whole population of the Toldas, men, women, and children, were arranged on a bank. It was an amusing scene, and it was impossible, not to like the so-called giants, they were so thoroughly good-humored and unsuspecting, they asked us to come again. They seem to like to have Europeans to live with them, and old Maria, an important woman in the tribe, once begged Mr. Lowe to leave any one of his sailors with them. They spend the greater part of the year here, but in summer they hunt along the foot of the Cordillera, sometimes they travel as far as the Rio Negro 750 miles to the north. They are well stocked with horses, each man having, according to Mr. Lowe, six or seven, and all the women, and even children, their one own horse. In the time of Sarmiento, 1580, these Indians had bows and arrows, now long since disused, they then also possessed some horses. This is a very curious fact, showing the extraordinarily rapid multiplication of horses in South America. The horse was first landed at Buenos Aires in 1537, and the colony being then for a time deserted, the horse ran wild, too. In 1580, only 43 years afterwards, we hear of them at the Strait of Magellan. Mr. Lowe informs me that a neighboring tribe the Foot Indians is now changing into Horse Indians, the tribe at Gregory Bay giving them their worn-out horses and sending in winter a few of their best skilled men to hunt for them. June 1st, we anchored in the fine bay of Port Famine. It was now the beginning of winter, and I never saw a more cheerless prospect. The dusky woods, pipe all with snow, could be only seen indistinctly through a drizzling hazy atmosphere. We were, however, lucky in getting two fine days. On one of these, Mount Sarmiento, a distant mountain 6,800 feet high, presented a very noble spectacle. I was frequently surprised in the scenery of Tierra del Fuego, at the little apparent elevation of mountains really lofty. I suspect it is owing to a cause which would not at first be imagined, namely, that the whole mass, from the summit to the water's edge, is generally in full view. I remember having seen a mountain, first from the Beagle Channel, where the whole sweep from the summit to the base, was full in view, and then from Ponce and Bissond across several successive ridges, and it was curious to observe in the latter case, as each fresh ridge afforded fresh means of judging of the distance, how the mountain rose in height. Before reaching Port Famine, two men were seen running along the shore, and hailing the ship. A boat was sent for them. They turned out to be two sailors who had run away from a sealing vessel, and had joined the Patagonians. These Indians had treated them with their usual disinterested hospitality. They had parted company through accident, and were then proceeding to Port Famine in hopes of finding some ship. I dare say they were worthless vagabonds, but I never saw more miserable looking ones. They had been living for some days on mussel shells and berries, and their tattered clothes had been burned, by sleeping so near their fires. 
they had been exposed night and day, without any shelter, to the late incessant gales, with rain, sleet, and snow, and yet they were in good health. During our stay at Port Famine, the Fugians twice came and played us. As there were many instruments, clothes, and men on shore, it was thought necessary to frighten them away. The first time a few great guns were fired, when they were far distant. It was most ludicrous to watch through a glass the Indians, as often as the shot struck the water, take up stones, and, as a bolt defiance, throw them towards the ship, though about a mile and a half distant. A boat was sent with orders, to fire a few musket shots wide of them. The Fugians hid themselves behind the trees, and for every discharge of the muskets they fired their arrows, all, however, fell short of the boat, and the officer as he pointed at them laughed. This made the Fugians frantic with passion, and they shook their mantles in vain rage. At last, seeing the balls cut, and strike the trees, they ran away, and we were left in peace and quietness. During the former voyage the Fugians were here very troublesome, and to frighten them a rocket was fired at night over their wigwams. it answered effectually, and one of the officers told me, that the clamor first raised, and the barking of the dogs, was quite ludicrous in contrast with the profound silence which in a minute or two afterwards prevailed. The next morning not a single Fugian was in the neighborhood. When a beagle was here in the month of February, I started one morning at four o'clock to ascend Mount Arn, which is 2,600 feet high, and is the most elevated point in this immediate district. We went in a boat to the foot of the mountain, but unluckily not to the best part, and then began our ascent. The forest commences at the line of high water mark, and during the first two hours I gave over all hopes of reaching the summit. So thick was the wood, that it was necessary to have constant recourse to the compass, for every landmark, though in a mountainous country, was completely shut out. In the deep ravines, the death-like scene of desolation exceeded all description, outside it was blowing a gale, but in these hollows, not even a breath of wind stirred the leaves of the tallest trees. So gloomy, cold, and wet was every part, that not even the fungi, mosses, or ferns could flourish. In the valleys it was scarcely possible to crawl along, they were so completely barricaded by great moldering trunks, which had fallen down in every direction. When passing over these natural bridges, one's course was often arrested, by sinking knee-deep into the rotten wood, at other times, when attempting to lean against a fern tree, one was startled by finding a mass of decayed matter ready to fall at the slightest touch. We at last found ourselves among the stunted trees, and then soon reached the bare ridge, which conducted us to the summit. Here was a view characteristic of Tierra del Fugo, irregular chains of hills, mottled with patches of snow, deep yellowish-green valleys, and arms of the sea intersecting the land in many directions. The strong wind was piercingly cold, and the atmosphere were rather hazy, so that we did not stay long on the top of the mountain. Our descent was not quite so laborious as our ascent, for the weight of the body forced a passage, and all the slips and falls were in the right direction. I have already mentioned the somber and dull character of the evergreen forests, three, in which two or three species of trees grow, to the exclusion of all others. Above the forest land, there are many dwarf alpine plants, which all spring from the mass of peat, and help to compose it. These plants are very remarkable from their close alliance with the species growing on the mountains of Europe, though so many thousand miles distant. The central part of Tierra del Fugo, where the clay slate formation occurs, is most favorable to the growth of trees, on the outer coast the poorer granitic soil, and to situation more exposed to the violent winds, do not allow of their attaining any great size. Near Port Famine I have seen more large trees than anywhere else, I measured a winter's bark which was 4 feet 6 inches in girth, and several of the beach were as much as 13 feet. Captain King also mentions a beach which was 7 feet in diameter, 17 feet above the roots. There is one vegetable production deserving notice from its importance as an article of food to the Fugians. It is a globular bright yellow fungus, which grows in vast numbers on the beech trees. When young it is elastic and turgid, with, picture, a smooth surface, but when mature it shrinks, becomes tougher, and has its entire surface deeply pitted or honeycombed, as represented in the accompanying woodcut. This fungus belongs to a new and curious genus, or, I found a second species on another species of beech in Chile, and Dr. Hooker informs me that just lately a third species has been discovered on a third species of beech in Van Dierden's land. How singular is this relationship between parasitical fungi and the trees on which they grow, in distant parts of the world. In Tierra del Fugo the fungus in its tough and mature state, is collected in large quantities by the women and children, and is eaten and cooked. It has a mucilaginous, slightly sweet taste, with a faint smell like that of a mushroom. With the exception of a few berries, chiefly of a dwarf arbutus, the natives eat no vegetable food besides this fungus. In New Zealand, before the introduction of the potato, the roots of the fern were largely consumed. At the present time, I believe, Tierra del Fugo is the only country in the world where a cryptogamic plant affords a staple article of food. 
the zoology of Tierra del Fuego, as might have been expected from the nature of its climate and vegetation, is very pure. Of mammalia, besides whales and seals, there is one bat, a kind of mouse, Reithridon chinchillides, two true mice, Actinomys allied to or identical with the Tucu tuco, two foxes, Canis magellanicus and Siazri, a sea otter, the guanaco, and a deer. Most of these animals inhabit only the drier eastern parts of the country, and the deer has never been seen south of the Strait of Magellan. Observing the general correspondence of the cliffs of soft sandstone, mud, and shingle, on the opposite sides of the strait, and on some intervening islands, one is strongly tempted to believe that the land was once joined, and thus allowed animals so delicate and helpless as the Tukutuka and Riathridon to pass over. The correspondence of the cliffs is far from proving an injunction, because such cliffs generally are formed by the intersection of sloping deposits, which, before the elevation of the land, had been accumulated near the then existing shores. It is, however, a remarkable coincidence, that in the two large islands cut off by the Beagle Channel from the rest of Tierra del Fuego, one has cliffs composed of matter that may be called stratified alluvium, which front similar ones on the opposite side of the channel, while the other is exclusively bordered by old crystalline rocks, in the former, called Navarin Island, both Froxes and Guanacus occur, but in the latter, Host Island, although similar in every respect, and only separated by a channel a little more than half a mile wide, I have the word of Jemmy Button for saying that neither of these animals are found. The gloomy woods are inhabited by few birds, occasionally the plaintive note of a white duck to tire and flycatcher, my Eobius albiceps, may be heard, concealed near the summit of the most lofty trees, and more rarely the loud strange cry of a black woodpecker, with the fine scarlet crest on its head. A little dusky colored gren, Cetalopus medlanicus, hops in a skulking manner among the entangled mass of the fallen and decaying trunks. But the creeper, Oxyurus supineri, is the commonest bird in the country. Throughout the beech forests, high up and low down, in the most gloomy, wet, and impenetrable ravines, it may be met with. This little bird no doubt appears more numerous than it really is, from its habit of following with seeming curiosity any person who enters these silent woods, continually uttering a harsh winter. It flutters from tree to tree, within a few feet of the intruder's face. It is far from wishing for the modest concealment of the true creeper, Certhia hamilaris, nor does it, like that bird, run up the trunks of trees, but industriously, after the manner of the willow wren, hops about, and searches for insects on every twig and branch. In the more open parts, three or four species of finches, a thrush, a starling, or icterus, two apici are hinchy, and several hawks and owls occur. The absence of any species whatever in the whole class of reptiles is a marked feature in the zoology of this country, as well as in that of the Falkland Islands. I do not ground this statement merely on my own observation, but I heard it from the Spanish inhabitants of the latter place, and from Jemmy Button with regard to Tierra del Fuego. On the banks of the Santa Cruz, in 50 degs south, I saw a frog, and it is not improbable that these animals, as well as lizards, may be found as far south as the Strait of Magellan, where the country retains the character of Patagonia, but within the damp and cold limit of Tierra del Fugo not one occurs. That the climate would not have suited some of the orders, such as lizards, might have been foreseen, but with respect to frogs, this was not so obvious. Beetles occur in very small numbers, it was long, before I could believe, that a country as large as Scotland, covered with vegetable productions, and with the variety of stations, could be so unproductive. The few which I found were alpine species, Harpalidae, and Heteromidae, living under stones. The vegetable feeding Chrysomelidae, so eminently characteristic of the tropics, are here almost entirely absent. 5. I saw very few flies, butterflies, or bees, and no crickets or orthotera. In the pools of water I found, but a few aquatic beetles, and not any fresh water shells, Succinia at first appears an exception, but here it must be called a terrestrial shell, for it lives on the damp herbage far from the water. Land shells could be procured only in the same alpine situations with the beetles. I have already contrasted the climate as well as the general appearance of Tierra del Fugo with that of Patagonia, and the difference is strongly exemplified in the entomology. I do not believe they have one species in common, certainly the general character of the insects is widely different. If we turn from the land to the sea, we shall find the latter as abundantly stocked with living creatures as the former is purely so. In all parts of the world a rocky and partially protected shore perhaps supports, in a given space, a greater number of individual animals than any other station. There is one marine production which, from its importance, is worthy of a particular history. It is the kelp, or Macrocystis periflora. This plant grows on every rock from low water mark to a great depth, both on the outer coast and within the channels. 6. I believe, during the voyages of the Adventure and Beagle, not one rock near the surface was discovered which was not buoyed by this floating weed. 
the good service Epes affords to vessels navigating near this stormy land is evident, and it certainly has saved many a one from being wrecked. I know few things more surprising than to see this plant growing and flourishing amidst those great breakers of the western ocean, which no mass of rock, let it be ever so hard, can long resist. This stem is round, slimy, and smooth, and seldom has a diameter of so much as an inch. A few taken together are sufficiently strong to support the weight of the large loose stones, to which in the inland channels they grow attached, and yet some of these stones were so heavy that when drawn to the surface, they could scarcely be lifted into a boat by one person. Captain Cook, in his second voyage, says, that this plant at Kurgle Land rises from a greater depth than 24 fathoms, and as it does not grow in a perpendicular direction, but makes a very acute angle with the bottom, and much of it afterwards spreads many fathoms on the surface of the sea, I'm well warranted to say, that some of it grows to the length of 60 fathoms and upwards. I do not suppose the stem of any other plant attains so great a length as 360 feet, as stated by Captain Cook. Captain Fitzroy, moreover, found it growing, 7, up from the greater depth of 45 fathoms. The beds of the seaweed, even when of not great breadth, make excellent natural floating breakwaters. It is quite curious to see, in an exposed harbor, how soon the waves from the open sea, as they travel through the straggling stems, sink in height, and pass into smooth water. The number of living creatures of all orders, whose existence intimately depends on the kelp, is wonderful. A great volume might be written, describing the inhabitants of one of these beds of seaweed. Almost all the leaves, excepting those that float on the surface, are so thickly encrusted with corallines as to be of the white color. We find exquisitely delicate structures, some inhabited by simple hydra-like polypi, others by more organized kinds, and beautiful compound acidii. On leaves, also, various patelliform shells, strachi, uncovered mollusks, and some bivalves are attached. Innumerable crustacea frequent every part of the plant. On shaking the great entangled roots, a pile of small fish, shells, cuttlefish, crabs of all orders, sea eggs, starfish, beautiful holothurii, planarii, and crawling naratus animals of a multitude of forms, all fall out together. Often as I recur to a branch of the kelp, I never fail to discover animals of new and curious structures. In Shiloh, where the kelp does not thrive very well, the numerous shells, corallines, and crustacea are absent, but there yet remain a few of the flustraceae, and some compound acidii, the latter, however, are of different species from those in Tierra del Fugo, we see here the fucus possessing a wider range than the animals which use it as an abode. I can only compare these great aquatic forests of the southern hemisphere with the terrestrial ones in the intertropical regions. Yet if in any country a forest was destroyed, I do not believe nearly, so many species of animals would perish as would here, from the destruction of the kelp. Amidst the leaves of this plant numerous species of fish live, which nowhere else could find food or shelter, with their destruction the many cormorants and other fishing birds, the otters, seals, and porpoises, would soon perish also, and lastly, the Fujian savage, the miserable lord of this miserable land, would redouble his cannibal feast, decrease in numbers, and perhaps cease to exist. June 8th, we weighed anchor early in the morning, and left Port Famine. Captain Fitzroy determined to leave the Strait of Magellan by the Magnolan Channel, which had not long been discovered. Our course lay due south, down that gloomy passage which I have, before alluded to as appearing to lead to another and worse world. The wind was fair, but the atmosphere was very thick, so that we missed much curious scenery. The dark ragged clouds were rapidly driven over the mountains, from their summits nearly down to their bases. The glimpses which we caught through the dusky mass were highly interesting, jagged points, cones of snow, blue glaciers, strong outlines, marked on a lurid sky, were seen at different distances and heights. In the midst of such scenery we anchored at Cape Turn, close to Mount Sarmiento, which was then hidden in the clouds. At the base of the lofty and almost perpendicular sides of our little cove there was one deserted wigwam, and it alone reminded us that man sometimes wandered into these desolate regions but it would be difficult to imagine a scene where he seemed to have fewer claims or less authority. The inanimate works of nature, rock, ice, snow, wind, and water, all warring with each other, yet combined against man here reigned in absolute sovereignty. June 9th, in the morning we were delighted, by seeing the veil of mist gradually rise from Sarmiento, and display it to our view. This mountain, which is one of the highest in Tierra del Fugo, has an altitude of 6,800 feet. Its pace, for about an eighth of its total height, is clothed by dusky woods, and above this a field of snow extends to the summit. These vast piles of snow, which never melt, and seem destined to last as long as the world holds together, present a noble and even sublime spectacle. The outline of the mountain was admirably clear and defined. 
Owing to the abundance of light reflected from the white and glittering surface, no shadows were cast on any part, and those lines which intersected the sky could alone be distinguished, hence the mass stood out in the boldest relief. Several glaciers descended in a winding course from the upper great expanse of snow to the sea coast, they may be likened to great frozen Niagara's, and perhaps these cataracts of blue ice are full as beautiful as the moving ones of water. By night we reached the western part of the channel, but the water was so deep that no anchorage could be found. We were in consequence obliged to stand off, and on in this narrow arm of the sea, during a pitch dark night of fourteen hours long. June tenth, in the morning we made the best of our way into the open Pacific. The western coast generally consists of low, rounded, quite barren hills of granite and greenstone. Sir Jane Arborough called one part South Desolation, because it is so desolate a land to behold, and well indeed might he say so. Outside the main islands, there are numberless scattered rocks on which the long swell of the open ocean incessantly rages. We passed out between the east and west furies, and a little farther northward there are so many breakers that the sea is called the Milky Way. One side of such a coast is enough to make a landsman dream for a week about shipwrecks, peril, and death, and with this sight we bade farewell forever to Tierra del Fuego. The following discussion on the climate of the southern parts of the continent with relation to its productions, on the snow line, on the extraordinarily low descent of the glaciers, and on the zone of perpetual congelation in the Antarctic islands, may be passed over by anyone not interested in these curious subjects, or the final recapitulation alone may be read. I shall, however, here give only an abstract, and must refer for details to the thirteenth chapter and the appendix of the former edition of this work. On the climate and productions of Tierra del Fuego, and of the southwest coast the following table gives the mean temperature of Tierra del Fuego, the Falkland Islands, and for comparison, that of Dublin, summer winter mean of summer latitude temperature. Temperature and winter heading level 2 Tierra del Fuego 53, 38 foot S 50, 33.08 41.54 Falkland Islands 51, 38 S 51, Dublin 53, 21 N. 59.5439.249.37 Hence we see that the central part of Tierra del Fuego is colder in winter, and no less than 9.5 degs less hot in summer, than Dublin. According to Von Butch, the mean temperature of July, not the hottest month in the year, at Salt Enfjord in Norway, is as high as 57.8 degs, and this place is actually 13 degs nearer the pole than Port Famine, 8, inhospitable as this climate appears to our feelings evergreen trees flourish luxuriantly under it. Hummingbirds may be seen sucking the flowers, and parrots feeding on the seeds of the winter's bark, in latitude 55 degs. As I have already remarked to what a degree the sea swarms with living creatures, and the shells, such as the patelli, fisherelli, chitons, and barnacles, according to Mr. G. B. Sowerby, are of a much larger size, and of a more vigorous growth, than the analogous species in the northern hemisphere. A large volute is abundant in southern Tierra del Fuego and the Falkland Islands. At the Hiablanca, in latitude 39 degs. S, the most abundant shells were three species of oliva, one of large size, one or two volutas, and to terebra. Now, these are amongst the best characterized tropical forms. It is doubtful whether even one small species of oliva exists on the southern shores of Europe, and there are no species of the two other genera. If a geologist were to find in lat 39 eggs on the coast of Portugal a bed containing numerous shells belonging to three species of oliva, to evolute and terebra, he would probably assert that the climate of period of their existence must have been tropical, but judging from South America, such an inference might be erroneous. The equable, humid, and windy climate of Tierra del Fuego extends, with only a small increase of heat, for many degrees along the west coast of the continent. The forests for 600 miles northward of Cape Horn have a very similar aspect. As a proof of the equable climate, even for 300 or 400 miles still further northward, I may mention that in Chilo, corresponding in latitude with the northern parts of Spain, the beach seldom produces fruit, whilst strawberries and apples thrive to perfection. Even the crops of barley and wheat, nine, are often brought into the houses, to be dried and ripened. At Valdivia, in the same latitude of 40 degs, with Madrid, grapes and figs ripen, but are not common, olives seldom ripen even partially, and oranges not at all. These fruits, in corresponding latitudes in Europe, are well known to succeed to perfection, and even in this continent, at the Rio Negro, under nearly the same parallel with Valdivia, sweet potatoes, convolvulus, are cultivated, and grapes, figs, olives, oranges, water and musk melons, produce abundant fruit. Although the humid and equable climate of Chilo, and of the coast northward and southward of it, is so unfavorable to our fruits, yet the native forests, from latitude 45 to 38 degs, almost rival in luxuriance those of the glowing intertropical regions. 
stately trees of many kinds, with smooth and highly colored barks, are loaded by parasitical monocotyledonous plants, large and elegant ferns are numerous, and arborescent grasses entwine the trees into one entangled mass to the height of 30 or 40 feet above the ground. Palm trees grow in lap 37 degs, an arborescent grass, very like a bamboo, in 40 degs, and another closely allied kind, of great length, but not erect, flourishes even as far south as 45 degs. S. An equable climate, evidently due to the large area of sea compared with the land, seems to extend over the greater part of the southern hemisphere, and, as a consequence, the vegetation partakes of a semi-tropical character. Tree ferns thrive luxuriantly in Van Diemen's land, latitude 45 degs, and I measured one trunk no less than six feet in circumference. An arborescent fern was found by Forster in New Zealand in 46 degs, where orchideous plants are parasitical on the trees. In the Auckland Islands, ferns, according to Dr. Diefenbach, 10, have trunks so thick and high that they may be almost called tree ferns, and in these islands, and even as far south as latitude 55 degs in the Macquarie Islands, barrets abound. On the height of the snow line, and on the descent of the glaciers in South America for the detailed authorities for the following table, I must refer to the former edition, height and feet latitude of snow line observer table with one rows and one columns. Table with eight rows and three columns equatorial region, mean result Humboldt 15748 Bolivia, latitude 16 to 18 degs. S. Bentline 17000 Central Chile, latitude 33 degs. S. Achilles, and 14,500 minus 15,000 the author. Chilo, latitude 41 to 43 degs. S. Officers of the 6,000 Beagle and the author. Tierra del Fugo, 54 degs. S. 3,500 minus 4,000 King. As the height of the plain of perpetual snow seems, chiefly to be determined by the extreme heat of the summer, rather than by the mean temperature of the year, we ought not to be surprised at its descent in the Strait of Magellan, where the summer is so cool, to only 3,500 or 4,000 feet above the level of the sea, although in Norway. We must travel to between latitude 67 and 70 degs. N, that is, about 14 degs near the pole, to meet with perpetual snow at this low level. The difference in height, namely, above 9,000 feet, between the snow line on the Cordillera behind Chilo, with its highest points ranging from only 5,600 to 7,500 feet, and in central Chile, 11, a distance of only 9. Degs of latitude, is truly wonderful. The land from the southward of Chilo to near Conception, latitude 37 degs, is hidden by one dense forest dripping with moisture. The sky is cloudy, and we have seen how badly the fruits of southern Europe succeed. In central Chile, on the other hand, a little northward of Conception, the sky is generally clear, rain does not fall for the seven summer months, and southern European fruits succeed admirably, and even the sugarcane has been cultivated. 12. No doubt the plain of perpetual snow undergoes the above remarkable flexure of 9,000 feet. Unparalleled in other parts of the world, not far from the latitude of Conception, where the land ceases to be covered with forest trees, for trees in South America indicate a rainy climate, and rain a clouded sky and little heat in summer. The descent of glaciers to the sea must, I conceive, mainly depend, subject, of course, to a proper supply of snow in the upper region, on the lowness of the line of perpetual snow on steep mountains near the coast. As the snow line is so low in Tierra del Fugo, we might have expected that many of the glaciers would have reached the sea. Nevertheless, I was astonished, when I first saw a range, only from 3,000 to 4,000 feet in height, in the latitude of Cumberland, with every valley filled with streams of ice descending to the sea coast. Almost every arm of the sea, which penetrates to the interior higher chain, not only in Tierra del Fugo, but on the coast for 650 miles northwards, is terminated by tremendous and astonishing glaciers, as described by one of the officers on the survey. Great masses of ice frequently fall from these icy cliffs, and the crash reverberates like the broadside of the men of war through the lonely channels. These falls, as noticed in the last chapter, produce great waves which break on the adjoining coasts. It is known that earthquakes frequently cause masses of earth to fall from sea cliffs. How terrific, then, would be the effect of a severe shock, and such occur here. 13. On a body like a glacier, already in motion, and traversed by fissures. I can readily believe that the water would be fairly beaten back out of the deepest channel, and then, returning with an overwhelming force, would whirl about huge masses of rock like so much chaff. In air sound, in the latitude of Paris, there are immense glaciers, and at the loftiest neighboring mountain is only 6,200 feet high. In this sound, about 50 icebergs were seen at one time floating outwards, and one of them must have been at least 168 feet in total height. Some of the icebergs were loaded with blocks of no inconsiderable size, of granite and other rocks, different from the clay slate of the surrounding mountains. 
The glacier furthest from the pole, surveyed during the voyages of the adventure in Fiegel, is in latitude 46 degs 50 feet, in the Gulf of Penis. It is 15 miles long, and in one part 7 broad, and descends to the sea coast. But even a few miles northward of this glacier, in Laduna de Sen, picture, Rafael, some Spanish missionaries, 14, encountered many icebergs, some great, some small, and others middle-sized, in a narrow arm of the sea, on the 22nd of the month corresponding with our June, and in a latitude corresponding with that of the Lake of Geneva. In Europe, the most southern glacier which comes down to the sea is met with, according to von Butch, on the coast of Norway, in latitude 67 degs. Now, this is more than 20 degs of latitude, or 1230 miles, nearer the pole than the Laguna de San Rafael. The position of the glaciers at this place, and in the Gulf of Penis may be put even in a more striking point of view, for they descend to the sea coast within 7.5 degs of latitude, or 450 miles, of a harbor, where three species of oliva, a voluta, and a tarabra, are the commonest shells, within less than 9 degs from where palms grow. Within 4.5 degs of a region where the jaguar and puma range over the plains, less than 2.5 degs from arborescent grasses, and, looking to the westward in the same hemisphere, less than 2 degs from orchidious parasites, and within a single degree of tree ferns. These facts are of high geological interest with respect to the climate of the northern hemisphere at the period when boulders were transported. I will not here detail how simply the theory of icebergs being charged with fragments of rock explain the origin and position of the gigantic boulders of eastern Tierra del Fuego, on the high plain of Santa Cruz, and on the island of Chilo. In Tierra del Fuego, the greater number of boulders lie on the lines of old sea channels, now converted into dry valleys by the elevation of the land. They are associated with the great unstratified formation of mud and sand, containing rounded and angular fragments of all sizes, which has originated, 15 in the repeated plowing up of the sea bottom by the stranding of icebergs, and by the matter transported on them. Few geologists now doubt that those erratic boulders which lie near lofty mountains have been pushed forward by the glaciers themselves, and that those distant from mountains, and embedded in subaqueous deposits, have been conveyed thither either on icebergs, or frozen in coast ice. The connection between the transportal of boulders and the presence of ice in some form, is strikingly shown by their geographical distribution over the earth. In South America they are not found further than 48 degs of latitude, measured from the southern pole. In North America it appears that the limit of their transportal extends to 53.5 degs from the northern pole, but in Europe, to not more than 40 degs of latitude, measured from the same point. On the other hand, in the intertropical parts of America, Asia, and Africa, they have never been observed, nor at the Cape of Good Hope, nor in Australia, 16 on the climate and productions of the Antarctic Islands, considering the rankness of the vegetation in Tierra del Fuego, and on the coast northward of it, the condition of the islands south and southwest of America is truly surprising. Sandwich land, in the latitude of the north part of Scotland, was found by Cook, during the hottest month of the year, covered many fathoms thick with everlasting snow, and there seems to be scarcely any vegetation. Georgia, an island 96 miles long and 10 broad, in the latitude of Yorkshire, in the very height of summer, is in a manner wholly covered with frozen snow. It can boast only of moss, some tufts of grass, and wild burnet, it is only one land bird, and thus Karenera, yet Iceland, which is 10 eggs near the pole, has, according to Mackenzie, 15 land birds. The South Shetland Islands, in the same latitude as the southern half of Norway, possess only some lichens, moss, and a little grass, and a lieutenant. Kendall, 17, found the bay, in which he was a tanker, beginning to freeze at a period corresponding with the 8th of September. The soil here consists of ice and volcanic ashes interstratified, and at a little depth beneath the surface it must remain perpetually congealed, for lieutenant. Kendall found the body of a foreign sailor which had long been buried, with the flesh and all the features perfectly preserved. It is a singular fact, that on the two great continents in the northern hemisphere, but not in the broken land of Europe between them, we have the zone of perpetually frozen undersoil in a low attitude namely, in 56 degs in North America at the depth of 3 feet, 18, and in 62 degs in Siberia at the depth of 12 to 15 feet, as the result of a directly opposite condition of things to those of the southern hemisphere. On the northern continents, the winter is rendered excessively cold by the radiation from a large area of land into a clear sky, nor is it moderated by the warmth bringing currents of the sea, the short summer, on the other hand, is hot. In the southern ocean the winter is not so excessively cold, but the summer is far less hot, for the clouded sky seldom allows the sun to warm the ocean, itself a bad absorbent of heat, and hence the mean temperature of the year, which regulates the zone of perpetually congealed undersoil, is low.
It is evident that rank vegetation, which does not so much require heat as it does protection from intense cold, would approach much nearer to the zone of perpetual congelation under the equable climate of the southern hemisphere than under the extreme climate of the northern continents. The case of the sailor's body perfectly preserved in the icy soil of the South Shetland Islands, latitude 62 to 63 degs. S, in a rather lower latitude than that, latitude 64 degs. N, under which Pallas found the frozen rhinoceros in Siberia, is very interesting. Although it is a fallacy, as I have endeavored to show in a former chapter, to suppose that the larger quadrupeds require a luxuriant vegetation for their support, nevertheless it is important to find in the South Shetland Islands a frozen undersoil within 360 miles of the forest-clad islands near Cape Horn, where, as far as the bulk of vegetation is concerned, any number of great quadrupeds might be supported. The perfect preservation of the carcasses of the Siberian elephants and rhinoceroses is certainly one of the most wonderful facts in geology, but independently of the imagined difficulty of supplying them with food from the adjoining countries, the whole case is not, I think, so perplexing as it has generally been considered. The plains of Siberia, like those of the Pampas, appear to have been formed under the sea, into which rivers brought down the bodies of many animals, of the greater number of these, only the skeletons have been preserved, but of others the perfect carcass. Now, it is known that in the shallow sea on the Arctic coast of America the bottom freezes, 19, and does not thaw in spring so soon as the surface of the land, moreover at greater depths, where the bottom of the sea does not freeze the mud a few feet beneath the top layer might remain even in summer below 32 degs, as in the case on the land with the soil at the depth of a few feet. At still greater depths, the temperature of the mud in water would probably not be low enough to preserve the flesh, and hence, carcasses drifted beyond the shallow parts near an Arctic coast, would have only their skeletons preserved. Now in the extreme northern parts of Siberia bones are infinitely numerous, so that even islets are said to be almost composed of them. 20. And those islets lie no less than 10 degrees of latitude north of the place, where Pallas found the frozen rhinoceros. On the other hand, a carcass washed by a flood into a shallow part of the Arctic Sea would be preserved for an indefinite period, if it were soon afterwards covered with mud sufficiently thick to prevent the heat of the summer water penetrating to it, and if, when the sea bottom was upraised into land, the covering was sufficiently thick to prevent the heat of the summer air and sun thawing and corrupting it. Recapitulation, I will recapitulate the principal facts with regard to the climate, ice action, and organic productions of the southern hemisphere transposing the places in imagination to Europe, with which we are so much better acquainted. Then, near Lisbon, the commonest seashells, namely, three species of oliva, a voluta, and a tarabra, would have a tropical character. In the southern provinces of France, magnificent forests, entwined by arborescent grasses, and with the trees, loaded with parasitical plants, would hide the face of the land. The puma and the jaguar would haunt the Pyrenees. In the latitude of Mont Blanc, but under an island as far westward as central North America, three ferns and parasitical orchidae would thrive amidst the thick woods. Even as far north as central Denmark, hummingbirds would be seen fluttering about delicate flowers, and parrots feeding amidst the evergreen woods, and in the sea there. We should have a voluta, and all the shells have large size and vigorous growth. Nevertheless, on some islands only 360 miles northward of our new Cape Horn in Denmark, a carcass buried in the soil, or if washed into a shallow sea, and covered up with mud, would be preserved perpetually frozen. If some bold navigator attempted to penetrate northward of these islands, he would run a thousand dangers amidst gigantic icebergs, on some of which he would see great blocks of rock borne far away from their original site. Another island of large size in the latitude of southern Scotland, but twice as far to the west, would be almost wholly covered with everlasting snow, and would have each bay terminated by ice cliffs, whence great masses would be yearly detached, this island would boast only of a little moss, grass, and burn it, and a titlark would be its only land inhabitant. From our new cave Horn in Denmark, a chain of mountains, scarcely half the height of the Alps, would run in a straight line due southward, and on its western flank every deep creek of the sea, or fjord, would end in pulled and astonishing glaciers. These lonely channels would frequently reverberate with the falls of ice, and so often would great waves rush along their coasts, numerous icebergs, some as tall as cathedrals, and occasionally loaded with no inconsiderable blocks of rock, would be stranded on the outlying islets, at intervals violent earthquakes would shoot prodigious masses of ice into the waters below. Lastly, some missionaries attempting to penetrate a long arm of the sea, would behold the not lofty surrounding mountains, sending down their many grand icy streams to the sea coast, and their progress in the boats, would be checked by the innumerable floating icebergs, some small and some great, and this would have occurred on our 22nd of June, and where the Lake of Geneva is now spread out, 21. July 23rd, the Beagle anchored late at night in the Bay of Valparaiso, the chief seaport of Chile. 
When morning came, everything appeared delightful. After Tierra del Fuego, the climate felt quite delicious the atmosphere so dry, and the heavens, so clear and blue with the sun shining brightly, that all nature seemed sparkling with life. The view from the anchorage is very pretty. The town is built at the very foot of a range of hills, about 1600 feet high, and rather steep. From its position, it consists of one long, straggling street, which runs parallel to the beach, and wherever a ravine comes down, the houses are piled up on each side of it. The rounded hills, being only partially protected by a very scanty vegetation, are worn into numberless little gullies, which expose a singularly bright red soil. From this cause, and from the low whitewashed houses with tile roofs, the view reminded me of street crews in Tenerife. In a northwesterly direction there are some fine glimpses of the Andes, but these mountains appear much grander when viewed from the neighboring hills, the great distance at which they are situated, can then more readily be perceived. The volcano of Acacagua is particularly magnificent. This huge and irregularly conical mass has an elevation greater than that of Chimborazo, or, from measurements made by the officers in the Beagle, its height is no less than 23,000 feet. The Cordillera, however, viewed from this point, owe the greater part of their beauty to the atmosphere through which they are seen. When the sun was setting in the Pacific, it was admirable to watch how clearly their rugged outlines could be distinguished, yet how varied, and how delicate were the shades of their color. I had the good fortune, to find living here Mr. Richard Corfield, an old school fellow and friend, to whose hospitality and kindness I was greatly indebted, in having afforded me a most pleasant residence during the Beagle's stay in Chile. The immediate neighborhood of Valparaiso is not very productive to the naturalist. During the long summer the wind blows steadily from the southward, and a little offshore, so the rain never falls, during the three winter months, however, it is sufficiently abundant. The vegetation in consequence is very scanty, except in some deep valleys, there are no trees, and only a little grass and a few low bushes are scattered over the less steep parts of the hills. When we reflect, that at the distance of 350 miles to the south, this side of the Andes is completely hidden by one impenetrable forest, the contrast is very remarkable. I took several long walks, while collecting objects of natural history. The country is pleasant for exercise. There are many very beautiful flowers, and, as in most other dry climates, the plants and shrubs possess strong and peculiar odors even once close, by brushing through them became scented. I did not cease from wonder at finding each succeeding day as fine as the foregoing. What a difference does climate make in the enjoyment of life? How opposite are the sensations when viewing black mountains half enveloped in clouds, and seeing another range through the light blue haze of a fine day. The one for a time may be very sublime, the other is all gaiety and happy life. August 14th, I set out on a riding excursion, for the purpose of geologizing the basal parts of the Andes, which alone at this time of the year are not shut up by the winter snow. Our first day's ride was northward along the seacoast. After dark we reached the Hacienda of Quintero, the estate which formerly belonged to Lord Cochrane. My object in coming here was to see the great beds of shells, which stand some yards above the level of the sea, and are burned for lime. The proofs of the elevation of this whole line of coast are unequivocal, at the height of a few hundred feet old looking shells are numerous, and I found some at 1300 feet. These shells either lie loose on the surface, or are embedded in a reddish black vegetable mold. I was much surprised to find under the microscope, that this vegetable mold is really marine mud, full of minute particles of organic bodies. 15th, we returned towards the valley of Quilota. The country was exceedingly pleasant, just such as poets would call pastoral, green open lawns, separated by small valleys with rivulets, and the cottages, we may suppose of the shepherds scattered on the hillsides. We were obliged to cross the ridge of the Chulicoquan. At its base there were many fine evergreen forest trees, but these flourished only in the ravines, where there was running water. Any person who had seen only the country near Valparaiso, would never have imagined, that there had been such picturesque spots in Chile. As soon as we reached the brow of the Sierra, the valley of Quilota was immediately under our feet. The prospect was one of a remarkable artificial luxuriance. The valley is very broad and quite flat, and is thus easily irrigated in all parts. The little square gardens are crowded with orange and olive trees, and every sort of vegetable. On each side huge bare mountains rise, and this from the contrast renders the patchwork valley the more pleasing. Whoever called Valparaiso the Valley of Paradise, must have been thinking of Quilota. We crossed over to the Hacienda de San Isidro, situated at the very foot of the Pell Mountain. Chile, as may be seen in the maps, is a narrow strip of land between the Cordillera and the Pacific, and the strip is itself traversed by several mountain lines, which in this part, run parallel to the Great Range. 
between these outer lines and the main cordillera, a succession of level basins, generally opening into each other by narrow passages, extend far to the southward. In these, the principal towns are situated, as San Felipe, Santiago, San Fernando. These basins or plains, together with the transverse flat valleys, like that of Quilota, which connect them with the coast, I have no doubt are the bottoms of ancient inlets and deep bays, such as at the present day, intersect every part of Tierra del Fugo and the western coast. Chile must formerly have resembled the latter country in the configuration of its land and water. The resemblance was occasionally shown strikingly, when a level fog bank covered, as with the mantle, all the lower parts of the country, the white paper curling into the ravines, beautifully represented little coves and bays, and here and there a solitary hillock peeping up, showed that it had formerly stood there as an islet. The contrast of these flat valleys and basins with the irregular mountains, gave the scenery a character which to me was new and very interesting. From the natural slope to seaward of these plains, they are very easily irrigated, and in consequence singularly fertile. Without this process the land would produce scarcely anything, for during the whole summer the sky is cloudless. The mountains and hills are dotted over with bushes and low trees, and excepting these the vegetation is very scanty. Each landowner in the valley possesses a certain portion of hill country, where his half-wild cattle, in considerable numbers, manage to find sufficient pasture. Once every year there is a grand rodeo, when all the cattle are driven down, counted, and marked, and a certain number separated to be fattened in the irrigated fields. Wheat is extensively cultivated, and a good deal of Indian corn, a kind of bean is, however, the staple article of food for the common laborers. The orchards produce an overflowing abundance of peaches, figs, and grapes. With all these advantages, the inhabitants of the country ought to be much more prosperous than they are. 16th The mayor Damo of the Hacienda was good enough to give me a guide and fresh horses, and in the morning we set out to ascend the Campana, or Bell Mountain, which is 6,400 feet high. The paths were very bad, but both the geology and scenery amply repaid the trouble. We reached by the evening, a spring called the Agua del Guanaco, which is situated at a great height. This must be an old name, for it is very many years, since the Guanaco drank its waters. During the ascent I noticed that nothing but bushes grew on the northern slope, whilst on the southern slope there was a bamboo about 15 feet high. In a few places there were palms, and I was surprised to see one at an elevation of at least 4,500 feet. These palms are, for their family, ugly trees. Their stem is very large, and of a curious form, being thicker in the middle than at the base or top. They are excessively numerous in some parts of Chile, and valuable on account of a sort of treacle made from this map. On one estate near Petorca they tried to count them, but failed, after having numbered several hundred thousand. Every year in the early spring, in August, very many are cut down, and when the trunk is lying on the ground, the crown of leaves is lopped off. The sap then immediately begins to flow from the upper end, and continues so doing for some months. It is, however, necessary that a thin slice should be shaved off from that end every morning, so as to expose a fresh surface. A good tree will give 90 gallons, and all this must have been contained in the vessels of the apparently dry trunk. It is said, that the sap flows much more quickly on those days, when the sun is powerful, and likewise, that it is absolutely necessary to take care, in cutting down the tree, that it should fall with its head upwards on the side of the hill for if it falls down the slope, scarcely any sap will flow, although in that case one would have thought, that the action would have been aided, instead of checked, by the force of gravity. The sap is concentrated by boiling, and is then called treacle, which it very much resembles in taste. We unsaddled our horses near the spring, and prepared to pass the night. The evening was fine, and the atmosphere so clear, that the masts of the vessels at anchor in the Bay of Valparaiso, although no less than 26 geographical miles distant, could be distinguished clearly as little black streaks. A ship doubling the point under sail, appeared as a bright white speck. Ensign expresses much surprise, in his voyage, at the distance at which his vessels were discovered from the coast, but he did not sufficiently allow for the height of the land, and the great transparency of the air. The setting of the sun was glorious, the valleys being black whilst the snowy peaks of the Andes yet retained a ruby tint. When it was dark, we made a fire beneath a little arbor of bamboos, fried our charqui, or dried slips of beef, took our mate, and were quite comfortable. There is an inexpressible charm in this living in the open air. The evening was calm and still, the shrill noise of the mountain biscuita, and the faint cry of a goat sucker, were occasionally to be heard. Besides these, fibrids, or even insects, frequent these dry, parched mountains. August 17th, in the morning we climbed up the rough mass of greenstone which crowns the summit. This rock, as frequently happens, was much shattered and broken into huge angular fragments. 
I observed, however, one remarkable circumstance, namely, that many of the surfaces presented every degree of freshness some appearing as if broken the day before, whilst on others lichens had either just become, or had long grown, attached. I so fully believed, that this was owing to the frequent earthquakes, that I felt inclined to hurry from below each loose pile. As one might very easily be deceived in effect of this kind, I doubted its accuracy, until ascending Mount Wellington, in Van Diemen's Land, where earthquakes do not occur, and there I saw the summit of the mountain similarly composed and similarly shattered, but all the blocks appeared as if they had been hurled into their present position thousands of years ago. We spent the day on the summit, and I never enjoyed one more thoroughly. Chile, founded by the Andes and the Pacific, was seen as in a map. The pleasure from the scenery, in itself beautiful, was heightened by the many reflections which arose from the mirror view of the Campana range with its lesser parallel ones, and of the broad valley of Quilota directly intersecting them. Who can avoid wondering at the force which has upheld these mountains, and even more so at the countless ages, which it must have required to have broken through, removed, and leveled whole masses of them. It is well in this case to call to mind the vast shingle and sedimentary beds of Patagonia, which, if heaped on the Cordillera, would increase its height by so many thousand feet. When in that country, I wondered how any mountain chain could have supplied such masses, and not have been utterly obliterated. We must not now reverse the wonder, and out whether all powerful time can grind down mountains even the gigantic Cordillera into gravel and mud. The appearance of the Andes was different from that which I had expected. The lower line of the snow was of course horizontal, and to this line the even summits of the range seem quite parallel. Only at long intervals, a group of points or a single cone shown where a volcano had existed, or does now exist, hence the range resembled a great solid wall, surmounted here and there by a tower, and making a most perfect barrier to the country. Almost every part of the hill had been drilled by attempts to open gold mines, the rage for mining, has left scarcely a spot in Chile unexamined. I spent the evening as before, talking round the fire with my two companions. The Guasas of Chile, who correspond to the Gauchos of the Pampas, are, however, a very different set of beings. Chile is the more civilized of the two countries, and the inhabitants, in consequence, have lost much individual character. Gradations in rank are much more strongly marked, the Guaso does not by any means consider every man his equal, and I was quite surprised to find that my companions did not like to eat at the same time with myself. This feeling of inequality is a necessary consequence of the existence of an aristocracy of wealth. It is said that some few of the greater landowners possess from five to ten thousand pounds sterling per annum, an inequality of riches which I believe is not met with in any of the cattle breeding countries eastward of the Andes. A traveler does not here meet that unbounded hospitality which refuses all payment, but yet is so kindly offered that no scruples can be raised in accepting it. Almost every house in Chile will receive you for the night, but a trifle is expected to be given in the morning, even a rich man will accept two or three shillings. The gaucho, although he may be a cutthroat, is a gentleman, the guazo is in few respects better, but at the same time a vulgar, ordinary fellow. The two men, although employed much in the same manner, are different in their habits and attire, and the peculiarities of each are universal in their respective countries. The caucho seems part of his horse, and scorns to exert himself, except when on his back, the guazo may be hired to work as a laborer in the fields. The former lives entirely on animal food, the latter almost wholly on vegetable. We do not here see the white boots, the broad drawers and scarlet chilip, the picturesque costume of the pampas. Here, common trousers are protected by black and green worsted leggings. The poncho, however, is common to both. The chief pride of the Guazo lies in his spurs, which are absurdly large. I measured one which was six inches in the diameter of the rowel, and the rowel itself contained upwards of thirty joints. The stirrups are on the same scale, each consisting of a square, carved block of wood, hollowed out, yet weighing three or four pounds. The Guazo is perhaps more expert with the lazo than the gaucho, but, from the nature of the country, he does not know the use of the bolas. August 18th, we descended the mountain, and passed some beautiful little spots, with rivulets and fine trees. Having slept at the same hacienda as before, we rode during the two succeeding days up the valley, and passed through Quilota, which is more like a collection of nursery gardens than a town. The orchards were beautiful, presenting one mass of peach blossoms. I saw, also, in one or two places the date palm, it is a most stately tree, and I should think a group of them in their native Asiatic or African deserts must be superb. We passed likewise San Felipe, a pretty straggling town like Guilota. The valley in this part expands into one of those great bays or plains, reaching to the foot of the Cordillera, which have been mentioned as forming so curious a part of the scenery of Chile. In the evening we reached the mines of Jajual, situated in a ravine at the flank of the Great Chain. I stayed here five days. 
My host, the superintendent of the mine, was a shrewd, but rather ignorant Cornish miner. He had married a Spanish woman and did not mean to return home, but his admiration for the mines of Cornwall remained unbounded. Amongst many other questions, he asked me, now that George Rex is dead, how many more of the family of Rexes are yet alive? This Rex certainly must be a relation of the great author Finnis, who wrote all books. These mines are of copper, and the ore is all shipped to Swansea, to be smelted. Hence the mines have an aspect singularly quiet, as compared to those in England, here no smoke, furnaces, or great steam engines, disturb the solitude of the surrounding mountains. The Chilean government, or rather the old Spanish law, encourages by every method the searching for mines. The discoverer may work a mine on any ground, by paying five shillings, and before paying this he may try, even in the garden of another man, for twenty days. It is now well known, that the Chilean method of mining is the cheapest. My host says, that the two principal improvements introduced by foreigners have been, first, reducing by previous roasting the copper varieties which, being the common ore in Cornwall, the English miners were astounded on their arrival, to find thrown away as useless, secondly, stamping and washing the scoriae from the old furnaces, by which process particles of metal are recovered in abundance. I have actually seen mules carrying to the coast, for transportation to England, a cargo of such cinders. But the first case is much the most curious. The Chilean miners were so convinced that the copper varieties contained not a particle of copper that they laughed at the Englishmen for their ignorance, who laughed in turn and bought their richest veins for a few dollars. It is very odd that, in a country where mining had been extensively carried on for many years, so simple a process as gently roasting the ore to expel the sulfur previous to smelting it had never been discovered. A few improvements have likewise been introduced in some of the simple machinery, but even to the present day, water is removed from some mines by men carrying it up the shaft in lethern bags. The laboring men work very hard. They have little time allowed for their meals, and during summer and winter they begin, when it is light, and leave off at dark. They are paid one pound sterling a month, and their food is given them. This for breakfast consists of sixteen figs and two small loaves of bread, for dinner, boiled beans, for supper, broken roasted wheat grain. They scarcely ever taste meat, as, with the twelve pounds per annum, they have to clothe themselves and support their families. The miners who work in mine itself have twenty-five shillings per month and are allowed a little charqui. But these men come down from their bleak habitations only once in every fortnight or three weeks. During my stay here I thoroughly enjoyed scrambling about these huge mountains. The geology, as might have been expected, was very interesting. The shattered and thick rocks, traversed by innumerable dikes of greenstone, showed what commotions had formerly taken place. The scenery was much the same as that near the Bell of Quiloda, dry barren mountains, dotted at intervals by bushes with the scanty foliage. The cactuses, or rather apuncheus, were here very numerous. I measured one of a spherical figure, which, including the spines, was six feet and four inches in circumference. The height of the common cylindrical, branching kind, is from twelve to fifteen feet, and the girth, with spines, of the branches between three and four feet. A heavy fall of snow on the mountains, prevented me during the last two days, from making some interesting excursions. I attempted to reach a lake which the inhabitants, from some unaccountable reason, believed to be an arm of the sea. During a very dry season, it was proposed to attempt cutting a channel from it, for the sake of the water, but the Padre, after a consultation, declared it was too dangerous, as all Chile would be inundated, if, as generally supposed, the lake was connected with the Pacific. We ascended to a great height, but becoming involved in the snow drifts failed, in reaching this wonderful lake, and had some difficulty in returning. I thought we should have lost our horses, for there was no means of guessing how deep the drifts were, and the animals, when led, could only move by jumping. The black sky showed that a fresh snowstorm was gathering, and we therefore were not a little glad when we escaped. By the time we reached the base the storm commenced, and it was lucky for us that this did not happen three hours earlier in the day. August 26, we left Jeju and again crossed the basin of San Felipe. The day was truly Chilean, glaringly bright, and the atmosphere were quite clear. The thick and uniform covering of newly fallen snow rendered the view of the volcano of Acantagua and the main chain quite glorious. We were now on the road to Santiago, the capital of Chile. We crossed the Cerro del Teljun and slept at a little rancho. The host, talking about the state of Chile as compared to other countries, was very humble, some see with two eyes, and some with one, but for my part one do not think that Chile sees with any. August 27, after crossing many low hills we descended into the small landlocked plain of Kitrin. In the basins, such as this one, which are elevated from 1,000 to 2,000 feet above the sea, two species of acacia, which are stunted in their forms, and stand wide apart from each other, grow in large numbers. 
These trees are never found near the sea coast, and this gives another characteristic feature to the scenery of these basins. We cross a low ridge which separates Gitrin from the great plain on which Santiago stands. The view is here preeminently striking, the dead level surface, covered in parts by woods of acacia, and with the city in the distance, abutting horizontally against the base of the Andes, whose snowy peaks were bright with the evening sun. At the first glance of this view, it was quite evident that the plain represented the extent of a former inland sea. As soon as we gained the level road we pushed our horses into a gallop and reached the city before it was dark. I stayed a week in Santiago and enjoyed myself very much. In the morning I rode to various places on the plain, and in the evening, dined with several of the English merchants, whose hospitality at this place is well known. A never-failing source of pleasure was to ascend the little hillock of rock, Street Lucia, which projects in the middle of the city. The scenery certainly is most striking, and, as I have said, very peculiar. I'm informed that this same character is common to the cities on the great Mexican platform. Of the town I have nothing to say in detail, it is not so fine or so large as Buenos Aires, but is built after the same model. I arrived here by a circuit to the north, so I resolved to return to Valparaiso by a rather longer excursion to the south of the direct road. September 5th, by the middle of the day we arrived at one of the suspension bridges, made of hide, which crossed the Mabu, a large turbulent river a few leagues southward of Santiago. These bridges are very poor affairs. The road, following the curvature of the suspending ropes, is made of bundles of sticks placed close together. It was full of holes, and oscillated rather fearfully, even with the weight of a man leading his horse. In the evening we reached a comfortable farmhouse, where there were several very pretty senoritas. They were much horrified at my having entered one of their churches out of mere curiosity. They asked me, why do you not become a Christian for a religion is certain? I assured them I was a sort of Christian, but they would not hear of it appealing to my own words, do not your padres, your very bishops, marry. The absurdity of a bishop having a wife particularly struck them, they scarcely knew whether to be most amused or horror struck at such an enormity. Sixth we proceeded due south and slipped at Trancagua. The road passed over the level but narrow plain, bounded on one side by lofty hills and on the other by the Cordillera. The next day we turned up the valley of the Rio Cachapil, in which the hot baths of Coqueens, long celebrated for their medicinal properties, are situated. The suspension bridges, in the less frequented parts, are generally taken down during the winter, when the rivers are low. Such was the case in this valley, and we were therefore obliged to cross the stream on horseback. This is rather disagreeable, for the foaming water, though not deep, rushes so quickly over the bed of large rounded stones, that one's head becomes quite confused, and it is difficult even to perceive, whether the horse is moving onward or standing still. In summer, when the snow melts, the torrents are quite impassable, their strength and fury are then extremely great, as might be plainly seen by the marks which they had left. We reached the baths in the evening, and stayed there five days, being confined the two last by heavy rain. The buildings consist of a square of miserable little hovels, each with a single table in French. They are situated in a narrow deep valley just without the central cordillera. It is a quiet, solitary spot, with a good deal of wild beauty. The mineral springs of Coqueens burst forth on a line of dislocation, crossing a mass of stratified rock, the whole of which betrays the action of heat. A considerable quantity of gas is continually escaping from the same orifices with the water. Though the springs are only a few yards apart, they have very different temperature, and this appears to be the result of an unequal mixture of cold water, for those with the lowest temperature have scarcely any mineral taste. After the great earthquake of 1822 the springs ceased, and the water did not return for nearly a year. They were also much affected by the earthquake of 1835, the temperature being suddenly changed from 118 to 92 degs. 1. It seems probable that mineral waters rising deep from the bowels of the earth would always be more deranged by subterranean disturbances than those near the surface. The man who had charge of the baths assured me that in summer the water is hotter and more plentiful than in winter. The former circumstance I should have expected, from the less mixture, during the dry season, of cold water, but the latter statement appears very strange and contradictory. The periodical eclipses during the summer, when rain never falls, can, I think, only be accounted for by the melting of the snow, yet the mountains which are covered by snow during that season, are three or four leagues distant from the springs. I have no reason, to doubt the accuracy of my informer, who, having lived on the spot for several years, ought to be well acquainted with the circumstance, which, if true, certainly is very curious, for we must suppose that the snow water, being conducted through porous strata to the regions of heat, is again thrown up to the surface by the line of dislocated and injected rocks at Coqueens, and the regularity of the phenomenon would seem to indicate that in this district, heated rock occurred at a depth not very great. 
One day I rode up the valley to the farthest inhabited spot. Shortly above that point, the Kachapal divides into two deep tremendous ravines, which penetrate directly into the Great Range. I scrambled up a peak mountain, probably more than 6,000 feet high. Here, as indeed everywhere else, scenes of the highest interest presented themselves. It was by one of these ravines that Pitcher entered Chile and ravaged the neighboring country. This is the same man whose attack on Ernestancia at the Rio Negro I have described. He was a renegade half-caste Spaniard, who collected a great body of Indians together, and established himself by a stream in the Pampas, which place none of the forces sent after him could ever discover. From this point he used to sally forth, and crossing the Cordillera by passes hitherto unattempted, he ravaged the farmhouses and drove the cattle to his secret rendezvous. Pitcher was a capital horseman, and he made all around him equally good, for he invariably shot anyone who hesitated to follow him. It was against this man, and other wandering Indian tribes, that Rose has waged the war of extermination. September 13, we left the Baths of Coqueens, and, rejoining the main road, slept at the Rio Clara. From this place we rode to the town of San Fernando. Before arriving there, the last landlocked basin had expanded into a great plain, which extended so far to the south, that the snowy summits of the more distant Andes were seen, as if above the horizon of the sea. San Fernando is forty leagues from Santiago, and it was my farthest point southward, for we here turned at right angles towards the coast. We slept at the gold mines of Yaquil, which are worked by Mr. Nixon, an American gentleman, to whose kindness I was much indebted during the four days I stayed at his house. The next morning we rode to the mines, which are situated at the distance of some leagues, near the summit of a lofty hill. On the way we had a glimpse of the Lake Tagua Tagua, celebrated for its floating islands, which have been described by M. Gay, too. They are composed of the stalks of various dead plants intertwined together, and on the surface of which other living ones take root. Their form is generally circular, and their thickness from four to six feet, of which the greater part is immersed in the water. As the wind blows, they pass from one side of the lake to the other, and often carry cattle and horses as passengers. When we arrived at the mine, I was struck by the pale appearance of many of the men, and inquired from Mr. Nixon respecting their condition. The mine is 450 feet deep, and each man brings up about 200 pound weight of stone. With this load they have to climb up the alternate notches cut in the trunks of trees, placed in a zigzag line up the shaft. Even beardless young men, 18 and 20 years old, with little muscular development of their bodies, they are quite naked excepting drawers, ascend with this great load from nearly the same depth. A strong man, who is not accustomed to this labor, perspires most profusely, with merely carrying up his own body. With this very severe labor, they live entirely on boiled beans and bread. They would prefer having bread alone, but their masters, finding that they cannot work so hard upon this, treat them like horses, and make them eat the beans. Their pay is here rather more than at the mines of Jadual, being from 24 to 28 shillings per month. They leave the mine only once in three weeks, when they stay with their families for two days. One of the rules of this mine sounds very harsh, but answers pretty well for the master. The only method of stealing gold is to secrete pieces of the ore, and take them out as occasion may offer. Whenever the major domo finds a lump thus hidden, its full value is topped out of the wages of all the men, who thus, without they all combine, are obliged to keep watch over each other. When the ore is brought to the mill, it is ground into an impalpable powder. The process of washing removes all the lighter particles, and amalgamation finally secures the gold dust. The washing, when described, sounds a very simple process, but it is beautiful to see how the exact adaptation of the current of water to the specific gravity of the gold so easily separates the powdered matrix from the metal. The mud which passes from the mills is collected into pools, where it subsides, and every now and then is cleared out and thrown into a common heap. A great deal of chemical action then commences, salts of various kinds effloresce on the surface, and the mass becomes hard. After having been left for a year or two, and then rewashed, it yields gold, and this process may be repeated even six or seven times, but the gold each time becomes less in quantity, and the intervals required, as the inhabitants say, to generate the metal, are longer. There can be no doubt, that the chemical action, already mentioned, each time liberates fresh gold from some combination. The discovery of a method to effect this before the first grinding, would without doubt raise the value of gold ores many fold. It is curious to find how the minute particles of gold, being scattered about and not corroding, at last accumulate in some quantity. A short time, since a few miners, being out of work, obtained permission to scrape the ground round the house and mills, they washed the earth thus got together, and so procured thirty dollars worth of gold. This is an exact counterpart of what takes place in nature. Mountains suffer degradation and wear away, and with them the metallic veins which they contain. 
The hardest rock is worn into impalpable mud, the ordinary metals oxidate, and both are removed, but gold, platinum, and a few others are nearly indestructible, and from their weight, sinking to the bottom, are left behind. After whole mountains have passed through this grinding mill, and have been washed by the hand of nature, the residue becomes metalliferous, and man finds a worth his, all to complete the task of separation. Bad as the above treatment of the miners appears, it is gladly accepted of by them, for the condition of the laboring agriculturists is much worse. Their wages are lower, and they live almost exclusively on beans. This poverty must be chiefly owing to the feudal-like system on which the land is tilled. The landowner gives a small plot of ground to the laborer for building on and cultivating, and in return has his services, or those of a proxy, for every day of his life, without any wages. Until a father has a grown-up son, who can by his labor pay the rent, there is no one, except on occasional days, to take care of his own patch of ground. Hence extreme poverty is very common among the laboring classes in this country. There are some old Indian ruins in this neighborhood, and I was shown one of the perforated stones, which Molina mentions as being found in many places in considerable numbers. They are of a circular flattened form, from five to six inches in diameter, with a hole passing quite through the center. It has generally been supposed that they were used as heads to clubs, although their form does not appear at all well adapted for that purpose. Burkle, 3, states that some of the tribes in southern Africa dig up roots by the aid of a stick pointed at one end, the force and weight of which are increased by a round stone with a hole in it, into which the other end is firmly wedged. It appears probable that the Indians of Chile formerly used some such root agricultural instrument. One day, a German collector in natural history, of the name of Rennes, called, and nearly at the same time an old Spanish lawyer. I was amused at being told the conversation which took place between them. Rennes speaks Spanish so well, that the old lawyer mistook him for a Chilean. Rennes alluding to me, asked him what he thought of the King of England sending out a collector to their country, to pick up lizards and beetles, and to break stones. The old gentleman thought seriously for some time, and then said, It is not well, hey on Gatto and Serato Aqui underscore, there is a cat shut up here. No man is, so rich as to send out people, to pick up such rubbish. I do not like it, if one of us were to go, and do such things in England, do not you think the King of England would very soon send us out of his country? And this old gentleman, from his profession, belongs to the better informed, and more intelligent classes. Rennes himself, two or three years before, left in a house at San Fernando some caterpillars, under charge of a girl to feed, that they might turn into butterflies. This was rumored through the town, and at last the padres and governor consulted together, and agreed it must be some heresy. Accordingly, when Rennes returned, he was arrested. September 19th, we left Yaquil, and followed the flat valley, formed like that of Quilota, in which the Rio Tindaritica flows. Even at these few miles south of Santiago the climate is much damper, in consequence there are fine tracts of pasturage, which are not irrigated, what if? We all followed this valley till it expanded into a great plain, which reaches from the sea to the mountains west of Rancagua. We shortly lost all trees and even bushes, so that the inhabitants are nearly as badly off for firewood as those in the Pampas. Never having heard of these plains, I was much surprised at meeting with such scenery in Chile. The plains belong to more than one series of different elevations, and they are traversed by broad flat bottom valleys, both of which circumstances, as in Patagonia, bespeak the action of the sea on gently rising land. In the steep cliffs bordering these valleys, there are some large caves, which no doubt were originally formed by the waves, one of these is celebrated under the name of Cuva del Abispo, having formerly been consecrated. During the day I felt very unwell, and from that time till the end of October did not recover. September 22nd, we continued to pass over green plains without a tree. The next day we arrived at a house near Nabatid, on the sea coast, where rich fishing Darrow gave us lodgings. I stayed here the two ensuing days, and although very unwell, managed to collect from the tertiary formation some marine shells. 24th our course was now directed towards Valparaiso, which with great difficulty I reached on the 27th, and was there confined to my bed till the end of October. During this time I was an inmate in Mr. Corfield's house, whose kindness to me, I do not know how to express. I will here add a few observations on some of the animals and birds of Chile. The puma, or South American lion, is not uncommon. This animal has a wide geographical range, being found from the equatorial forests, throughout the deserts of Patagonia as far south as the damp and cold latitudes, 53 to 54 degs, of Tierra del Fuego. I have seen its footsteps in the Cordillera of central Chile, at an elevation of at least 10,000 feet. In La Plata the puma preys chiefly on deer, ostriches, biscuita, and other small quadrupeds, it there seldom attacks cattle or horses, and most rarely man. In Chile, 
However, it destroyed many young horses and cattle, owing probably to the scarcity of other quadrupeds, I heard, likewise, of two men and a woman who had been thus killed. It is asserted, that the puma always kills its prey, by springing on the shoulders, and then drawing back the head with one of its paws, until the vertebrae break, I have seen in Patagonia the skeletons of Guanacus, with their necks thus dislocated. The puma, after eating its fill, covers the carcass with many large bushes, and lies down to watch it. This habit is often the cause of its being discovered, for the condors wheeling in the air every now, and then descend to partake of the feast, and being angrily driven away, rise altogether on the wing. The Chileno Guazo then knows there is a lion watching his prey, the word is given, and men and dogs hurry to the chase. Sir F. Head says, that a cow shown in the pampas, upon merely seeing some condors wheeling in the air, cried a lion. I could never myself meet with anyone who pretended to such powers of discrimination. It is asserted that, if a puma has once been betrayed by thus watching the carcass, and has then been hunted, it never resumes this habit, but that, having gorged itself, it wanders far away. The puma is easily killed. In an open country, it is first entangled with the bolas, then lassoed, and dragged along the ground till rendered insensible. At Dandil, south of the Plata, I was told that within three months one hundred were thus destroyed. In Chile they are generally driven up bushes or trees, and are then either shot, or baited to death by dogs. The dogs employed in this chase belong to a particular breed, called Leonorus, they are weak, slight animals, like long-legged terriers, but are born with a particular instinct for this sport. The puma is described as being very crafty, when pursued, it often returns on its former track, and then suddenly making a spring on one side, waits there till the dogs have passed by. It is a very silent animal, uttering no cry even when wounded, and only rarely during the breeding season of birds, two species of the genus Droptichus, Megapodius, and Albicollis of Gitlitz, are perhaps the most conspicuous. The former, called by the Chilinus el Turco, is as large as a field fur, to which bird it is some alliance, but its legs are much longer, tail shorter, and beak stronger, its color is reddish-brown. The Turco is not uncommon. It lives on the ground, sheltered among the thickets which are scattered over the dry and sterile hills. With its tail erect, and stilt-like legs, it may be seen every now, and then popping from one bush to another with uncommon quickness. It really requires little imagination to believe, that the bird is ashamed of itself, and is aware of its most ridiculous figure. On first seeing it, one is tempted to exclaim, a vilely stuffed specimen has escaped from some museum, and has come to life again. It cannot be made to take flight without the greatest trouble, nor does it run, but only hops. The various loud cries which it utters when concealed amongst the bushes, are as strange as its appearance. It is said to build its nest in a deep hole beneath the ground. I dissected several specimens, the gizzard, which was very muscular, contained beetles, vegetable fibers, and pebbles. From this character, from the length of its legs, scratching feet, membranous covering to the nostrils, short and arched wings, this bird seems in a certain degree, to connect the thrushes with the gallinaceous order. The second species, or P. albicollis, is allied to the first in its general form. It is called tapicolo, or cover your posterior, and well does the shameless little bird deserve its name, for it carries its tail more than erect, that is, inclined backwards towards its head. It is very common, and frequents the bottoms of hedgerows, and the bushes scattered over the barren hills, where scarcely another bird can exist. In its general manner of feeding, of quickly hopping out of the thickets and back again, in its desire of concealment, unwillingness to take flight, and notification, it bears a close resemblance to the Turco, but its appearance is not quite so ridiculous. The Tapicolo is very crafty, when frightened by any person, it will remain motionless at the bottom of a bush, and will then, after a little while, try with much address to crawl away on the opposite side. It is also an active bird, and continually making a noise, these noises are various and strangely odd, some are like the cooing of doves, others like the bubbling of water, and many defy all similes. The country people say it changes its cry five times in the year, according to some change of season, I suppose, or, two species of hummingbirds are common, Trotulus forficatus is found over a space of 2500 miles on the west coast, from the hot dry country of Lima, to the forests of Tierra del Fugo, where, it may be seen flitting about in snowstorms. In the wooded island of Chilo, which has an extremely humid climate, this little bird, skipping from side to side amidst the dripping foliage, is perhaps more abundant than almost any other kind. I opened the stomachs of several specimens, shot in different parts of the continent, and in all, remains of insects were as numerous as in the stomach of a creeper. When a species migrates in the summer southward, it is replaced by the arrival of another species coming from the north. The second kind, Trotulus gigas, is a very large bird for the delicate family to which it belongs, when on the wing its appearance is singular. 
Like others of the genus, it moves from place to place with the rapidity which may be compared to that of surface amongst flies, and sphinx among moths, but whilst hovering over a flower, it flaps its wings with a very slow and powerful movement, totally different from that vibratory one common to most of the species, which produces the humming noise. I never saw any other bird where the force of its wings appeared, as in a butterfly, so powerful in proportion to the weight of its body. When hovering by a flower, its tail is constantly expanded and shut like a fan, the body being kept in a nearly vertical position. This action appears to steady and support the bird, between the slow movements of its wings. Although flying from flower to flower in search of food, its stomach generally contained abundant remains of insects, which I suspect, are much more the object of its search than honey. The note of this species, like that of nearly the whole family, is extremely shrill. November 10th, the beagle sailed from Valparaiso to the south, for the purpose of surveying the southern part of Chile, the island of Chilo, and the broken land called the Chanas Archipelago, as far south as the peninsula of Tres Montes. On the 21st we anchored in the Bay of S. Carlos, the capital of Chilo. This island is about 90 miles long, with a breadth of rather less than 30. The land is hilly, but not mountainous, and is covered by one great forest, except where a few green patches have been cleared round the thatched cottages. From a distance the view somewhat resembles that of Tierra del Fugo, but the woods, when seen nearer, are incomparably more beautiful. Many kinds of fine evergreen trees and plants with a tropical character here take the place of the gloomy beach of the southern shores. In winter the climate is detestable, and in summer it is only a little better. I should think there are few parts of the world, within the temperate regions, where so much rain falls. The winds are very boisterous, and the sky almost always clouded, to have a week of fine weather is something wonderful. It is even difficult to get a single glimpse of the Cordillera, during our first visit, once only the volcano of Osorno stood out in bold relief, and that was before sunrise, it was curious to watch, as the sun rose, the outline gradually fading away in the glare of the eastern sky. The inhabitants from their complexion and low stature, appear to have three-fourths of Indian blood in their veins. They are an humble, quiet, industrious set of men. Although the fertile soil, resulting from the decomposition of the volcanic rocks, supports a rank vegetation, yet the climate is not favorable to any production, which requires much sunshine to ripen it. There is very little pasture for the larger quadrupeds, and in consequence, the staple articles of food are pigs, potatoes, and fish. The people all dress in strong woolen garments, which each family makes for itself, and dyes with indigo of a dark blue color. The arts, however, are in the rudest state, as may be seen in their strange fashion of plowing, their method of spinning, grinding corn, and in the construction of their boats. The forests are so impenetrable, that the land is nowhere cultivated, except near the coast, and on the adjoining islets. Even where panthers exist, they are scarcely passable from the soft and swampy state of the soil. The inhabitants, like those of Tierra del Fugo, move about chiefly on the beach or in boats. Although with plenty to eat, the people are very poor, there is no demand for labor, and consequently the lower orders cannot scrape together money sufficient to purchase even the smallest luxuries. There is also a great deficiency of a circulating medium. I have seen a man bringing on his back a bag of charcoal, with which to buy some trifle, and another carrying a plank, to exchange for a bottle of wine. Hence every tradesman must also be a merchant, and again sell the goods which he takes in exchange. November 24th, the Ualan whale boat were sent under the command of Mr., now Captain, Sullivan, to survey the eastern or inland coast of Chilo, and with orders to meet the Beagle at the southern extremity of the island, to which point you would proceed by the outside, so as thus to circumnavigate the whole. I accompanied this expedition, but instead of going in the boats the first day, I hired horses to take me to Chacao, at the northern extremity of the island. The road followed the coast, every now and then crossing promontories covered by fine forests. In these shaded paths it is absolutely necessary that the whole road should be made of logs of wood, which are squared and placed by the side of each other. From the rays of the sun never penetrating the evergreen foliage, the ground is so damp and soft that except by this means neither man nor horse would be able to pass along. I arrived at the village of Chacao shortly after the tents belonging to the boats were pitched for the night. The land in this neighborhood has been extensively cleared, and there were many quieter and most picturesque nooks in the forest. Chacao was formerly the principal port in the island, but many vessels having been lost, owing to the dangerous currents and rocks in the straits, the Spanish government burnt the church, and thus arbitrarily compelled the greater number of inhabitants to migrate to S. Carlos. We had not long bivouacked before the barefooted son of the governor came down to reconnoiter us. Seeing the English flag hoisted at the Uall's masthead, he asked with the utmost indifference whether it was always to fly at Chacao. 
In several places the inhabitants were much astonished at the appearance of men of war's boats, and hoped and believed there was the forerunner of a Spanish fleet, coming to recover the island from the Patriot government of Chile. All the men in power, however, had been informed of their intended visit, and were exceedingly civil. While we were eating our supper, the governor paid us a visit. He had been a lieutenant colonel in the Spanish service, but now was miserably pure. He gave us two sheep, and accepted in return two cotton handkerchiefs, some brass trinkets, and a little tobacco twenty-fifth the torrents of rain. We managed, however, to run down the coast as far as Huapila now. The whole of this eastern side of Chilo has one aspect, it is a plain, broken by valleys, and divided into little islands, and the whole thickly covered with one impervious blackish-green forest. On the margins there are some cleared spaces, surrounding the high-roofed cottages twenty-sixth the day rose splendidly clear. The volcano of Orsano was spouting out volumes of smoke. This most beautiful mountain, formed like a perfect cone, and white with snow, stands out in front of the Cordillera. Another great volcano, with the saddle-shaped summit, also emitted from its immense crater little jets of steam. Subsequently we saw the lofty peak Corcovado, well deserving the name of El Famoso Corcovado. Thus we beheld, from one point of view, three great active volcanoes, each about 7,000 feet high. In addition to this, far to the south, there were other lofty cones covered with snow, which, although not known to be active, must be in their origin volcanic. The line of the Andes is not, in this neighborhood, nearly so elevated as in Chile, neither does it appear to form so perfect a barrier between the regions of the Earth. This great range, although running in a straight north and south line, owing to an optical deception, always appeared more or less curved, for the lines drawn from each peak to the beholder's eye, necessarily converged like the radii of a semicircle, and as it was not possible, owing to the clearness of the atmosphere and the absence of all intermediate objects, to judge how far distant the farthest peaks were off. They appeared to stand in a flattish semicircle. Landing at midday, we saw a family of pure Indian extraction. The father was singularly like York Minster, and some of the younger boys, with their ruddy complexions, might have been mistaken for Pampas Indians. Everything I have seen, convinces me of the close connection of the different American tribes, who nevertheless speak distinct languages. This party could muster but little Spanish, and talk to each other in their own tongue. It is a pleasant thing, to see the Aborigines advance to the same degree of civilization, however low that may be, which their white conquerors have attained. More to the south we saw many pure Indians, indeed, all the inhabitants of some of the islets retain their Indian surnames. In the census of 1832, there were in Chilo and its dependencies 42,000 souls, the greater number of these appear to be of mixed blood. 11,000 retain their Indian surnames, but it is probable that not nearly all of these are of a pure breed. Their manner of life is the same with that of the other poor inhabitants, and they are all Christians, but it is said, that they yet retain some strange superstitious ceremonies, and that they pretend to hold communication with the devil in certain caves. Formerly, everyone convicted of this offense was sent to the Inquisition at Lima. Many of the inhabitants who are not included in the 11,000 with Indian surnames, cannot be distinguished by their appearance from Indians. Gomez, the governor of Lemuy, is descended from noblemen of Spain on both sides, but by constant intermarriages with the natives the present man is an Indian. On the other hand the governor of Quincheo boasts much of his purely kept Spanish blood. We reached at night a beautiful little cove, north of the island of Cacahu. The people here complained of want of land. This is partly owing to their own negligence in not clearing the woods, and partly to restrictions by the government, which makes it necessary, before buying ever so small a piece, to pay two shillings to the surveyor for measuring each quadra, 150 yards square, together with whatever price he fixes for the value of the land. After his valuation the land must be put up three times to auction, and if no one bids more, the purchaser can have it at that rate. All these exactions must be a serious check to clearing the ground, where the inhabitants are so extremely pure. In most countries, forests are removed without much difficulty by the aid of fire, but in Chilo, from the damp nature of the climate, and the sort of trees, it is necessary first to cut them down. This is a heavy drawback to the prosperity of Chilo. In the time of the Spaniards the Indians could not hold land, and a family, after having cleared a piece of ground, might be driven away, and the property seized by the government. The Chilean authorities are now performing an act of justice, by making retribution to these pure Indians, giving to each man, according to his grade of life, a certain portion of land. The value of uncleared ground is very little. The government gave Mr. Douglas, the present surveyor, who informed me of these circumstances, eight and a half square miles of forest near S. Carlos, in lieu of a debt, and this he sold for $350, or about 70 pounds sterling. The two succeeding days were fine, and at night we reached the island of Quincheo. 
This neighborhood is the most cultivated part of the archipelago, for a broad strip of land on the coast of the main island, as well as on many of the smaller adjoining ones, is almost completely cleared. Some of the farmhouses seem very comfortable. I was curious to ascertain how rich any of these people might be, but Mr. Douglas says that no one can be considered as possessing a regular income. One of the richest landowners might possibly accumulate, in a long industrious life, as much as 1,000 pounds sterling, but should this happen, it would all be stowed away in some secret corner, for it is the custom of almost every family to have a jar or treasure chest buried in the ground. November 30th, early on Sunday morning we reached Castro, the ancient capital of Chilo, but now a most forlorn and deserted place. The usual quadrangular arrangement of Spanish towns could be traced, but the streets and plaza were coated with fine green turf, on which sheep were browsing. The church, which stands in the middle, is entirely built of plank, and has a picturesque and venerable appearance. The poverty of the place may be conceived from the fact that although containing some hundreds of inhabitants, one of our party was unable anywhere to purchase either a pound of sugar or an ordinary knife. No individual possessed either a watch or a clock, and an old man, who was supposed to have a good idea of time, was employed to strike the church bell by guess. The arrival of our boats was a rare event in this quiet, retired corner of the world, and nearly all the inhabitants came down to the beach to see us pitch our tents. They were very civil, and offered us a house, and one man even sent us a cask of cider as a present. In the afternoon we paid our respects to the governor, a quiet old man, who, in his appearance and manner of life, was scarcely superior to an English cottager. At night heavy rain set in, which was hardly sufficient to drive away from our tents a large circle of lookers-on. An Indian family, who had come to trade in a canoe from Kalin, bivouacked near us. They had no shelter during the rain. In the morning I asked a young Indian, who was wet to the skin, how he had passed the night. He seemed perfectly content, and answered, Nyabiak, Sandor. December 1st, we steered for the island of Lemhai. I was anxious to examine a reported coal mine which turned out to be lignite of little value in the sandstone, probably of an ancient tertiary epoch, of which these islands are composed. When we reached Lemai we had much difficulty in finding any place to pitch our tents, for it was springtide, and the land was watered down to the water's edge. In a short time we were surrounded by a large group of the nearly pure Indian inhabitants. They were much surprised at our arrival, and said one to the other, This is the reason we have seen so many parrots lately, the chuka, an odd red-breasted little bird, which inhabits the thick forest, and utters very peculiar noises, has not cried the war for nothing. They were soon anxious for barter. Money was scarcely worth anything, but their eagerness for tobacco was something quite extraordinary. After tobacco, indigo came next in value, then capsicum, old clothes, and gunpowder. The latter article was required for a very innocent purpose, each parish has a public musket, and the gunpowder was wanted for making a noise on their saint or feast days the people here live chiefly on shellfish and potatoes. At certain seasons they catch also, in corrals, or hudges underwater, many fish which are left on the mud banks as the tide falls. They occasionally possess fowls, sheep, goats, pigs, horses, and cattle, the order in which they are here mentioned, expressing their respective numbers. I never saw anything more obliging and humble than the manners of these people. They generally began with stating that they were poor natives of the place and not Spaniards, and that they were in sad want of tobacco and other comforts. At Kalin, the most southern island, the sailors bought with a stick of tobacco, of the value of three halfpence, two fowls, one of which, the Indian stated, had skin between its toes, and turned out to be a fine duck, and with some cotton handkerchiefs, worth three shillings, three sheep and a large bunch of onions were procured. The yawl at this place was anchored some way from the shore, and we had fears for her safety from robbers during the night. Our pilot, Mr. Douglas, accordingly told the constable of the district that we always placed sentinels with loaded arms, and not understanding Spanish, if we saw any person in the dark, we should assuredly shoot him. The constable, with much humility, agreed to the perfect propriety of this arrangement, and promised us that no one should stir out of his house during that night. During the four succeeding days we continued sailing southward. The general features of the country remained the same, but it was much less thickly inhabited. On the large island of Tanqui there was scarcely one cleared spot, the trees on every side extending their branches over the sea beach. I one day noticed, growing on the sandstone cliffs, some very fine plants of the pank, Gunnerus cabra, which somewhat resembles the root barb on a gigantic scale. The inhabitants eat the stalks, which are subacid, and tan leather with the roots, and prepare a black dye from them. The leaf is nearly circular, but deeply indented on its margin. I measured one which was nearly 8 feet in diameter, and therefore no less than 24 in circumference. The stalk is rather more than a yard high, 
and each plant sends out four or five of these enormous leaves, presenting together a very noble appearance. December 6th, we reached Kalin, called Elf in Del Christianid. In the morning we stopped for a few minutes at a house on the northern end of Lalek, which was the extreme point of South American Christendom, and a miserable hovel it was. The latitude is 43 degs 10 feet, which is 2 degrees farther south than the Rio Negro on the Atlantic coast. These extreme Christians were very poor, and, under the plea of their situation, begged for some tobacco. As a proof of the poverty of these Indians, I may mention that shortly before this, we had met a man, who had traveled three days and a half on foot, and had as many to return, for the sake of recovering the value of a small axe and a few fish. How very difficult it must be, to buy the smallest article, when such trouble is taken to recover so small a debt. In the evening we reached the island of San Pedro, where we found the Beagle at Anchor. In doubling the point, two of the officers landed to take a round of angles with the Theodolite. A fox, Canis felvides, of a kind said to be peculiar to the island, and very rare in it, and which is a new species, was sitting on the rocks. He was so intently absorbed, in watching the work of the officers, that I was able, by quietly walking up behind, to knock him on the head with my geological hammer. This fox, more curious or more scientific, but less wise, than the generality of his brethren, is now mounted in the museum of the Zoological Society. We stayed three days in this harbor, on one of which Captain Fitzroy, with a party, attempted to ascend to the summit of San Pedro. The woods here had rather a different appearance from those on the northern part of the island. The rock, also, being Macasha's slate, there was no beach, but the steep sides dipped directly beneath the water. The general aspect in consequence, was more like that of Tierra del Fugo than of Cholo. In vain we tried to gain the summit, the forest was so impenetrable, that no one who has not beheld it can imagine so entangled a mass of dying and dead trunks. I am sure that often, for more than ten minutes together, our feet never touched the ground, and we were frequently ten or fifteen feet above it, so that the seamen as a joke called out the soundings. At other times we crept one after another on our hands and knees, under the rotten trunks. In the lower part of the mountain, noble trees of the winter's bark, and the laurel like the sassafras with fragrant leaves, and others, the names of which I do not know, were matted together by a trailing bamboo or cane. Here we were more like fishes struggling in a net than any other animal. On the higher parts, brushwood takes the place of larger trees, with here and there a red cedar or an aller spine. I was also pleased to see, at an elevation of a little less than 1,000 feet, our old friend the southern beach. They were, however, pure stunted trees, and I should think, that this must be nearly their northern limit. We ultimately gave up the attempt in despair. December 10th, the Yualan whale boat, with Mr. Sullivan, proceeded on their survey, but I remained on board the Beagle, which the next day left San Pedro for the southward. On the 13th we ran into an opening in the southern part of Guayatarcas, or the Chanas Archipelago, and it was fortunate we did so, for on the following day a storm, worthy of Tierra del Fugo, raged with great fury. White massive clouds were piled up against a dark blue sky, and to cross them black ragged sheets of vapor were rapidly driven. The successive mountain ranges appeared like dim shadows, and the setting sun cast on the woodland a yellow gleam, much like that produced by the flame of spirits of wine. The water was white with the flying spray, and the wind lulled, and roared again through the rigging, it was an ominous sublime scene. During a few minutes there was a bright rainbow, and it was curious to observe the effect of the spray, which being carried along the surface of the water, changed the ordinary semicircle into a circle of band of prismatic colors being continued, from both feet of the common arch across the bay, close to the vessel's side, thus forming a distorted, but very nearly entire ring. We stayed here three days. The weather continued bad, but this did not much signify, for the surface of the land in all these islands is all but impassable. The coast is so very rugged that to attempt to walk in that direction requires continued scrambling up and down over the sharp rocks of mica slate, and as for the woods, our faces, hands, and shrimp bones all bore witness to the maltreatment we received, in merely attempting to penetrate their forbidden recesses. December 18th, we stood out to sea. On the 20th we bade farewell to the south, and with the fair wind turned the ship's head northward. From Cape Tresmontes we sailed pleasantly along the lofty weather-beaten coast, which is remarkable for the bold outline of its hills, and the thick covering of forest even on the almost precipitous flanks. The next day a harbor was discovered, which on this dangerous coast, might be of great service to a distressed vessel. It can easily be recognized by a hill 1600 feet high, which is even more perfectly conical than the famous sugar loaf at Rio de Janeiro. The next day, after anchoring, I succeeded in reaching the summit of this hill. It was a laborious undertaking, for the sides were so steep, that in some parts it was necessary to use the trees as ladders. There were also several extensive breaks of the fuchsia, covered with its beautiful drooping flowers, but very difficult to crawl through. 
In these wild countries it gives much delight to gain the summit of any mountain. There is an indefinite expectation of seeing something very strange, which, however often it may be barked, never failed with me to recur on each successive attempt. Everyone must know the feeling of triumph and pride which a grand view from a height communicates to the mind. In these little frequented countries there is also joined to it some vanity, that you perhaps are the first man who ever stood on this pinnacle, or admired this view. A strong desire is always felt to ascertain, whether any human being, has previously visited an unfrequented spot. A bit of wood with a nail in it, is picked up, and studied as if it were covered with hieroglyphics. Possessed with this feeling, I was much interested by finding, on the wild part of the coast, a bed made of grass beneath a ledge of rock. Close by it there had been a fire, and the man had used an axe. The fire, dead, and situation showed the dexterity of an Indian, but he could scarcely have been an Indian, for the races in this part extinct, owing to the Catholic desire of making it one below Christians and slaves. I had at the time some misgivings, that the solitary man who had made his bed on this wild spot, must have been some poor shipwrecked sailor, who, in trying to travel up the coast, had here laid himself down for his dreary night December 28th the weather continued very bad, but it at last permitted us to proceed with the survey. The time hung heavy on our hands, as it always did, when we were delayed from day to day by successive gales of wind. In the evening another harbor was discovered, where we anchored. Directly afterwards a man was seen waving a shirt, and a boat was sent which brought back two seamen. A party of six had run away from an American whaling vessel, and had landed a little to the southward in a boat, which was shortly afterwards knocked to pieces by the surf. They had now been wandering up and down the coast for fifteen months, without knowing which way to go, or where they were. What a singular piece of good fortune it was, that this harbor was now discovered. Had it not been for this one chance, they might have wondered till they had grown old men, and at last have perished on this wild coast. Their sufferings had been very great, and one of their party had lost his life, by falling from the cliffs. They were sometimes obliged to separate in search of food, and this explained the bed of the solitary man. Considering what they had undergone, I think they had kept a very good reckoning of time, for they had lost only four days. December 30th. We anchored in a snug little cove at the foot of some high hills, near the northern extremity of Tresmontes. After breakfast the next morning, a party ascended one of these mountains, which was 2,400 feet high. The scenery was remarkable. The chief part of the range was composed of grand, solid, abrupt masses of granite, which appeared as if they had been coeval with the beginning of the world. The granite was capped with micaslet, and this in the lapse of ages had been worn into strange finger-shaped points. These two formations, thus differing in their outlines, agree in being almost destitute of vegetation. The sparrows had to our eyes a strange appearance, from having been so long accustomed to the sight of an almost universal forest of dark green trees. I took much delight in examining the structure of these mountains. The complicated and lofty ranges bore a noble aspect of durability, equally profitless, however, to man and to all other animals. Granted to the geologist is classic ground, from its widespread limits, and its beautiful and compact texture, Virox have been more anciently recognized. Granite has given rise, perhaps, to more discussion concerning its origin than any other formation. We generally see it constituting the fundamental rock, and, however formed, we know it is the deepest layer in the crust of this globe to which man has penetrated. The limit of man's knowledge in any subject, possesses a high interest, which is perhaps increased by its close neighborhood to the realms of imagination. January 1, 1835, the New Year is ushered in with the ceremonies proper to it in these regions. She lays out no false hopes, a heavy northwestern gale, with steady rain, bespeaks the rising year. Thank God, we are not destined here, to see the end of it, but hope then to be in the Pacific Ocean, where a blue sky tells one there is a heaven, a something beyond the clouds above our heads. The northwest winds prevailing for the next four days, we only managed to cross a great bay, and then anchored in another secure harbor. I accompanied the captain in a boat to the head of a deep creek. On the way the number of seals which we saw was quite astonishing, every bit of flat rock, and parts of the beach, were covered with them. There appeared to be of a loving disposition, and lay huddled together, fast asleep, like so many pigs, but even pigs would have been ashamed of their dirt, and of the foul smell which came from them. Each herd was watched by the patient but inauspicious eyes of the turkey buzzard. This disgusting bird, with its bald scarlet head, formed a wall in putridity, is very common on the west coast, and their tendance on the seals, shows on what they rely for their food. We found the water, probably only that of the surface, nearly fresh, this was caused by the number of torrents which, in the form of cascades, came tumbling over the bold granite mountains into the sea. The fresh water attracts the fish, and these bring many terns, gulls, and two kinds of cormorant. 
we saw also a pair of the beautiful black necked swans, and several small sea otters, the fur of which is held in such high estimation. In returning, we were again amused by the impetuous manner in which the heap of seals, old and young, tumbled into the water as the boat passed. They did not remain long under water, but rising, followed us with outstretched necks, expressing great wonder and curiosity. Seventh having run up the coast, we anchored near the northern end of the Chanis Archipelago, in Los Harbor, where we remained a week. The islands were here, as in Chilo, composed of a stratified, soft, littoral deposit, and the vegetation in consequence was beautifully luxuriant. The woods came down to the sea beach, just in the manner of an evergreen shrubbery over a gravel walk. We also enjoyed from the anchorage a splendid view of four great snowy cones of the Cordillera, including all Famoso Corcovado. The range itself had in this latitude so little height that few parts of it appeared above the tops of the neighboring islets. We found here a party of five men from Kalin, Elf and El Christiandit, who had most adventurously crossed in their miserable boat canoe, for the purpose of fishing, the open space of sea which separates Chandas from Chilo. These islands will, in all probability, in a short time become, peopled like those adjoining the coast of Chilo. The wild potato grows on these islands in great abundance, on the sandy, shelly soil near the sea beach. The tallest plant was four feet in height. The tubers were generally small, but I found one, of an oval shape, two inches in diameter, they resembled in every respect, and had the same smell as English potatoes, but when boiled they shrunk much, and were watery and insipid, without any bitter taste. They are undoubtedly here indigenous, they grow as far south, according to Mr. Lowe, as latitude 50 degs, and are called Aquinas by the wild Indians of that part, the Chilatan Indians have a different name for them. Professor Henslow, who has examined the dried specimens which I brought home, says that they are the same with those described by Mr. Sabine, one, from Valparaiso, but that they form a variety which by some botanists, has been considered as specifically distinct. It is remarkable, that the same plant should be found on the sterile mountains of central Chile, where a drop of rain does not fall for more than six months, and within the damp forests of these southern islands. In the central parts of the Chanis Archipelago, latitude 45 degs, the forest has very much the same character with that along the whole west coast, for 600 miles southward to Cape Horn. The arborescent grass of Chile is not found here, while the beach of Tierra del Fugo grows to a good size, and forms a considerable proportion of the wood, not, however, in the same exclusive manner as it does far the southward. Cryptogamic plants here find a most congenial climate. In the Strait of Magellan, as I have before remarked, the country appears too cold and wet to allow of their arriving at perfection, but in these islands, within the forest, the number of species and great abundance of mosses, lichens, and small ferns, is quite extraordinary, too. In Tierra del Fugo trees grow only on the hillsides, every level piece of land being invariably covered by a thick bed of peat, but, in Chilo flatland supports the most luxuriant forests. Here, within the Chanis archipelago, the nature of the climate more closely approaches that of Tierra del Fugo than that of northern Chilo, for every patch of level ground is covered by two species of plants, Astelia pumila and Donatia magellanica, which by their joint decay, compose a thick bed of elastic peat in Tierra del Fugo, above the region of woodland, the former of these eminently sociable plants is the chief agent in the production of peat. Fresh leaves are always succeeding one to the other round the central taproot. The lower ones soon decay, and in tracing root downwards in the peat, the leaves, yet holding their place, can be observed passing through every stage of decomposition, till the whole becomes blended in one confused mass. The astelia is assisted by a few other plants, here and there a small creeping myrtus, M. nemularia, with the woody stem like our cranberry, and with the sweet berry, and epitrum, eroborum, like our heath, arash, gencus grandiflorus, are nearly the only ones that grow on the swampy surface. These plants, though possessing a very close general resemblance to the English species of the same genera, are different. In the more level parts of the country, the surface of the peat is broken up into little pools of water, which stand at different heights, and appear as if artificially excavated. Small streams of water, flowing underground, complete the disorganization of the vegetable matter, and consolidate the whole. The climate of the southern part of America appears particularly favorable to the production of peat. In the Falkland Islands almost every kind of plant, even the coarse grass which covers the whole surface of the land, becomes converted into this substance, scarcely any situation checks its growth, some of the beds are as much as 12 feet thick, and the lower part becomes so solid when dry, that it will hardly burn. Although every plant lends its aid, yet in most parts the astelia is the most efficient. It is rather a singular circumstance, as being so very different from what occurs in Europe, that I know where saw moss forming by its decay any portion of the peat in South America. 
with respect to the northern limit, at which the climate allows of that peculiar kind of slow decomposition which is necessary for its production, I believe that in Shiloh, latitude 41 to 42 degs, although there is much swampy ground, no well characterized peat acres, but in the Chanis Islands, three degrees farther southward, we have seen, that it is abundant. On the eastern coast in La Plata, latitude 35 degs, I was told by a Spanish resident who had visited Ireland, that he had often sought for this substance, but had never been able to find any. He showed me, as the nearest approach to it which he had discovered, a black peaty soil, so penetrated with roots as to allow of an extremely slow and imperfect combustion. The zoology of these broken islets of the Chanis archipelago is, as might have been expected, very pure. Of quadrupeds two aquatic kinds are common. The myopotamus coipus, like a beaver but with a round tail, is well known from its fine fur, which is an object of trade throughout the turbularies of La Plata. It here, however, exclusively frequents salt water, which same circumstance has been mentioned as sometimes occurring with the great rodent, the capybara. A small sea otter is very numerous, this animal does not feed exclusively on fish, but, like the seals, draws a large supply from a small red crab, which swims in shoals near the surface of the water. Mr. Bino saw one in Tierra del Fugo eating a cuttlefish, and at Los Harbor, another was killed in the act of carrying to its hole a large blue shell. At one place I caught in a trap a singular little mouse, Embrichitis, it appeared common on several of the islets, but the Chilitans at Los Harbor said, that it was not found at all. What a succession of chances, three, or what changes of level must have been brought into play, thus to spread these small animals throughout this broken archipelago. In all parts of Chilo and Chanis, two very strange birds occur, which are allied to, and replace, the Turco and Tampicolo of central Chile. One is called by the inhabitants Chucoteroptichus rubecula, it frequents the most gloomy, and retired spots within the damp forests. Sometimes, although its cry may be heard close at hand, let a person watch ever so attentively he will not see the Chuka, at other times, let him stand motionless and the red-breasted little bird will approach within a few feet in the most familiar manner. It then busily hops about the entangled mass of rotting cones and branches, with its little tail cocked upwards. The Chukot is held in superstitious fear by the Chilitans, on account of its strange and varied cries. There are three very distinct cries, one is called Chiduko, and is an omen of good, another, Utru, which is extremely unfavorable, and the third, which I have forgotten. These words are given in imitation of the noises, and the natives are in some things absolutely governed by them. The Chilitans assuredly have chosen a most comical little creature for their profit. An allied species, but rather larger, is called by the natives Gigid Drop to Chistarnii, and by the English the Barking Bird. This latter name is well given, for I defy anyone at first to feel certain that a small dog is not yelping somewhere in the forest. Just as with the Chuka, a person will sometimes hear the bark close by, but in vain many endeavor by watching, and with still a less chance by beating the bushes, to see the bird, yet at other times the Gigid fearlessly comes near. Its manner of feeding, and its general habits are very similar to those of the Chuka. On the coast, or, a small dusky colored bird, or Pichiarhinchus patagonicus, is very common. It is remarkable from its quiet habits, it lives entirely on sea beach, like a sandpiper. Besides these birds only few others inhabit this broken land. In my rough notes I describe the strange noises, which, although frequently heard within these gloomy forests, yet sparsely disturb the general silence. The yelping of the Gidgid, and the sudden woo-woo of the Chuka, sometimes come from afar off, and sometimes from close at hand, the little black wren of Tierra del Fugo occasionally adds its cry, the creeper, Oxyurus, follows the intruder screaming and wittering, the hummingbird may be seen every now, and then darting from side to side, and emitting, like an insect, its shrill chirp, lastly, from the top of some lofty tree the indistinct but plaintive note of the white duck to tire and flycatcher, my obvious, may be noticed. From the great preponderance in most countries of certain common genera of birds, such as the finches, one feels at first surprised at meeting with the peculiar forms above enumerated, as the commonest birds in any district. In central Chile two of them, namely, the Oxyurus and Sutalopus, occur, although most rarely. When finding, as in this case, animals which seem to play so insignificant a part in the great scheme of nature, one is apt to wonder, why they were created. But it should always be recollected, that in some other country perhaps they are essential members of society, or at some former period may have been so. If America south of 37 decks were sunk beneath the waters of the ocean, these two birds might continue to exist in central Chile for a long period, but it is very improbable, that their numbers would increase. We should then see a case which must inevitably have happened with very many animals.
These southern seas are frequented by several species of petrels, the largest kind, Procellaria gigantea, or Nelly, Quibrantahusus, or Breakbones, of the Spaniards, is a common bird, both in the inland channels and on the open sea. In its habits and manner of flight, there is a very close resemblance with the albatross, and as with the albatross, a person may watch it for hours together without seeing on what it feeds. The breakbones is, however, a rapacious bird, for it was observed by some of the officers at Port Street Antonio chasing a diver, which tried to escape by diving and flying, but was continually struck down, and at last killed by a blow on its head. At Port St. Julian these great petrels were seen killing and devouring young gulls. A second species, Puffinus cenarius, which is common to Europe, Cape Horn, and the coast of Peru, is of much smaller size than the P. gigantea, but, like it, of a dirty black color. It generally frequents the inland sounds in very large flocks, I do not think I ever saw so many birds of any other sort together, as I once saw of these behind the island of Chilo. Hundreds of thousands flew in an irregular line for several hours in one direction. When part of the flock settled on the water the surface was blackened, and a noise proceeded from them as of human beings talking in the distance. There are several other species of petrels, but I will only mention one other kind, the Pelicanides brarty which offers an example of those extraordinary cases of a bird evidently belonging to one well-marked family, yet both in its habits and structure allied to a very distinct tribe. This bird never leaves the quiet inland sounds. When disturbed it dives to a distance, and on coming to the surface, with the same movement takes flight. After flying by a rapid movement of its short wings for a space in a straight line, it drops, as if struck dead, and dives again. The form of its beak and nostrils, length of foot, and even the coloring of its plumage, show that this bird is a petrel. On the other hand, its short wings and consequent little power of flight, its form of body and shape of tail, the absence of a hind toe to its foot, its habit of diving, and its choice of situation, make it at first doubtful whether its relationship is not equally close with the ox. It would undoubtedly be mistaken for an ox when seen from a distance, either on the wing, or when diving, and quietly swimming about the retired channels of Tierra del Fuego. On January the 15th we sailed from Los Harbor, and three days afterwards anchored a second time in the Bay of Escarlos in Chilo. On the night of the 19th the volcano of Osorno was in action. At midnight the sentry observed something like a large star, which gradually increased in size till about 3 o'clock, when it presented a very magnificent spectacle. By the aid of a glass, dark objects, in constant succession, were seen, in the midst of a great glare of red light, to be thrown up, and to fall down. The light was sufficient to cast on the water a long bright reflection. Large masses of molten matter seem very commonly, to be cast out of the craters in this part of the Cordillera. I was assured, that when the Corcovado is in eruption, great masses are projected upwards, and are seen to burst in the air. Assuming many fantastical forms, such as trees, their size must be immense, for they can be distinguished from the highland behind S. Carlos, which is no less than 93 miles from the Corcovado. In the morning the volcano became tranquil. I was surprised at hearing afterwards that a Concagua in Chile, 480 miles northwards, was in action on the same night, and still more surprised to hear that the great eruption of Casagana, 2700 miles north of Aconcagua, accompanied by an earthquake felt over 1000 miles also occurred within six hours of this same time. This coincidence is the more remarkable, as Casagana had been dormant for 26 years, and to Concagua most rarely shows any signs of action. It is difficult even to conjecture whether this coincidence was accidental, or shows some subterranean connection. If Vesuvius, Etna, and Hecla in Iceland, all three relatively nearer each other than the corresponding points in South America, suddenly burst forth an eruption on the same night, the coincidence would be thought remarkable, but it is far more remarkable in this case, where the three vents fall on the same great mountain chain, and where the vast plains along the entire eastern coast, and the upraised recent shells along more than 2,000 miles on the western coast, shall in how equable and connected a manner the elevatory forces have acted. Captain Fitzroy being anxious that some bearings should be taken on the outer coast of Chilo, it was planned that Mr. King and myself should ride to Castro, and thence across the island to the Capella de Qko, situated on the west coast. Having hired horses and a guide, we set out on the morning of the 22nd. We had not proceeded far, before we were joined by a woman and two boys, who were bent on the same journey. Everyone on this road acts on a hail fellow well met fashion, and one may here enjoy the privilege, so rare in South America, of traveling without firearms. At first, the country consisted of a succession of hills and valleys, nearer to Castro it became very level. The road itself is a curious affair, it consists in its whole length, with the exception of very few parts, of great logs of wood, which are either broad and laid longitudinally, or narrowed and placed transversely. 
In summer the road is not very bad, but in winter, when the wood is rendered slippery from rain, traveling is exceedingly difficult. At that time of the year, the ground on each side becomes a morass and is often overflowed, hence it is necessary that the longitudinal logs should be fastened down by transverse poles, which are pegged on each side into the earth. These pegs render a fall from a horse dangerous, as the chance of alighting on one of them is not small. It is remarkable, however, how active custom has made the Chilitan horses. In crossing bad parts, where the logs had been displaced, they skip from one to the other, almost with the quickness and certainty of a dog. On both hands the road is bordered by the lofty forest trees, with their bases matted together by canes. When occasionally a long reach of this avenue could be beheld, it presented a curious scene of uniformity. The white line of logs, narrowing in perspective, became hidden by the gloomy forest, or terminated in a zigzag which ascended some steep hill. Although the distance from S. Carlos to Castro was only 12 leagues in a straight line, the formation of the road must have been a great labor. I was told that several people had formerly lost their lives in attempting to cross the forest. The first who succeeded was an Indian, who cut his way through the canes in eight days and reached S. Carlos. He was rewarded by the Spanish government with the grant of land. During the summer, many of the Indians wander about the forests, but chiefly in the higher parts, where the woods are not quite so thick, in search of the half-wild cattle which live on the leaves of the cane and certain trees. It was one of these huntsmen who by chance discovered, a few years since, an English vessel, which had been wrecked on the outer coast. The crew were beginning to fill in provisions, and it is not probable that, without the aid of this man, they would ever have extricated themselves from these scarcely penetrable woods. As it was, one seaman died on the march, from fatigue. The Indians in these excursions, steer by the sun, so that if there is a continuance of cloudy weather, they can not travel. The day was beautiful, and the number of trees which were in full flower perfumed the air, yet even this could hardly dissipate the effects of the gloomy dampness of the forest. Moreover, the many dead trunks that stand like skeletons, never fail to give to these primeval woods a character of solemnity, absent in those of countries long civilized. Shortly after sunset we bivouacked for the night. Our female companion, who was rather good-looking, belonged to one of the most respectable families in Castro, she rode, however, astride, and without shoes or stockings. I was surprised at the total want of pride shown by her and her brother. They brought food with them, but at all our meals sat watching Mr. King and myself whilst eating, till we were fairly ashamed into feeding the whole party. The night was cloudless, and while lying in our beds, we enjoyed the sight, and it is a high enjoyment, of the multitude of stars which illumined the darkness of the forest. January 23rd, we rose early in the morning, and reached the pretty quiet town of Castro by two o'clock. The old governor had died since our last visit, and a Chilino was acting in his place. We had a letter of introduction to Don Pedro, whom we found exceedingly hospitable and kind, and more disinterested than is usual on this side of the continent. The next day Don Pedro procured us fresh horses, and offered to accompany us himself. We proceeded to the south, generally following the coast, and passing through several hamlets, each with its large barn-like chapel built of wood. At Vlapili, Don Pedro asked the commandant to give us a guide to QKO. The old gentleman offered to come himself, but for a long time nothing would persuade him that two Englishmen really wished to go to such an out of the way place as QKO. We were thus accompanied by the two greatest aristocrats in the country, as was plainly to be seen in the manner of all the poorer Indians towards them. At Chomchi we struck across the island, following intricate winding paths, sometimes passing through magnificent forests, and sometimes through pretty cleared spots, abounding with corn and potato crops. The sundulating woody country, partially cultivated, reminded me of the wilder parts of England, and therefore had to my eye a most fascinating aspect. At Belinko, which is situated on the borders of the Lake of Qko, only a few fields were cleared, and all the inhabitants appeared to be Indians. This lake is 12 miles long, and runs in an east and west direction. From local circumstances, the sea breeze blows very regularly during the day, and during the night it falls calm. This has given rise to strange exaggerations, for the phenomenon, as described to us at S. Carlos, was quite a prodigy. The road to Qko was so very bad, that we determined to embark in a Periagua underscore. The commandant, in the most authoritative manner, ordered six Indians to get ready to pull us over, without deigning to tell them whether they would be paid. The Periagua is a strange rough boat, but the crew were still stranger, I doubt if six uglier little men ever got into a boat together. They pulled, however, very well and cheerfully. The stroke oarsman gabbled Indian, and uttered strange cries, much after the fashion of a pig driver driving his pigs. We started with the light breeze against us, but yet reached the Capella di Qko, before it was late. The country on each side of the lake was one unbroken forest. 
in the same periagua with us, a cow was embarked. Two gets a large and animal into a small boat appears at first to difficulty, but the Indians managed it in a minute. They brought the cow alongside the boat, which was heeled towards her, then placing two oars under her belly, with their ends resting on the gunwale. By the aid of these levers they fairly tumbled the poor beast heels overhead into the bottom of the boat, and then lashed her down with ropes. At QKO we found an uninhabited hovel, which is the residence of the Padre, when he pays this capella a visit, where, lighting a fire, we cooked our supper, and were very comfortable. The district of QKO is the only inhabited part on the whole west coast of Chilo. It contains about 30 or 40 Indian families, who are scattered along 4 or 5 miles of the shore. They are very much secluded from the rest of Chilo, and have scarcely any sort of commerce, except sometimes in a little oil, which they get from seal blubber. They are tolerably dressed in clothes of their own manufacture, and they have plenty to eat. They seemed, however, discontented, yet humble to a degree which it was quite painful to witness. These feelings are, I think, chiefly to be attributed to the harsh and authoritative manner in which they are treated by their rulers. Our companions, although so very civil to us, behaved to the poor Indians, as if they had been slaves, rather than free men. They ordered provisions and the use of their horses, without ever condescending to say how much, or indeed whether the owners should be paid at all. In the morning, being left alone with these poor people, we soon ingratiated ourselves by presence of cigars and meat. A lump of white sugar was divided between all present, and tasted with the greatest curiosity. The Indians ended all their complaints by saying, and it is only because we are poor Indians, and know nothing, but it was not so, when we had a king. The next day after breakfast, we rode a few miles northward to Punta Huantamo. The road lay along a very broad beach, on which, even after so many fine days, a terrible surf was breaking. I was assured that after a heavy gale, the roar can be heard at night even at Castro, a distance of no less than 21 sea miles across a hilly and wooded country. We had some difficulty in reaching the point, owing to the intolerably bad pass, for everywhere in the shade the ground soon becomes a perfect quagmire. The point itself is a bold rocky hill. It is covered by a plant allied, I believe, to Bromelia, and called by the inhabitants Chetones. In scrambling through the beds, our hands were very much scratched. I was amused by observing the precaution our Indian guidebook, in turning up his trousers, thinking that they were more delicate than his own hard skin. This plant bears a fruit, in shape like an artichoke, in which a number of seed vessels are packed, these contain a pleasant sweet pulp, here much esteemed. I saw at Los Harbor the Chilatans making shishi, or cider, with this fruit, so true is it, as Humboldt remarks, that almost everywhere man finds means of preparing some kind of beverage from the vegetable kingdom. The savages, however, of Tierra del Fugo, and I believe of Australia, have not advanced as far in the arts. The coast to the north of Puntehuan Tamil is exceedingly rugged and broken, and is fronted by many breakers, on which the sea is eternally roaring. Mr. King and myself were anxious to return, if it had been possible, on foot along this coast, but even the Indians said it was quite impracticable. We were told, that men have crossed, by striking directly through the woods from QKO to S. Carlos, but never by the coast. On these expeditions, the Indians carry with them only roasted corn, and of this, they eat sparingly twice a day 26-3 embarking in the Paragua, we returned across the lake, and then mounted our horses. The whole of Chilo took advantage of this week of unusually fine weather, to clear the ground by burning. In every direction volumes of smoke were curling upwards. Although the inhabitants were so assiduous, in setting fire to every part of the wood, yet I did not see a single fire which they had succeeded in making extensive. We dined with our friend the Commandant, and did not reach Castro till after dark. The next morning we started very early. After having ridden for some time, we obtained from the brow of a steep hill an extensive view, and it is a rare thing on this road, of the great forest. Over the horizon of trees, the volcano of Corcovado, and the great flat up one to the north, stood out in proud preeminence, scarcely another peak in the long range, showed its snowy summit. I hope it will be long, before I forget this farewell view of the magnificent Cordillera of fronting Chilo. At night we bivouacked under a cloudless sky, and the next morning reached S. Carlos. We arrived on the right day, for before evening heavy rain commenced. February 4th, sailed from Chilo. During the last week I made several short excursions. One was to examine a great bed of now existing shells, elevated 350 feet above the level of the sea, from among these shells, large forest trees were growing. Another right was to Pihuchuku Gai. I had with me a guide who knew the country far too well, for he would pertinaciously tell me endless Indian names for every little point, rivulet, and creek. In the same manner as in Tierra del Fugo, the Indian language appears singularly well adapted for attaching names to the most trivial features of the land. 
I believe everyone was glad to say farewell to Chilo, yet if we could forget the gloom and ceaseless rain of winter, Chilo might pass for a charming island. There is also something very attractive in the simplicity and humble politeness of the poor inhabitants. We stared northward along shore, but owing to thick weather did not reach Valdivia till the night of the 8th. The next morning the boat proceeded to the town, which is distant about 10 miles. We followed the course of the river, occasionally passing a few hotels, and patches of ground cleared out of the otherwise unbroken forest, and sometimes meeting a canoe with an Indian family. The town is situated on the low banks of the stream, and is so completely buried in a wood of apple trees, that the streets are merely paths in an orchard I have never seen any country, where apple trees appeared to thrive so well as in this damp part of South America, on the borders of the roads there were many young trees evidently self-grown. In Chilo the inhabitants possess a marvelously short method of making an orchard. At the lower part of almost every branch, small, conical, brown, wrinkled points project, these are always ready to change into roots, as may sometimes be seen, where any mud has been accidentally splashed against the tree. A branch as thick as a man's thigh is chosen in the early spring, and is cut off just beneath a group of these points, all the smaller branches are lopped off, and it is then placed about two feet deep in the ground. During the ensuing summer the stump throws out long shoots, and sometimes even bears fruit. I was shown one which had produced as many as 23 apples, but this was thought very unusual. In the third season the stump was changed, as I have myself seen, into a well-wooded tree, loaded with fruit. An old man near Valdivia illustrated his motto, Necessitated es la mare del invention, by giving an account of the several useful things he manufactured from his apples. After making cider, and likewise wine, he extracted from the refuse a white, and finely flavored spirit, by another process he procured a sweet treacle, or, as he called it, honey. His children and pigs seemed almost to live, during this season of the year, in his orchard. February 11th, I set out with the guide on a short ride, in which, however, I managed to see singularly a little, either of the geology of the country, or of its inhabitants. There is not much cleared land near Valdivia, after crossing a river at the distance of a few miles, we entered the forest, and then passed only one miserable hovel, before reaching our sleeping place for the night. The short difference in latitude, of 150 miles, has given a new aspect to the forest, compared with that of Chilo. This is owing to a slightly different proportion in the kinds of trees. The evergreens do not appear to be quite so numerous, and the forest in consequence, has a brighter tint. As in Chilo, the lower parts are matted together by canes, here also another kind, resembling the bamboo of Brazil, and about 20 feet in height, grows in clusters, and ornaments the banks of some of the streams in a very pretty manner. It is with this plant, that the Indians make their chooses, or long tapering spears. Our resting house was so dirty, that I preferred sleeping outside, on these journeys the first night is generally very uncomfortable, because one is not accustomed to the tickling, and biting of the fleas. I'm sure, in the morning, there was not a space on my legs the size of a shilling which had not its little red mark, where the flea had feasted twelfth we continued to ride through the uncleared forest, only occasionally meeting an Indian on horseback, or a troop of fine mules bringing a of planks and corn from the southern plains. In the afternoon one of the horses knocked up, we were then on the brow of a hill, which commanded a fine view of the Llanos. The view of these open plains was very refreshing, after being hemmed in, and buried in the wilderness of trees. The uniformity of a forest soon becomes very wearisome. This west coast makes me remember with pleasure the free, unbounded plains of Patagonia, yet, with the true spirit of contradiction, I cannot forget how sublime is the silence of the forest. The Llanos are the most fertile and thickly peopled parts of the country, as they possess the immense advantage of being nearly free from trees. Before leaving the forest we crossed some flat little lawns, around which single trees stood, as in an English park, I have often noticed with surprise, in wooded undulatory districts, that the quite level parts have been destitute of trees. On account of the tired horse, I determined to stop at the mission of Cudico, to the friar of which I had a letter of introduction. Cudico is an intermediate district between the forest and the Llanos. There are a good many cottages, with patches of corn and potatoes, nearly all belonging to Indians. The tribes dependent on Valdivia, are reduced as why Christianus. The Indians farther northward, about Iracot and Imperial, are still very wild, and not converted, but they have all much intercourse with the Spaniards. The Padre said, that the Christian Indians did not much like coming to Mass, but that otherwise they showed respect for religion. The greatest difficulty is in making them observe the ceremonies of marriage. The wild Indians take as many wives as they can support, and to sequel sometimes have more than ten, on entering his house. The number may be told by that of the separate fires. Each wife lays a week, in turn with the cacique, but all are employed in weaving ponchos, etc., for his profit. 
to be the wife of a cacique, is an honor much sought after by the Indian women. The men of all these tribes wear a coarse woolen poncho, those south of Faldivia wear short trousers, and those north of it a petticoat, like the chilipa of the gauchos. All have their long hair bound by a scarlet fillet, but with no other covering on their heads. These Indians are good-sized men, their cheekbones are prominent, and in general appearance they resemble the great American family to which they belong, but their physiognomy seemed to me to be slightly different from that of any other tribe which I had before seen. Their expression is generally grave, and even austere, and possesses much character, this may pass either for honest bluntness or fierce determination. The long black hair, the great and much lined features, and the dark complexion, called to my mind old portraits of James I on the road we met with none of that humble politeness, so universal in Shiloh. Some gave their merry merry good morning, with promptness, but the greater number did not seem inclined to offer any salute. This independence of manners is probably a consequence of their long wars, and the repeated victories which they alone, of all the tribes in America, have gained over the Spaniards. I spent the evening very pleasantly, talking with the Padre. He was exceedingly kind and hospitable, and coming from Santiago, had contrived to surround himself with some few comforts. Being a man of some little education, he bitterly complained of the total want of society. With no particular zeal for religion, no business or pursuit, how completely must this man's life be wasted? The next day, on our return, we met seven very wild-looking Indians, of whom some were caciques, that had just received from the Chilean government their yearly small stipend for having long remained faithful. They were fine-looking men, and they rode one after the other, with most gloomy faces. An old cacique, who headed them, had been, I suppose, more excessively drunk than the rest, for he seemed extremely grave and very cramped. Shortly before this, two Indians joined us, who were traveling from a distant mission to Valdivia concerning some lawsuit. One was a good-humored old man, but from his wrinkled beardless face looked more like an old woman than a man. I frequently presented both of them with cigars, and though ready to receive them, and I dare say grateful, they would hardly condescend to thank me. A Chilean Indian would have taken off his hat, and given his dice a page. The traveling was very tedious, both from the badness of the roads, and from the number of great fallen trees, which it was necessary either to leap over, or to avoid by making long circuits. We slept on the road, and next morning reached Faldivia, whence I proceeded on board. A few days afterwards I crossed the bay with a party of officers, and landed near the fort called Nibla. The buildings were in a most ruinous state, and the gun carriages quite rotten. Mr. Wickham remarked to the commanding officer that with one discharge they would certainly all fall to pieces. The poor man, trying to put a good face upon it, gravely replied, No, I'm sure, sir, they would stand too. The Spaniards must have intended to have made this place impregnable. There is now lying in the middle of the courtyard a little mountain of mortar, which rivals in hardness the rock on which it is placed. It was brought from Chile, and cost seven thousand dollars. The revolution having broken out, prevented its being applied to any purpose, and now it remains a monument of the fallen greatness of Spain. I wanted to go to a house about a mile and a half distant, but my guide said it was quite impossible to penetrate the wood in a straight line. He offered, however, to lead me, by following obscure cattle tracks, the shortest way, the walk, nevertheless, took no less than three hours. This man is employed in hunting strayed cattle, yet, well as he must know the woods, he was not long since lost for two whole days, and had nothing to eat. These facts convey a good idea of the impracticability of the forests of these countries. A question often occurred to me, how long does any vestige of a fallen tree remain? This man showed me one which a party of fugitive royalists had cut down fourteen years ago, and taking this as a criterion, I should think a bowl a foot and a half in diameter, would in thirty years be changed into a heap of mold. February 20th, this day has been memorable in the annals of Faldivia, for the most severe earthquake experienced by the oldest inhabitant. I happened to be on shore, and was lying down in the wood to rest myself. It came on suddenly, and lasted two minutes, but the time appeared much longer. The rocking of the ground was very sensible. The undulations appeared to my companion and myself to come from due east, whilst others thought they proceeded from southwest. This shows how difficult it sometimes is to perceive the directions of the vibrations. There was no difficulty in standing upright, but the motion made me almost giddy. It was something like the movement of a vessel in a little cross ripple, or still more like that felt by a person skating over thin ice, which bends under the weight of his body. A bad earthquake at once destroys our oldest associations, the earth, the very emblem of solidity, has moved beneath our feet like a thin crust over a fluid, one second of time has created in the mind a strange idea of insecurity, which hours of reflection would not have produced. In the forest, as the breeze moved the trees, I felt only the earth tremble, but saw no other effect. 
Captain Fitzroy and some officers were at the town during the shock, and there the scene was more striking, for although the houses, from being built of wood, did not fall, they were violently shaken, and the boards creaked and rattled together. The people rushed out of doors in the greatest alarm. It is these accompaniments that create that perfect horror of earthquakes experienced by all who have thus seen, as well as felt, their effects. Within the forest it was a deeply interesting, but by no means an exciting phenomenon. The tides were very curiously affected. The great shock took place at the time of low water, and an old woman who was on the beach told me that the water flowed very quickly, but not in great waves, to high water mark, and then as quickly returned to its proper level. This was also evident by the line of wet sand. The same kind of quick, but quiet movement in the tide, happened a few years since at Chilo, during a slight earthquake, and created much causeless alarm. In the course of the evening there were many weaker shocks, which seemed to produce in the harbor the most complicated currents, and some of great strength. March 4th, we entered the harbor of Conception. While the ship was beating up to the anchorage, I landed on the island of Quiriquina. The mayordomo of the estate quickly wrote down, to tell me the terrible news of the great earthquake of the 20th that not a house in Conception or Talcahano, the port, was standing, that seventy villages were destroyed, and that a great wave had almost washed away the ruins of Talcahano. Of this latter statement I soon saw abundant proofs, the whole coast being strewn over with timber and furniture, as if a thousand ships had been wrecked. Besides chairs, tables, bookshelves, etc., in great numbers, there were several roofs of cottages, which had been transported almost whole. The storehouses at Talcahano had been burst open, and great bags of cotton, yerba, and other valuable merchandise were scattered on the shore. During my walk round the island, I observed that numerous fragments of rock, which, from the marine productions adhering to them, must recently have been lying in deep water, had been cast up high on the beach, one of these was six feet long, three broad, and two thick. The island itself has plainly showed the overwhelming power of the earthquake, as the beach did that of the consequent great wave. The ground in many parts was fissured in north and south lines, perhaps caused by the yielding of the parallel and steep sides of this narrow island. Some of the fissures near the cliffs were a yard wide. Many enormous masses had already fallen on the beach, and the inhabitants thought that when the rains commenced far greater slips would happen. The effect of the vibration on the hard primary slate, which composes the foundation of the island, was still more curious, the superficial parts of some narrow ridges were as completely shivered as if they had been blasted by gunpowder. This effect, which was rendered conspicuous by the fresh fractures and displaced soil, must be confined to near the surface, for otherwise there would not exist a block of solid rock throughout Chile, nor is this improbable, as it is known, that the surface of a vibrating body is affected differently from the central part. It is, perhaps, owing to the same reason, that earthquakes do not cause quite such terrific havoc within deep mines as would be expected. I believe this convulsion has been more effectual in lessening the size of the island of Quiriquina than the ordinary wear and tear of the sea and weather during the course of a whole century. The next day I landed at Talcahano, and afterwards rode to Conception. Both towns presented the most awful yet interesting spectacle I ever beheld. To a person who had formerly known them, it possibly might have been still more impressive, for the ruins were so mingled together, and the whole scene possessed so little the air of a habitable place, that it was scarcely possible to imagine its former condition. The earthquake commenced at half past eleven o'clock in the forenoon. If it had happened in the middle of the night, the greater number of the inhabitants, which in this one province must amount to many thousands, must have perished, instead of less than a hundred, as it was, the invariable practice of running out of doors at the first trembling of the ground, alone saved them. In conception each house, or row of houses, stood by itself, a heap or line of ruins, but in Talcahano, owing to the great wave, little more than one layer of bricks, tiles, and timber with here and there part of the wall left standing, could be distinguished. From this circumstance conception, although not so completely desolated, was a more terrible, and if I may so call it, picturesque sight. The first shock was very sudden. The mayordomo at Quiriquina told me that the first notice he received of it was finding both the horse he rode and himself rolling together on the ground. Rising up, he was again thrown down. He also told me that some cows which were standing on the steep side of the island were rolled into the sea. The great wave caused the destruction of many cattle, on one low island near the head of the bay, seventy animals were washed off and drowned. It is generally thought, that this has been the worst earthquake ever recorded in Chile, but as the very severe ones occur only after long intervals, this cannot easily be known, nor indeed would a much worse shock have made any difference, for the ruin was now complete. Innumerable small tremblings followed the great earthquake, and within the first twelve days no less than three hundred were counted. After viewing conception, I cannot understand how the greater number of inhabitants escaped unhurt. 
The houses in many parts fell outwards, thus forming in the middle of the streets little hillocks of brickwork and rubbish. Mr. Rouse, the English consul, told us that he was at breakfast, when the first movement warned him to run out. He had scarcely reached the middle of the courtyard, when one side of his house came thundering down. He retained presence of mind to remember, that if he once got on the top of that part which had already fallen, he would be safe. Not being able from the motion of the ground to stand, he crawled up on his hands and knees, and no sooner had he ascended this little eminence, than the other side of the house fell in, the great beam sweeping close in front of his head. With his eyes blinded, and his mouth choked with the cloud of dust which darkened the sky, at last he gained the street. As shock succeeded shock, at the interval of a few minutes, no one dared approach the shattered ruins, and no one knew whether his dearest friends and relations were not perishing from the want of help. Those who had saved any property were obliged to keep a constant watch, for thieves prowled about, and at each little trembling of the ground, with one hand they beat their breasts and cried misericordia, and then with the other filched what they could from the ruins. The thatch roofs fell over the fires, and flames burst forth in all parts. Hundreds knew themselves ruined, and few had the means of providing food for the day. Earthquakes alone are sufficient to destroy the prosperity of any country. If beneath England the now inner subterranean forces should exert those powers, which most assuredly in former geological ages they have exerted, how completely would the entire condition of the country be changed? What would become of the lofty houses, thickly packed cities, great manufactories, the beautiful public and private edifices? If the new period of disturbance were first to commence by some great earthquake in the dead of the night, how terrific would be the carnage! England would at once be bankrupt, all the papers, records, and accounts would from that moment be lost. Government being unable to collect the taxes, and failing to maintain its authority, the hand of violence and rapine would remain uncontrolled. In every large town famine would go forth, pestilence and death following in its train. Shortly after the shock, a great wave was seen from the distance of three or four miles, approaching in the middle of the bay with a smooth outline, but along the shore it tore up cottages and trees, as it swept onwards with irresistible force. At the head of the bay it broke in a fearful line of white breakers, which rushed up to a height of twenty-three vertical feet above the highest spring tides. Their force must have been prodigious, for at the fort a cannon with its carriage, estimated at four tons in weight, was moved fifteen feet inwards. A skinner was left in the midst of the ruins, two hundred yards from the beach. The first wave was followed by two others, which in their retreat, carried away a vast track of floating objects. In one part of the bay, a ship was pitched high and dry on shore, was carried off, again driven on shore, and again carried off. In another part, two large vessels anchored near together were whirled about, and their cables were thrice wound round each other, though anchored at a depth of thirty-six feet, they were for some minutes aground. The great wave must have travelled slowly, for the inhabitants of Talcahano had time to run up the hills behind the town, and some sailors pulled out seaward, trusting successfully to their boat riding securely over the swell, if they could reach it before it broke. One old woman with a little boy, four or five years old, ran into a boat, but there was nobody to row it out, the boat was consequently dashed against an anchor, and cut in twain, the old woman was drowned, but the child was picked up some hours afterwards clinging to the wreck. Pools of salt water were still standing amidst the ruins of the houses, and children, making boats with old tables and chairs, appeared as happy as their parents were miserable. It was, however, exceedingly interesting to observe, how much more active and cheerful all appeared, than could have been expected. It was remarked with much truth, that from the destruction being universal, no one individual was humbled more than another, or could suspect his friends of coldness, that most grievous result of the loss of wealth. Mr. Rouse, and the large party whom he kindly took under his protection, lived for the first week in a garden beneath some apple trees. At first they were as merry, as if it had been a picnic, but soon afterwards heavier rain caused much discomfort, for they were absolutely without shelter. In Captain Fitzroy's excellent account of the earthquake, it is said that two explosions, one like a column of smoke and another like the blowing of a great whale, were seen in the bay. The water also appeared everywhere to be boiling, and it became black, and exhaled a most disagreeable sulfurous smell. These latter circumstances were observed in the Bay of Valparaiso during the earthquake of 1822. They may, I think, be accounted for, by the disturbance of the mud at the bottom of the sea containing organic matter and decay. In the Bay of Callao, during a calm day, I noticed, that as the ship dragged her cable over the bottom, its course was marked by a line of bubbles. The lower orders in Talcahano thought that the earthquake was caused by some old Indian women, who two years ago, being offended, stopped at the volcano of Ventuco. This silly belief is curious, because it shows that experience has taught them to observe that there exists a relation between the suppressed action of the volcanoes and the trembling of the ground. 
it was necessary to apply the witchcraft to the point where their perception of cause and effect failed, and this was the closing of the volcanic vent. This belief is the more singular in this particular instance, because, according to Captain Fitzroy, there is reason to believe that Antioco was no ways affected. The town of Conception was built in the usual Spanish fashion, with all the streets running at right angles to each other, one set ranging SW by W, and the other set NW by N. The walls in the former direction certainly stood better than those in the latter. The greater number of the masses of brickwork were thrown down towards the N. E. Both these circumstances perfectly agree with the general idea of the undulations having come from the SW, in which quarter subterranean noises were also heard for it is evident that the walls running SW and any which presented their ends to the point whence the undulations came, would be much less likely to fall than those walls which, running in W and SE, must in their whole lengths have been at the same instant thrown out of the perpendicular, for the undulations coming from the SW, must have extended in NW and SE waves, as they passed under the foundations. This may be illustrated by placing books edgeways on a carpet, and then, after the manner suggested by Mitchell, imitating the undulations of an earthquake, it will be found that they fall with more or less readiness, according as their direction more or less nearly coincides with the line of the waves. The fissures in the ground generally, though not uniformly, extended in an SE and NW direction, and therefore corresponded to the lines of undulation, or of principal flexure. Bearing in mind all these circumstances, which so clearly point to the SW as the chief focus of disturbance, it is a very interesting fact that the island of S. Maria, situated in that quarter, was, during the general uplifting of the land, raised to nearly three times the height of any other part of the coast. The different resistance offered by the walls, according to their direction, was well exemplified in the case of the cathedral. The side which fronted the N.E. presented a grand pile of ruins, in the midst of which door cases and masses of timber stood up, as if floating in a stream. Some of the angular blocks of brickwork were of great dimensions, and they were rolled to a distance on the level plaza, like fragments of rock at the base of some high mountain. The side walls, running SW and NE, fell exceedingly fractured, yet remained standing, but the vast buttresses, at right angles to them, and therefore parallel to the walls that fell, were in many cases cut clean off, as if by a chisel, and hurled to the ground. Some square ornaments on the coping of these same walls, were moved by the earthquake into a diagonal position. A similar circumstance was observed after an earthquake at Valparaiso, Calabria, and other places, including some of the ancient Greek temples. 1. This twisting displacement, at first appears to indicate a vortico's movement beneath each point thus affected, but this is highly improbable. May it not be caused by a tendency in each stone, to arrange itself in some particular position, with respect to the lines of vibration, in a manner somewhat similar to pins on a sheet of paper when shaken. Generally speaking, arched doorways or windows stood much better than any other part of the buildings. Nevertheless, a poor lame old man, who had been in the habit, during trifling shocks, of crawling to a certain doorway, was this time crushed to pieces. I have not attempted to give any detailed description of the appearance of conception, for I feel that it is quite impossible to convey the mingled feelings which I experienced. Several of the officers visited it before me, but their strongest language failed to give a just idea of the scene of desolation. It is a bitter and humiliating thing to see works, which have cost man so much time and labor, overthrown in one minute, yet the compassion for the inhabitants was almost instantly banished by the surprise in seeing a state of things produced in a moment of time, which one was accustomed to attribute to a succession of ages. In my opinion, we have scarcely beheld, since leaving England, any sight so deeply interesting. In almost every severe earthquake, the neighboring waters of the sea are said to have been greatly agitated. The disturbance seems generally, as in the case of conception, to have been of two kinds. First, at the instant of the shock, the water swells high up on the beach with a gentle motion, and then as quietly retreats. Secondly, some time afterwards, the whole body of the sea retires from the coast, and then returns in waves of overwhelming force. The first movement seems to be an immediate consequence of the earthquake affecting differently a fluid and a solid, so that their respective levels are slightly deranged, but the second case is a far more important phenomenon. During most earthquakes, and especially during those on the west coast of America, it is certain that the first great movement of the waters has been a retirement. Some authors have attempted to explain this by supposing that the water retains its level, whilst the land oscillates upwards, but surely the water close to the land, even on a rather steep coast, would partake of the motion of the bottom. Moreover, as urged by Mr. Little, similar movements of the sea have occurred at islands far distant from the chief line of disturbance, as was the case with Juan Fernandez during this earthquake, and with Madeira during the famous Lisbon shock. I suspect, but the subject is a very obscure one, that wave, 
however produced, first draws the water from the shore, on which it is advancing to break, I have observed, that this happens with the little waves from the paddles of a steamboat. It is remarkable, that whilst Talcahano and Calio, near Lima, both situated at the head of large shallow bays, have suffered during every severe earthquake from great waves, Valparaiso, seated close to the edge of profoundly deep water, has never been overwhelmed, though so often shaken by the severest shocks. From the great wave not immediately following the earthquake, but sometimes after the interval of even half an hour, and from distant islands being affected similarly with the coasts near the focus of the disturbance, it appears that the wave first rises in the offing, and as this is of general occurrence, the cause must be general, I suspect we must look to the line, where the less disturbed waters of the deep ocean join the water near the coast which has partaken of the movements of the land, as the place, where the great wave is first generated, it would also appear, that the wave is larger or smaller, according to the extent of shoal water which has been agitated together with the bottom on which it rested. The most remarkable effect of this earthquake was the permanent elevation of the land, it would probably be far more correct to speak of it as the cause. There can be no doubt, that the land round the Bay of Conception was upraised two or three feet, but it deserves notice, that owing to the wave having obliterated the old lines of tidal action on the sloping sandy shores, I could discover no evidence of this fact, except in the united testimony of the inhabitants, that one little rocky shoal, now exposed, was formerly covered with water. At the island of Esmeria, about 30 miles distant, the elevation was greater, on one part, Captain Fitzroy founds beds of putrid mussel shells, still adhering to the rocks underscore, 10 feet above high water mark, the inhabitants had formerly dived at lower water sprig hides for these shells. The elevation of this province is particularly interesting, from its having been the theater of several other violent earthquakes, and from the vast numbers of seashells scattered over the land, up to a height of certainly 600, and I believe, of 1,000 feet. At Valparaiso, as I have remarked, similar shells are found at the height of 1300 feet, it is hardly possible to doubt, that this great elevation has been affected by successive small uprisings, such as that which accompanied or caused the earthquake of this year, and likewise by an insensibly slow rise, which is certainly in progress on some parts of this coast. The island of Juan Fernandez, 360 miles to the NE, was, at the time of the great shock of the 20th, violently shaken, so that the trees beat against each other, and a volcano burst forth underwater close to the shore, these facts are remarkable because this island, during the earthquake of 1751, was then also affected more violently than other places at an equal distance from conception, and this seems to show some subterranean connection between these two points. Chilo, about 340 miles southward of Conception, appears to have been shaken more strongly than the intermediate district of Faltivia, where the volcano of Valerica was no ways affected, whilst in the Cordillera in front of Chilo, two of the volcanoes burst forth at the same instant in violent action. These two volcanoes, and some neighboring ones, continued for a long time in eruption, and ten months afterwards were again influenced by an earthquake at Conception. Some men, cutting wood near the base of one of these volcanoes, did not perceive the shock of the 20th, although the whole surrounding province was then trembling, here we have an eruption relieving and taking the place of an earthquake, as would have happened at conception, according to the belief of the lower orders, if the volcano at Tantuco had not been closed by witchcraft. Two years and three quarters afterwards, Valdivia and Chilo were again shaken, more violently than on the 20th, and an island in the Chanis archipelago, was permanently elevated more than eight feet. It will give a better idea of the scale of these phenomena, if, as in the case of the glaciers, we suppose them to have taken place at corresponding distances in Europe, then would the land from the North Sea to the Mediterranean, have been violently shaken, and at the same instant of time a large tract of the eastern coast of England would have been permanently elevated. Together with some outlying islands, a train of volcanoes on the coast of Holland would have burst forth in action, and an eruption taken place at the bottom of the sea, near the northern extremity of Ireland and lastly, the ancient fence of Auvergne. Cantal, and Montor would each have sent up to the sky a dark column of smoke, and have long remained in fierce action. Two years and three quarters afterwards, France, from its center to the English Channel, would have been again desolated by an earthquake and an island permanently upraised in the Mediterranean. The space, from under which volcanic matter on the 20th was actually erupted, is 720 miles in one line, and 400 miles in another line at right angles to the first, hence, in all probability, a subterranean lake of lava is here stretched out, of nearly double the area of the Black Sea. From the intimate, and complicated manner in which the elevatory and eruptive forces were shown to be connected during this strain of phenomena, we may confidently come to the conclusion, that the forces which slowly, and by little starts uplift continents, and those which at successive periods pour forth volcanic matter from open orifices, are identical.
For many reasons, I believe that the frequent quakings of the Earth on this line of coast are caused by the rending of the strata, necessarily consequent on the tension of the land when upraised, and their injection by fluidified rock. This rending and injection would, if repeated often enough, and we know, that earthquakes repeatedly affect the same areas in the same manner, form a chain of hills, and the linear island of S. Mary, which was upraised thrice the height of the neighboring country, seems to be undergoing this process. I believe that the solid axis of a mountain, differs in its manner of formation from a volcanic hill, only in the molten stone, having been repeatedly injected, instead of having been repeatedly ejected. Moreover, I believe that it is impossible to explain the structure of great mountain chains, such as that of the Cordillera, or the strata, capping the injected axis of plutonic rock, have been thrown on their edges along several parallel, and neighboring lines of elevation, except on this view of the rock of the axis having been repeatedly injected, after intervals sufficiently long to allow the upper parts or wedges to cool and become solid, for if the strata had been thrown into their present highly inclined, vertical, and even inverted positions, by a single blow, the very bowels of the earth would have gushed out, and instead of beholding abrupt mountain axes of rock solidified under great pressure, deluges of lava would have flowed out at innumerable points on every line of elevation. March 7, 1835 we stayed three days at Conception, and then sailed for Valparaiso. The wind being northerly, we only reached the mouth of the harbor of Conception, before it was dark. Being very near the land, and a fog coming on, the anchor was dropped. Presently a large American whaler appeared alongside of us, and we heard the Yankee swearing at his men to keep quiet, whilst he listened for the breakers. Captain Fitzroy hailed him, in a loud clear voice, to anchor where he then was. The poor man must have thought the voice came from the shore, such a babel of cries issued at once from the ship everyone looing out, let go the anchor, veer a cable, shorten sail. It was the most laughable thing I ever heard. If the ship's crew had been all captains, and no men, there could not have been a greater uproar of orders. We afterwards found, that the mates tattered, I suppose all hands were assisting him in giving his orders. On the 11th we anchored at Valparaiso, and two days afterwards I set out to cross the Cordillera. I proceeded to Santiago, where Mr. Caldcle most kindly assisted me in every possible way, in making the little preparations which were necessary. In this part of Chile there are two passes across the Andes to Mendoza, the one most commonly used, namely, that of a Cacagua or Spalata is situated some way to the north, the other, called the Portillo, is to the south, and nearer, but more lofty and dangerous. March 18th, we set out for the Portillo Pass. Leaving Santiago we crossed the white burnt up plain on which that city stands, and in the afternoon, arrived at the Maipú, one of the principal rivers in Chile. The valley, at the point where it enters the first cordillera, is bounded on each side by lofty barren mountains, and although not broad, it is very fertile. Numerous cottages were surrounded by vines, and by orchards of apple, nectarine, and peach trees their buzz breaking with the weight of the beautiful riba fruit. In the evening we passed the custom house, where our luggage was examined. The frontier of Chile is better guarded by the cordillera, than by the waters of the sea. There are very few valleys which lead to the central ranges, and the mountains are quite impassable in other parts by beasts of burden. The custom house officers were very civil, which was perhaps partly owing to the passport which the President of the Republic had given me, but I must express my admiration at the natural politeness of almost every Chileno. In this instance, the contrast with the same class of men in most other countries was strongly marked. I may mention an anecdote with which I was at the time much pleased, we met near Mendoza a little and very fat negress, riding astride on a mule. She had a gutter, so enormous, that it was scarcely possible to avoid gazing at her for a moment, but my two companions almost instantly, by way of apology, made the common salute of the country, by taking off their hats. Where would one of the lower or higher classes in Europe, have shown such feeling politeness to a poor and miserable object of a degraded race? At night we slept at a cottage. Our manner of traveling was delightfully independent. In the inhabited parts we bought a little firewood, higher pasture for the animals, and bivouacked in the corner of the same field with them. Carrying an iron pot, we cooked and ate our supper under a cloudless sky, and knew no trouble. My companions were Mariano Gonzalez, who had formerly accompanied me in Chile, and Enerero, with his ten mules and a madrina. The madrina, or godmother, is a most important personage, she is an old steady mare, with a little bell round her neck, and wherever she goes, the mules, like good children, follow her. The affection of these animals for their madrinas saves infinite trouble. If several large troops are turned into one field to graze, in the morning the muleteers have only to lead the madrinas a little apart, and tinkle their bells, although there may be two or three hundred together, each mule immediately knows the bell of its own madrina, and comes to her. It is nearly impossible to lose an old mule, for if it detained for several hours by force, she will, 
by the power of smell, like a dog, track out her companions, or rather the madrina. For, according to the muleteer, she is the chief object of affection. The feeling, however, is not of an individual nature, for I believe I'm right in saying that any animal with a bell will serve as a madrina. In a true peach animal carries on a level road, a cargo weighing 416 pounds, more than 29 stone, but in a mountainous country 100 pounds less, yet with what delicate slim limbs, without any proportional bulk of muscle, these animals support so great a burden. The mule always appears to me a most surprising animal. That a hybrid should possess more reason, memory, obstinacy, social affection, ponders of muscular endurance, and length of life, than either of its parents, seems to indicate that art has here outdone nature. Of our ten animals, six were intended for riding, and four for carrying cargoes, each taking turn about. We carried a good deal of food in case we should be snowed up, as the season was rather late for passing the Portillo. March 19th, we rode during this day to the last, and therefore most elevated, house in the valley. The number of inhabitants became scanty, but wherever water could be brought on the land, it was very fertile. All the main valleys in the Cordillera are characterized by having, on both sides, a fringe or terrace of shingle and sand, rudely stratified, and generally of considerable thickness. These fringes evidently once extended across the valleys and were united, and the bottoms of the valleys in northern Chile, where there are no streams, are thus smoothly filled up. On these fringes the roads are generally carried, for their surfaces are even, and they arise, with a very gentle slope up the valleys, hence, also, they are easily cultivated by irrigation. They may be traced up to a height of between 7,000 and 9,000 feet, where they become hidden by the irregular piles of debris. At the lower and or mouths of the valleys, they are continuously united to those landlocked plains, also formed of shingle, at the foot of the main cordillera, which I have described in a former chapter as characteristic of the scenery of Chile, and which were undoubtedly deposited, when the sea penetrated Chile, as it now does the more southern coasts. No one fact in the geology of South America interested me more than these terraces of rudely stratified shingle. They precisely resemble in composition the matter which the torrents in each valley would deposit, if they were checked in their course by any cause, such as entering a lake or arm of the sea, but the torrents, instead of depositing matter, are now steadily at work wiring away both the solid rock and these alluvial deposits, along the whole line of every main valley and side valley. It is impossible here to give the reasons, but I am convinced that the shingle terraces were accumulated, during the gradual elevation of the Cordillera, by the torrents delivering, at successive levels, their detritus on the beachheads of long narrow arms of the sea, first high up the valleys, then lower and lower down as the land slowly rose. If this be so, and I cannot doubt it, the grand and broken chain of the Cordillera, instead of having been suddenly thrown up, as was still lately the universal, and still is the common opinion of geologists, has been slowly up have been mass, in the same gradual manner as the coasts of the Atlantic and Pacific have risen within the recent period. A multitude of facts in the structure of the Cordillera, on this view receive a simple explanation. The rivers which flow in these valleys, ought rather to be called mountain torrents. Their inclination is very great, and their water the color of mud. The roar which they may be made, as it rushed over the great rounded fragments, was like that of the sea. Amidst the din of rushing waters, the noise from the stones, as they rattled one over another, was most distinctly audible even from a distance. This rattling noise, night and day, may be heard along the whole course of the torrent. The sound spoke eloquently to the geologist, the thousands and thousands of stones, which, striking against each other, made the one dull uniform sound, were all hurrying in one direction. It was like thinking on time, where the minute that now glides past is irrevocable. So is it with these stones, the ocean is their eternity, and each note of that wild music told of one more step towards their destiny. It is not possible for the mind to comprehend, except by a slow process, any effect which is produced by a cause repeated so often, that the multiplier itself conveys an idea, not more definite than the savage implies, when he points to the hairs of his head. As often as I have seen heads of mud, sand, and shingle, accumulated to the thickness of many thousand feet, I have felt inclined to exclaim that causes, such as the present rivers and the present beaches, could never have ground down, and produced such masses. But, on the other hand, when listening to the rattling noise of these torrents, and calling to mind that whole races of animals have passed away from the face of the earth, and that during this whole period, night, and day, these stones have gone rattling onwards in their course, I have thought to myself, can any mountains, any continent, withstand such waste? In this part of the valley, the mountains on each side, were from 3,000 to 6,000 or 8,000 feet high, with rounded outlines and steep bare flanks. The general color of the rock was dullish purple, and the stratification very distinct. If the scenery was not beautiful, it was remarkable and grand. 
We met during the day several herds of cattle, which men were driving down from the higher valleys in the Cordillera. The sign of the approaching winter hurried our steps, more than was convenient for geologizing. The house where we slept, was situated at the foot of a mountain, on the summit of which are the mines of S. Pedro de Nolasco. Sir F. had marvels how, mines have been discovered in such extraordinary situations, as the bleak summit of the mountain of S. Pedro de Nolasco. In the first place, metallic veins in this country, are generally harder than the surrounding strata, hence, during the gradual wear of the hills, they project above the surface of the ground. Secondly, almost every laborer, especially in the northern parts of Chile, understands something about the appearance of ores. In the great mining provinces of Coquimbo and Copiapo, firewood is very scarce, and men search for it over every hill and dale, and by this means nearly all the richest mines have there been discovered. Chenin Silo, from which silver to the value of many hundred thousand pounds has been raised in the course of a few years, was discovered by a man who threw a stone at his loaded donkey, and thinking that it was very heavy, he picked it up, and found it full of pure silver, the pain occurred at no great distance, standing up like a wedge of metal. The miners, also, taking a crowbar with them, often wander on Sundays over the mountains. In the south part of Chile, the men who drive cattle into the Cordillera, and who frequent every ravine, where there is a little pasture, are the usual discoverers. Twentieth, as we ascended the valley, the vegetation, with the exception of a few pretty alpine flowers, became exceedingly scanty, and of quadrupeds, birds, or insects, scarcely one could be seen. The lofty mountains, their summits marked with a few patches of snow, stood well separated from each other, the valleys being filled up with an immense thickness of stratified alluvium. The features in the scenery of the Andes which struck me most, as contrasted with the other mountain chains with which I'm acquainted, were, the flat fringes sometimes expanding into narrow plains on each side of the valleys, the bright colors, chiefly red and purple, of the utterly bare and precipitous hills of Porphyry, the grand and continuous wall-like dikes. The plainly divided strata which, where nearly vertical, formed the picturesque and wild central pinnacles, but where less inclined, composed the great mass of mountains on the outskirts of the range, and lastly, the smooth conical piles of fine, and brightly colored detritus, which sloped up at a high angle from the base of the mountains, sometimes to a height of more than 2,000 feet. I frequently observed, both in Tierra del Fugo, and within the Andes, that where the rock was covered during the greater part of the year with snow, it was shivered in a very extraordinary manner into small angular fragments. Scoresby, one, has observed the same fact in Spitsbergen. The case appears to me rather obscure, for that part of the mountain which is protected by a mantle of snow, must be less subject to repeated, and great changes of temperature than any other part. I have sometimes thought that the earth and fragments of stone on the surface were perhaps less effectually removed by slowly percolating snow water, too, than by rain, and therefore that the appearance of a quicker disintegration of the solid rock under the snow was deceptive. Whatever the cause may be, the quantity of crumbling stone on the cordillera is very great. Occasionally in the spring, great masses of this detritus slide down the mountains and cover the snow drifts in the valleys, thus forming natural ice houses. We rode over one, the height of which was far below the limit of perpetual snow. As the evening grew to a close, we reached a singular basin-like plain, called the Val del Yizo. It was covered by a little dry pasture, and we had the pleasant sight of a herd of cattle amidst the surrounding rocky deserts. The valley takes its name of Yizo from a grape bed, I should think at least 2,000 feet thick, of white, and in some parts quite pure, gypsum. We slept with a party of men, who were employed in loading mules with this substance, which is used in the manufacture of wine. We set out early in the morning, 21st, and continued to follow the course of the river, which had become very small, till we arrived at the foot of the ridge that separates the waters flowing into the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The road, which as yet had been good with this steady, but very gradual ascent, now changed into a steep zigzag track up the Great Range, dividing the republics of Chile and Mendoza. I will here give a very brief sketch of the geology of the several parallel lines forming the Cordillera. Of these lines, there are two considerably higher than the others, namely, on the Chilean side, the Puquines Ridge, which, where the road crosses it, is 13,210 feet above the sea, and the Portillo Ridge, on the Mendoza side, which is 14,305 feet. The lower heads of the Puquines Ridge, and of the several great lines to the westward of it, are composed of a vast pile, many thousand feet in thickness, of porphyries which have flowed as submarine lavas, alternating with angular and rounded fragments of the same rocks, thrown out of the submarine craters. These alternating masses are covered in the central parts, by a great thickness of red sandstone, conglomerate, and calcareous clay slate, associated with, and passing into, prodigious beds of gypsum. In these upper beds shells are tolerably frequent, and they belong to about the period of the lower chalk of Europe. 
It is an old story, but not the less wonderful, to hear of shawls which were once crawling on the bottom of the sea, now standing nearly 14,000 feet above its level. The lower beds in this great pile of strata have been dislocated, baked, crystallized and almost blended together, through the agency of mountain masses of a peculiar white soda granitic rock. The other main line, namely, that of the Portillo, is of a totally different formation. It consists chiefly of grand bare pinnacles of a red potash granite, which low down on the western flank, are covered by a sandstone, converted by the former heat into a quartz rock. On the quartz, there rest beds of a conglomerate several thousand feet in thickness, which have been upheaved by the red granite, and dip at an angle of 45 degs towards the Puquins line. I was astonished to find that this conglomerate was partly composed of pebbles, derived from the rocks, with their fossil shells, of the Puquins range, and partly of red potash granite, like that of the Portillo. Hence we must conclude that both the Puquins and Portillo ranges were partially upheft and exposed to wear and tear when the conglomerate was forming, but as the beds of the conglomerate have been thrown off at an angle of 45 degs by the red Portillo granite, with the underlying sandstone baked by it, we may feel sure that the greater part of the injection and upheaval of the already partially formed Portillo line took place after the accumulation of the conglomerate and long after the elevation of the Puquins ridge so that the Portillo, the loftiest line in this part of the Cordillera, is not so old as the less lofty line of the Puquins. Evidence derived from an inclined stream of lava at the eastern base of the Portillo might be adduced to show that it owes part of its great height to elevations of a still later date. Looking to its earliest origin, the red granite seems to have been injected on an ancient pre-existing line of white granite and mica slate. In most parts, perhaps in all parts, of the Cordillera, it may be concluded that each line has been formed by repeated upheavals and injections, and that the several parallel lines are of different ages. Only thus can we gain time, at all sufficient to explain the truly astonishing amount of denudation, which these great, though comparatively with most other ranges recent, mountains have suffered. Finally, the shells in the Puquins or oldest ridge, proof, as before remarked, that it has been upraised 14,000 feet, since a secondary period, which in Europe we are accustomed to consider as far from ancient, but since these shells lived in a moderately deep sea, it can be shown, that the area now occupied by the Cordillera, must have subsided several thousand feet, then. Northern Chile as much as 6,000 feet, so as to have allowed that amount of submarine strata to have been heaped on the bed on which the shells lived. The proof is the same with that by which it was shown that at a much later period, since the tertiary shells of Patagonia lived, there must have been there a subsidence of several hundred feet, as well as an ensuing elevation. Daily it is forced home on the mind of the geologist, that nothing, not even the wind that blows, is so unstable as the level of the crust of this earth. I will make only one other geological remark, although the Portillo chain is here higher than the Puquins, the waters draining the intermediate valleys, have burst through it. The same fact, on a grander scale, has been remarked in the eastern and loftiest line of the Bolivian Cordillera, through which the rivers pass, analogous facts have also been observed in other quarters of the world. On the supposition of the subsequent and gradual elevation of the Portillo line, this can be understood, for a chain of islets would at first appear, and, as these were lifted up, the tides would be always wearing deeper and broader channels between them. At the present day, even in the most retired sounds on the coast of Tierra del Fuego, the currents in the transverse breaks, which connect the longitudinal channels, are very strong, so that in one transverse channel even a small vessel under sail was whirled round and round. About noon we began the tedious ascent of the Puquins Ridge, and then for the first time experienced some little difficulty in our respiration. The mules would halt every 50 yards, and after resting for a few seconds the poor willing animals started of their own accord again. The short breathing from the rarefied atmosphere is called by the Chilean Spuna, and they have most ridiculous notions concerning its origin. Some say all the waters here have Puna, others that where there is snow there is Puna, and this no doubt is true. The only sensation I experienced was a slight tightness across the head and chest, like that felt on leaving a warm room and running quickly in frosty weather. There was some imagination even in this, for upon finding fossil shells on the highest ridge, I entirely forgot the Puna in my delight. Certainly the exertion of walking was extremely great, and the respiration became deep and laborious, I'm told that in Potosi, about 13,000 feet above the sea, strangers do not become thoroughly accustomed to the atmosphere for an entire year. The inhabitants all recommend onions for the puna, as this vegetable has sometimes been given in Europe for pectoral complaints, it may possibly be of real service, for my part one found nothing so good as the fossil shells. When about halfway up we met a large party with 70 loaded mules. 
It was interesting to hear the wild cries of the muleteers, and to watch the long descending string of the animals, they appeared so diminutive, there being nothing but the black mountains with which they could be compared. When near the summit, the wind, as generally happens, was impetuous and extremely cold. On each side of the ridge, we had to pass over broad bands of perpetual snow, which were now soon, to be covered by a fresh layer. When we reached the crest and looked backwards, a glorious view was presented. The atmosphere is splendidly clear, the sky an intense blue, the profound valleys, the wild broken forms, the heaps of ruins, piled up during the lapse of ages, the bright colored rocks, contrasted with the quiet mountains of snow, all these together produced a scene no one could have imagined. Neither plant nor bird, excepting a few condors wheeling around the higher pinnacles, distracted my attention from the inanimate mass. I felt glad that I was alone, it was like watching a thunderstorm, or hearing in full orchestra a chorus of the Messiah. On several patches of the snow I found the Protococcus nivellus, or red snow, so well known from the accounts of Arctic navigators. My attention was called to it, by observing the footsteps of the mules stained a pale red, as if their hoofs had been slightly bloody. I at first thought, that it was owing to dust blown from the surrounding mountains of red porphyry, for from the magnifying power of the crystals of snow, the groups of these microscopical plants appeared like coarse particles. The snow was colored only where it had thought very rapidly, or had been accidentally crushed. A little rubbed on paper gave it a faint rose tinge mingled with a little brick red. I afterwards scraped some off the paper, and found that it consisted of groups of little spheres in colorless cases, each of the thousandth part of an inch in diameter. The wind on the crest of the Puquines, as just remarked, is generally impetuous and very cold, it is said, three, to blow steadily from the westward or Pacific side. As the observations have been chiefly made in summer, this wind must be an upper and return current. The peak of Tenerife, with the less elevation, and situated in latitude 28 degs, in like manner falls within an upper return stream. At first it appears rather surprising, that the trade wind along the northern parts of Chile, and on the coast of Peru, should blow in so very southerly a direction as it does, but when we reflect that the Cordillera, running in a north and south line, intercepts, like a great wall, the entire depth of the lower atmospheric current, we can easily see, that the trade wind must be drawn northward following the line of mountains, towards the equatorial regions, and thus lose part of that easterly movement which it otherwise would have gained from the Earth's rotation. At Mendoza, on the eastern foot of the Andes, the climate is said to be subject to long calms, and to frequent, though false appearances of gathering rainstorms, we may imagine that the wind, which coming from the eastward is thus banked up by the line of mountains, would become stagnant and irregular in its movements. Having crossed the Puquines, we descended into a mountainous country, intermediate between the two main ranges, and then took up our quarters for the night. We were now in the Republic of Mendoza. The elevation was probably not under 11,000 feet, and the vegetation in consequence exceedingly scanty. The root of a small scrubby plant served as fuel, but it made a miserable fire, and the wind was piercingly cold. Being quite tired with my day's work, I made up my bed as quickly as I could, and went to sleep. About midnight I observed the sky became suddenly clouded, I awakened the Arriero to know if there was any danger of bad weather, but he said that without thunder and lightning there was no risk of a heavy snowstorm. The peril is imminent, and the difficulty of subsequent escape great, to anyone overtaken by bad weather between the two ranges. A certain cave offers the only place of refuge, Mr. Caldclue, who crossed on this same day of the month, was detained there for some time by a heavy fall of snow. Cassages, or houses of refuge, have not been built in this pass as, in the Divis Palata, and, therefore, during the autumn, the Portillo is little frequented. I may here remark that within the main Portillo a rain never falls, for during the summer the sky is cloudless, and in winter snowstorms alone occur. At the place, where we slept water necessarily boiled, from the diminished pressure of the atmosphere, at a lower temperature than it does in a less lofty country, the case being the converse of that of a Papin's digester. Hence the potatoes, after remaining for some hours in the boiling water, were nearly as hard as ever. The pot was left on the fire all night, and next morning it was boiled again, but yet the potatoes were not cooked. I found out this, by overhearing my two companions discussing the cause, they had come to the simple conclusion, that the cursed pot, which was a new one, did not choose to boil potatoes. March 22nd, after eating our potatoless breakfast, we traveled across the intermediate track to the foot of the Portillo Range. In the middle of summer cattle are brought up here to graze, but they had now all been removed, even the greater number of the guanacas had decamped, knowing well that, if overtaken here by a snowstorm, they would be caught in a trap. We had a fine view of a mass of mountains called Tupangato, the hill clothed with unbroken snow, in the midst of which there was a blue patch, no doubt a glacier, a circumstance of rare occurrence in these mountains. 
now commenced a heavy and long climb, similar to that of the Pew Queens. Bald conical hills of red granite rose on each hand, in the valleys there were several broad fields of perpetual snow. These frozen masses, during the process of thawing, had in some parts been converted into pinnacles or columns, for, which, as they were high and close together, made it difficult for the cargo mules to pass. On one of these columns of ice, a frozen horse was sticking as on a pedestal, but with its hind legs straight up in the air. The animal, I suppose, must have fallen with its head downward into a hole, when the snow was continuous, and afterwards the surrounding parts must have been removed by the thaw. When nearly on the crest of the Portillo, we were enveloped in a falling cloud of minute frozen spicula. This was very unfortunate, as it continued the whole day, and quite intercepted our view. The pass takes its name of Portillo, from a narrow cleft or doorway on the highest ridge, through which the road passes. From this point, on a clear day, those vast plains which uninterruptedly extend to the Atlantic Ocean can be seen. We descended to the upper limit of vegetation, and found good quarters for the night under the shelter of some large fragments of rock. We met here some passengers, we made anxious inquiries about the state of the road. Shortly after it was dark the clouds suddenly cleared away, and the effect was quite magical. The great mountains, bright with the full moon, seemed impending over us on all sides, as over a deep crevice. One morning, very early, I witnessed the same striking effect. As soon as the clouds were dispersed it froze severely, but as there was no wind, we slept very comfortably. The increased brilliancy of the moon and stars at this elevation, owing to the perfect transparency of the atmosphere, was very remarkable. Travelers having observed the difficulty of judging heights and distances amidst lofty mountains, have generally attributed it to the absence of objects of comparison. It appears to me, that it is fully as much owing to the transparency of the air confounding objects at different distances, and likewise partly to the novelty of an unusual degree of fatigue arising from a little exertion, help it being thus opposed to the evidence of the senses. I am sure, that this extreme clearness of the air gives a peculiar character to the landscape, all objects appearing to be brought nearly into one plane, as in a drawing or panorama. The transparency is, I presume, owing to the equable and high state of atmospheric dryness. This dryness was shown by the manner in which woodwork shrank, as I soon found by the trouble my geological hammer gave me, by articles of food, such as bread and sugar, becoming extremely hard, and by the preservation of the skin and parts of the flesh of the beasts, which had perished on the road. To the same cause we must attribute the singular facility with which electricity is excited. My flannel waistcoat, when rubbed in the dark, appeared as if it had been washed with phosphorus, every hair on a dog's back crackled, even the linen sheets, and lethern straps of the saddle, when handled, emitted sparks. March 23rd, the descent on the eastern side of the Cordillera is much shorter or steeper than on the Pacific side, in other words, the mountains rise more abruptly from the plains than from the alpine country of Chile. A level and brilliantly wide sea of clouds was stretched out beneath our feet, shutting out the view of the equally level pampas. We soon entered the band of clouds, and did not again emerge from it that day. About noon, finding pasture for the animals and bushes for firewood at La Serra Nails, we stopped for the night. This was near the uppermost limit of bushes, and the elevation, I suppose, was between seven and eight thousand feet. I was much struck with the marked difference between the vegetation of these eastern valleys and those on the Chilean side, yet the climate, as well as the kind of soil, is nearly the same, and the difference of longitude very trifling. The same remark holds good with the quadrupeds, and in a lesser degree with the birds and insects. I may instance the mice, of which I obtained thirteen species on the shores of the Atlantic, and five on the Pacific, and not one of them is identical. We must accept all those species, which habitually or occasionally frequent elevated mountains, and certain birds, which range as far south as the Strait of Magellan. This fact is in perfect accordance with the geological history of the Andes, for these mountains have existed as a great barrier, since the present traces of animals have appeared, and therefore, unless we suppose the same species, to have been created in two different places, we ought not to expect any closer similarity between the organic beings on the opposite sides of the Andes than on the opposite shores of the ocean. In both cases, we must leave out of the question those kinds which have been able to cross the barrier, whether of solid rock or salt water. 5. A great number of the plants and animals were absolutely the same as, or most closely allied to, those of Patagonia. We here have the agati, biscuita, three species of armadillo, the ostrich, certain kinds of partridges and other birds, none of which are ever seen in Chile, but are the characteristic animals of the desert plains of Patagonia. We have likewise many of the same, to the eyes of a person who is not a botanist, for these stunted bushes, withered grass, and dwarf plants. Even the black slowly crawling beetles are closely similar, and some, I believe, on rigorous examination, absolutely identical. 
It had always been to me a subject of regret that we were unavoidably compelled to give up the ascent of the S. Cruz River. Before reaching the mountains, I always had a latent hope of meeting with some great change in the features of the country, but I now feel sure that it would only have been following the plains of Patagonia up the mountainous ascent. March 24. Early in the morning I climbed up a mountain on one side of the valley and enjoyed a far extended view over the pampas. This was a spectacle to which I had always looked forward with interest, but I was disappointed. At the first glance it much resembled a distant view of the ocean, but in the northern parts many irregularities were soon distinguishable. The most striking feature consisted in the rivers, which, facing the rising sun, glittered like silver threads, till lost in the immensity of the distance. At midday we descended the valley and reached a hovel, where an officer and three soldiers were posted to examine passports. One of these men was a thoroughbred pampas Indian. He was kept much for the same purpose as a bloodhound, to track out any person who might pass by secretly, either on foot or horseback. Some years ago, a passenger endeavored to escape the detection by making a long circuit over a neighboring mountain, but this Indian, having by chance crossed his track, followed it for the whole day over dry and very stony hills, till at last he came on his prey hidden in a gully. We here heard that the silvery clouds, which we had admired from the bright region above, had poured down torrents of rain. The valley from this point gradually opened, and the hills became mere water-worn hillocks compared to the giants behind. It then expanded into a gently sloping plain of shingle, covered with low trees and bushes. The Stalus, although appearing narrow, must be nearly ten miles wide, before it blends into the apparently dead-level pampas. We passed the only house in this neighborhood, the estanche of Chacuayo, and at sunset we pulled up in the first snug corner, and there bivouacked. March 25th. I was reminded of the pampas of Buenos Aires by seeing the disk of the rising sun, intersected by an horizon level as that of the ocean. During the night a heavy dew fell, a circumstance which we did not experience within the Cordillera. The road proceeded for some distance due east across a low swamp, then meeting the dry plain, it turned to the north towards Mendoza. The distance is two very long days of journey. Our first day's journey was called 14 leagues to Estacado, and the second 17 to Luxon, near Mendoza. The whole distance is over a level desert plain, with not more than two or three houses. The sun was exceedingly powerful, and the right devoid of all interest. There is very little water in this traversia, and in our second day's journey we found only one little pool. Little water flows from the mountains, and it soon becomes absorbed by the dry and porous soil, so that, although we traveled at the distance of only 10 or 15 miles from the outer range of the Cordillera, we did not cross a single stream. In many parts the ground was encrusted with the Salina fluorescence, hence we had the same salt-loving plants which are common near Bahia Blanca. The landscape has a uniform character from the Strait of Magellan, along the whole eastern coast of Patagonia, to the Rio Colorado, and it appears that the same kind of country extends inland from this river, in a sweeping line as far as San Luis and perhaps even further north. To the eastward of this carved line lies the basin of the comparatively damp and green plains of Buenos Aires. The sterile plains of Mendoza and Patagonia consist of a bed of shingle, worn smooth and accumulated by the waves of the sea while the pampas, covered by thistles, clover, and grass, have been formed by the ancient estuary mud of the Plata. After our two days' tedious journey, it was refreshing to see in the distance the rows of poplars and willows growing round the village and river of Luxon. Shortly before we arrived at this place, we observed to the south a ragged cloud of dark reddish-brown color. At first we thought that it was smoke from some great fire on the plains, but we soon found that it was a swarm of locusts. They were flying northward, and with the aid of a light breeze, they overtook us at a rate of 10 or 15 miles an hour. The main body filled the air from a height of 20 feet, to that, as it appeared, of two or three thousand above the ground, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, or rather, I should say, like a strong breeze passing through the rigging of a ship. The sky, seen through the advanced guard, appeared like a mezzotinto engraving, but the main body was impervious to sight. They were not, however, so thick together, but that they could escape a stick waved backwards and forwards. When they alighted, they were more numerous than the leaves in the field, and the surface became reddish instead of being green. The swarm having once alighted, the individuals flew from side to side in all directions. Locusts are not an uncommon pest in this country. Already during the season, several smaller swarms had come up from the south, where as apparently in all other parts of the world, they are bred in the deserts. The poor cottagers in vain attempted by lighting fires, by shouts, and by waving branches to avert the attack. This species of locust closely resembles, and perhaps is identical with, the famous Gryllus migratorius of the east. We crossed the Luxon, which is a river of considerable size, while its course towards the seacoast is very imperfectly known. It is even doubtful whether, in passing over the plains, it is not evaporated and lost. 
We slept in the village of Luxon, which is a small place surrounded by gardens, and forms the most southern cultivated district in the province of Mendoza. It is five leagues south of the capital. At night I experienced an attack, for it deserves no less a name, of the Benchuca underscore, a species of Redubius, the great black butt of the pampas. It is most disgusting to feel soft wingless insects, about an inch long, crawling over one's body. Before sucking they are quite thin, but afterwards they become round, and bloated with blood, and in this state are easily crushed. One which I caught a tyke week, for they are found in Chile and Peru, was very empty. When placed on a table, and though surrounded by people, if a finger was presented, the bolt insect would immediately protrude its sucker, make a charge, and if allowed, draw blood. No pain was caused by the round. It was curious to watch its body during the act of sucking, as in less than ten minutes it changed from being as flat as a wafer to a globular form. This one feast, for which the Binchuka was indebted to one of the officers, kept it fat during four whole months, but, after the first fortnight, it was quite ready to have another suck. March 27th, we rode on to Mendoza. The country was beautifully cultivated, and resembled Chile. This neighborhood is celebrated for its fruit and certainly nothing could appear more flourishing than the vineyards and the orchards of figs, peaches, and olives. We bought watermelons nearly twice as large as a man's head, most deliciously cool and well-flavored, for a half penny apiece, and for the value of threepence, half the wheelbarrow full of peaches. The cultivated and enclosed part of this province is very small, there is little more than that which we passed through between Luxon and the capital. The land, as in Chile, owes its fertility entirely to artificial irrigation, and it is really wonderful to observe how extraordinarily productive apparent reversion is thus rendered. We stayed the ensuing day in Mendoza. The prosperity of the place has much declined of late to years. The inhabitants say it is good to live in, but very bad to grow rich in. The lower orders have the lounging, reckless manners of the gauchos of the pampas, and their dress, riding gear, and habits of life, are nearly the same. To my mind the town had a stupid, forlorn aspect. Neither the boasted Alameda, nor the scenery, is at all comparable with that of Santiago, but to those who, coming from Buenos Aires, have just crossed the unvary pampas, the gardens and orchards must appear delightful. Sir F. Head, speaking of the inhabitants, says, they eat their dinners, and it is so very hot, they go to sleep, and could they do better? I quite agree with Sir F. Head, the happy doom of the Mendozanus is to eat, sleep and be idle. March 29th, we set out on our return to Chile, by the Espalada Pass situated north of Mendoza. We had to cross a long and most sterile traverse of 15 leagues. The soil in parts was absolutely bare, in others covered by numberless dwarf cacti, armed with formidable spines, and called by the inhabitants little lions. There were, also, a few low bushes. Although the plain is nearly 3,000 feet above the sea, the sun was very powerful, and the heat as well as the clouds of impalpable dust, rendered the traveling extremely irksome. Our course during the day, lay nearly parallel to the Cordillera, but gradually approaching them. Before sunset we entered one of the white valleys, or rather bays, which open on the plain, this soon narrowed into a ravine, where a little higher up the house of Villa Vicencio is situated. As we had ridden all day without a drop of water, both our mules and selves were very thirsty, and we looked out anxiously for the stream which flows down this valley. It was curious to observe how gradually the water made its appearance, on the plain the course was quite dry, by degrees it became a little damper, then puddles of water appeared, these soon became connected, and at Villa Vicencio there was a nice little rivulet 30 of the solitary hubble which bears the imposing name of Villa Vicencio, has been mentioned by every traveler who has crossed the Andes. I stayed here, and at some neighboring mines during the two succeeding days. The geology of the surrounding country is very curious. The Espalada range is separated from the main cordillera by a long narrow plain or basin, like those so often mentioned in Chile, but higher, being 6,000 feet above the sea. This range has nearly the same geographical position with respect to the cordillera, which the gigantic Portillo line has, but it is of a totally different origin, it consists of various kinds of submarine lava, alternating with volcanic sandstones and other remarkable sedimentary deposits, the whole having a very close resemblance to some of the tertiary beds on the shores of the Pacific. From this resemblance I expected to find silicified wood, which is generally characteristic of those formations. I was gratified in a very extraordinary manner. In the central part of the range, at an elevation of about 7,000 feet, I observed on a bare slope some snow-white projecting columns. These were petrified trees, 11 being silicified, and from 30 to 40 converted into coarsely crystallized white calcareous spar. They were abruptly broken off, the upright stumps projecting a few feet above the ground. The trunks measured from 3 to 5 feet each in circumference. They stood a little way apart from each other, but the whole formed one group. 
Mr. Robert Brown has been kind enough to examine the wood. He says it belongs to the fur tribe, partaking of the character of the Araucarian family, but with some curious points of affinity with the U. The volcanic sandstone in which the trees were embedded, and from the lower part of which they must have sprung, had accumulated in successive thin layers around their trunks, and the stone yet retained the impression of the bark. It required little geological practice to interpret the marvelous story which this scene at once unfolded, though I confess I was at first so much astonished, that I could scarcely believe the plainest evidence. I saw the spot where a cluster of fine trees once waved their branches on the shores of the Atlantic, where that ocean, now driven back 700 miles, came to the foot of the Andes. I saw that they had sprung from a volcanic soil which had been raised above the level of the sea, and that subsequently this dry land, with its upright trees, had been let down into the depths of the ocean. In these depths, the formerly dry land was covered by sedimentary beds, and these again by enormous streams of submarine lava, one such mass attaining the thickness of a thousand feet, and these deluges of molten stone and aqueous deposits five times alternately had been spread out. The ocean which received such thick masses, must have been profoundly deep, but again the subterranean forces exerted themselves, and I now beheld the bed of that ocean, forming a chain of mountains more than 7,000 feet in height. Nor had those antagonistic forces been dormant, which are always at work wearing down the surface of the land. The great piles of strata had been intersected by many wide valleys, and the trees now changed into silex, were exposed projecting from the volcanic soil, now changed into rock, whence formerly, in a green and budding state, they had raised their lofty heads. Now, all was utterly irreclaimable and desert, even the lichen cannot adhere to the stony casts of former trees. Past, and scarcely comprehensible as such changes must ever appear, yet they have all occurred within a period, recent when compared with the history of the Cordillera, and the Cordillera itself is absolutely modern as compared with many of the fossiliferous strata of Europe and America. April 1st, we crossed the Upsala range, and at night, slept at the Custom House, the only inhabited spot on the plain. Shortly before leaving the mountains, there was a very extraordinary view, red, purple, green, and quite white sedimentary rocks, alternating with black lavas, were broken up, and thrown into all kinds of disorder by masses of porphyry of every shade of color, from dark brown to the brightest lilac. It was the first view I ever saw, which really resembled those pretty sections which geologists make of the inside of the earth. The next day we crossed the plain, and followed the course of the same great mountain stream which flows by Luxon. Here it was a furious torrent, quite impassable, and appeared larger than in the low country, as was the case with the rivulet of Villa Vicencio. On the evening of the succeeding day, we reached the Rio de las Vacas, which is considered the worst stream in the Cordillera to cross. As all these rivers have a rapid and short course, and are formed by the melting of the snow, the hour of the day makes a considerable difference in their volume. In the evening the stream is muddy and full, but about daybreak it becomes clearer, and much less impetuous. This we found to be the case with the Rio Vacas, and in the morning we crossed it with little difficulty. The scenery thus far was very uninteresting, compared with that of the Portillo Pass. Little can be seen beyond the bare walls of the one grand flat bottom valley, which the road follows up to the highest crest. The valley and the huge rocky mountains are extremely barren, during the two previous nights the poor mules had absolutely nothing to eat, for excepting a few low resinous bushes, scarcely a plant can be seen. In the course of this day we crossed some of the worst passes in the Cordillera, but their danger has been much exaggerated. I was told that, if I attempted to pass on foot, my head would turn giddy, and that there was no room to dismount, but I did not see a place where anyone might not have walked over backwards, or got off his mule on either side. One of the bad passes, called Los Animus underscore, the souls, I had crossed, and did not find out till a day afterwards, that it was one of the awful dangers. No doubt there are many parts in which, if the mule should stumble, the rider would be hurled down a great precipice, but of this there is little chance. I dare say, in the spring, the laterus, or roads, which each year are formed anew across the piles of fallen detritus, are very bad, but from what I saw, I suspect the real danger is nothing. With cargo mules the case is rather different, for the loads project so far, that the animals, occasionally running against each other, or against a point of rock, lose their balance, and are thrown down the precipices. In crossing the rivers I can well believe, that the difficulty may be very great, at this season there was little trouble, but in the summer they must be very hazardous. I can quite imagine, as Sir F. Head describes, the different expressions of those who, have underscore passed the gulf, and those who are underscore passing. I never heard of any man being drowned, but with loaded mules it frequently happens. The arriero tells you to show your mule the best line, and then allow her to cross as she likes, the cargo mule takes a bad line, and is often lost. April 4th, from the Rio de las Vacas to the Punta del Incas, half a day's journey. 
as there was pasture for the mules, and geology for me, we bivouacked to here for the night. When one hears of a natural bridge, one pictures to oneself some deep and narrow ravine, across which a bold mass of rock has fallen, or a great arch hollowed out like the vault of a cavern. Instead of this, the Inca's bridge consists of a crust of stratified shingle cemented together by the deposits of the neighboring hot springs. It appears as if the stream had scooped out a channel on one side, leaving an overhanging ledge, which was met by earth and stones falling down from the opposite cliff. Certainly an oblique junction, as would happen in such a case, was very distinct on one side. The bridge of the Icas is by no means worthy of the great monarchs whose name it bears fifth. We had a long day's ride across the central ridge, from the Incas bridge to the Ages del Agua, which are situated near the lowest, Casich underscore on the Chilean side. These casuches are around little towers, with steps outside to reach the floor, which is raised some feet above the ground on account of the snow drifts. They are eight in number, and under the Spanish government, were kept during the winter well stored with food and charcoal, and each courier had a master key. Now they only answer the purpose of caves, or rather dungeons. Seated on some little eminence, they are not, however, ill suited to the surrounding scene of desolation. The zigzag ascent of the cumber, or the partition of the waters, was very steep and tedious, its night, according to Mr. Pentland, is 12,454 feet. The road did not pass over any perpetual snow, although there were patches of it on both hands. The wind on the summit was exceedingly cold, but it was impossible not to stop for a few minutes to admire, again and again, the color of the heavens, and the brilliant transparency of the atmosphere. The scenery was grand, to the westward there was a fine chaos of mountains, divided by profound ravines. Some snow generally falls before this period of the season, and it has even happened, that the Cordillera have been finally closed by this time. But we were most fortunate. The sky, by night and by day, was cloudless, excepting a few round little masses of vapor, that floated over the highest pinnacles. I have often seen these islets in the sky, marking the position of the Cordillera, when the far distant mountains have been hidden beneath the horizon. April 6, in the morning we found some thief had stolen one of our mules, and the bell of the Madrina. We therefore rode only two or three miles down the valley, and stayed there the ensuing day in hopes of recovering the mule, which the Arriero thought had been hidden in some ravine. The scenery in this part, had assumed a Chilean character, the lower sides of the mountains, dotted over with the pale evergreen quail tree, and with the great chandelier-like cactus, are certainly more to be admired than the bare eastern valleys, but I cannot quite agree with the admiration expressed by some travelers. The extreme pleasure, I suspect, is chiefly owing to the prospect of a good fire, and of a good supper, after escaping from the cold regions above, and I'm sure I most heartily participated in these feelings eighth we left the valley of the Aconcagua, by which we had descended, and reached in the evening a cottage near the Villa del Street Rosa. The fertility of the plain was delightful, the autumn being advanced, the leaves of many of the fruit trees were falling, and of the laborers, some were busy in drying figs and peaches on the roofs of their cottages, while others were gathering the grapes from the vineyards. It was a pretty scene, but I missed that pensive stillness which makes the autumn in England indeed the evening of the year. On the 10th we reached Santiago, where I received a very kind and hospitable reception from Mr. Caldglue. My excursion only cost me 24 days, and never did I more deeply enjoy an equal space of time. A few days afterwards I returned to Mr. Corfield's house at Valparaiso. April 27th, I set out on a journey to Coquimbo, and then through Guasco to Copiapo, where Captain Fitzroy kindly offered to pick me up in the Beagle. The distance in a straight line along the shore northward is only 420 miles, but my mode of traveling made it a very long journey. I bought four horses and two mules, the latter carrying the luggage on alternate days. The six animals together only cost the value of 25 pounds sterling, and at Copiapo I sold them again for 23. We traveled in the same independent manner as before, cooking our own meals, and sleeping in the open air. As we rode towards the Vino del Mar, I took a farewell view of Valparaiso, and admired its picturesque appearance. For geological purposes I made a detour from the high road to the foot of the Bell of Quilota. We passed through an alluvial district rich in gold, to the neighborhood of Limash, where we slept. Washing for gold supports the inhabitants of numerous hotels, scattered along the sides of each little rivulet, but, like all those whose gains are uncertain, they are unthrifty in all their habits, and consequently poor 28th in the afternoon we arrived at a cottage at the foot of the Pell Mountain. The inhabitants were freeholders, which is not very usual in Chile. They supported themselves on the produce of a garden and a little field, but were very pure. Capital is here so deficient, that the people are obliged to sell their green corn, while standing in the field, in order to buy necessaries for the ensuing year. Weed in consequence, was dearer in the very district of its production than at Valparaiso, where the contractors live. The next day we joined the main road to Coquimbo. 
At night there was a very light shower of rain. This was the first drop that had fallen since the heavy rain of September 11th and 12th, which detained me a prisoner at the Baths of Cock Queens. The interval was seven and a half months, but the rain this year in Chile was rather later than usual. The distant Andes were now covered by a thick mass of snow, and were a glorious sight. May 2nd, the road continued to follow the coast, at no great distance from the sea. The few trees and bushes which are common in central Chile decreased rapidly in numbers, and were replaced by a dull plant, something like yucca in appearance. The surface of the country, on a small scale, was singularly broken and irregular, abrupt little peaks of rock rising out of small plains or basins. The indented coast and the bottom of the neighboring sea, studded with breakers, would, if converted into dry land, present similar forms, and such a conversion without doubt, has taken place in the part over which we rode third, Guilimari to Conchali. The country became more and more barren. In the valleys there was scarcely sufficient water for any irrigation, and the intermediate land was quite bare, not supporting even goats. In the spring, after the winter showers, a thin pasture rapidly springs up, and cattle are then driven down from the Cordillera to graze for a short time. It is curious to observe how the seeds of the grass and other plants seem to accommodate themselves, as if by an acquired habit, to the quantity of rain which falls upon different parts of this coast. One shower far northward at Copiapo produces as great an effect on the vegetation as two at Guasco and three or four in this district. At Valparaiso a winter so dry is greatly to injure the pasture, what at Guasco produce the most unusual abundance. Proceeding northward, the quantity of rain does not appear to decrease in strict proportion to the latitude. At Conchali, which is only 67 miles north of Valparaiso, rain is not expected till the end of May, whereas at Valparaiso some generally falls early in April, the annual quantity is likewise small in proportion to the lateness of the season at which it commences forth. Finding the coast road devoid of interest of any kind, we turned inland towards the mining district and valley. A Villarpel. This valley, like every other in Chile, is level, broad, and very fertile. It is bordered on each side, either by cliffs of stratified shingle, or by bare rocky mountains. Above the straight line of the uppermost irrigating ditch, all is brown as on a high road, while all below is up as bright a green as verdigris, from the beds of alfalfa, a kind of clover. We proceeded to Las Hornas, another mining district, where the principal hill was drilled with holes, like a great ant's nest. The Chilean miners are a peculiar race of men in their habits. Living for weeks together in the most desolate spots, when they descend to the villages on feast days, there is no excess of extravagance into which they do not run. They sometimes gain a considerable sum, and then, like sailors with prize money, they try how soon they can contrive to squander it. They drink excessively, buy quantities of clothes, and in a few days return penniless to their miserable abodes, there to work harder than beasts of burden. This thoughtlessness, as with sailors, is evidently the result of a similar manner of life. Their daily food has found them, and they acquire no habits of carefulness, moreover, temptation and the means of yielding to it are placed in their power at the same time. On the other hand, in Cornwall, and some other parts of England, where the system of selling part of the vein is followed, the miners, from being obliged to act and think for themselves, are a singularly intelligent and well-conducted set of men. The dress of the Chilean miner is peculiar and rather picturesque. He wears a very long shirt of some dark-colored baize, with a lethern apron, the whole being fastened round his waist by a bright-colored sash. His trousers are very broad, and his small cap of scarlet cloth is made to fit the head closely. We met a party of these miners in full costume, carrying the body of one of their companions to be buried. They marched at a very quick trot, four men supporting the corpse. One set having run as hard as they could for about 200 yards, were relieved by four others, who had previously dashed on ahead on horseback. Thus they proceeded, encouraging each other by wild cries, altogether the scene formed the most strange funeral. We continued traveling northward, in a zigzag line, sometimes stopping a day to geologize, the country was so thinly inhabited, and the track so obscure, that we often had difficulty in finding our way. On the 12th I stayed at some mines. The ore in this case, was not considered particularly good, but from being abundant it was supposed the mine would sell for about thirty or forty thousand dollars, that is, six thousand or eight thousand pounds sterling, yet it had been bought by one of the English associations for an ounce of gold, three L8s. The ore is yellow parodies, which, as I have already remarked, before the arrival of the English, was not supposed to contain a particle of copper. On a scale of profits nearly as great as in the above instance, piles of cinders, abounding with minute globules of metallic copper, were purchased, yet with these advantages, the mining associations, as is well known, contrived to lose immense sums of money. 
The folly of the greater number of the commissioners and shareholders amounted to infatuation, a thousand pounds per annum given in some cases, to entertain the Chilean authorities, libraries of well-bound geological books, miners brought out for particular metals, as tin, which are not found in Chile, contracts to supply the miners with milk, in parts where there are no cows, machinery, where it could not possibly be used, and a hundred similar arrangements, or witness to our absurdity, and to this day, afford amusement to the natives. Yet there can be no doubt that the same capital well employed in these mines would have yielded an immense return. A confidential man of business, a practical miner and a sayer, would have been all that was required. Captain Head has described the wonderful load which the Apires, truly beasts of burden, carry up from the deepest mines. I confess I thought the account exaggerated, so that I was glad to take an opportunity of weighing one of the loads, which I picked out by hazard. It required considerable exertion on my part, when standing directly over it, to lift it from the ground. The load was considered underweight when found to be 197 pounds. The Apire had carried this up 80 perpendicular yards, part of the way by a steep passage, but the greater part up notched poles, placed in a zigzag line up the shaft. According to the general regulation, the Apire is not allowed to halt for breath, except the mine is 600 feet deep. The average load is considered as rather more than 200 pounds, and I have been assured that one of 300 pounds, 22 stone and a half, by way of a trial has been brought up from the deepest mine. At this time the Apires were bringing up the usual load 12 times in the day, that is 2,400 pounds from 80 yards deep, and they were employed in the intervals, in breaking and picking Oregon. These men, excepting from accidents, are healthy, and appear cheerful. Their bodies are not very muscular. They rarely eat meat once a week, and never oftener, and then only the hard dry shark we. Although with the knowledge that the labor was voluntary, it was nevertheless quite revolting to see the state in which they reached the mouth of the mine, their bodies bent forward, leaning with their arms on the steps, their legs bowed, their muscles quivering, the perspiration streaming from their faces over their breasts, their nostrils distended, the corners of their mouth forcibly drawn back, and the expulsion of their breath most laborious. Each time they draw their breath, they utter an articulate cry of I, I, which ends in a sound rising from deep in the chest, but shrill like the note of a fife. After staggering to the pile of ore, they emptied the carpato, in two or three seconds recovering their breath, they wipe up the sweat from their brows, and apparently quite fresh descended the mine again at a quick pace. This appears to me a wonderful instance of the amount of labor which habit, for it can be nothing else, will enable a man to endure. In the evening, talking with the mayor Domo underscore of these mines about the number of foreigners now scattered over the whole country, he told me that, though quite a young man, he remembers when he was a boy at school at Coquimbo, a holiday being given to see the captain of an English ship, who was brought to the city, to speak to the governor. He believes that nothing would have induced any boy in the school, himself included, to have gone close to the Englishmen, so deeply had they been impressed with an idea of the heresy, contamination, and evil to be derived from contact with such a person. To this day they relate the atrocious actions of the buccaneers, and especially of one man, who took away the figure of the Virgin Mary, and returned the year, after for that of St. Joseph, saying it was a pity the lady should not have a husband. I heard also of an old lady who, at a dinner at Coquimbo, remarked how wonderfully strange it was, that she should have lived to dine in the same room with an Englishman, for she remembered as a girl, that twice, at the mere cry of loss and gleases, every soul, carrying what valuables they could, had taken to the mountains 14th we reached the Coquimbo, where we stayed a few days. The town is remarkable for nothing but its extreme quietness. It is said to contain from 6,000 to 8,000 inhabitants. On the morning of the 17th it rained lightly, the first time this year, for about five hours. The farmers, who plant corn near the seacoast where the atmosphere is most humid, taking advantage of this shower, would break up the ground, after a second they would put the seed in, and if a third shower should fall, they would reap a good harvest in the spring. It was interesting to watch the effect of this trifling amount of moisture. Twelve hours afterwards the ground appeared as dry as ever, yet after an interval of ten days, all the hills were faintly tinted with green patches, the grass being sparingly scattered and hair-like fibers a full inch in length. Before this shower every part of the surface was bare as on a high road. In the evening, Captain Fitzroy and myself were dining with Mr. Edwards, an English resident well known for his hospitality by all who have visited Coquimbo, when the sharp earthquake happened. I heard the forecoming rumble, but from the screams of the ladies, the running of the servants, and the rush of several of the gentlemen to the doorway, I could not distinguish the motion. Some of the women afterwards were crying with terror, and one gentleman said he should not be able to sleep all night, or if he did, it would only be, to dream of falling houses. The father of this person had lately lost all his property at Talcahano, and he himself had only just escaped the falling roof at Valparaiso, in 1822.
He mentioned a curious coincidence which then happened. He was playing at cards when a German, one of the party, got up and said he would never sit in a room in these countries with the door shut. As owing to his having done so, he had nearly lost his life at Copiapo. Accordingly he opened the door, and no sooner had he done this than he cried out, Here it comes again, and the famous shock commenced. The whole party escaped. The danger in an earthquake is not from the time, lost in opening the door, but from the chance of its becoming jammed by the movement of the walls. It is impossible to be much surprised at the fear which natives and old residents, though some of them known to be men of great command of mind, so generally experience during earthquakes. I think, however, this excessive panic may be partly attributed to a want of habit in governing their fear, as it is not a feeling they are ashamed of. Indeed, the natives do not like to see a person indifferent. I heard of two Englishmen who, sleeping in the open air during a smart shock, knowing that there was no danger, did not rise. The natives cried out indignantly, look at those heretics, they do not even get out of their beds. I spent some days in examining the step-formed terraces of Shingle, first noticed by Captain B. Hall, and believed by Mr. Little to have been formed by the sea, during the gradual rising of the land. This certainly is the true explanation, for I found numerous shawls of existing species on these terraces. Five narrow, gently sloping, fringe-like terraces rise one behind the other, and where best developed, are formed of shingle, they front the bay, and sweep up both sides of the valley. At Quasco, north of Coquimbo, the phenomenon is displayed on a much grander scale, so as to strike with surprise even some of the inhabitants. The terraces are there much broader, and may be called plains, in some parts there are six of them, but generally only five, they run up the valley for 37 miles from the coast. These step-formed terraces or fringes closely resemble those in the valley of Escruz, and, except in being on a smaller scale, those great ones along the whole coastline of Patagonia. They have undoubtedly been formed by the denuding power of the sea, during long periods of rest in the gradual elevation of the continent. Shells of many existing species not only lay on the surface of the terraces at Coquimbo, to a height of 250 feet, but are embedded in a friable calcareous rock, which in some places, is as much as between 20 and 30 feet in thickness, but is of little extent. These modern beds rest on an ancient tertiary formation containing shells, apparently all extinct. Although I examined, so many hundred miles of coast on the Pacific, as well as Atlantic side of the continent, I found no regular strata containing seashells of recent species, excepting at this place, and at a few points northward on the road to Guasco. This fact appears to me highly remarkable, for the explanation generally given by geologists, of the absence in any district of stratified fossiliferous deposits of a given period, namely, that the surface then existed as dry land, is not here applicable, for we know from the shells strewed on the surface, and embedded in loose sand or mold, that the land for thousands of miles along both coasts, has lately been submerged. The explanation, no doubt, must be sought in the fact that the whole southern part of the continent has been for a long time slowly rising, and therefore that all matter deposited along shore and shallow water must have been soon brought up and slowly exposed to the wearing action of the sea beach, and it is only in comparatively shallow water that the greater number of marine organic beings can flourish. And in such water it is obviously impossible that strata of any great thickness can accumulate. To show the vast power of the wearing action of sea beaches, we need only appeal to the great cliffs along the present coast of Patagonia, and to the escarpments for ancient sea cliffs at different levels, one above another, on that same line of coast. The old underlying tertiary formation at Coquimbo appears to be of about the same age with several deposits on the coast of Chile, of which that of Navidad is the principal one, and with the great formation of Patagonia, both at Navidad and in Patagonia there is evidence that since the shells, a list of which has been seen by Professor E. Forbes, there entombed were living, there has been a subsidence of several hundred feet, as well as an ensuing elevation. It may naturally be asked how it comes that, although no extensive fossiliferous deposits of the recent period, nor of any period intermediate between it and the ancient tertiary epoch, have been preserved on either side of the continent, yet that at this ancient tertiary epoch, sedimentary matter containing fossil remains, should have been deposited and preserved at different points in north and south lines, over a space of 1100 miles on the shores of the Pacific, and of at least 1350 miles on the shores of the Atlantic, and in an east and west line of 700 miles across the widest part of continent. I believe the explanation is not difficult, and that it is perhaps applicable to nearly analogous facts observed in other quarters of the world.
considering the enormous power of denudation which the sea possesses, as shown by numberless facts, it is not probable that a sedimentary deposit, when being upraised, could pass through the ordeal of the beach, so as to be preserved in sufficient masses, to last to a distant period, without it were originally of wide extent, and of considerable thickness, now it is impossible on a moderately shallow bottom, which alone is favorable to most living. Creatures, that a thick and widely extended covering of sediment could be spread out, without the bottom sank down, to receive the successive layers. This seems to have actually taken place at about the same period in southern Patagonia and Chile, though these places are a thousand miles apart. Hence, if prolonged movements of approximately contemporaneous subsidence are generally widely extensive, as I am strongly inclined to believe from my examination of the coral reefs of the great oceans, or if, confining our view to South America, the subsiding movements have been coextensive with those of elevation, by which, within the same period of existing shells, the shores of Peru, Chile, Tierra del Fuego, Patagonia, and La Plata have been upraised, then we can see that at the same time, at far distant points, circumstances would have been favorable to the formation of fossiliferous deposits of wide extent, and of considerable thickness, and such deposits, consequently, would have a good chance of resisting the wear and tear of successive beach lines, and of lasting to a future epoch. May 21st, I set out in company with Don Jose Edwards to the silver mine of Arcuras, and thence up the valley of Coquimbo. Passing through a mountainous country, we reached by nightfall the mines belonging to Mr. Edwards. I enjoyed my night's rest here from a reason which will not be fully appreciated in England, namely, the absence of fleas. The rooms in Coquimbo swarm with them, but they will not live here at the height of only three or four thousand feet. It can scarcely be the trifling diminution of temperature, but some other cause which destroys these troublesome insects at this place. The mines are not in a bad state, though they formerly yielded about two thousand pounds in weight of silver a year. It has been said, that a person with a copper mine will gain, with silver he may gain, but with gold he is sure to lose. This is not true, all the large Chilean fortunes have been made by mines of the more precious metals. A short time, since an English physician returned to England from Copiapo, taking with him the profits of one share of a silver mine, which amounted to about 24,000 pounds sterling. No doubt a copper mine with care, is a sure game, whereas the other is gambling, or rather taking a ticket in a lottery. The owners lose great quantities of rich wars, for no precautions can prevent robberies. I heard of a gentleman laying a bet with another, that one of his men should rob him before his face. The ore when brought out of the mine is broken into pieces, and the useless stone thrown on one side. A couple of the miners who were thus employed, pitched, as if by accident, two fragments away at the same moment, and then cried out for a joke let us see which rolls furthest. The owner, who was standing by, had a cigar with his friend on the race. The miner by this means watched the very point amongst the rubbish, where the stone lay. In the evening he picked it up, and carried it to his master, showing him a rich mass of silver ore, and saying, this was the stone on which you won a cigar by its rolling so far. May 23rd, we descended into the fertile valley of Coquimbo, and followed it till we reached an hacienda belonging to a relation of Don Jose, where we stayed the next day. I then rode one day's journey further, to see what were declared to be some petrified shells and beans, which latter turned out, to be small quartz pebbles. We passed through several small villages, and the valley was beautifully cultivated, and the whole scenery very grand. We were here near the main Cordillera, and the surrounding hills were lofty. In all parts of northern Chile, fruit trees produce much more abundantly at a considerable height near the Andes than in the lower country. The figs and grapes of this district are famous for their excellence, and are cultivated to a great extent. This valley is, perhaps, the most productive one north of Quilota. I believe it contains, including Coquimbo, 25,000 inhabitants. The next day I returned to the Hacienda, and thence, together with Don Jose, to Coquimbo. June 2nd, we set out for the valley of Guasco, following the coast road, which was considered rather less desert than the other. Our first day's ride was to a solitary house, called Yerba Buna, where there was pasture for our horses. The shower mentioned as having fallen, a fortnight ago, only reached about halfway to Guasco. We had, therefore, in the first part of our journey a most faint tinge of green, which soon faded quite away. Even where brightest, it was scarcely sufficient to remind one of the fresh turf and budding flowers of the spring of other countries. While traveling through these deserts one feels like a prisoner shut up in a gloomy court, who longs to see something green and to smell a moist atmosphere. June 3rd, Yerba Buna to Carazal. During the first part of the day we crossed a mountainous rocky desert, and afterwards a long deep sandy plain, strewed with broken seashells. There was very little water, and that little saline, the whole country, from the coast to the Cordillera, is in an inhabited desert. 
I saw traces only of one living animal in abundance, namely, the shells of a bulimus, which were collected together in extraordinary numbers on the driest spots. In the spring one humble little plant sends out a few leaves, and on these the snails feed. As they are seen only very early in the morning, when the ground is slightly damp with dew, the Guascus believe that they are bred from it. I have observed in other places that extremely dry and sterile districts, where the soil is calcareous, are extraordinarily favorable to land shells. At Carazal there were a few cottages, some brackish water, and a trace of cultivation, but it was with difficulty that we purchased a little corn and straw for our horses. Fourth, Carazal to sauce. We continued to ride over desert plains, tenanted by large herds of guanaco. We crossed also the valley of Chanral, which, although the most fertile one between Guasco and Coquimpo, is very narrow, and produces so little pasture, that we could not purchase any for our horses. At Sos we found a very civil old gentleman, superintendent of a copper smelting furnace. As an especial favor, he allowed me to purchase at a high price an armful of dirty straw, which was all the poor horses had for supper after their long day's journey. Few smelting furnaces are not at work in any part of Chile, it is found more profitable, on account of the extreme scarcity of firewood, and from the Chilean method of reduction being so unskillful, to ship the ore for Swansea. The next day we crossed some mountains to Friaran, in the valley of Guasco. During each day's ride further northward, the vegetation became more and more scanty, even the great chandelier-like cactus was here replaced by a different and much smaller species. During the winter months, both in northern Chile and in Peru, a uniform bank of clouds hangs, at no great height, over the Pacific. From the mountains we had a very striking view of this wide and brilliant aerial field, which sent arms up the valleys, leaving islands and promontories in the same manner, as the sea does in the Chanas Archipelago, and in Tierra del Fuego. We stay two days at Friarana. In the valley of Guasco there are four small towns. At the mouth there is the port, a spot entirely desert, and without any water in the immediate neighborhood. Five leagues higher up stands Friarana, a long straggling village, with decent whitewashed houses. Again, ten leagues further up Ballinor is situated, and above this Guasco Alto, a horticultural village, famous for its dried fruit. On a clear day the view up the valley is very fine, the straight opening terminates in the far distant snowy cordillera, on each side an infinity of crossing lines are blended together in a beautiful haze. The foreground is singular from the number of parallel and step-formed terraces, and the included strip of green valley, with its willow bushes, is contrasted on both hands with the naked hills. That the surrounding country was most barren will be readily believed, when it is known that a shower of rain had not fallen during the last thirteen months. The inhabitants heard with the greatest envy of the rain at Coquimpo, from the appearance of the sky they had hopes of equally good fortune, which, a fortnight afterwards, were realized. I was at Copiapo at the time, and there the people, with equal envy, talked of the abundant rain at Guasco. After two or three very dry years, perhaps with not more than one shower during the whole time, a rainy year generally follows, and this does more harm than even the drought. The rivers swell, and cover with gravel and sand the narrow strips of ground, which alone are fit for cultivation. The floods also injure the irrigating ditches. Great devastation had thus been caused three years ago. June 8, we rode on to Ballinor, which takes its name from Ballinagan, Ireland, the birthplace of the family of O'Higgins, who, under the Spanish government, were presidents and generals in Chile. As the rocky mountains on each hand were concealed by clouds, the terrace-like plains gave to the valley an appearance like that of Santa Cruz in Patagonia. After spending one day at Ballinor I set out, on the 10th, for the upper part of the valley of Copiapo. We rode all day over in an interesting country. I'm tired of repeating the epithets barren and sterile. These words, however, as commonly used, are cooperative. I have always applied them to the plains of Patagonia, which can boast of spiny bushes and some dufts of grass, and this is absolute fertility, as compared with northern Chile. Here again, there are not many spaces of 200 yards square, where some little bush, cactus, or lichen, may not be discovered by careful examination, and in the soil seeds lie dormant ready to spring up during the first rainy winter. In Peru real deserts occur over wide tracts of country. In the evening we arrived at a valley, in which the bed of the stream was tap, following it up, we came to tolerably good water. During the night, the stream, from not being evaporated and absorbed so quickly, flows a league lower down than during the day. Sticks were plentiful for firewood, so that it was a good place to bivouac for us, but for the poor animals there was not a mouthful to eat. June 11th, we rode without stopping for 12 hours till we reached an old smelting furnace, where there was water and firewood, but our horses again had nothing to eat, being shut up in an old courtyard. The line of road was hilly, and the distant views interesting, from the varied colors of the bare mountains. 
It was almost a pity to see the sun shining constantly over so useless a country, such splendid weather ought to have brightened fields and pretty gardens. The next day we reached the valley of Copiapo. I was heartily glad of it, for the whole journey was a continued source of anxiety, it was most disagreeable to hear, whilst eating our own suppers, our horses gnawing the posts to which they were tied, and to have no means of relieving their hunger. To all appearance, however, the animals were quite fresh, and no one could have told that they had eaten nothing for the last 55 hours. I had a letter of introduction to Mr. Bingley, who received me very kindly at the Hacienda of Petrero Seco. This estate is between 20 and 30 miles long, but very narrow, being generally only two fields wide, one on each side the river. In some parts the estate is of no width, that is to say, the land cannot be irrigated, and therefore is valueless, like the surrounding rocky desert. The small quantity of cultivated land in the whole line of valley does not so much depend on inequalities of level and consequent unfitness for irrigation as on the small supply of water. The river this year was remarkably full, here, high up the valley, it reached to the horse's belly, and was about fifteen yards wide, and rapid, lower down it becomes smaller and smaller, and is generally quite lost, as happened during one period of thirty years, so that not a drop entered the sea. The inhabitants watch a storm over the Cordillera with great interest, as one good fall of snow provides them with water for the ensuing year. This is of infinitely more consequence than rain in the lower country. Rain, as often as it falls, which is about once in every two or three years, is a great advantage because the cattle and mules can for some time afterwards find a little pasture in the mountains. But without snow on the Andes, desolation extends throughout the valley. It is on record that three times nearly all the inhabitants have been obliged to emigrate to the south. This year there was plenty of water, and every man irrigated his ground as much as he chose, but it has frequently been necessary to post soldiers at the sluices, to see that each estate took only its proper allowance during so many hours in the week. The valley is said to contain 12,000 souls, but its produce is sufficient only for three months in the year, the rest of the supply being drawn from Valparaiso and the south. Before the discovery of the famous silver mines of Chen and Silo, Copiapa was in a rapid state of decay, but now it is in a very thriving condition, and the town, which was completely overthrown by an earthquake, has been rebuilt. The valley of Copiapo, forming a mere ribbon of green in a desert, runs in a very southerly direction, so that it is of considerable length to its source in the Cordillera. The valleys of Guasco and Copiapo may both be considered as long narrow islands, separated from the rest of Chile by deserts of rock instead of by salt water. Northward of these, there is one other very miserable valley, called Perpato, which contains about 200 souls, and then there extends the real desert of Atacama, a barrier far worse than the most turbulent ocean. After staying a few days at Petrero Seco, I proceeded up the valley to the house of Don Benito Cruz, to whom I had a letter of introduction. I found him most hospitable, indeed it is impossible to bear too strong testimony to the kindness with which travelers are received in almost every part of South America. The next day I hired some mules to take me by the ravine of Jalcar into the central Cordillera. On the second night the weather seemed to foretell a storm of snow or rain, and whilst lying in our beds we felt a trifling shock of an earthquake. The connection between earthquakes and the weather has been often disputed, it appears to me to be a point of great interest, which is little understood. Humboldt has remarked in one part of the personal narrative, one, that it would be difficult for any person who had long resided in New Andalusia, or in Lower Peru, to deny that there exists some connection between these phenomena, in another part, however he seems to think the connection fanciful. At Guayaquil it is said, that a heavy shower in the dry season, is invariably followed by an earthquake. In northern Chile, from the extreme infrequency of rain, or even of weather foreboding rain, the probability of accidental coincidences becomes very small, yet the inhabitants are here most firmly convinced of some connection between the state of the atmosphere and of the trembling of the ground. I was much struck by this when mentioning to some people at Copiapo that there had been a sharp shock at Coquimpo, they immediately cried out. How fortunate, there will be plenty of pasture there this year. To their minds an earthquake foretold rain as surely as rain foretold abundant pasture. Certainly it did so happen that on the very day of the earthquake, that shower of rain fell, which I have described as in ten days' time producing a thin sprinkling of grass. At other times rain has followed earthquakes at a period of the year, when it is a far greater prodigy than the earthquake itself. This happened after the shock of November, 1822, and again in 1829, at Valparaiso, also after that of September, 1833, at Tacna. A person must be somewhat habituated to the climate of these countries, to perceive the extreme improbability of rain falling at such seasons, except as a consequence of some law quite unconnected with the ordinary course of the weather.
in the cases of great volcanic eruptions, as that of Kasegana, where torrents of rain fell at a time of the year most unusual for it, and almost unprecedented in Central America, it is not difficult to understand that the volumes of paper and clouds of ashes might have disturbed the atmospheric equilibrium. Humboldt extends this view to the case of earthquakes unaccompanied by eruptions, but I can hardly conceive it possible that the small quantity of aeriform fluids which then escape from the fissured ground can produce such remarkable effects. There appears much probability in the view first proposed by Mr. P. Scroat, that when the barometer is low, and when rain might naturally be expected to fall, the diminished pressure of the atmosphere over a wide extent of country might well determine the precise day on which the earth, already stretched to the utmost by the subterranean forces, should yield, crack, and consequently tremble. It is, however, doubtful how far this idea will explain the circumstances of torrents of rain falling in the dry season during several days, after an earthquake unaccompanied by an eruption, such cases seem to bespeak some more intimate connection between the atmospheric and subterranean regions. Finding little of interest in this part of the ravine, we retraced our steps to the house of Don Benito, where I stayed two days collecting fossil shells and wood. Great prostrate silicified trunks of trees, embedded in a conglomerate, were extraordinarily numerous. I measured one, which was 15 feet in circumference, how surprising it is, that every atom of the woody matter in this great cylinder, should have been removed and replaced by silic so perfectly, that each vessel and pore is preserved. These trees flourished at about the period of their lower chalk, they all belonged to the fir tribe. It was amusing to hear the inhabitants discussing the nature of the fossil shells which I collected, almost in the same terms as were used a century ago in Europe, namely, whether or not they had been thus born by nature. My geological examination of the country generally created a good deal of surprise amongst the Chilinus, it was long, before they could be convinced, that I was not hunting for mines. This was sometimes troublesome, I found the most ready way of explaining my employment, was to ask them how it was, that they themselves were not curious concerning earthquakes and volcanoes, why some springs were hot and others cold, why there were mountains in Chile, and not a hill in La Plata. These bare questions at once satisfied and silenced the greater number. Some, however, like a few in England, who are a century behind hand, thought that all such inquiries were useless and impious, and that it was quite sufficient that God had thus made the mountains. An order had recently been issued that all stray dogs should be killed, and we saw many lying dead on the road. A great number had lately gone mad, and several men had been bitten, and had died in consequence. On several occasions hydrophobia has prevailed in this valley. It is remarkable thus, to find so strange and dreadful a disease, appearing time after time in the same isolated spot. It has been remarked that certain villages in England, are in like manner much more subject to this visitation than others. Dr. Ananu states, that hydrophobia was first known in South America in 1803, this statement is corroborated by Azra and Aloha having never heard of it in their time. Dr. Ananu says, that it broke out in Central America, and slowly traveled southward. It reached Arequipa in 1807, and it is said that some men there, who had not been bitten, were affected, as were some Negroes, who had eaten a bullock which had died of hydrophobia. At Ica 42 people thus miserably perished. The disease came on between 12 and 90 days after the bite, and in those cases, where it did come on, death ensued invariably within five days. After 1808, a long interval ensued without any cases. On inquiry, I did not hear of hydrophobia in Van Diemen's land, or in Australia, and Perkle says, that during the five years he was at the Cape of Good Hope, he never heard of an instance of it. Webster asserts that at the Azores hydrophobia has never occurred, and the same assertion has been made with respect to Mauritius and St. Helena, too, in so strange a disease some information might possibly be gained, by considering the circumstances under which it originates in distant climates, for it is improbable, that a dog already bitten, should have been brought to these distant countries. At night, a stranger arrived at the house of Don Benito, and asked permission to sleep there. He said he had been wandering about the mountains for seventeen days, having lost his way. He started from Fosco, and being accustomed to traveling in the Cordillera, did not expect any difficulty in following the track to Copiapo, but he soon became involved in a labyrinth of mountains, whence he could not escape. Some of his mules had fallen over precipices, and he had been in great distress. His chief difficulty arose from not knowing where to find water in the lower country, so that he was obliged to keep bordering the central ranges. We returned down the valley, and on the 22nd reached the town of Copiapo. The lower part of the valley is broad, forming a fine plain like that of Quilota. The town covers a considerable space of ground, each house possessing a garden, but it is an uncomfortable place, and the dwellings are purely furnished. Everyone seems bent on the one object of making money, and then migrating as quickly as possible. 
All the inhabitants are more or less directly concerned with minds, and minds and ores are the sole subjects of conversation. Necessaries of all sorts are extremely dear, as the distance from the town to the port is 18 leagues, and the land carriage very expensive. A fowl costs five or six shillings, meat is nearly as dear as in England, firewood, or rather sticks, are brought on donkeys from a distance of two and three days journey within the Cordillera, and pasturage for animals is a shilling a day, all this for South America is wonderfully exorbitant. June 26, I hired a guide and eight mules, to take me into the Cordillera by a different line from my last excursion. As the country was utterly desert, we took a cargo and a half of barley mixed with the chopped straw. About two leagues above the town a broad valley called the Despoblado, or uninhabited, branches off from that one by which we had arrived. Although a valley of the grandest dimensions, and leading to a pass across the Cordillera, yet it is completely dry, excepting perhaps for a few days during some very rainy winter. The sides of the crumbling mountains were furrowed by sparsely any ravines, and the bottom of the main valley, filled with shingle, was smooth and nearly level. No considerable torrent could ever have flowed down this bed of shingle, for if it had, a great cliff-bounded channel, as in all the southern valleys, would assuredly have been formed. I feel little doubt that this valley, as well as those mentioned by travelers in Peru, were left in the state we now see them by the waves of the sea, as the land slowly rose. I observed in one place, where the Despoblado was joined by a ravine, which in almost any other chain would have been called a grand valley, that its bed, though composed merely of sand and gravel, was higher than that of its tributary. A mere rivulet of water, in the course of an hour, would have cut a channel for itself, but it was evident, that ages had passed away, and no such rivulet had drained this great tributary. It was curious to behold the machinery, if such a term may be used, for the drainage, all, with the last trifling exception, perfect, yet without any signs of action. Everyone must have remarked how mud banks, left by the retiring tide, imitate in miniature a country with hill and dale, and here we have the original model in rock, formed as the continent rose during the secular retirement of the ocean, instead of during the ebbing and flowing of the tides. If a shower of rain falls on the mud bank, when left dry, it deepens the already formed shallow lines of excavation, and so it is with the rain of successive centuries on the bank of rock and soil, which we call a continent. We rode on after it was dark, till we reached a side ravine with a small well, called Aguanamarga. The water deserved its name, for besides being Salina was most offensively putrid and bitter so that we could not force ourselves to drink either tea or mate. I suppose the distance from the river of Copiapo to this spot, was at least 25 or 30 English miles, in the whole space there was not a single drop of water, the country deserving the name of desert in the strictest sense. Yet about halfway we passed some old Indian ruins near Punta Gorda, I noticed also in front of some of the valleys, which branch off from the Despoblado, two piles of stones placed a little way apart, and directed so as to point up the mouths of these small valleys. My companions knew nothing about them, and only answered my queries by their imperturbable Queen Sabe. I observed Indian ruins in several parts of the Cordillera, the most perfect which I saw, were the Runas de Thambilis, in the Espalita Pass. Small square rooms were there huddled together in separate groups, some of the doorways were yet standing, they were formed by a cross slab of stone only about three feet high. Aloha has remarked on the lowness of the doors in the ancient Peruvian dwellings. These houses, when perfect, must have been capable of containing a considerable number of persons. Tradition says that they were used as halting places for the Incas when they crossed the mountains. Traces of Indian habitations have been discovered in many other parts, where it does not appear probable that they were used as mere resting places, but yet where the land is as utterly unfit for any kind of cultivation, as it is near the Tambilis, or at the Incas Bridge, or in the Portillo Pass, at all which places I saw ruins. In the ravine of Jajual, near Aconcagua, where there is no pass, I heard of remains of houses situated at a great height, where it is extremely cold and sterile. At first I imagined that these buildings had been places of refuge, built by the Indians on the first arrival of the Spaniards, but I have since been inclined to speculate on the probability of a small change of climate. In this northern part of Chile, within the Cordillera, old Indian houses are said to be especially numerous, by digging amongst the ruins, bits of woolen articles, instruments of precious metals, and heads of Indian corn, are not unfrequently discovered, an arrowhead made of agate, and of precisely the same form with those now used in Tierra del Fuego, was given me. I'm aware, that the Peruvian Indians now frequently inhabit most lofty and bleak situations, but at Copiapo I was assured by men who had spent their lives, in traveling through the Andes, that there were very many, machissimas, buildings at heights so great as, almost to border upon the perpetual snow, and in parts, where there exist no passes, and where the land produces absolutely nothing, and what is still more extraordinary, where there is no water.
Nevertheless it is the opinion of the people of the country, although they are much puzzled by the circumstance, that, from the appearance of the houses, the Indians must have used them as places of residence. In this valley, at Punta Gorda, the remains consisted of seven or eight square little rooms, which were of a similar form with those of Dambillus, but built chiefly of mud, which the present inhabitants cannot, either here, or, according to Aloa, in Peru, imitate in durability. They were situated in the most conspicuous and defenseless position, at the bottom of the flat broad valley. There was no water nearer than three or four leagues, and that only in very small quantity, and bad, the soil was absolutely sterile, I looked in vain even for a lichen adhering to the rocks. At the present day, with the advantage of beasts of burden, a mine, unless it were very rich, could scarcely be worked here with profit. Yet the Indians formerly chose it as a place of residence. If at the present time two or three showers of rain were to fall annually, instead of one, as now is the case during as many years, a small rill of water would probably be formed in this great valley, and then, by irrigation, which was formerly so well understood by the Indians, the soil would easily be rendered sufficiently productive to support a few families. I have convincing proofs that this part of the continent of South America has been elevated near the coast at least from 400 to 500, and in some parts from 1,000 to 1,300 feet, since the epoch of existing shells, and further inland the rise possibly may have been greater. As the peculiarly arid character of the climate is evidently a consequence of the height of the Cordillera, we may feel almost sure that before the later elevations, the atmosphere could not have been so completely drained of its moisture as it now is, and as the rise has been gradual, so would have been the change in climate. On this notion of a change of climate, since the buildings were inhabited, the ruins must be of extreme antiquity, but I do not think their preservation under the Chilean climate any great difficulty. We must also admit on this notion, and this perhaps is a greater difficulty, that man has inhabited South America for an immensely long period, inasmuch as any change of climate affected by the elevation of the land must have been extremely gradual. At Valparaiso, within the last 220 years, the rise has been somewhat less than 19 feet, at Lima the sea beach has certainly been up have from 80 to 90 feet, within the Indo-human period, but such small elevations could have had little power, in deflecting the moisture of bringing atmospheric currents. Dr. Lund However, found human skeletons in the caves of Brazil, the appearance of which induced him to believe that the Indian race has existed during a vast lapse of time in South America. When at Lima, I conversed on these subjects, three, with Mr. Gill, a civil engineer, who had seen much of the interior country. He told me that a conjecture of a change of climate had sometimes crossed his mind, but that he thought that the greater portion of land, now incapable of cultivation, but covered with Indian ruins, had been reduced to the state by the water conduits, which the Indians formerly constructed on so wonderful a scale, having been injured by neglect and by subterranean movements. I may here mention that the Peruvians actually carried their irrigating streams and tunnels through hills of solid rock. Mr. Gill told me he had been employed professionally to examine one. He found the passage low, narrow, crooked, and not of uniform breadth, but of very considerable length. Is it not most wonderful that men should have attempted such operations without the use of iron or gunpowder? Mr. Gill also mentioned to me a most interesting, and, as far as I'm aware, quite unparalleled case of a subterranean disturbance having changed the drainage of a country. Traveling from Casma to Huaraz, not very far distant from Lima, he found a plain covered with ruins and marks of ancient cultivation, but now quite barren. Near it was the dry course of a considerable river, whence the water for irrigation had formerly been conducted. There was nothing in the appearance of the water course to indicate that the river had not flowed there a few years previously. In some parts, beds of sand and gravel were spread out, in others, the solid rock had been worn into a broad channel, which in one spot was about 40 yards in breadth and 8 feet deep. It is self-evident that a person following up the course of a stream will always ascend at a greater or less inclination. Mr. Gill, therefore, was much astonished when walking up the bed of this ancient river to find himself suddenly going downhill. He imagined that the downward slope had a fall of about 40 or 50 feet perpendicular. We here have unequivocal evidence that a ridge had been uplifted right across the old bed of a stream. From the moment the river course was thus arched, the water must necessarily have been thrown back and a new channel formed. From that moment, also, the neighboring plain must have lost its fertilizing stream, and become a desert. June 27th, we set out early in the morning, and by midday, reached the ravine of Papote, where there is a tiny rill of water, with a little vegetation, and even a few algaroba trees, a kind of mimosa. From having firewood, a smelting furnace had formerly been built here, we found a solitary man in charge of it, whose sole employment was hunting guanacas. 
At night it froze sharply, but having plenty of wood for our fire, we kept ourselves warm. 28. We continued gradually ascending, and the valley now changed into a ravine. During the day we saw several guanacas, and the track of the Clisellilid species, the vicuna. This latter animal is preeminently alpine in its habits, it seldom descends much below the limit of perpetual snow, and therefore haunts even a more lofty and sterile situation than the guanaco. The only other animal which we saw in any number was a small fox. I suppose this animal preys on the mice and other small rodents, which, as long as there is the least vegetation, subsist in considerable numbers in very desert places. In Patagonia, even on the borders of the Salinas, where a drop of fresh water can never be found, excepting dew, these little animals swarm. Next to lizards, mice appear to be able to support existence on the smallest and driest portions of the earth even on islets in the midst of great oceans. The scene on all sides showed desolation, brightened and made palpable by a clear, unclouded sky. For a time such scenery is sublime, but this feeling cannot last, and then it becomes uninteresting. We bivouacked at the foot of the Primer Linea, or the first line of the partition of waters. The streams, however, on the east side do not flow to the Atlantic, but into an elevated district, in the middle of which there is a large saline, or salt lake, thus forming a little Caspian Sea at the height, perhaps, of 10,000 feet. Where we slept, there were some considerable patches of snow, but they do not remain throughout the year. The winds in these lofty regions, obey very regular laws every day a fresh breeze blows up the valley, and at night, an hour or two after sunset, the air from the cold regions above descends as through a funnel. This night it blew a gale of wind, and the temperature must have been considerably below the freezing point, for water in a vessel soon became a block of ice. No clouds seemed to oppose any obstacle to the air. I suffered very much from the cold, so that I could not sleep, and in the morning rose with my body quite dull and benumbed. In the Cordillera further southward, people lose their lives from snowstorms, here, it sometimes happens from another cause. My guide, when a boy of 14 years old, was passing the Cordillera with a party in the month of May, and while in the central parts, a furious gale of wind arose, so that the men could hardly cling on their mules, and stones were flying along the ground. The day was cloudless, and not a speck of snow fell, but the temperature was low. It is probable that the thermometer could not have stood very many degrees below the freezing point, but the effect on their bodies, ill protected by clothing, must have been in proportion to the rapidity of the current of cold air. The gale lasted for more than a day, the men began to lose their strength, and the mules would not move onwards. Makai's brother tried to return, but he perished, and his body was found two years afterwards, lying by the side of his mule near the road, with the bridle still in his hand. Two other men in the party, lost their fingers and toes, and out of 200 mules and 30 cows, only 14 mules escaped alive. Many years ago the whole of a large party are supposed to have perished from a similar cause, but their bodies to this day, have never been discovered. The union of a cloudless sky, low temperature, and a furious gale of wind, must be, I should think, in all parts of the world an unusual occurrence. June 29th, we gladly traveled down the valley to our former night's lodging, and thence to near the Aguamarga. On July 1st we reached the valley of Copiapo. The smell of the fresh clover was quite delightful, after the scentless air of the dry sterile despoblado. Whilst staying in the town I heard an account from several of the inhabitants, of a hill in the neighborhood which they called El Brameter, the Roar or Bellower. I did not at the time, pay sufficient attention to the account, but, as far as I understood, the hill was covered by sand, and the noise was produced only when people, by ascending it, put the sand in motion. The same circumstances are described in detail on the authority of seats in Andarenburg, or, as the cause of the sounds which have been heard by many travelers on Mount Sinai near the Red Sea. One person with whom I conversed, had himself heard the noise, he described it as very surprising, and he distinctly stated that, although he could not understand how it was caused, yet it was necessary to set the sand rolling down the acclivity. A horse walking over dry coarse sand, causes a peculiar chirping noise from the friction of the particles, a circumstance which I several times noticed on the coast of Brazil. Three days afterwards I heard of the Beagle's arrival at the port, distant 18 leagues from the town. There is very little land cultivated down the valley, its wide expanse supports a wretched wiry grass, which even donkeys can hardly eat. The spearness of the vegetation is owing to the quantity of saline matter with which the soil is impregnated. The port consists of an assemblage of miserable little hovels, situated at the foot of a sterile plain. At present, as the river contains water enough to reach the sea, the inhabitants enjoy the advantage of having fresh water within a mile and a half. On the beach there were large piles of merchandise, and the little place had an air of activity. In the evening I gave my adios, with a hearty goodwill, to my companion Mariano Gonzalez, with whom I had ridden, so many leagues in Chile. The next morning the Beagle sailed for Iquique.
July 12, we anchored in the port of Iquique, in latitude 20 degs 12 feet, on the coast of Peru. The town contains about a thousand inhabitants, and stands on a little plain of sand at the foot of a great wall of rock, 2,000 feet in height, here forming the coast. The whole is utterly desert. A light shower of rain falls only once in very many years, and the ravines consequently are filled with detritus, and the mountainsides covered by piles of fine white sand, even to a height of a thousand feet. During this season of the year a heavy bank of clouds, stretched over the ocean, seldom rises above the wall of rocks on the coast. The aspect of the place was most gloomy, the little port, with its few vessels, and small group of wretched houses, seemed overwhelmed and out of all proportion with the rest of the scene. The inhabitants live like persons on board a ship, every necessary comes from a distance, water is brought in boats from Pisigua, about 40 miles northward, and is sold at the rate of 9 reals, 460, an 18 gallon cask, I bought a wine bottle full for threepence. In like manner firewood, and of course every article of food, is imported. Very few animals can be maintained in such a place, on the ensuing morning I hire with difficulty, at the price of four pounds sterling, two mules and a guide, to take me to the natrate of soda works. These are at present the support of Ike Week. The salt was first exported in 1830, in one year and a mountain value of 100,000 pounds sterling, was sent to France and England. It is principally used as a manure, and in the manufacture of nitric acid, owing to its deliquescent property it will not serve for gunpowder. Formerly there were two exceedingly rich silver mines in this neighborhood, but their produce is now very small. Our arrival in the offing, caused some little apprehension. Peru is in a state of anarchy, and each party having demanded a contribution, the poor town of Iquique was in tribulation, thinking the evil hour was come. The people had also their domestic troubles, a short time before, three French carpenters had broken open, during the same night, the two churches, and stolen all the plate, one of the robbers, however, subsequently confessed, and the plate was recovered. The convicts were sent to Arequipa, which though the capital of this province, is 200 leagues distant, government there thought it a pity, to punish such useful workmen, who could make all sorts of furniture, and accordingly liberated them. Things being in this state, the churches were again broken open, but this time the plate was not recovered. The inhabitants became dreadfully enraged, and declaring that none, but heretics would thus eat God Almighty, proceeded to torture some Englishmen, with the intention of afterwards shooting them. At last the authorities interfered, and peace was established. The 13th in the morning I started for the Saltpeter Works, a distance of 14 leagues. Having ascended the steep coast mountains by a zigzag sandy track, we soon came in view of the mines of Guantaje and Street Rosa. These two small villages are placed at the very mouths of the mines, and being perched up on hills, they had a still more unnatural and desolate appearance than the town of Iquique. We did not reach the Saltpeter Works till after sunset, having ridden all day across an undulating country, a complete and utter desert. The road was strewed with the bones, and dry skins of many beasts of burden which had perished on it from fatigue. Excepting the vulture aura, which preys on the carcasses, I saw neither bird, quadruped, reptile, nor insect. On the coast mountains, at the height of about 2,000 feet where during this season the clouds generally hang, a very few cacti were growing in the clefts of rock, and the loose sand was strewn over with a lichen, which lies on the surface quite unattached. This plant belongs to the genus Cladonia, and somewhat resembles the reindeer lichen. In some parts there was insufficient quantity to tinge the sand, as seen from a distance, of a pale yellowish color. Further inland, during the whole ride of 14 leagues, I saw only one other vegetable production, and that was a most minute yellow lichen, growing on the bones of the dead mules. This was the first true desert which I had seen, the effect on me was not impressive, but I believe this was owing to my having become gradually accustomed to such scenes, as I rode northward from Valparaiso, through Caquimpo, to Copiapo. The appearance of the country was remarkable, from being covered by a thick crust of common salt, and of a stratified saliferous alluvium, which seems to have been deposited as the land slowly rose above the level of the sea. The salt is white, very hard, and compact, it occurs in water-worn nodules projecting from the agglutinated sand, and is associated with much gypsum. The appearance of this superficial mass very closely resembled that of a country after snow, before the last dirty patches are thawed. The existence of this crust of a soluble substance over the whole face of the country shows how extraordinarily dry the climate must have been for a long period. At night I slept at the house of the owner of one of the saltpeter mines. The country is here as unproductive as near the coast, but water, having rather a bitter and brackish taste, can be procured by digging wells. 
the well at this house, was 36 yards deep, as scarcely any rain falls, it is evident the water is not thus derived, indeed if it were, it could not fail to be as salt as brine, for the whole surrounding country is encrusted with various saline substances. We must therefore conclude, that it percolates underground from the Cordillera, though distant many leagues. In that direction there are a few small villages, where the inhabitants, having more water, are enabled to irrigate a little land, and raise hay, on which the mules and asses, employed in carrying the saltpeter, are fed. The nitrate of soda was now selling at the ship's side at 14 shillings per hundred pounds, the chief expense is its transport to the sea coast. The mine consists of a hard stratum, between two and three feet thick, of the nitrate mingled with a little of the sulfate of soda and a good deal of common salt. It lies close beneath the surface, and follows for a length of 150 miles the margin of a grand basin or plain, this, from its outline, manifestly must once have been a lake, or more probably an inland arm of the sea, as may be inferred from the presence of iotic salts in the saline stratum. The surface of the plain is 3300 feet above the Pacific 19th, we anchored in the Bay of Callao, the seaport of Lima, the capital of Peru. We stayed here six weeks, but from the troubled, state of public affairs, I saw very little of the country. During our whole visit the climate was far from being so delightful, as it is generally represented. A dull heavy bank of clouds constantly hung over the land, so that during the first 16 days I had only one view of the Cordillera behind Lima. These mountains, seen in stages, one above the other, through openings in the clouds, had a very grand appearance. It has almost become a proverb, that rain never falls in the lower part of Peru. Yet this can hardly be considered correct, for during almost every day of our visit there was a thick drizzling mist, which was sufficient to make the streets muddy and once closed damp, this the people are pleased to call Peruvian dew. That much rain does not fall is very certain, for the houses are covered only with flat roofs made of hardened mud, and on the mole ship loads of wheat were piled up, being thus left for weeks together without any shelter. I cannot say I like the very little I saw of Peru, in summer, however, it is said, that the climate is much pleasanter. In all seasons, both inhabitants and foreigners suffer from severe attacks of ague. This disease is common on the whole coast of Peru, but is unknown in the interior. The attacks of illness which arise from miasma never fail to appear most mysterious. So difficult is it to judge from the aspect of a country, whether or not it is healthy, that if a person had been told to choose within the tropics a situation appearing favorable for health, very probably he would have named this coast. The plain round the outskirts of Calio is sparingly covered with the coarse grass, and in some parts there are a few stagnant, though very small, pools of water. The miasma, in all probability, arises from these, for the town of Erica was similarly circumstanced, and its healthiness was much improved by the drainage of some little pools. Miasma is not always produced by luxuriant vegetation with an ardent climate, for many parts of Brazil, even where there are marshes and rank vegetation, are much more healthy than this sterile coast of Peru. The densest forests in a temperate climate, as in Chilo, do not seem in the slightest degree to affect the healthy condition of the atmosphere. The island of Street Jago, at the Cape de Verts, offers another strongly marked instance of a country, which anyone would have expected to find most healthy, being very much the contrary. I have described the barren and open plains as supporting, during a few weeks after the rainy season, a thin vegetation, which directly withers away and dries up, at this period the air appears to become quite poisonous, both natives and foreigners often being affected with violent fevers. On the other hand, the Galapagos archipelago, in the Pacific, with the similar soil, and periodically subject to the same process of vegetation, is perfectly healthy. Humboldt has observed, that, under the torrid zone, the smallest marshes are the most dangerous being surrounded, as at Veracruz and Carthagena, with an arid and sandy soil, which raises the temperature of the ambient air. 5. On the coast of Peru, however, the temperature is not hot to any excessive degree, and perhaps in consequence, the intermittent fevers are not of the most malignant order. In all unhealthy countries the greatest risk is run by sleeping on shore. Is this owing to the state of the body during sleep, or to a greater abundance of miasma at such times? It appears certain, that those who stay on board a vessel, though anchored at only a short distance from the coast, generally suffer less than those actually on shore. On the other hand, I have heard of one remarkable case, where a fever broke out among the crew of a man-of-war some hundred miles off the coast of Africa, and at the same time one of those fearful periods, six, of death commenced at Sierra Leone. No state in South America, since the Declaration of Independence, has suffered more from anarchy than Peru. At the time of their visit, there were four chiefs in arms contending for supremacy in the government, if one succeeded in becoming for a time very powerful, the others coalesced against him, but no sooner were they victorious, than they were again hostile to each other. 
The other day, at the anniversary of the independence, high mass was performed, the president partaking of the sacrament, during the Tedim Laudermus underscore, instead of each regiment displaying the Peruvian flag, a black one with death's head was unfurled. Imagine a government under which such a scene could be ordered, on such an occasion, to be typical of their determination of fighting to death. This state of affairs happened at a time very unfortunately for me, as I was precluded from taking any excursions much beyond the limits of the town. The barren island of Street Lorenzo, which forms the harbor, was nearly the only place where one could walk securely. The upper part, which is upwards of 1,000 feet in height, during this season of the year, winter, comes within the lower limit of the clouds, and in consequence, an abundant cryptogamic vegetation, and a few flowers cover the summit. On the hills near Lima, at a height but little greater, the ground is carpeted with moss and beds of beautiful yellow lilies, called amekis. This indicates a very much greater degree of humidity than at a corresponding height at Pike Week. Proceeding northward of Lima, the climate becomes damper, till on the banks of the Guayaquil, nearly under the equator, we find the most luxuriant forests. The change, however, from the sterile coast of Peru to that fertile land, is described as taking place rather abruptly in the latitude of Cape Blanco, two degrees south of Guayaquil. Calio is a filthy, ill-built small seaport. The inhabitants, both here and at Lima, present every imaginable shade of mixture, between European, Negro,